The Pomegranate Takuan and Iori arrived at Lord Hojo Ujikatsu's mansion in Ushigome later the same day. A young retainer stationed at the gate went to announce Takuan, and a few minutes later Shinzo came out. My father is at Edo Castle, said Shinzo. Won't you come in and wait? At the castle, said Takuan. I'll go on then, since that's where I was headed anyway. Would you mind if I left Iori here with you? Not at all, replied Shinzo, with a smile and a quick glance at Iori. May I order a palanquin for you? If you would. The lacquered palanquin was barely out of sight before Iori was at the stables, inspecting Lord Ujikatsu's well-fed chestnut browns and dappled greys, one by one. He particularly admired their faces, which he thought much more aristocratic than those of workhorses of his acquaintance. There was a mystery here, though. How could the warrior class afford to keep large numbers of horses standing idle instead of having them out working the fields? He was just beginning to imagine cavalrymen riding into battle when Shinzo's loud voice distracted him. He looked toward the house, expecting a scolding, but saw that the object of Shinzo's wrath was a thin old woman with a staff and a stubbornly set face. Pretending to be out? shouted Shinzo. Why would my father have to pretend to an old hag he doesn't even know? My, aren't you angry? Osugi said sarcastically. I gather you're his lordship's son. Do you know how many times I've come here trying to see your father? Not a few, I'll tell you, and every time I've been told he's out. A little rattled, Shinzo said, It doesn't have anything to do with how many times you come. My father doesn't like to receive people. If he doesn't want to see you, why do you keep coming back? Undaunted, Osugi cackled, doesn't like to see people? Why does he live among them, then? She bared her teeth. The idea of calling her a dirty name and letting her hear the click of his sword being released crossed Shinzo's mind, but he didn't want to make an unseemly show of temper, nor was he sure it would work. My father is not here, he said in an ordinary tone of voice. Why don't you sit down and tell me what this is all about? Well, I think I'll accept your kind offer. It's been a long walk and my legs are tired. She sat down on the edge of the step and began rubbing her knees. When you speak softly to me, young man, I feel ashamed for raising my voice. Now, I want you to convey what I say to your father when he comes home. I'll be glad to do that. I came to tell him about Miyamoto Musashi. Puzzled, Shinzo asked, Has something happened to Musashi? No, I want your father to know what kind of man he is. When Musashi was seventeen, he went to Sekigahara and fought against the Tokugawas. Against the Tokugawas, do you hear? What's more, he's done so many evil deeds in Mimasaka that no one there has anything good to say about him. He killed any number of people, and he's been running away from me for years because I've been trying to take my rightful revenge on him. Musashi's a useless vagabond, and he's dangerous. Now wait. No, just listen. Musashi started playing around with the woman my son was engaged to. He actually stole her and made off with her. Hold on now, said Shinzo, raising his hand in protest. Why tell such stories about Musashi? I'm doing it for the sake of the country, Osugi said smugly. What good will it do the country to slander Musashi? Osugi rearranged herself and said, I hear that slick-tongued rogue is soon to be appointed an instructor in the shogun's house. Where did you hear that? A man who was at the Ono Dojo. I heard it with my own ears. Did you now? A swine like Musashi shouldn't even be allowed in the shogun's presence, let alone be appointed tutor. A teacher to the house of Tokugawa is a teacher to the nation. It makes me sick just to think of it. I'm here to warn Lord Hojo, because I hear he recommended Musashi. Do you understand now? She sucked in the saliva at the corners of her mouth and went on. 
I'm sure it's to the country's benefit to warn your father. And let me warn you, too. Be careful you don't get taken in by Musashi's smooth talk. Fearing she might go on in this vein for hours, Shinzo summoned his last ounce of patience, swallowed hard, and said, Thank you. I understand what you've said. I'll pass it on to my father. Please do. With the air of someone who has finally achieved a cherished goal, Osugi got up and walked toward the gate, her sandals flopping noisily on the path. Filthy old hag, cried a boyish voice. Startled, Osugi barked, What? What? And looked around until she spotted Iori among the trees, showing his teeth like a horse. Eat that, he shouted, and flung a pomegranate at her. It struck so hard it broke. Ow! screamed Osugi, clutching at her chest. She bent to pick up something to throw at him, but he ran out of sight. She ran to the stable and was looking inside when a large, soft lump of horse manure struck her squarely in the face. Sputtering and spitting, Osugi wiped the mess from her face with her fingers, and the tears began to flow. To think that traveling about the country on her son's behalf had led to this sort of thing. Iori watched at a safe distance from behind a tree. Seeing her weeping like an infant, he was suddenly very ashamed of himself. He half wanted to go and apologize to her before she got out the gate, but his fury at hearing her malign Musashi had not subsided. Caught between pity and hatred, he stood there for a time, biting his fingernails. Come up here, Iori. You can see the red Fuji. Shinzo's voice came from a room high up on the hill. With a great sense of relief, Iori ran off. Mount Fuji? The vision of the peak dyed crimson in the evening light emptied his mind of all other thoughts. Shinzo, too, seemed to have forgotten his conversation with Osugi. Land of Dreams Ieyasu turned the office of shogun over to Hidetada in 1605, but continued to govern from his castle in Suruga. Now that the work of laying the foundations for the new regime was largely completed, he was beginning to let Hidetada take over his rightful duties. When he yielded his authority, Ieyasu had asked his son what he intended to do. Hidetada's reply, I'm going to build was said to please the old shogun immensely. In contrast to Edo, Osaka was still preoccupied with preparations for the final battle. Illustrious generals laid secret plots, couriers carried messages to certain fiefs, displaced military leaders and ronin were provided with solace and compensation. Ammunition was stockpiled, lances polished, moats deepened and more and more townsmen deserted the western cities for the booming city in the east, frequently changing loyalties, for the fear lingered that a Toyotomi victory might mean a reversion to chronic strife. To the daimyo and higher-ranking vassals who had yet to decide whether to entrust the fate of their children and grandchildren to Edo or Osaka, the impressive construction program in Edo was an argument in favor of the Tokugawas. Today, as on many other days, Hidetada was engaged in one of his favorite pastimes. Dressed as though for a country outing, he left the main encirclement and went to the hill at Fukiage to inspect the construction work. At about the time the shogun and his retinue of ministers, personal attendants, and Buddhist priests stopped for a rest, a commotion broke out at the bottom of the Momiji Hill. Stop the son of a bitch! Catch him! A well digger was running around in circles, trying to shake off the carpenters who were chasing him. He darted like a hare between stacks of lumber and hid briefly behind a plasterer's hut. Then he made a dash for the scaffolding on the outer wall and began climbing. Cursing loudly, a couple of the carpenters climbed after him and caught hold of his feet. The well digger, arms waving frantically, fell back into a pile of shavings. The carpenters fell on him, kicking and beating him from all sides. 
For some strange reason, he neither cried out nor attempted to resist, but clung as tightly as he could to the ground, as if that was his only hope. The samurai in charge of the carpenters and the inspector of workmen came running up. What's going on here? asked the samurai. He stepped on my square, the filthy pig, one carpenter whined. A square is a carpenter's soul. Get a hold of yourself. What would you do if he walked on your sword? demanded the carpenter. All right, that's enough. The shogun is resting up there on the hill. Hearing the shogun mentioned, the first carpenter quieted down. But another man said, He's got to wash. Then he's got to bow to the square and apologize. We'll take care of the punishment, said the inspector. You men go back to work. He seized the prostrate man by the collar and said, Lift your face. Yes, sir. You're one of the well diggers, aren't you? Yes, sir. What are you doing down here? This isn't where you work. He was around here yesterday, too, said the carpenter. Was he? said the inspector, staring at Matahachi's pale face and noticing that for a well digger he was a little too delicate, a little too refined. He conferred with the samurai for a minute, then led Matahachi away. Matahachi was locked in a woodshed behind the office of the inspector of workmen, and for the next several days had nothing to look at but some firewood, a sack or two of charcoal, and barrels for making pickles. Fearing the plot would be discovered, he was soon in a state of terror. Once inside the castle, he'd reconsidered and decided that if it meant being a well digger the rest of his life, he wasn't going to become an assassin. He'd seen the shogun and his entourage several times and done nothing. What took him to the foot of Momiji Hill whenever he could manage it during his rest periods was an unforeseen complication. A library was to be built, and when it was, the locust tree would be moved. Matahachi guiltily supposed the musket would be uncovered and this would link him directly to the plot. But he hadn't been able to find a time when no one was around to dig up the musket and throw it away. Even when sleeping, he'd break out in a sweat. Once he dreamed he was in the land of the dead, and wherever he looked there were locust trees. A few nights after his confinement in the woodshed, in a vision as clear as day, he dreamed of his mother. Instead of taking pity on him, Osugi shouted angrily and threw a basket full of cocoons at him. When the cocoons rained down on his head, he tried to run away. She pursued him, her hair mysteriously transformed into white cocoons. He ran and ran, but she was always behind him. Bathed in sweat, he jumped off a cliff and began falling through the darkness of hell, falling endlessly through blackness. Mother, forgive me, he cried out like a hurt child, and the sound of his own voice awakened him. The reality he woke to, the prospect of death, was more terrifying than the dream. He tried the door, which was locked, as he already knew. In desperation, he climbed up a pickle barrel, broke a small window near the roof, and squeezed through. Using piles of lumber and rock and small hills of excavated dirt for cover, he made his way stealthily to the vicinity of the western rear gate. The locust tree was still there. He sighed with relief. He found a hoe and started digging as if he expected to discover his own life. Unnerved by the noise he was making, he stopped and looked all around him. Seeing no one, he began again. The fear that someone had already found the musket made him swing the hoe frantically. His breathing became rapid and uneven. Sweat and grime mixed, making him look as if he'd just come from a mud bath. He was beginning to get dizzy, but he could not stop. The blade struck something long. Casting the hoe aside, he reached down to pull it out, thinking, I've got it. His relief was short-lived. The object wasn't wrapped in oil paper, there was no box, and it wasn't cool like metal. He took hold, held it up, and dropped it. It was a slender white wrist bone or shin bone. Matachi did not have the heart to pick up the hoe again. It seemed like another nightmare. But he knew he was awake. He could count every leaf of the locust tree. 
What would Daizo have to gain by lying? He wondered, as he walked around the tree, kicking at the dirt. He was still circling the tree when a figure walked quietly up behind him and slapped him lightly on the back. With a loud laugh right beside Matahachi's ear, he said, You won't find it. Matahachi's whole body went limp. He almost fell into the hole. Turning his head toward the voice, he stared blankly for several minutes before uttering a little croak of astonishment. Come with me, said Takuan, taking him by the hand. Matahachi could not move. His fingers went numb, and he clawed at the priest's hand. A chill of abject horror spread from his heels upward. Didn't you hear? Come with me, said Takuan, scolding with his eyes. Matahachi's tongue was almost as useless as a mute's. The, this, fix, dirt, I... In a pitiless tone, Takuan said, Leave it. It's a waste of time. The things people do on this earth, good or bad, are like ink on porous paper. They cannot be erased, not in a thousand years. You imagine that kicking a little dirt around will undo what you've done? It's because you think like that that your life is so untidy. Now come with me. You're a criminal. Your crime, heinous. I'm going to cut off your head with a bamboo saw and cast you into the pool of blood and hell. He seized Matahachi's earlobe and pulled him along. Takuan rapped on the door of the shed where the kitchen helpers slept. One of you boys come out here, he said. A boy came out, rubbing the sleep from his eyes. When he recognized the priest he'd seen talking with the shogun, he came awake and said, Yes, sir. Can I do something for you? I want you to open that woodshed. There's a well digger locked up in there. He isn't in there. He's right here. There's no point in putting him back in through the window, so open the door. The boy hastened to fetch the inspector, who rushed out, apologizing and begging Takuan not to report the matter. Takuan shoved Matachi into the shed, went inside, and closed the door. A few minutes later, he poked his head out and said, You must have a razor somewhere. Sharpen it and bring it here. The inspector and the kitchen helper looked at each other, neither daring to ask the priest why he wanted the razor. Then they honed the razor and handed it over to him. Thanks, said Takuan. Now you can go back to bed. The inside of the shed was pitch black, only a glimpse of starlight being visible through the broken window. Takuan seated himself on a pile of kindling. Matachi slumped down on a reed mat, hanging his head in shame. For a long time... There was silence. Unable to see the razor, Matahachi wondered nervously whether Takuan was holding it in his hand. At last, Takuan spoke. Matahachi, what did you dig up under the locust tree? Silence. I could show you how to dig up something. It would mean extracting something from nothingness, Recovering the real world from a land of dreams. Yes, sir. You haven't the least idea what the reality I'm talking about is. No doubt you are still in your world of fantasy. Well, since you're as naive as an infant, I suppose I'll have to chew your intellectual food for you. How old are you? Twenty-eight. The same age as Musashi. Matachi put his hands to his face and wept. Takuan did not speak until he had cried himself out. Then he said, Isn't it frightening to think that the locust tree nearly became the grave marker of a fool? You were digging your own grave, actually on the verge of putting yourself into it. Matachi flung his arms around Takuan's legs and pleaded, Save me! Please save me! My eyes! My eyes are open now. I was taken in by Daizo of Narai. No, your eyes are not open. Nor did Daizo deceive you. He simply tried to make use of the biggest fool on earth, a greedy, unsophisticated, petty-minded dolt who nevertheless had the temerity to take on a task any sensible man would shrink from. Yes, yes, 
I was a fool. Just who do you think this Daizo was? I don't know. His real name is Mizoguchi Shinano. He was a retainer of Otani Yoshitsugu, who is a close friend of Ishida Mitsunari. Mitsunari, you will remember, was one of the losers at Sekigahara. N no, gasped Matahachi. He's one of the warriors the shogunate is trying to track down? What else would a man out to assassinate the shogun be? Your stupidity is appalling. He didn't tell me that. He just said he hated the Tokugawas. He thought it'd be better for the country if the Toyotomis were in power. He was talking about working for the sake of everybody. You didn't bother to ask yourself who he really was, did you? Without once using your head, you went boldly about the business of digging your own grave. Your kind of courage is frightening, Matahaji. What am I to do? Do? Please, Takuan, please, help me. Let go of me. But, but I didn't actually use the gun. I didn't even find it. Of course you didn't. It didn't arrive on time. If Jotaro, whom Daizo duped into becoming a part of this dreadful plot, had reached Edo as planned, the musket might very well have been buried under the tree. Jotaro? You mean the boy? Never mind. That doesn't concern you. What does concern you is the crime of treason, which you have committed and which cannot be pardoned, nor can it be condoned by the gods and the Buddha. You may as well stop thinking about being saved. Isn't there any way? Certainly not. Have mercy, sobbed Matahachi, clinging to Takuan's knees. Takuan stood up and kicked him away. Idiot! he shouted in a voice that threatened to lift the roof off the shed. The ferocity of his glare was beyond description. A Buddha refusing to be clung to, a terrifying Buddha unwilling to save even the penitent. For a second or two, Matachi met the look resentfully. Then his head dropped in resignation, and his body was racked with sobs. Takuan took the razor from the top of the woodpile and touched Matachi's head with it lightly. As long as you're going to die, you may as well die looking like a disciple of the Buddha. Out of friendship, I'll help you do that. Close your eyes and sit quietly with your legs crossed. The line between life and death is not thicker than an eyelid. There is nothing frightening about death, nothing to cry over. Don't weep, child. Don't weep. Takuan will prepare you for the end. The room where the shogun's council of elders met to discuss matters of state was isolated from other parts of Edo Castle. This secret chamber was completely enclosed by other rooms and hallways. Whenever it was necessary to receive a decision from the shogun, the ministers would either go to his audience chamber or send a petition in a lacquered box. Notes and replies had been going back and forth with unusual frequency, and Takuan and Lord Hojo had been admitted to the room several times, often remaining there for day-long deliberations. On this particular day, in another room, less isolated but no less well guarded, the ministers had heard the report of the envoy sent to Kiso. He said that though there had been no delay in acting on the order of Daizo's arrest, Daizo had escaped after closing up his establishment in Narai, taking his entire household with him. A search had brought to light a substantial supply of arms and ammunition, together with a few documents that had escaped destruction. The papers included letters to and from Toyotomi supporters in Osaka. The envoy had arranged for shipment of the evidence to the shogun's capital and then rushed back to Edo by fast horse. The ministers felt like fishermen who had cast a big net and not caught so much as a single minnow. The very next day, a retainer of Lord Sakai, who was a member of the Council of Elders, made a report of a different sort. In accordance with your lordship's instructions, Miyamoto Musashi has been released from prison. He was handed over to a man named Musou Gonnosuke, 
to whom we explained in detail how the misunderstanding came about. Lord Sakai promptly informed Takuan, who said lightly, Very good of you. Please ask your friend Musashi not to think too badly of us, said Lord Sakai apologetically, uncomfortably aware of the error made in the territory under his jurisdiction. One of the problems solved most quickly was that of Daizo's base of operations in Edo. Officials under the Commissioner of Edo descended on the pawn shop in Shibaura and in one swift move confiscated everything, both property and secret documents. In the process, the unlucky Akemi was taken into custody, though she was completely in the dark regarding her patron's treacherous plans. Received an audience by the shogun one evening, Takuan related events as he knew them and told him how everything had turned out. He ended by saying, Please do not forget for a moment that there are many more daizos of Narai in this world. Hidetata accepted the warning with a vigorous nod. If you attempt to search out all such men and bring them to justice, Takuan continued, all your time and effort will be consumed in coping with insurgents. You won't be able to carry out the great work expected of you as your father's successor. The shogun perceived the truth of Takuan's words and took them to heart. Let the punishments be light, he directed. Since you reported the conspiracy, I leave it to you to decide the penalties. After expressing his heartfelt thanks, Takuan said, Quite without intending to, I see I've been here at the castle for more than a month. It's time to leave now. I'll go to Koyagyu and Yamato to visit Lord Sekishusai. Then I'll return to the Daitokuji, traveling by way of the Senshu district. Mention of Sekishusai seemed to evoke a pleasant memory for Hidetada. How is old Yagyu's health? he asked. Unfortunately, I'm told that Lord Munenori thinks the end is near. Hidetada recalled the time when he had been at the Shokokuji encampment and Sekishusai had been received by Ieyasu. Hidetada had been a child at the time, and Sekishusai's manly bearing had made a deep impression on him. Takuan broke the silence. There is one other matter, he said. In consultation with the Council of Elders and with their permission, Lord Hojo of Awa and I have recommended a samurai by the name of Miyamoto Musashi to be a tutor in Your Excellency's household. I hope that you will look favorably upon this recommendation. I've been informed of that. It's said that the House of Hosokawa is interested in him, which is very much to his favor. I have decided it would be all right to appoint one more tutor. It was a day or two before Takuan left the castle, and in the time he acquired a new disciple. Going to the woodshed behind the inspector's office, he had one of the kitchen helpers open the door for him, letting the light fall on a freshly shaven head. Temporarily blinded, the novice, who thought himself a condemned man, slowly lifted his downcast eyes and said, Ah! Come, said Takuan. Wearing the priest's robe Takuan had sent him, Matahachi stood up unsteadily on legs that felt as if they had begun to decay. Takuan gently put his arm around him and helped him out of the shed. The day of retribution had arrived. Behind his eyelids, closed in resignation, Matahachi could see the reed mat on which he would be forced to kneel before the executioner raised his sword. Apparently, he had forgotten that traitors faced an ignominious death by hanging. Tears trickled down his clean-shaven cheeks. Can you walk? asked Takuan. Matachi thought he was replying. In fact, no sound came out. He was barely conscious of going through the castle gates and crossing the bridges spanning the inner and outer moats. Trudging along dolefully beside Takuan, he was the perfect image of the proverbial sheep being led to slaughter. Hail to the Buddha Amida! Hail to the Buddha Amida! 
Silently, he repeated the invocation to the Buddha of eternal light. Matahachi squinted and looked beyond the outer moat at stately daimyo mansions. Farther to the east lay Hibiya village. Beyond, the streets of the downtown district were visible. The floating world called out to him anew, and along with his yearning for it, fresh tears came to his eyes. He closed them and rapidly repeated, Hail to the Buddha Amida! Hail to the Buddha Amida! The supplication became first audible, then louder and louder, faster and faster. Hurry up! Takuan said sternly. From the moat, they turned toward Otamachi and cut diagonally across a large vacant lot. Matahachi felt he had walked a thousand miles already. Would the road simply go on like this, all the way to hell, daylight gradually giving way to utter darkness? Wait here, commanded Takuan. They were in the middle of a flat open area. To the left, muddy water came down the moat from Tokiwa Bridge. Directly across the street was an earthen wall, only recently covered with white plaster. Beyond this was the stockade of the new prison and a group of black buildings, which looked like ordinary townhouses, but was actually the official residence of the Commissioner of Edo. His legs quaking, Matachi could no longer support himself. He plopped down on the ground. Somewhere in the grass, the cry of a quail suggested the pathway to the land of the dead. Run for it? His feet were not bound, nor were his hands. But no, he thought. He couldn't get away with it. If the shogun decided he was worth finding, there would not be a leaf, a blade of grass, to hide behind. In his heart, he cried out to his mother, who at this moment seemed very dear to him. If only he had never left her side, he wouldn't be here now. He recalled other women, too, Oko, Akemi, Otsu, others he had been fond of or dallied with. But his mother was the only woman he genuinely longed to see. If only he were given the opportunity to go on living, he was certain he would never again go against her will, never again be an unfilial son. He felt a damp chill on the back of his neck. He looked up at three wild geese winging their way toward the bay and envied them. The urge to take flight was like an itch. And why not? He had nothing to lose. If he were caught, he would be no worse off than he was now. With a desperate look in his eyes, he glanced toward the gate across the street. No sign of Takuan. He jumped up and started to run. Stop! The loud voice alone was enough to break his spirit. He looked around and saw one of the commissioner's executioners. The man stepped forward and brought his long staff down on Matahachi's shoulder, felling him with one blow, then pinned him down with the staff, as a child might pin down a frog with a stick. When Takuan came out of the commissioner's residence, he was accompanied by several guards, including a captain. They led out another prisoner who was tied up with a rope. The captain selected the place where the punishment would be carried out, and two freshly woven reed mats were spread on the ground. Shall we get on with it? he asked Takuan, who nodded his assent. As captain and priest sat down on stools to watch, the executioner shouted, Stand up! and lifted his staff. Matahachi dragged himself to his feet, but was too weak to walk. The executioner seized him angrily by the back of his robe and half-dragged him to one of the mats. He sat. His head dropped. He could no longer hear the quail. Though he was conscious of voices, they sounded indistinct, as though separated from him by a wall. Hearing his name whispered, he looked up in surprise. Akemi! he gasped. What are you doing here? She was kneeling on the other mat. No talking! Two of the guards made use of their staffs to separate them. The captain stood up and began reading the official judgments and sentences in stern, dignified tones. Akemi held back her tears, but Matahachi wept shamelessly. The captain finished, sat down, and shouted, Strike! 
two low-ranking guards carrying long switches of split bamboo pranced into position and began systematically lashing the prisoners across the back. One, two, three, they counted. Matahachi moaned. Akemi head bowed and face ashen, clamped her teeth together with all her might in an effort to bear the pain. Seven, eight, nine, the switches frayed. Smoke seemed to rise from their tips. A few passers-by stopped at the edge of the lot to watch. What's going on? Two prisoners being punished, it looks like. A hundred lashes, probably. They're not even to fifty yet. Must hurt. A guard approached and startled them by thumping the ground sharply with his staff. Off with you! You're not allowed to stand here! The gawkers moved to a safer distance and, looking back, saw that the punishment was over. The guards discarded their switches, which were now only bundles of flabby strands, and wiped the sweat off their faces. Takuan stood up. The captain was already on his feet. They exchanged amenities, and the captain led his men back toward the commissioner's compound. Takuan stood still for several minutes, looking at the bowed figures on the mats. He said nothing before walking away. The shogun had bestowed a number of gifts on him. These he had donated to various Zen temples in the city. Yet the gossips of Edo were soon added again. According to which rumor one heard, he was an ambitious priest who meddled in politics, or one the Tokugawas had persuaded to spy on the Osaka faction, or a black-robed conspirator. The rumors meant nothing to Takuan. Though he cared very much about the welfare of the nation, it made little difference to him whether the gaudy flowers of the time, the castles at Edo and Osaka, blossomed or fell. A few thin rays of sunlight filtered through the clouds. The voice of the quail was audible again. Neither of the forms moved for quite some time, though neither had completely lost consciousness. Finally, Akemi mumbled, Matachi, look, water. Before them were two wooden pails of water, each with a dipper, placed there as evidence that the office of the commissioner was not entirely heartless. After gulping down several mouthfuls, Akemi offered the dipper to Matahachi. When he failed to respond, she asked, What's the matter? Don't you want any? Slowly he reached out and took the dipper. Once it touched his lips, he drank ravenously. Matahachi, have you become a priest? Huh? Is that all? Is what all? Is the punishment over? They haven't caught off our heads yet. They weren't supposed to. Didn't you hear the man read the sentences? What did he say? He said we were to be banished from Edo. I'm alive, he shrieked. Almost insane with joy, he jumped up and walked away without so much as a backward glance at Akemi. She put her hands to her head and began to fuss with her hair. Then she adjusted her kimono and tightened her obi. Shameless, she muttered through crooked lips. Matahachi was only a speck on the horizon. A Cricket in the Grass Jotaro jogged along at a good pace, paying little attention to the road. Suddenly he halted and looked around, wondering if he'd lost his way. I don't remember passing here before, he thought nervously. Samurai houses fringed the remains of an old fortress. One section of the compound had been rebuilt to serve as the official residence of the recently appointed Okubo Nagayasu, but the rest of the area, rising like a natural mound, was covered with weeds and trees. The stone ramparts were crumbling, having been ravaged many years earlier by an invading army. The fortification looked primitive compared to the castle complexes of the last forty to fifty years. There was no moat, no bridge, nothing that could properly be described as a castle wall. 
It had probably belonged to one of the local gentry in the days before the great civil war daimyo incorporated their rural domains into larger feudal principalities. On one side of the road were paddies and marshland, on the other, walls, and beyond, a cliff, atop which the fortress must once have stood. As he tried to get his bearings, Jotaro's eyes traveled along the cliff. Then he saw something move, stop, and move again. At first it looked like an animal, but soon the stealthily moving silhouette became the outline of a man. Jotaro shivered, but stood riveted to the spot. The man lowered a rope with a hook attached to the top. After he had slid down the full length of the rope and found a foothold, he shook the hook loose and repeated the process. When he reached the bottom, he disappeared into a copse. Jotaro's curiosity was thoroughly aroused. A few minutes later, he saw the man walking along the low rises, separating the paddies, and apparently heading straight for him. He nearly panicked, but relaxed when he could make out the bundle on the man's back. What a waste of time! Nothing but a farmer stealing kindling! He thought the man must have been crazy to risk scaling the cliff for nothing more than some firewood. He was disappointed, too. His mystery had become unbearably humdrum. But then came his second shock. As the man strolled up the road past the tree Jotaro was hiding behind, the boy had to stifle a gasp. He was sure the dark figure was Daizo. It couldn't be, he told himself. The man had a black cloth around his face and wore peasant's knickers, leggings, and light straw sandals. The mysterious figure turned off into a path skirting a hill. No one with such sturdy shoulders and buoyant stride could be in his fifties, as Daizo was. Having convinced himself that he was mistaken, Jotaro followed. He had to get back to the inn, and the man just might, unwittingly, help him find his way. When the man came to a road marker, he set down his bundle, which appeared to be very heavy. As he leaned over to read the writing on the stone, Something about him again struck Jotaro as familiar. While the man climbed a path up the hill, Jotaro examined the marker, on which were carved the words, Pine Tree on Head Burying Mound Above. This was where the local inhabitants buried the severed skulls of criminals and defeated warriors. The branches of an immense pine were clearly visible against the night sky. By the time Jotaro reached the top of the rise, the man had seated himself by the roots of the tree and was smoking a pipe. Daizo, no question about it now. A peasant would never carry tobacco with him. Some had been successfully grown domestically, but on such a limited scale that it was still very expensive. Even in the relatively well-off Kansai district, it was considered a luxury. And up in Sendai, when Lord Date smoked, his scribe felt constrained to make an entry in his daily journal. Morning, three smokes. Afternoon, four smokes. Bedtime, one smoke. Financial considerations aside, most people who had a chance to try tobacco found it made them dizzy or even nauseated. Though appreciated for its flavor, it was generally regarded as a narcotic. Jotaro knew that smokers were few. He also knew that Daizo was one of them, for he had frequently seen him drawing on a handsomely made ceramic pipe. Not that this had ever before struck him as strange. Daizo was wealthy and a man of expensive tastes. What's he up to? he thought impatiently. Accustomed now to the danger of the situation, he gradually crept closer. Having finished his pipe, the merchant got to his feet, removed his black kerchief, and tucked it into his waist. Then slowly he walked around the pine. The next thing Jotaro knew, he was holding a shovel in his hands. Where had that come from? Leaning on the shovel, Daizo looked around at the night scenery for a moment, apparently fixing the location in his mind. 
seemingly satisfied, Daisol rolled aside a large rock on the north side of the tree and began digging energetically, looking neither right nor left. Jotaro watched the hole grow nearly deep enough for a man to stand in. Finally, Daizo stopped and wiped the sweat from his face with his kerchief. Jotaro remained as still as a rock and totally baffled. This'll do, the merchant murmured softly as he finished trampling down the soft dirt at the bottom of the hole. For an instant, Jotaro had a peculiar impulse to call out and warn him not to bury himself, but he held back. Jumping up to the surface, Daizo proceeded to drag the heavy bundle from the tree to the edge of the hole and undo the hempen cord around the top. At first, Jotaro thought the sack was made of cloth, but now he could see that it was a heavy leather cloak of the sort generals wore over their armor. Inside was another sack, made of tenting or some similar fabric. When this was opened, the top of an incredible stack of gold came into view, semi-cylindrical ingots made by pouring the molten metal into half-sections of bamboo split lengthwise. There was more to come. Loosening his obi, Daizo unburdened himself of several dozen large, newly minted gold pieces, which had been stuffed into his stomach wrapper, the back of his kimono, and other parts of his clothing. Having placed these neatly on top of the ingots, he tied both containers securely and dropped the bundle into the pit, as he might have dumped the carcass of a dog. He then shoveled the dirt back in, stamped on it with his feet, and replaced the rock. He finished off by scattering dry grass and twigs around the rock. Then he set about transforming himself back into the well-known Daizo of Narai, affluent dealer in herbs. The peasant's garb, wrapped around the shovel, went into a thicket not likely to be explored by passers-by. He donned his traveling cloak and hung his money pouch around his neck in the manner of itinerant priests. As he slipped his feet into his zori, he mumbled with satisfaction, Quite a night's work. When Daizo was out of hearing range, Jotaro emerged from his hiding place and went to the rock. Though he scrutinized the spot carefully, he could discern no trace of what he had just witnessed. He stared at the ground, as if at a magician's empty palm. I'd better get moving, he thought suddenly. If I'm not there when he gets back to the inn, he'll be suspicious. Since the lights of the town were now visible beneath him, he had no trouble setting his course. Running like the wind, he somehow contrived to stay on back roads and keep well out of Daisel's path. It was with an expression of perfect innocence that he climbed the stairs at the inn and entered their room. He was in luck. Skeichi was slumped against the lacquered traveling case, alone and sound asleep. A thin trickle of saliva ran down his chin. Hey, Skeichi, you'll catch cold there! Purposely, Jotaro shook him to wake him up. Oh, it's you, is it? drawled Skechi, rubbing his eyes. What were you doing out this late without telling the master? Are you crazy? I've been back for hours. If you'd been awake, you'd have known that. Don't try to fool me. I know you went out with that woman from the Sumia. If you're running around after a whore now, I hate to think what you'll be acting like when you grow up. Just then, Daizo opened the shoji. I'm back! was all he said. An early morning start was necessary in order to make Edo before nightfall. Jinnai had his troop, Akemi restored to it, on the road well before sunrise. Daizo, Skeichi, and Jotaro, however, took their time over breakfast and were not ready to leave until the sun was fairly high in the sky. Daizo led the way, as usual, but Jotaro trailed behind with Skeichi, which was unusual. Finally, Daizo stopped, asking, What's the matter with you this morning? Pardon? Jotaro did his best to appear nonchalant. Is something wrong? No, nothing at all. Why do you ask? You look glum. Not like you. It's nothing, sir. I was just thinking. If I stay with you, I don't know whether I'll ever find my teacher or not. 
I'd like to go and look for him on my own, if it's all right with you. Without a moment's hesitation, Daizo replied, It isn't! Jotaro had sidled up and started to take hold of the man's arm, but now he withdrew his hand and asked nervously, Why not? Let's rest here a while, said Daizo, lowering himself onto the grassy plain for which the province of Musashi was famous. Once seated, he gestured to Skeichi to go on ahead. But I have to find my teacher as soon as possible, pleaded Jotaro. I told you, you're not going off by yourself. Looking very stern, Daizo put his ceramic pipe to his lips and took a puff. As of today, you're my son. He sounded serious. Jotaro swallowed hard, but then Daizo laughed, and the boy, assuming it was all a joke, said, I couldn't do that. I don't want to be your son. What? You're a merchant. I want to be a samurai. I'm sure you'll find that Daizo of Narai is no ordinary townsman without honor or background. Become my adopted son, and I'll make a real samurai out of you. Jotaro realized with dismay that he meant what he was saying. May I ask why you decided this so suddenly? the boy asked. In a trice, Daizo seized him and pinioned him to his side. Putting his mouth to the boy's ear, he whispered, You saw me, didn't you, you little bastard? Saw you? Yes, you were watching, weren't you? I don't know what you're talking about. Watching what? What I did last night. Jotaro tried his best to stay calm. Why did you do that? The boy's defenses were close to collapse. Why were you prying into my private affairs? I'm sorry, blurted Jotaro. I'm really sorry. I won't tell a soul. Keep your voice down. I'm not going to punish you, but in return, you're going to become my adopted son. If you refuse, you give me no choice but to kill you. Now, don't force me to do that. I think you're a fine boy, very likable. For the first time in his life, Jotaro began to feel real fear. I'm sorry, he repeated fervently. Don't kill me. I don't want to die. Like a captured skylark, he wriggled timidly in Daizo's arms, afraid that if he really struggled, the hand of death would descend on him forthwith. Although the boy felt his grip to be vice-like, Daizo was not holding him tightly at all. In fact, when he pulled the boy onto his lap, his touch was almost tender. Then you'll be my son, won't you? His stubbly chin scratched Jotaro's cheek. Though he couldn't have identified it, what fettered Jotaro was an adult masculine scent. He was like an infant on Daizo's knee, unable to resist, unable even to speak. It's for you to decide. Will you let me adopt you, or will you die? Answer me, now! With a wail, the boy burst into tears. He rubbed his face with dirty fingers until muddy little puddles formed on both sides of his nose. Why cry? You're lucky to have such an opportunity. I guarantee you'll be a great samurai when I finish with you. But what is it? You're, you're... Yes? I can't say it. Out with it. Speak. A man should state his thoughts simply and clearly. You're... Well, your business is stealing. Had it not been for the hands resting lightly on him, Jotaro would have been off like a gazelle. But Daizo's lap was a deep pit, the walls of which prevented him from moving. <laughs> chortled Daizo, giving him a playful slap on the back. Is that all that's bothering you? Y yes The big man's shoulders shook with laughter. I might be the sort of person who'd steal the whole country, but a common burglar or a highwayman I am not. Look at Ieyasu or Hideyoshi or Nobunaga. 
They're all warriors who stole or tried to steal the whole nation, aren't they? Just stick with me, and one of these days you'll understand. Then you're not a thief? I wouldn't bother with a business that's so unprofitable. Lifting the boy off his knee, he said, Now stop blubbering, and let's be on our way. From this moment on, you're my son. I'll be a good father to you. Your end of the bargain is that you never breathe a word to anyone about what you think you saw last night. If you do, I'll wring your neck. Jotaro believed him. The Pioneers On the day near the end of the fifth month, when Osugi arrived in Edo, the air was steamingly sultry, the way it was only when the rainy season failed to bring rain. In the nearly two months since she had left Kyoto, she had traveled at a leisurely pace, taking time to pamper her aches and pains or to visit shrines and temples. Her first impression of the shogun's capital was distasteful. Why build houses in a swamp like this? she remarked disdainfully. The weeds and rushes haven't even been cleared away yet. Because of the unseasonable drought, a pall of dust hung over the Takanawa High Road, with its newly planted trees and recently erected milestones. The stretch from Shioiri to Nihonbashi was crowded with ox carts loaded with rocks or lumber. All along the way, new houses were going up at a furious clip. Of all the... gasped Osugi, looking up angrily at a half-finished house. A gob of wet clay from a plasterer's trowel had accidentally landed on her kimono. The workmen exploded with laughter. How dare you throw mud on people and then stand there laughing? You should be on your knees, apologizing. Back in Miyamoto, a few sharp words from her would have had her tenants or any of the other villagers cowering. These laborers, among the thousands of newcomers from all over the country, barely looked up from their work. What's the old hag babbling about? a worker asked. Osugi, incensed, shouted, Who said that? Why, you? The more she sputtered, the harder they laughed. Spectators began to gather, asking each other why the old woman wasn't acting her age and taking the matter in stride. Storming into the house, Osugi seized the end of the plank the plasterers were standing on and yanked it off its supports. Men in buckets full of wet clay clattered to the floor. You old bitch! Jumping to their feet, they surrounded her threateningly. Osugi did not flinch. Come outside, she commanded grimly as she placed her hand on her short sword. The workmen had second thoughts. The way she looked and carried on, she had to be from a samurai family. They might get into trouble if they weren't careful. Their manner softened noticeably. Observing the change, Osugi declared grandly, Henceforward, I'll not countenance rudeness from the likes of you. With a look of satisfaction on her face, she went out and started up the road again, leaving the spectators to gape at her stubborn straight back. She was hardly on her way again before an apprentice, his muddy feet grotesquely covered with shavings and sawdust, ran up behind her carrying a bucket of mucky clay, shouting, How do you like this, you old witch? He slung the contents of his pail at her back. Ow! The howl did credit to Osugi's lungs, but before she could turn around, the apprentice had vanished. When she realized the extent of the damage, she scowled bitterly and tears of sheer vexation filled her eyes. The merriment was general. What are you nincompoops laughing at? raged Osugi, baring her teeth. What's so funny about an old woman being splattered with grime? Is this the way you welcome elderly people to Edo? You're not even human. Just remember, you'll all be old one day. This outburst attracted even more onlookers. Edo indeed, she snorted. To hear people talk, 
You'd think it was the greatest city in the whole country. And what is it? A place full of dirt and filth, where everybody's pulling down hills and filling in swamps and digging ditches and piling up sand from the seaside. Not only that, it's full of riffraff, like you'd never find in Kyoto or anywhere in the West. Having got that off her chest, she turned her back on the sniggering crowd and went rapidly on her way. To be sure, the city's newness was its most remarkable feature. The wood and plaster of the houses was all bright and fresh. Many building sites were only partially filled in, and ox and horse dung assailed the eyes and nostrils. Not so long ago, this road had been a mere footpath through the rice paddies between the villages of Hibiya and Chiyoda. Had Osugi gone a little to the west, nearer Edo Castle, she would have found an older and more sedate district, where daimyo and vassals of the shogun had begun building residences soon after Tokugawa Ieyasu occupied Edo in 1590. As it was, absolutely nothing appealed to her. She felt ancient. Everyone she saw, shopkeepers, officials on horseback, samurai striding by in basket hats, all were young, as were laborers, craftsmen, vendors, soldiers, even generals. The front of one house, where plasterers were still at work, bore a shop sign, behind which sat a heavily powdered woman, brushing her eyebrows as she awaited customers. In other half-finished buildings, people were selling sake, setting up displays of dry goods, laying in supplies of dried fish. One man was hanging out a sign advertising medicine. If I weren't looking for someone, Osugi mumbled sourly, I wouldn't stay in this garbage dump a single night. Coming to a hill of excavated dirt blocking the road, she halted. At the foot of a bridge crossing the as-yet waterless moat stood a shanty. Its walls consisted of reed matting held in place by strips of bamboo, but a banner proclaimed that this was a public bath. Osugi handed over a copper coin and went in to wash her kimono. After cleaning it as well as she could, she borrowed a drawing pole and hung the garment up by the side of the shanty. Clothed in her underwear, with a light bathrobe draped over her back, she squatted in the shadow of the bathhouse and gazed absently at the road. Across the street, half a dozen men stood in a circle, haggling in voices loud enough for Osugi to hear what they were saying. How many square feet is it? I wouldn't mind considering it if the price is right. There's two-thirds of an acre. The price is what I mentioned before. I can't come down from that. It's too much. You must know that yourself. Not at all. It costs a lot of money to fill in land. And don't forget, there's no more available around here. Oh, there must be. They're filling in everywhere. Already sold. People are snatching it up as it is, swamp and all. You won't find 300 square feet for sale. Of course, if you're willing to go way over toward the Sumida River, you might be able to get something cheaper. Do you guarantee there's two-thirds of an acre? You don't have to take my word for it. Get a rope and measure it off yourself. Osugi was astounded. The figure quoted for a hundred square feet would have been sufficient for tens of acres of good rice land. But essentially the same conversation was taking place all over the city, for many a merchant speculated in land. Osugi was also mystified. Why would anybody want land here? It's no good for rice, and you can't call this place a city. By and by, the deal across the street was sealed with a ritual hand-clapping intended to bring good luck to all concerned. As she idly watched the departing shadows, Osugi became conscious of a hand on the back of her obi. Thief! she shrieked as she made a grab for the pickpocket's wrist. But her coin purse had already been removed, and the thief was already in the street. Thief! Osugi screamed again. Flying after the man, she managed to throw her arms around his waist. Help! Thief! The pickpocket struggled, striking her several times in the face without being able to break her grip. Let go of me, you cow! He shouted, kicking her in the ribs. With a loud grunt, Osugi fell down, but she had her short sword out and slashed at the man's ankle. 
Ow! Blood pouring from the wound, he limped a few steps, then flopped down on the ground. Startled by the commotion, the land dealers turned around, and one of them exclaimed, Hey, isn't that that good-for-nothing from Koshu? The speaker was Hangawara Yajibe, master of a large gang of construction workers. Looks like him, agreed one of his henchmen. What's that in his hand? Looks like a purse. It does, doesn't it? And somebody just yelled thief. Look, there's an old woman sprawled out on the ground. Go see what's the matter with her. I'll take care of him. The pickpocket was on his feet and running again, but Yajibe caught up with him and slapped him to the ground as he might have swatted a grasshopper. Returning to his boss, the henchman reported, Just as we thought, he stole the old lady's purse. I have it here. How is she? Not hurt bad. She fainted, but came to screaming bloody murder. She's still sitting there. Can't she stand up? I guess not. He kicked her in the ribs. You son of a bitch. Still glaring at the pickpocket, Yajibe issued a command to his underling. Ushie, put up a stake. The words set the thief to trembling as though the point of a knife were being pressed against his throat. Not that, he pleaded, groveling in the dirt at Yajibe's feet. Let me off just this once. I promise I won't do it again. Yajibe shook his head. Nope, you'll get what you deserve. Ushi, who had been named after the zodiac sign under which he was born, a not uncommon practice among farmers, returned with two workmen from the nearby bridge site. Over there, he said, pointing toward the middle of a vacant lot. After the workmen had driven a heavy post into the ground, one of them asked, This good enough? That's fine, said Yajibe. Now tie him to it and nail a board above his head. When this had been done, Yajibe borrowed a carpenter's ink pot and brush and wrote on the board, This man is a thief. Until recently he worked for me, but he has committed a crime for which he must be punished. He is to be tied here, exposed to rain and sun, for seven days and seven nights, by order of Yajibe of Bakurocho. Thanks, he said, returning the ink pot. Now, if it's not too much trouble, give him a bite to eat every once in a while. Just enough to keep him from starving. Anything left over from your lunch will do. The two workmen, along with others who had congregated in the meantime, signified their assent. Some of the laborers promised that they would see to it that the thief got his share of ridicule. It wasn't just samurai who feared public exposure of their misdeeds or weaknesses. Even for ordinary townspeople in these times, to be laughed at was the worst of all punishments. Punishing criminals without reference to law was a firmly established practice. In the days when the warriors were too busy with warfare to maintain order, townsmen had, for the sake of their own safety, taken it upon themselves to deal with miscreants. Though Edo now had an official magistrate and a system was developing whereby leading citizens in each district functioned as government representatives, the summary administration of justice still occurred. With conditions still being a bit chaotic, the authorities saw little reason to interfere. Ushi, said Yajibe, take the old lady her purse. Too bad this had to happen to somebody her age. She seems to be all alone. What happened to her kimono? She says she washed it and hung it up to dry. Go get it for her, then bring her along. We might as well take her home with us. There's little point in punishing the thief if we're going to leave her here for some other ruffian to prey on. Moments later, Yajibe strode away. Ushi was close behind, the kimono over his arm and Osugi on his back. They soon reached Nihonbashi, the bridge of Japan from which all distances along the roads leading out of Edo were now measured. Stone parapets supported the wooden arch, and since the bridge had been constructed only about a year before, the railing still preserved a feeling of newness. Boats from Kamakura and Odawara were moored along one riverbank. On the other was the city's fish market. Oh, my side hurts, Osugi said with a loud groan. The fishmongers looked up to see what was going on. 
being gaped at was not to Yajibe's liking. Glancing back at Osugi, he said, We'll be there soon. Try to hold on. Your life's not in danger. Osugi laid her head on Ushi's back and became as quiet as a baby. In the downtown area, tradesmen and artisans had formed their own neighborhoods. There was a blacksmith's district, one for lance makers, others for dyers, tatami weavers, and so on. Yajibe's house stood out prominently from those of the other carpenters because the front half of the roof was covered with tiles. All the other houses had board roofs. Until a fire a couple of years before, nearly all the roofs had been made of thatch. As it happened, Yajibe had acquired what passed for his surname from his roof, Hangawara, meaning half-tiled. He had come to Edo as a ronin, but being both clever and warm-hearted, he had proved to be a skillful manager of men. Before long, he set himself up as a contractor, employing a sizable crew of carpenters, roofers, and unskilled workers. From building projects carried out for various daimyo, he acquired enough capital to branch out into the real estate business as well. Too affluent now to have to work with his own hands, he played the role of local boss. Among Edo's numerous self-appointed bosses, Yajibe was one of the best known and most highly respected. The townspeople looked up to the bosses as well as to the warriors, but of the two, the bosses were the more highly admired, because they usually stood up for the common people. Although those of Edo had a style and spirit of their own, the bosses were not unique to the new capital. Their history went back to the troubled latter days of the Ashkaga shogunate, when gangs of thugs roamed the countryside like prides of lions, pillaging at will and submitting to no restraints. According to a writer of that era, they wore little more than vermilion loincloths and wide stomach wrappers. Their long swords were very long, nearly four feet, and even their short swords were more than two feet in length. Many used other weapons of a cruder type, such as battle axes and iron rakes. They let their hair grow wild, using thick strips of rope for headbands, and leather leggings often covered their calves. Having no fixed loyalties, they operated as mercenaries, and after peace was restored, were ostracized by both farmers and samurai alike. By the Edo era, those not content with being bandits or highwaymen often sought their fortunes in the new capital. More than a few succeeded, and this breed of leaders was once described as having righteousness for bones, love of the people for flesh, and gallantry for skin. In short, they were popular heroes par excellence. Slaughter by the Riverside Life under Yajibe's half-tiled roof agreed so much with Osugi that a year and a half later she was still there. After the first few weeks, during which she rested and recovered her health, hardly a day passed without her telling herself she should be on her way. Whenever she broached the subject to Yajibe, whom she didn't see often, he urged her to stay on. What's the hurry? he would ask. There's no reason for you to go anywhere. Bide your time until we find Musashi. Then we can serve as your seconds. Yajibe knew nothing of Osugi's enemy except what she herself had told him, that he was, in so many words, the blackest of black guards. But since the day of her arrival, all of his men had been under instructions to report immediately anything they heard or saw of Musashi. After initially detesting Edo, Osugi had mellowed an attitude to the point where she was willing to admit that the people were friendly, carefree, and really very kind at heart. The Hangawara household was a particularly easy-going place and something of a haven for social misfits, country boys too lazy to farm, displaced ronin, profligates who had run through their parents' money and tattooed ex-convicts made up a coarse and motley crew whose unifying esprit de corps curiously resembled that of a well-run school for warriors. The ideal here, however, 
was blustering masculinity rather than spiritual manliness. It was really a dojo for thugs. As in the martial arts dojo, there was a rigid class structure. Under the boss, who was the ultimate temporal and spiritual authority, came a group of seniors, usually referred to as the Elder Brothers. Below them were the ordinary henchmen, the Kobum, whose ranking was determined largely by length of service. There was also a special class of guests. Their status depended on such factors as their ability with weapons. Bolstering the hierarchical organization was a code of etiquette, of uncertain origin but strictly adhered to. At one point, Yajibe, thinking Osugi might be bored, suggested that she take care of the younger men. Since then, her days had been fully occupied with sewing, mending, washing, and straightening up after the kobum, whose slovenliness gave her plenty of work. For all their lack of breeding, the kobun recognized quality when they saw it. They admired both Osugi's Spartan habits and the efficiency with which she went about her chores. She's a real samurai lady, they were wont to say. The house of Hongiden must have very good blood in it. Osugi's unlikely host treated her with consideration and had even built her separate living quarters on the vacant lot behind his house. And whenever he was at home, he went to pay his respects each morning and evening. When asked by one of his underlings why he displayed such deference toward a stranger, Yajibe confessed that he had acted very badly toward his own father and mother while they were still alive. At my age, he said, I feel I have a filial duty to all older people. Spring came, and the wild plum blossoms fell, but the city itself had as yet almost no cherry blossoms. Apart from a few trees in the sparsely settled hills to the west, there were only the saplings that Buddhists had planted along the road leading to the Sensoji in Asakusa. Rumor had it that this year they were sprouting buds and would blossom for the first time. One day Yajibe came to Osugi's room and said, I'm going to the Sensoji. Do you feel like coming along? I'd love to. That temple's dedicated to Kanzeong, and I'm a great believer in her powers. She's the same bodhisattva as the Kanon I prayed to at Kiyomizudera in Kyoto. With Yajibe and Osugi went two of the Kobun, Judo and Koroku. Judo bore the nickname Reed Mat, for reasons no one knew, but it was obvious why Koroku was called the Acolyte. He was a small, compact man with a distinctly benign face, if one overlooked the three ugly scars on his forehead, evidence of a proclivity for street brawls. They first made their way to the moat at Kyobashi, where boats were available for hire. After Koroku had skillfully sculled them out of the moat and into the Sumida River, Yajibe ordered the box lunches opened. I'm going to the temple today, he explained, because it's the anniversary of my mother's death. I really should go back home and visit her grave, but it's too far, so I compromise by going to the Sensoji and making a donation. But that's neither here nor there. Just think of it as a picnic. He reached over the side of the boat, rinsed off a sake cup, and offered it to Osugi. It's very fine of you to remember your mother, she said as she accepted the cup, all the while wondering fretfully if Matahachi would do the same when she was gone. I wonder, though, is drinking sake on the anniversary of your poor mother's passing the thing to do? Well, I'd rather do that than hold some pompous ceremony. Anyway, I believe in the Buddha. That's all that counts for ignorant louts like me. You know the saying, don't you? He who has faith need have no knowledge. Osugi, letting it go at that, proceeded to have several refills. After a time, she remarked, I haven't drunk like this for ages. I feel like I'm floating on air. Drink up, urged Yajibe. It's good sake, isn't it? Don't worry about being out on the water. 
We're here to take care of you. The river, flowing south from the town of Sumida, was broad and placid. On the Shimosa side, the east bank opposite Edo, stood a luxuriant forest. Tree roots jutting into the water formed nests holding limpid pools, which shone like sapphires in the sunlight. Oh, said Osugi, listen to the nightingales. When the rainy season comes, you can hear cuckoos all day long. Let me pour for you. I hope you don't mind my joining in your celebration. I like to see you having a good time. From the stern, Koroku called out lustily, Say, boss, how about passing the sake around? Just pay attention to your work. If you start now, we'll all drown. On the way back, you can have all you want. If you say so. But I just want you to know the whole river's beginning to look like sake. Stop thinking about it. Here, pull over to that boat next to the bank so we can buy some fresh fish. Koroku did as he was told. After a bit of haggling, the fisherman, flashing a happy smile, lifted the cover off a tank built into the deck and told them to take anything they wanted. Osugi had never seen anything like it. The tank was full to the brim with wriggling, flapping fish, some from the sea, some from the river. Carp, prawns, catfish, black porgies, gobies, even trout and sea bass. Yajibe sprinkled soy sauce on some white bait and began eating it raw. He offered some to Osugi, but she declined with a look of dread on her face. When they drew up on the west side of the river and disembarked, Osugi seemed a little wobbly on her feet. Be careful, warned Yajibe. Here, take my hand. No, thank you. I don't need any help. She waved her own hand before her face indignantly. After Judo and Koroku had moored the boat, the four of them crossed a broad expanse of stones and puddles to get to the riverbank proper. A group of small children were busily turning over stones, but seeing the unusual foursome, they stopped and flocked around, chattering excitedly. Buy some, sir, please. Won't you buy some, Granny? Yajibe seemed to like children. At least, he showed no signs of annoyance. What have you got there? Crabs? Not crabs, arrowheads, they cried, producing handfuls of them from their kimonos. Arrowheads? That's right. A lot of men and horses are buried in a mound by the temple. People coming here buy arrowheads to offer to the dead. You should, too. I don't think I want any arrowheads, but I'll give you some money. How'll that do? That, it appeared, would do admirably. And as soon as Yajibe had passed out a few coins, the children ran off to resume their digging. But even as he watched, a man emerged from a thatched roof house nearby, took the coins away from them, and went back inside. Yajibe clicked his tongue and turned away in disgust. Osugi was gazing out over the river, fascination in her eyes. If there are a lot of arrowheads lying around, she observed, there must have been a big battle. I don't really know, but it seems there were quite a few battles here in the days when Edo was only a provincial estate. That was four or five hundred years ago. I've heard that Minamoto no Yoritomo came up here from Izu to organize troops in the 12th century, when the imperial court was divided... When was that? 14th century? Lord Niita of Musashi was defeated by the Ashkagas somewhere in the neighborhood. Just in the last couple of centuries, Ota Dokan and other local generals are said to have fought many battles not far up the river. While they were talking, Judo and Koroku went on ahead to make a place for them to sit on the veranda of the temple. The Sensoji turned out to be a terrible disappointment to Osugi. In her eyes, it was nothing more than a large, run-down house, the priest's residence a mere shack. Is this it? She wanted to know, with more than a hint of deprecation. After all I've heard about the Sensoji. The setting was a splendidly primeval forest of large, ancient trees. But not only did the Kanzeon Hall look shabby, when the river flooded, 
the water came through the woods right up to the veranda. Even at other times, small tributaries washed over the grounds. Welcome! Good to see you again! Glancing up in surprise, Osugi saw a priest kneeling on the roof. Working on the roof? asked Yajibe amiably. Have to, because of the birds. The oftener I mend it, the oftener they steal the thatch to make nests with. There's always a leak somewhere. Make yourselves comfortable. I'll be down shortly. Yajibe and Osugi picked up votive candles and went into the dim interior. No wonder it leaks, she thought, looking at the star-like holes above her. Kneeling beside Yajibe, she took out her prayer beads and, with a dreamy look in her eye, chanted the vow of Kanzeon from the Lotus Sutra. You will reside in the air like the sun, and if you are pursued by evil men and pushed off the diamond mountain, reflect on the power of Kanzeon, and you will not lose a hair from your head. And if bandits surround you and threaten you with swords, if you reflect on the power of Kanzeon, the bandits will take pity on you. And if the king sentences you to death, and the sword is about to behead you, reflect on the power of Kanzeon. The sword will break into pieces. She recited softly at first, but as she became oblivious to the presence of Yajibe, Judo, and Koroku, her voice rose and grew resonant. A rapt expression came to her face. The eighty-four thousand sentient beings began to aspire in their hearts for Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, the unsurpassed wisdom of the Buddhas. Prayer beads trembling in her fingers, Osugi went without a break from the recitation into a personal supplication of her own. Hail to Kanzeon, world-honored one! Hail to the Bodhisattva of infinite mercy and infinite compassion. Look favorably on this old woman's one wish. Let me strike Musashi down, and very soon, let me strike him down, let me strike him down. Abruptly lowering her voice, she bowed to the floor. And make Matahachi a good boy. Cause the house of Honiden to prosper. After the long prayer ended, there was a moment's silence before the priest invited them outside to have some tea. Yajibe and the two younger men, who had knelt in proper fashion throughout the invocation, got up rubbing their tingly legs and went out on the veranda. I can have some sake now, can't I? Judo asked eagerly. Permission having been granted, he hastened to the priest's house and arranged their lunch on the porch. By the time the others joined him, he was sipping sake with one hand and broiling the fish they had bought with the other. Who cares if there aren't any cherry blossoms, he remarked. Feels just like a flower viewing picnic anyway. Yajibe handed the priest an offering, delicately wrapped in paper, and told him to use it for the roof repairs. As he did so, he happened to notice a row of wooden plaques on which were written donors' names, together with the amounts they had contributed. Nearly all were about the same as Yajibe's, some less, but one stood out conspicuously. Ten gold coins, Daizo of Narai, province of Shinano. Turning to the priest, Yajibe remarked somewhat diffidently, Perhaps it's crass of me to say so, but ten gold coins is a considerable sum. Is this Daizo of Narai as rich as all that? I really couldn't say. He appeared out of the blue one day toward the end of last year and said it was a disgrace that the most famous temple in the Kanto district was in such bad shape. He told me the money should be added to our fund for buying lumber. Sounds like an admirable sort of man. He also donated three gold coins to Yushima Shrine and no fewer than twenty to Kanda Myojin Shrine. He wanted the latter to be kept in good condition because it enshrines the spirit of Tairano Masakado. Daizo insists that Masakado was not a rebel. He thinks he should be revered as the pioneer who opened up the eastern part of the country. 
you'll find there are some very unusual donors in this world. Hardly had he finished speaking when a crowd of children came running helter-skelter toward them. What are you doing here? shouted the priest sternly. If you want to play, go down by the river. You mustn't run wild in the temple grounds. But the children swept on like a school of minnows until they reached the veranda. Come quick, cried one. It's awful. There's a samurai down there. He's fighting. One man against four. Real swords. Praise to Buddha, not again, lamented the priest as he hurriedly slipped on his sandals. Before running off, he took a moment to explain, Forgive me, I'll have to leave you for a while. The riverbank is a favorite place for fights. Every time I turn around, somebody's down there cutting people to pieces or beating them to a pulp. Then men from the magistrate's office come to me for a written report. I'll have to go see what it is this time. A fight? chorused Yajibe and his men, and off they raced. Osugi followed, but was so much slower on her feet that by the time she got there, the fight was over. The children and some onlookers from a nearby fishing village all stood around in silence, swallowing hard and looking pale. At first, Osugi thought the silence strange, but then she too caught her breath and her eyes opened wide. Across the ground flitted the shadow of a swallow. Walking toward them was a young, smug-faced samurai clad in a purplish-red warrior's cloak. Whether or not he noticed the spectators, he paid them no heed. Osugi's gaze shifted to four bodies lying in a tangle some twenty paces behind the samurai. The victor paused. As he did so, a low gasp went up from several lips, for one of the vanquished had moved. Struggling to his feet, he cried, Wait! You can't run away! The samurai assumed a waiting stance while the wounded man ran forward, gasping, This fight's not over yet! When he leapt weakly to the attack, the samurai retreated a step, allowing the man to stumble forward. Then he struck. The man's head split in two. Now is it over? he shouted viciously. No one had even seen the drying pole drawn. Having wiped off his blade, he stooped to wash his hands in the river. Though the villagers were accustomed to fights, they were astonished at the samurai's sangfroid. The last man's death had been not only instantaneous, but inhumanly cruel. Not a word was uttered. The samurai stood up and stretched. It's just like the Iwakuni River, he said. Reminds me of home. For a few moments, he gazed idly at the wide stream and a flock of white-bellied swallows swooping and skimming the water. Then he turned and walked rapidly downstream. He made straight for Yajibe's boat, but as he began untying it, Judo and Koroku came running out of the forest. Wait! What do you think you're doing? shouted Judo, who was now close enough to see the blood on the samurai's hakama and sandal thongs, but took no notice of it. Dropping the rope, the samurai grinned and asked, Can't I use the boat? Of course not, snapped Judo. Suppose I paid to use it. Don't talk nonsense! The voice brusquely refusing the samurai's request was Judo's, but in a sense, it was the whole brash new city of Edo speaking fearlessly through his mouth. The samurai did not apologize, but neither did he resort to force. He turned and walked off without another word. Kojiro! Kojiro! Wait! Osugi called at the top of her lungs. When Kojiro saw who it was, the grimness vanished from his face, and he broke into a friendly smile. Why? What are you doing here? I've been wondering what happened to you. I'm here to pay my respects to Kanzeon. I came with Hangawara Yajibe and these two young men. Yajibe is letting me stay at his house in Bakurocho. When was it I saw you last? Let's see, Mount Hie. You said then you were going to Edo, so I thought I might run into you. I hardly expected it to be here. 
He glanced at Judo and Koroku, who were in a state of shock. You mean those two there? Oh, they're just a couple of ruffians, but their boss is a very fine man. Yajibe was just as thunderstruck as everybody else to see his guest chatting amiably with the awesome samurai. He was on the spot in no time, bowing to Kojiro and saying, I'm afraid my boys spoke very rudely to you, sir. I hope you'll forgive them. We're just ready to leave. Perhaps you'd like to ride downstream with us? Shavings Like most people thrown together by circumstance, who ordinarily have little or nothing in common, the samurai and his host soon found mutual ground. The supply of sake was plentiful, the fish fresh, and Osugi and Kojiro had an odd spiritual kinship that kept the atmosphere from getting stickily formal. It was with genuine concern that she inquired about his career as a shugyosha, and he about her progress in achieving her great ambition. When she told him she'd had no word of Musashi's whereabouts for a long time, Kojiro offered a ray of hope. I heard a rumor that he visited two or three prominent warriors last fall and winter. I have a hunch he's still in Edo. Yajibe wasn't so sure, of course, and told Kojiro that his men had learned absolutely nothing. After they had discussed Osugi's predicament from every angle, Yajibe said, I hope we can count on your continued friendship. Kojiro responded in the same vein and made rather a display of rinsing out his cup and offering it not only to Yajibe, but to his two minions, for each of whom he poured a drink. Osugi was positively exhilarated. They say, she observed gravely, that good is to be found whenever one looks. Even so, I'm exceptionally lucky. To think that I have two strong men like you on my side. I'm sure the great Kanzeon is looking after me. She made no attempt to conceal her sniffling or the tears that came to her eyes. Not wanting the conversation to get maudlin, Yajibe said, Tell me, Kojiro, who were the four men you cut down back there? This seemed to be the opportunity Kojiro had been waiting for, for his agile tongue set to work without delay. Oh, them, he began with a nonchalant laugh. Just some ronin from Obata's school. I went there five or six times to discuss military matters with Obata, and those fellows kept butting in with impertinent remarks. They even had the nerve to spout off on the subject of swordsmanship, so I told them that if they'd come to the banks of the Sumida, I'd give them a lesson in the secrets of the Gandyu style, along with a demonstration of the dying pole's cutting edge. I let them know I didn't care how many of them came. When I got there, there were five of them, but the minute I took a stance, one turned tail and ran. I must say... Edo has no shortage of men who talk better than they fight. He laughed again, this time boisterously. Obata? You don't know him? Obata Kagenori. He comes from the lineage of Obata Nichijo, who served the Takeda family of Kai. Ieyasu took him on, and now he's a lecturer in military science to the shogun Hidetada. He also has his own school. Oh yes, I remember now. Yajibe was surprised and impressed by Kojiro's apparent familiarity with such a celebrated person. The young man still has his forelock, he marveled to himself, but he must be somebody if he associates with samurai of that rank. The carpenter boss was, after all, a simple soul, and the quality he most admired in his fellow man was clearly brute strength. His admiration for Kojiro intensified. Leaning toward the samurai, he said, Let me make you a proposition. I've always got forty or fifty young louts lying around my house. How would it be if I built a dojo for you and asked you to train them? Well, I wouldn't mind giving them lessons, but you must understand that so many daimyo are tugging at my sleeve with offers, two, three thousand bushels, that I don't know what to do. Frankly, I wouldn't seriously consider going into anyone's service for less than five thousand. 
Also, I'm rather obligated, just for the sake of courtesy, to stay where I'm living now. Still, I've no objection to coming to your place. With a low bow, Yajibe said, I'd greatly appreciate that. Osugi chimed in. We'll be expecting you. Judo and Koroku, far too naive to recognize the condescension and self-serving propaganda lacing Kojiro's speech, were bowled over by the great man's largesse. When the boat rounded the turn into the Kyobashi moat, Kojiro said, I'll be getting off here. He then leapt onto the bank and in a matter of seconds was lost in the dust hovering over the street. Very impressive, young man, said Yajibe, still under the spell. Yes, Osugi agreed with conviction. He's a real warrior. I'm sure plenty of daimyo would pay him a handsome stipend. After a moment's pause, she added wistfully, If only Matahachi were like that. About five days later, Kojiro breezed into Yajibe's establishment and was ushered into the guest room. There, the forty or fifty henchmen on hand paid their respects, one by one. Kojiro, delighted, remarked to Yajibe that he seemed to lead a very interesting life. Pursuing his earlier idea, Yajibe said, As I told you, I'd like to build a dojo. Would you care to take a look at the property? The field in back of the house measured nearly two acres. Freshly dyed cloth hung in one corner, but Yajibe assured Kojiro the dyer he had rented the plot to could easily be evicted. You don't really need a dojo, observed Kojiro. The area is not open to the street. No one's likely to intrude. Whatever you say, but what about rainy days? I won't come if the weather's bad. I should warn you, though. The practice sessions will be rougher than the ones held by the Yagyu or other schools around town. If your men aren't careful, they might wind up crippled or worse. You'd better make that clear to them. There'll be no misunderstanding about that. Feel free to conduct classes as you see fit. They agreed on having lessons three times a month, on the 3rd, the 13th, and the 23rd, weather permitting. Kojiro's appearances in Bakurocho were a source of endless gossip. One neighbor was heard to say, Now they've got a show-off over there worse than all the others put together. His boyish forelock also came in for considerable comment, the general opinion being that since he must be in his early twenties, it was high time he conformed to the samurai practice of shaving his pate but only those inside the Hangawara house were treated to the sight of Kojiro's brightly embroidered underrobe, which they got to see every time he bared his shoulder to give his arm free play. Kojiro's demeanor was quite what might be expected. Though this was practice and many of his students were inexperienced, he gave no quarter. By the third session, the casualties already included one man permanently deformed, plus four or five suffering from lesser injuries. The wounded were not far off. Their moans could be heard coming from the back of the house. Next! shouted Kojiro, brandishing a long sword made of loquat wood. At the beginning, he had told them that a blow struck with a loquat sword will rot your flesh to the bone. Ready to quit? If you're not, come forward. If you are, I'm going home, he taunted contemptuously. Out of pure chagrin, one man said, All right, I'll give it a try. He disengaged himself from the group, walked toward Kojiro, then leaned over to pick up a wooden sword. With a sharp crack, Kojiro flattened him. That, he declared, is a lesson in why not to leave yourself open. It's the worst thing you can do. With obvious self-satisfaction, he looked around at the faces of the others, thirty to forty in number, most of them all but visibly trembling. The latest victim was carried to the well, where water was poured over him. He did not come to. Poor guy's done for. You mean he's dead? He's not breathing. Others ran up to stare at their slain comrade. Some were angry, some resigned, but Kojiro didn't give the corpse a second glance. 
If something like this frightens you, he said menacingly, you'd better forget about the sword. When I think that any one of you would be itching to fight if somebody on the street called you a thug or a braggart, he didn't finish the sentence. But as he walked across the field in his leather socks, he continued his lecture. Give the matter some thought, my fine hoodlums. You're ready to draw the minute a stranger steps on your toes or brushes against your scabbard. But you're tied up in knots when the time comes for a real bout. You'll throw your lives away cheerfully over a woman or your own petty pride. But you haven't got the guts to sacrifice yourself in a worthy cause. You're emotional. You're moved only by vanity. That's not enough. Nowhere near enough. Throwing his chest out, he concluded, The truth is simple. The only real bravery, the only genuine self-confidence, comes from training and self-discipline. I dare any one of you, stand up and fight me like a man. One student, hoping to make him eat his words, attacked from behind. Kojiro bent double, almost touching the ground, and the assailant flew over his head and landed in front of him. The next instant, there was the loud crack of Kojiro's loquat sword against the man's hip bone. That'll be all for today, he said, tossing the sword aside and going to the well to wash his hands. The corpse was lying in a flaccid heap beside the sink. Kojiro dipped his hands in the water and splashed some on his face without a word of sympathy. Slipping his arm back into his sleeve, he said, I hear a lot of people go to this place called Yoshiwara. You men must know the district pretty well. Wouldn't you like to show me around? Bluntly announcing that he wanted to have a good time or go drinking was a habit of Kojiro's, but it was a matter of conjecture whether he was being deliberately impudent or disarmingly candid. Yajibe chose the more charitable interpretation. Haven't you been to Yoshiwara yet? he asked with surprise. We'll have to do something about that. I'd go with you myself, but, well, I have to be here this evening for the wake and so on. He singled out Judo and Koroku and gave them some money. Also a warning. Remember, you two, I'm not sending you out to play around. You're only going along to take care of your teacher and see that he has a good time. Kojiro, a few steps in front of the other two, soon found he had trouble staying on the road, for at night, most of Edo was pitch black, to an extent unimaginable in cities like Kyoto, Nara, and Osaka. This road's terrible, he said. We should have brought a lantern. People would laugh if you went around the licensed quarter carrying a lantern, said Judo. Watch out, sir. That pile of dirt you're on came out of the new moat. You'd better come down before you fall in. Presently, the water in the moat took on a reddish cast, as did the sky beyond the Sumida River. A late spring moon hung like a flat white cake above the roofs of Yoshiwara. That's it over there, cross the bridge, said Judo. Shall I lend you a hand towel? What for? To hide your face a little, like this. Judo and Koroku both drew red cloths from their obi and tied them kerchief fashion over their heads. Kojiro followed suit using a piece of russet silk crepe. That's the way, said Judo. Stylish like. Looks very good on you. Kojiro and his guides fell in with the bandanaed throng sauntering from house to house. Like Yanagimachi in Kyoto, Yoshiwara was brightly lit. The entrances to the houses were gaily decorated with curtains of red or pale yellow. Some had bells at the bottom to let the girls know when customers entered. After they had been in and out of two or three houses, Judo said, leeringly, to Kojiro, There's no use trying to hide it, sir. Hide what? You said you'd never been here before, but a girl in the last house recognized you. The minute we went in, she gave a little cry and hid behind a screen. Your secret's out, sir. I've never been here before. Who are you talking about? Don't play innocent, sir. Let's go back. I'll show you. They re-entered the house, whose curtain bore a crest shaped like a bitter buckbean leaf split in three. Sumiya 
was written in rather small characters to the left. The house's heavy beams and stately corridors were reminiscent of Kyoto temple architecture, but the garish newness nullified the attempt to create an aura of tradition and dignity. Kojiro strongly suspected that swamp plants still thrived beneath the floor. The large parlor they were shown to upstairs had not been straightened up after the last customers. Both table and floor were strewn with bits of food, tissue paper, toothpicks, and whatnot. The maid who came to clean up performed her chore with all the finesse of a day laborer. When Onao arrived to take their orders, she made a point of letting them know how busy she was. She claimed that she hardly had time to sleep, and another three years of this hectic pace would put her in her grave. The better houses of Kyoto contrived to maintain the fiction that their raison d'etre was to entertain and please their customers. Here, the aim was obviously to relieve men of their money as quickly as possible. So this is Edo's pleasure quarter, sniffed Kojiro, with a critical glance at the knot holes in the ceiling. Pretty shoddy, I'd say. Oh, this is only temporary, Onao protested. The building we're putting up now will be finer than anything you'd see in Kyoto or Fushimi. She stared at Kojiro a moment. You know, sir, I've seen you somewhere before. Ah, yes, it was last year on the Koshu High Road. Kojiro had forgotten the chance meeting, but reminded of it, he said with a spark of interest, Why, yes, I guess our fates must be entwined. I should say they are, Judo said laughing, if there's a girl here who remembers you. While teasing Kojiro about his past, he described the girl's face and clothing and asked Onao to go find her. I know the one you mean, said Onao and went to fetch her. When some time had passed and she still hadn't come back, Judo and Koroku went out in the hall and clapped their hands to summon her. They had to clap several more times before she finally reappeared. She's not here, the one you asked for, said Onao. She was here only a few minutes ago. It's strange, just as I was saying to the master. We were at Kobotoke Pass, and that samurai you're with came walking along the road, and she went off by herself that time, too. Behind the sumiya stood the frame of the new building, roof partly finished, no walls. Hanagiri! Hanagiri! This was the name they had given Akemi, who was hiding between a stack of lumber and a small mountain of shavings. Several times the searchers had passed so close she had had to hold her breath. How disgusting, she thought. For the first few minutes, her wrath had been directed at Kojiro alone. By now, it had expanded to embrace every member of the masculine sex. Kojiro, Seijuro, the samurai at Hachioji, the customers who manhandled her nightly at the Sumiya. All men were her enemies, all abominable. Except one the right one, the one who would be like Musashi, the one she had sought incessantly. Having given up on the real Musashi, she had now persuaded herself that it would be comforting to pretend to be in love with someone similar to him. Much to her chagrin, she found no one remotely like him. Hanagiri! It was Shoji Jinnai himself, first shouting from the back of the house, now drawing closer to her hiding place. He was accompanied by Kojiro and the other two men. They had complained at tiresome length, making Jinnai repeat his apologies over and over, but finally they went off toward the street. Akemi, seeing them go, breathed a sigh of relief and waited until Jinnai went back inside, then ran straight to the kitchen door. Why, Hanagiri, were you out there all the time? The kitchen maid asked hysterically. Shh, be quiet and give me some sake. Sake? Now? Yes, sake! Since coming to Edo, the times when Akemi had sought solace in sake had become more and more frequent. 
the frightened maid poured her a large cupful. Shutting her eyes, Akemi drained the vessel dry, her powdered face tilted back until it was almost parallel with the white bottom of the cup. As she turned away from the door, the maid cried in alarm, Where are you off to now? Shut up. I'll just wash my feet, then go back inside. Taking her at her word, the maid shut the door and returned to her work. Akemi slipped her feet into the first pair of zori she saw and walked somewhat unsteadily to the street. How good to be out in the open, was her first reaction, but this was followed very closely by revulsion. She spat in the general direction of the pleasure-seekers strolling along the brightly lit road and took to her heels. Coming to a place where stars were reflected in a moat, she stopped to look. She heard running feet behind her. Uh-oh! Lanterns this time! And they're from the Sumia! Animals! Can't they even let a girl have a few minutes' peace? No! Find her! Put her back to making money! Turning flesh and blood into a little lumber for their new house! That's the only thing that'll satisfy them! Well, they won't get me back! The curled wood shavings hanging loosely in her hair bobbed up and down as she ran as fast as her legs would carry her into the darkness. She had no idea where she was going and couldn't have cared less, so long as it was away, far away. The Owl When they finally forsook the tea house. Kojiro was barely able to stand. Shoulder! Shoulder! He gurgled, grabbing onto both Judo and Koroku for support. The three lumbered uncertainly down the dark, deserted street. Judo said, Sir, I told you we should spend the night. In that dive? Not on your life! I'd rather go back to the Sumia. I wouldn't, sir. Why not? That girl... She ran away from you. If they find her, she could be forced to go to bed with you. But for what? You wouldn't enjoy it then. Hmm, maybe you're right. Do you want her? Nah. But you can't quite get her out of your mind, can you? I've never fallen in love in my life. I'm not the type. I've got more important things to do. What, sir? Obvious, my boy. I'm going to be the best, most famous swordsman ever, and the quickest way to do that is to be the shogun's teacher. But he already has the house of Yagyu to teach him, and I hear he recently hired Ono Jiroemon. Ono Jiroemon? Who gives a fart about him? The Yagyus don't impress me much either. You watch me. One of these days... They had reached the stretch of road along which the new moat was being dug, and soft dirt was piled halfway up the willow trees. Watch out, sir! It's very slippery, said Judo, as he and Koroku tried to help their teacher down from the pile of dirt. Hold it! Kojiro shouted, abruptly shoving the two men away. He slid rapidly down the dirt pile. Who's there? The man who had just lunged at Kojiro's back lost his balance and tumbled head first into the moat. Have you forgotten, Sasaki? You killed four of our comrades! Kojiro jumped to the top of the dirt pile, from where he could see that there were at least ten men among the trees, partly hidden by rushes. Swords pointed at him, they slowly began closing in. So you're from the Obata school, are you? he said in a contemptuous tone. The sudden action had sobered him completely. Last time you lost four men out of five. How many of you came tonight? How many want to die? Just give me the number, and I'll oblige. Cowards, attack if you dare! His hand went deftly over his shoulder to the hilt of the drying pole. Obata Nichijo before taking the tonsure, had been one of the most celebrated warriors in Kai, a province famous for its heroic samurai. After the defeat of the house of Takeda by Tokugawa Ieyasu, the Obata family had lived in obscurity until Kagenori distinguished himself at the Battle of Sekigahara. 
He had subsequently been summoned into service by Iesu himself, and had gained fame as a teacher of military science. He had, however, refused the shogunate's offer of a choice plot of land in central Edo with the plea that a country warrior like himself would feel out of place there. He preferred a wooded lot adjoining Hirakawa Tenjin Shrine, where he had established his school in an ancient thatched farmhouse to which had been added a new lecture hall and a rather imposing entrance. Now advanced in years and suffering from a neural disorder, Kagenori had been confined to his sick room in recent months, appearing only rarely in the lecture hall. The woods were full of owls, and he had taken to signing his name as Old Man Owl. Sometimes he'd smile weakly and say, I'm an owl like the others. Not infrequently, the pain from the waist up was agonizing. Tonight had been one of those times. Feel a little better? Would you like some water? The speaker was Hojo Shinzo, son of Hojo Ujikatsu, the celebrated military strategist. I'm much more comfortable now, said Kagenori. Why don't you go to bed? It'll soon be light. The invalid's hair was white. His frame was skinny and angular as an aged plum tree. Don't worry about me. I get plenty of sleep during the day. You can't have much time left for sleeping when you spend your days taking over my lectures. You're the only one who can do that. Sleeping too much isn't good discipline. Noticing that the lamp was about to go out, Shinzo stopped rubbing the old man's back and went to fetch some oil. When he returned, Kagenori, still lying on his stomach, had raised his bony face from the pillow. The light was reflected eerily in his eyes. What is it, sir? Don't you hear it? It sounds like splashing water. It seems to be coming from the well. Who would it be at this hour? Do you suppose some of the men have been out drinking again? That's probably it, but I'll take a look anyhow. Give them a good scolding while you're at it. Yes, sir. You'd better go to sleep. You must be tired. When Kagenori's pain had subsided and he had dropped off to sleep, Shinzo carefully tucked the covers up around his shoulders and went to the back door. Two students were leaning over the well bucket, washing blood off their faces and hands. He ran toward them with a scowl on his face. You went, didn't you? he said curtly. After I pleaded with you not to? The exasperation in his voice faded when he saw a third man lying in the shadow of the well. From the way he was groaning, it sounded as if he might die from his wounds at any moment. Like little boys begging for help from an older brother, both men, their faces oddly twisted, sobbed uncontrollably. Fools! Shinzo had to restrain himself from giving them a thrashing. How many times did I warn you you were no match for him? Why didn't you listen? After he dragged our master's name through the mud? After he killed four of our men? You keep saying we're not being reasonable. Aren't you the one who's lost his reason? Controlling your temper, holding yourself back, bearing insults in silence. Is that what you call reasonable? That's not the way of the samurai. Isn't it? If confronting Sasaki Kojiro was the thing to do, I'd have challenged him myself. He went out of his way to insult our teacher and commit other outrages against us. But that's no excuse for losing our sense of proportion. I'm not afraid to die. But Kojiro is not worth risking my life or anybody else's over. That's not the way most people see it. They think we're afraid of him, afraid to stand up for our honor. Kojiro's been maligning Kagenori all over Edo. If he wants to run off at the mouth, let him. Do you think anybody who knows Kagenori is going to believe he lost an argument to that conceited novice? Do as you please, Shinzo. The rest of us are not going to sit by and do nothing. Just exactly what do you have in mind? Only one thing. Kill him. You think you can? I told you not to go to the Sensoji. You wouldn't listen. 
Four men died. You've just returned after being defeated by him again. Isn't that piling shame on dishonor? It's not Kojiro who's destroying Kagenori's reputation. It's you. I have one question. Did you kill him? There was no answer. Of course not. I'll bet anything he doesn't have a scratch on him. The trouble with you is you don't have enough sense to avoid meeting him on his own terms. You don't understand his strength. True, he's young. He's of low character. He's coarse. He's arrogant. But he's an outstanding swordsman. How he learned his skill, I don't know. But there's no denying he has it. You underestimate him. That's your first mistake. One man pressed in on Shinzo as though ready to attack him physically. You're saying that whatever the bastard does, there's nothing we can do about it. Shinzo nodded defiantly. Exactly. There's nothing we can do. We're not swordsmen. We're students of military science. If you think my attitude is cowardly, then I'll just have to put up with being called a coward. The wounded man at their feet moaned. Water... Water, please. His two comrades knelt and propped him into a sitting position. Seeing they were about to give him some water, Shinzo cried in alarm, Stop! If he drinks water, it'll kill him! As they hesitated, the man put his mouth to the bucket. One swallow and his head collapsed into it, bringing the night's death toll to five. While the owls hooted at the morning moon, Shinzo silently returned to the sick room. Kagenori was still asleep, breathing deeply. Reassured, Shinzo went to his own cubicle. Works on military science lay open on his desk, books he had begun reading but had had no time to finish. Though well-born, as a child he had done his share of splitting firewood, carrying water, and studying long hours by candlelight. His father, a great samurai, did not believe that young men of his class should be pampered. Shinzo had entered the Obata school with the ultimate aim of strengthening military skills in his family's fief, and though one of the younger students, he ranked highest in his teacher's estimation. These days, caring for his ailing master kept him awake most of the night. He sat now with his arms folded and heaved a deep sigh. Who would look after Kagenori if he were not there? All the other students living at the school were of an uncouth type, typically attracted to military matters. The men who came to the school only for classes were even worse. They blustered about, voicing opinions on the masculine subjects that samurai habitually discussed. None of them really understood the spirit of the lonely man of reason who was their teacher. The finer points of military science went over their heads. Far more comprehensible was any kind of slur, either real or fancied, against their pride or their ability as samurai. Insulted, they became mindless instruments of vengeance. Shinzo had been away on a trip when Kojiro arrived at the school. Since Kojiro had claimed that he wanted to ask some questions about military textbooks, his interest seemed genuine, and he had been introduced to the master. But then, without asking a single question, he began arguing with Kagenori presumptuously and arrogantly, which suggested that his real purpose was to humiliate the old man. When some students finally got him into another room and demanded an explanation, he reacted with a flood of invective and an offer to fight any one of them at any time. Kojiro had then spread allegations that Obata's military studies were superficial, that they were no more than a rehash of the Ksunoki style or the ancient Chinese military text known as the Six Secrets, and that they were spurious and unreliable. When his malicious pronouncements got back to the ears of the students, they vowed to make him pay with his life. Shinzo's opposition, the problem, was trivial. Their master ought not to be disturbed by matters of this sort. Kojiro was not a serious student of military science, had proved futile, though he had also pointed out that before any decisive step was taken, Kagenori's son, Yogoro, who was away on a long journey, 
should be consulted. Can't they see how much useless trouble they're causing? lamented Shinzo. The fading light of the lamp dimly illuminated his troubled face. Still racking his brain for a solution, he laid his arms across the open books and dozed off. He awoke to the murmur of indistinct voices. Going first to the lecture hall and finding it empty, he slipped on a pair of zodi and went outside. In a bamboo grove that was part of the sacred compound of the Hirakawa Tenjin Shrine, he saw what he had expected, a large group of students holding an emotion-charged council of war. The two wounded men, their faces ashen, their arms suspended in white slings, stood side by side, describing the night's disaster. One man asked indignantly, Are you saying ten of you went and half were killed by this one man? I'm afraid so. We couldn't even get close to him. Murata and Ayabe were supposed to be our best swordsmen. They were the first to go. Yosobe managed by sheer guts to get back here, but he made the mistake of drinking some water before we could stop him. A grim silence descended over the group. As students of military science, they were concerned with problems of logistics, strategy, communications, intelligence, and so on, not with the techniques of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Most of them believed, as they had been taught, that swordsmanship was a matter for ordinary soldiers, not generals. Yet their samurai pride stood in the way of their accepting the logical corollary which was that they were helpless against an expert swordsman like Sasaki Kojiro. What can we do? asked a mournful voice. For a time, the only answer was the hooting of the owls. Then one student said brightly, I have a cousin in the house of Yagyu. Maybe through him we could get them to help us. Don't be stupid, shouted several others. We can't ask for outside help. It'll only bring more shame on our teacher. It'll be an admission of weakness. Well, what can we do? The only way is to confront Kojiro again. But if we do it on a dark road again, it'll only do more damage to the school's reputation. If we die in open battle, we die. At least we won't be thought of as cowards. Should we send him a formal challenge? Yes, and we have to keep at it, no matter how many times we lose. I think you're right, but Shinzo isn't going to like this. He doesn't have to know about it, nor does our master. Remember that, all of you. We can borrow brush and ink from the priest. They started quietly for the priest's house. Before they had gone ten paces, the man in the lead gasped and stepped back. The others instantly came to a dead halt, their eyes riveted on the back veranda of the time-worn shrine building. There... Against a backdrop formed by the shadow of a plum tree laden with green fruit stood Kojiro, one foot propped on the railing and a malevolent grin on his face. To a man, the students turned pale. Some had trouble breathing. Kojiro's voice was venomous. I gather from your discussion that you still haven't learned that you've decided to write a letter of challenge and have it delivered to me. Well, I've saved you the trouble. I'm here, ready to fight. Last night, before I'd even washed the blood off my hands, I came to the conclusion there'd be a sequel, so I followed you sniveling cowards home. He paused to let this sink in, then continued in an ironic tone. I was wondering how you decide on the time and place to challenge an enemy. Do you consult a horoscope to pick the most propitious day? Or do you consider it wiser not to draw your swords until there comes a dark night when your opponent is drunk and on his way home from the licensed quarter? He paused again as though waiting for an answer. Have you nothing to say? Isn't there a single red-blooded man among you? If you're so eager to fight me, come on! One at a time, or all at once! It's all the same to me! I wouldn't run from the likes of you if you were in full armor and marching to the beat of drums! No sound came from the cowed men. What's the matter with you? The pauses grew longer. 
Have you decided not to challenge me? Isn't there even one among you with some backbone? All right, it's time now to open your stupid ears and listen. I am Sasaki Kojiro. I learned the art of the sword indirectly from the great Toda Seigen after his death. I know the secrets of unsheathing invented by Katayama Hisayasu, and I have myself created the Gandyu style. I'm not like those who deal in theory, who read books and listen to lectures on Sun Tzu or the Six Secrets. In spirit, in will, you and I have nothing in common. I don't know the details of your daily study, but I'm showing you now what the science of fighting is all about in real life. I'm not bragging. Think. When a man is set upon in the dark as I was last night, if he has the good fortune to win, what does he do? If he's an ordinary man, he goes as quickly as he can to a safe place. Once there, he thinks back over the incident and congratulates himself on having survived. Isn't that right? Isn't that what you would do? But did I do that? No! Not only did I cut down half of your men, I followed the stragglers home and waited here, right under your noses. I listened while you tried to make up your weak minds, and I took you completely by surprise. If I wanted to, I could attack now and smash you to bits. That's what it means to be a military man. That's the secret of military science. Some of you have said Sasaki Kojiro is just a swordsman, that he had no business coming to a military school and shooting off his mouth. How far do I have to go to convince you how wrong you are? Perhaps today I'll also prove to you that I'm not only the greatest swordsman in the country, but also a master of tactics. Aha! This is turning into quite a little lecture, isn't it? I'm afraid if I continue to pour out my fund of knowledge, poor Obata Kagenori may find himself out of a stipend. That wouldn't do, would it? Oh, I'm thirsty. Koroku, judo, get me some water. Right away, sir, they replied in unison from beside the shrine, where they had been watching in rapt admiration. Having brought him a large earthen cup of water, Judo asked eagerly, What are you going to do, sir? Ask them, Kojiro sneered. Your answer's in those weaselly empty faces. Did you ever see men look so stupid? Koroku laughed. What a gutless bunch, said Judo. Come on, sir, let's go. They're not going to stand up to you. While the three of them swaggered through the shrine gate, Shinzo concealed among the trees, muttered through clenched teeth. I'll get you for this. The students were despondent. Kojiro had outwitted and defeated them. Then he gloated, leaving them frightened and humiliated. The silence was broken by a student running up and asking in a bewildered tone, Did we order coffins? When no one replied, he said, the coffin maker's just arrived with five coffins. He's waiting. Finally, one of the group answered dispiritedly, The bodies have been sent for. They haven't arrived yet. I'm not sure, but I think we'll need one more coffin. Ask him to make it and put the ones he brought in the storehouse. That night, a wake was held in the lecture hall. Though everything was done quietly, in the hope that Kagenori would not hear, he was able to guess more or less what had occurred. He refrained from asking questions, nor did Shinzo make any comment. From that day, the stigma of defeat hung over the school. Only Shinzo, who had urged restraint and been accused of cowardice, kept alive the desire for revenge. His eyes harbored a glint that none of the others could fathom. In early fall, Kagenori's illness worsened. Visible from his bedside was an owl perched on a limb of a large zelkova tree, staring, never moving, hooting at the moon in the daytime. Shinzo now heard in the owl's hoot the message that his master's end was near. Then a letter arrived from Yogoro, saying he had heard about Kojiro and was on his way home. 
For the next few days, Shinzo wondered which would come first, the arrival of the son or the death of the father. In either case, the day for which he was waiting, the day of his release from his obligations, was at hand. On the evening before Yogoro was expected, Shinzo left a farewell letter on his desk and took his leave of the Obata school. From the woods near the shrine, he faced Kagenori's sick room and said softly, Forgive me for leaving without your permission. Rest at ease, good master. Yogoro will be home tomorrow. I don't know if I can present Kojiro's head to you before you die, but I must try. If I should die trying, I shall await you in the land of the dead. A Plate of Loaches Musashi had been roaming the countryside, devoting himself to ascetic practices, punishing his body to perfect his soul. He was more resolved than ever to go it alone, if that meant being hungry, sleeping out in the open in cold and rain, and walking about in filthy rags, then so be it. In his heart was a dream that would never be satisfied by taking a position in Lord Date's employ, even if his lordship were to offer him his entire three million bushel fief. After the long trip up the Nakasendo, he had spent only a few nights in Edo before taking to the road again, this time north to Sendai. The money given him by Ishimodageki had been a burden on his conscience. From the moment he'd discovered it, he'd known he'd find no peace until it was returned. Now, a year and a half later, he found himself on Hotengahara, a plain in Shimosa province, east of Edo. Little changed since the rebellious Tairano Masakado and his troops had rampaged through the area in the 10th century. The plain was a dismal place still, sparsely settled and growing nothing of value, only weeds, a few trees, and some scrubby bamboo and rushes. The sun, low on the horizon, reddened the pools of stagnant water, but left the grass and brush colorless and indistinct. What now? Musashi mumbled, resting his weary legs at a crossroads. His body felt listless and still waterlogged from the cloudburst he'd been caught in a few days earlier at Tochigi Pass. The raw evening damp made him eager to find human habitation. For the past two nights he'd slept under the stars, but now he longed for the warmth of a hearth and some real food, even simple peasant fare such as millet boiled with rice. A touch of saltiness in the breeze suggested that the sea was near. If he headed toward it, he reasoned, he just might find a house, perhaps even a fishing village or small port. If not, then he'd have to resign himself to yet another night in the autumn grasses, under the great autumn moon. He realized with no small hint of irony that were he a more poetic type, he might savor these moments in a poignantly lonely landscape. As it was, he wanted only to escape it, to be with people, to have some decent food and get some rest. Yet the incessant buzzing of the insects seemed to be reciting a litany to his solitary wandering. Musashi stopped on a dirt-covered bridge. A definite splashing noise seemed to rise above the peaceful rippling of the narrow river. An otter? In the fading daylight, he strained his eyes until he could just make out a figure kneeling in the hollow by the water's edge. He chuckled to note that the face of the young boy peering up at him was distinctly otter-like. "'What are you up to down there?' Musashi called in a friendly voice. "'Loaches,' was the laconic reply. The boy was shaking a wicker basket in the water to clean the mud and sand off his wriggling catch. "'Catch many?' Musashi inquired, loath to sever this newly found bond with another human. Aren't many around. It's already fall. How about letting me have some? My loaches? Yes, just a handful. I'll pay you for them. Sorry, these are for my father. Hugging the basket, he leapt nimbly up the bank and was off like a shot into the darkness. 
Speedy little devil, I must say. Musashi, alone once again, laughed. He was reminded of his own childhood and of Jotaro. I wonder what's become of him, he mused. Jotaro had been fourteen when Musashi had last seen him. Soon he would be sixteen. Poor boy. He accepted me as his teacher, loved me as his teacher, served me as his teacher, and what did I do for him? Nothing. Absorbed in his memories, he forgot his fatigue. He stopped and stood still. The moon had risen bright and full. It was on nights like this that Otsu liked to play the flute. In the insects' voices he heard the sound of laughter, Otsu's and Jotaro's together. Turning his head to one side, he spotted a light. He turned the rest of his body in the same direction and made straight for it. Lespediza grew all around the isolated shack, almost as high as the lopsided roof. The walls were covered with calabash vines the blossoms looking from a distance like enormous dewdrops. As he drew near, he was startled by the great angry snort of an unsaddled horse tied up beside the hovel. Who's there? Musashi recognized the voice coming from the shacks as that of the boy with the loaches. Smiling, he called. How about putting me up for the night? I'll leave first thing in the morning. The boy came to the door and looked Musashi over carefully. After a moment, he said, All right, come in. The house was as rickety as any Musashi had ever seen. Moonlight poured through cracks in the walls and roof. After removing his cloak, he couldn't find even a peg to hang it on. Wind from below made the floor drafty, despite the reed mat covering it. The boy knelt before his guest in formal fashion and said, Back there at the river, you said you wanted some loaches, didn't you? Do you like loaches? In these surroundings, the boy's formality so surprised Musashi that he merely stared. What are you looking at? How old are you? Twelve. Musashi was impressed by his face. It was as dirty as a lotus root just pulled out of the ground, and his hair looked and smelled like a bird's nest yet there was character in his expression. His cheeks were chubby, and his eyes, shining like beads through the encircling grime, were magnificent. I have a little millet and rice, said the boy hospitably, and now that I've given some to my father, you can have the rest of the loaches if you want them. Thanks. I suppose you'd like some tea, too. Yes, if it's not too much trouble. Wait here. He pushed open a screechy door and went into the next room. Musashi heard him breaking firewood, then fanning the flame in an earthen hibachi. Before long, the smoke filling the shack drove a host of insects outdoors. The boy came back with a tray, which he placed on the floor in front of Musashi. Falling to immediately, Musashi devoured the salty broiled loaches the millet and rice, and the Swedish black bean paste in record time. That was good, he said gratefully. Was it really? The boy seemed to take pleasure in another person's happiness. A well-behaved lad, thought Musashi. I'd like to express my thanks to the head of the house. Has he gone to bed? No, he's right in front of you. The boy pointed at his own nose. Are you here all alone? Yes. Oh, I see. There was an awkward pause. And what do you do for a living? Musashi asked. I rent out the horse and go along as a groom. We used to farm a little, too. Oh, we've run out of lamp oil. You must be ready for bed anyway, aren't you? Musashi agreed that he was, and lay down on a worn straw pallet spread next to the wall. The hum of the insects was soothing. He fell asleep, but perhaps because of his physical exhaustion, he broke into a sweat. Then he dreamed he heard rain falling. The sound in his dream made him sit up with a start. No mistake about it. What he heard now was a knife or sword being honed. 
As he reached reflexively for his sword, the boy called in to him, Can't you sleep? How had he known that? Amazed, Musashi said, What are you doing sharpening a blade at this hour? The question was uttered so tensely that it sounded more like the counterblow of a sword than an inquiry. The boy broke into laughter. Did I scare you? You look too strong and brave to be frightened so easily. Musashi was silent. He wondered if he had come upon an all-seeing demon in the guise of a peasant boy. When the scraping of the blade on the whetstone began again, Musashi went to the door. Through a crack, he could see that the other room was a kitchen with a small sleeping space at one end. The boy was kneeling in the moonlight next to the window with a large jug of water at his side. The sword he was sharpening was of a type farmers used. What do you intend to do with that? asked Musashi. The boy glanced toward the door but continued with his work. After a few more minutes, he wiped the blade, which was about a foot and a half long, and held it up to inspect it. It glistened brightly in the moonlight. Look! he said. Do you think I can cut a man in half with this? Depends on whether you know how. Oh, I'm sure I do. Do you have someone particular in mind? My father. Your father? Musashi pushed open the door. I hope that's not your idea of a joke. I'm not joking. You can't mean you intend to kill your father— even the rats and wasps in this forsaken wilderness have better sense than to kill their parents. But if I don't cut him in two, I can't carry him. Carry him where? I have to take him to the burial ground. You mean he's dead? Yes. Musashi looked again at the far wall. It had not occurred to him that the bulky shape he had seen there might be a body. Now he saw that it was indeed the corpse of an old man, laid out straight with a pillow under its head and a kimono draped over it. By its side was a bowl of rice, a cup of water, and a helping of broiled loaches on a wooden plate. Recalling how he had unwittingly asked the boy to share the loaches intended as an offering to the dead man's spirit, Musashi felt a twinge of embarrassment. At the same time, he admired the boy for having the coolness to conceive of cutting the body into pieces so as to be able to carry it. His eyes riveted on the boy's face. For a few moments, he said nothing. When did he die? This morning. How far away is the graveyard? It's up in the hills. Couldn't you have got somebody to take him there for you? I don't have any money. Let me give you some. The boy shook his head. No, my father didn't like to accept gifts. He didn't like to go to the temple either. I can manage, thank you. From the boy's spirit and courage, his stoic yet practical manner, Musashi suspected that his father had not been born an ordinary peasant. There had to be something to explain the son's remarkable self-sufficiency. In deference to the dead man's wishes, Musashi kept his money and instead offered to contribute the strength needed to transport the body in one piece. The boy agreed, and together they loaded the corpse on the horse. When the road got steep, they took it off the horse and Musashi carried it on his back. The graveyard turned out to be a small clearing under a chestnut tree, where a solitary round stone served as a marker. After the burial, the boy placed some flowers on the grave and said, My grandfather, grandmother, and mother are buried here too. He folded his hands in prayer. Musashi joined him in silent supplication for the family's repose. The gravestone doesn't seem to be very old, he remarked. When did your family settle here? During my grandfather's time. Where were they before that? My grandfather was a samurai in the Mogami clan, but after his lord's defeat, he burned our genealogy and everything else. There was nothing left. I don't see his name carved on the stone. There's not even a family crest or a date. When he died, he ordered that nothing appear on the stone. He was very strict. One time, some men came from the Gamo fief, 
another time from the Date fief, and offered him a position, but he refused. He said a samurai shouldn't serve more than one master. That was the way he was about the stone, too. Since he'd become a farmer, he said putting his name on it would reflect shame on his dead lord. Do you know your grandfather's name? Yes. It was Misawa Iori. My father, since he was only a farmer, dropped the surname and just called himself Sangemon. And your name? San no Suke. Do you have any relatives? An older sister, but she went away a long time ago. I don't know where she is. No one else? No. How do you plan to make your living now? Same as before, I guess. But then he added hurriedly, Look, you're a shugyosha, aren't you? You must travel around just about everywhere. Take me with you. You can ride my horse and I'll be your groom. As Musashi turned the boy's request over in his mind, he gazed out upon the land below them. Since it was fertile enough to support a plethora of weeds, he could not understand why it was not cultivated. It was certainly not because the people hereabouts were well off. He had seen evidence of poverty everywhere. Civilization, Musashi was thinking, does not flourish until men have learned to exercise control over the forces of nature. He wondered why the people here in the center of the Kanto Plain were so powerless, why they allowed themselves to be oppressed by nature. As the sun rose, Musashi caught glimpse of small animals and birds reveling in the riches that man had not yet learned to harvest, or so it seemed. He was soon reminded that Sanosuke, despite his courage and independence, was still a child. By the time the sunlight made the dewy foliage glisten and they were ready to start back, the boy was no longer sad, seemed, in fact, to have put all thoughts of his father completely out of mind. Halfway down the hill, he began badgering Musashi for an answer to his proposal. I'm ready to start today, he declared. Just think, anywhere you go, you'll be able to ride the horse, and I'll be there to wait on you. This elicited a non-committal grunt. While Sanosuke had much to recommend him, Musashi questioned whether he should again put himself in the position of being responsible for a boy's future. Jotaro, he, had natural ability, but how had he benefited by attaching himself to Musashi? And now that he had disappeared to heaven knew where, Musashi felt his responsibility even more keenly. Still, Musashi thought, if a man dwells only on the dangers ahead, he cannot advance a single step, let alone make his way through life successfully. Furthermore, in the case of a child, no one, not even his parents, can actually guarantee his future. Is it really possible to decide objectively what's good for a child and what's not? He asked himself. If it's a matter of developing Sanlusuke's talents and guiding him in the right direction, I can do that. I guess that's about as much as anyone can do. Promise, won't you? Please, the boy insisted. Sanlusuke, do you want to be a groom all your life? Of course not. I want to be a samurai. That's what I thought. But if you come with me and become my pupil, you'll be in for a lot of rough times, you know. The boy threw down the rope and, before Musashi knew what he was up to, knelt on the ground below the horse's head. Bowing deeply, he said, I beg you, sir, make a samurai of me. That's what my father wanted, but there was no one we could ask for help. Musashi dismounted, looked around for a moment, then picked up a stick and handed it to Sanosuke. He found another one for himself and said, I want you to strike me with that stick. After I've seen how you handle it, I can decide whether you have the talent to be a samurai. If I hit you, will you say yes? Try it and see, Musashi laughed. Sanosuke took a firm grip on his weapon and rushed forward as if possessed. Musashi showed no mercy. Time and again the boy was struck, on the shoulders, in the face, on the arms. After each setback, he staggered away but always came back to the attack. Pretty soon he'll be in tears thought Musashi. But Sanosuke would not give up. When his stick broke in two, he charged empty-handed. 
What do you think you're doing, you runt? Musashi snapped with deliberate meanness. He seized the boy by his obi and threw him flat on the ground. You big bastard! shouted Sanosuke, already on his feet and attacking again. Musashi caught him by the waist and held him up in the air. Had enough? No! he shouted defiantly, though the sun was in his eyes and he was reduced to uselessly waving his arms and legs. I'm going to throw you against that rock over there. It'll kill you. Ready to give up? No! Stubborn, aren't you? Can't you see you're beaten? Not as long as I'm alive, I'm not. You'll see. I'll win in the end. How do you expect to do that? I'll practice. I'll discipline myself. But while you're practicing for ten years, I'll be doing the same thing. Yes, but you're a lot older than I am. You'll die first. Hmm. And when they put you in a coffin, I'll strike the final blow and win. Fool! shouted Musashi, tossing the boy to the ground. When Sanlosuke stood up, Musashi looked at his face for a moment, laughed, and clapped his hands together once. Good! You can be my pupil. Like teacher, like pupil. On the short journey back to the shack, Sanlosuke rattled on and on about his dreams for the future. But that night, when Musashi told him he should be ready to bid farewell to the only home he had ever known, he became wistful. They sat up late, and Sanlosuke, misty-eyed and speaking in a soft voice, shared his memories of parents and grandparents. In the morning, while they were preparing to move out, Musashi announced that henceforth he would call Sanlosuke Yori. If you're going to become a samurai he explained. It's only proper that you take your grandfather's name. The boy was not yet old enough for his coming-of-age ceremony, when he would normally have been given his adult name. Musashi thought taking his grandfather's name would give him something to live up to. Later, when the boy seemed to be lingering inside the house, Musashi said quietly but firmly, Yori, hurry up. There's nothing in there you need. You don't want reminders of the past. Iori came flying out in a kimono barely covering his thighs, a groom's straw sandals on his feet, and a cloth wrapper containing a box lunch of millet and rice in his hand. He looked like a little frog, but he was ready and eager for a new life. Pick a tree away from the house and tie the horse up, Musashi commanded. You may as well mount it now. Do as I say. Yes, sir. Musashi noted the politeness. It was a small but encouraging sign of the boy's readiness to adopt the ways of the samurai in place of the slovenly speech of peasants. Iori tied up the horse and came back to where Musashi was standing under the eaves of the old shack, gazing at the surrounding plain. What's he waiting for? wondered the boy. Putting his hand on Iori's head, Musashi said, This is where you were born and where you acquired your determination to win. Iori nodded. Rather than serve a second lord, your grandfather withdrew from the warrior class. Your father, true to your grandfather's dying wish, contented himself with being a mere farmer. His death left you alone in the world, so the time has come for you to stand on your own feet. Yes, sir. You must become a great man. I'll try. Tears sprang to his eyes. For three generations, this house sheltered your family from wind and rain. Say your thanks to it, then say goodbye, once and for all, and have no regrets. Musashi went inside and set fire to the hovel. When he came out, Iori was blinking back his tears. If we left the house standing, said Musashi, it'll only become a hideout for highwaymen or common thieves. I'm burning it to keep men like that from desecrating the memory of your father and grandfather. I'm grateful. The shack turned into a small mountain of fire, then collapsed. Let's go, said Iori, no longer concerned with relics of the past. Not yet. There's nothing else to do here, is there? Musashi laughed. We're going to build a new house on that knoll over there. New house? What for? You just burned the old one down. 
That belonged to your father and grandfather. The one we build will be for us. You mean we're going to stay here? That's right. We're not going away somewhere and train and discipline ourselves? We'll do that here. What can we train ourselves for here? To be swordsmen, to be samurai. We'll discipline our spirits and work hard to make ourselves into real human beings. Come with me and bring that axe with you. He pointed to a clump of grass where he had put the farm tools. Shouldering the axe, Iori followed Musashi to the knoll, where there were a few chestnut trees, pines, and cryptomerias. Musashi, stripping to the waist, took the axe and went to work. Soon he was sending up a veritable shower of white chips of raw wood. Iori watched, thinking, maybe he's going to build a dojo, or are we going to practice out in the open? One tree fell, then another and another. Sweat poured down Musashi's ruddy cheeks, washing away the lethargy and loneliness of the past few days. He had conceived of his present plan while standing by the farmer's fresh grave in the tiny burial ground. I'll lay down my sword for a time, he had decided, and work with a hoe instead. Zen, calligraphy, the art of tea, painting pictures and carving statues, were all useful in perfecting one's swordsmanship. Couldn't tilling a field also contribute to his training? Wasn't this broad tract of earth waiting for someone to bring it under cultivation a perfect training hall? By changing inhospitable flatlands into farmlands, he would also be promoting the welfare of future generations. He'd lived his whole life like a mendicant Zen priest, on the receiving end, so to speak, depending on other people for food, shelter, and donations. He wanted to make a change, a radical one, since he'd long suspected that only those who had actually grown their own grain and vegetables really understood how sacred and valuable they were. Those who hadn't were like priests who did not practice what they preached, or swordsmen who learned combat techniques but knew nothing of the way. As a boy, he had been taken by his mother into the fields and had worked alongside the tenants and villagers. His purpose now, however, was more than just to produce food for his daily meals. He sought nourishment for his soul. He wanted to learn what it meant to work for a living rather than beg for one. He also wanted to implant his own way of thinking among the people of the district. As he saw it, by surrendering the land to weeds and thistles and giving in to storms and floods, they were passing on their hand-to-mouth existence from generation to generation without ever opening their eyes to their own potentialities and those of the land around them. Iori, he called, get some rope and tie up this timber, then drag it down to the river bank. When that was done, Musashi propped his axe against the tree and wiped the sweat off his forehead with his elbow. He then went down and stripped the bark off the trees with a hatchet. When darkness fell, they built a bonfire with the scraps and found blocks of wood to use as pillows. Interesting work, isn't it? said Musashi. With perfect honesty, Iori answered, I don't think it's interesting at all. I didn't have to become your pupil to learn how to do this. You'll like it better as time goes on. As autumn waned, the insect voices faded into silence. Leaves withered and fell. Musashi and Iori finished their cabin and addressed themselves to the task of making the land ready for planting. One day, while he was surveying the land, Musashi suddenly found himself thinking it was like a diagram of the social unrest that lasted for a century after the Onin War. Such thoughts aside... It was not an encouraging picture. Unknown to Musashi, Hotengahara had over the centuries been buried many times by volcanic ash from Mount Fuji, and the Tone River had repeatedly flooded the flatlands. When the weather was fair, the land became bone dry, but whenever there were heavy rains, the water carved out new channels, carrying great quantities of dirt and rock along with it. 
There was no principal stream into which the smaller ones flowed naturally, the nearest thing to this being a wide basin that lacked sufficient capacity to either water or drain the area as a whole. The most urgent need was obvious, to bring the water under control. Still, the more he had looked, the more he had questioned why the area was undeveloped. It won't be easy, he thought, excited by the challenge it posed. Joining water and earth to create productive fields was not much different from leading men and women in such a way that civilization might bloom. To Musashi, it seemed that his goal was in complete agreement with his ideals of swordsmanship. He had come to see the way of the sword in a new light. A year or two earlier, he had wanted only to conquer all rivals— but now the idea that the sword existed for the purpose of giving him power over other people was unsatisfying. To cut people down, to triumph over them, to display the limits of one's strength, seemed increasingly vain. He wanted to conquer himself, to make life itself submit to him, to cause people to live rather than die. The way of the sword should not be used merely for his own perfection, it should be a source of strength for governing people and leading them to peace and happiness. He realized his grand ideals were no more than dreams, and would remain so as long as he lacked the political authority to implement them. But here in this wasteland, he needed neither rank nor power. He plunged into the struggle with joy and enthusiasm. Day in and day out, stumps were uprooted, Gravel sifted, land leveled, soil and rocks made into dikes. Musashi and Iori worked from before dawn until after the stars were shining bright in the sky. Their relentless toil attracted attention. Villagers passing by often stopped, stared, and commented, What do they think they're doing? How can they live in a place like that? Isn't the boy old Sangemon's son? Everyone laughed but not all let it go at that. One man came out of genuine kindness and said, I hate to tell you this, but you're wasting your time. You can break your backs making a field here, but one storm and it'll be gone overnight. When he saw that they were still at it several days later, he seemed a bit offended. All you're doing here, I tell you, is making a lot of water holes where they won't do any good. A few days later, he concluded that the strange samurai was short on brains. Fools! he shouted in disgust. The next day brought a whole group to heckle. If anything could grow here, we wouldn't sweat under the blazing sun working our own fields, poor as they are. We'd sit home and play the flute. And there wouldn't be any famines. You're digging up the place for nothing. Got the sense of a pile of manure. Still hoeing, Musashi kept his eyes on the ground and grinned. Iori was less complacent, though Musashi had earlier scolded him for taking the peasants seriously. Sir, he pouted, they all say the same thing. Pay no attention. I can't help it, he cried, seizing a rock to throw at their tormentors. An angry glare from Musashi stopped him. Now what good do you think that would do? If you don't behave yourself, I'm not going to have you as my pupil. Iori's ears burned at the rebuke, but instead of dropping the rock, he cursed and hurled it at a boulder. The rock gave off sparks as it cracked in two. Iori tossed his hoe aside and began to weep. Musashi ignored him, though he wasn't unmoved. He's all alone, just as I am, he thought. As though in sympathy with the boy's grief, a twilight breeze swept over the plain, setting everything astir. The sky darkened and raindrops fell. Come on, Yori, let's go in, called Musashi. Looks like we're in for a squall. Hurriedly, collecting his tools, he ran for the house. By the time he was inside, the rain was coming down in gray sheets. Yori, he shouted, surprised that the boy had not come with him. He went to the window and strained his eyes toward the field. Rain spattered from the sill into his face. 
A streak of lightning split the air and struck the earth. As he shut his eyes and put his hands over his ears, he felt the force of the thunder. In the wind and rain, Musashi saw the cryptomeria tree at the Shippoji and heard the stern voice of Takuan. He felt that whatever he had gained since then, he owed to them. He wanted to possess the tree's immense strength, as well as Takuan's icy, unwavering compassion. If he could be to Iori what the old cryptomeria had been to him, he would feel he'd succeeded in repaying a part of his debt to the monk. Iori! Iori! There was no answer, only thunder and the rain pounding on the roof. Where could he have gone? he wondered, still unwilling to venture outside. When the rain slackened to a drizzle, he did go out. Iori had not moved an inch. With his clothing clinging to his body and his face still screwed up in an angry frown, he looked rather like a scarecrow. How could a child be so stubborn? Idiot! Musashi chided. Get back into the house! Being drenched like that's not exactly good for you. Hurry up before rivers start forming. Then you won't be able to get back. Iori turned, as though trying to locate Musashi's voice, then started laughing. Something bothering you? This kind of rain doesn't last. See? The clouds are breaking up already. Musashi, not expecting to receive a lesson from his pupil, was more than a little put out. But Iori didn't give the matter a second thought. Come on, the boy said, picking up his hoe. We can still get quite a bit done before the sun's gone. For the next five days, bulbuls and shrikes conversed hoarsely under a cloudless blue sky, and great cracks grew in the earth as it caked around the roots of the rushes. On the sixth day, a cluster of small black clouds appeared on the horizon and rapidly spread across the heavens until the whole plain seemed to be under an eclipse. Iori studied the sky briefly and said in a worried tone, This time it's the real thing. Even as he spoke, an inky wind swirled around them. Leaves shook, and little birds dropped to the earth as if felled by a silent and invisible horde of hunters. Another shower? Musashi asked. Not with a sky like that. I'd better go to the village, and you'd better gather up the tools and get inside as fast as you can. Before Musashi could ask why, Iori took off across the flatlands and was quickly lost in a sea of high grass. Again, Iori's weather sense was accurate. The sudden downpour, driven by a raging, gusty wind that sent Musashi scurrying for shelter, developed its own distinctive rhythms. The rain fell in unbelievable quantity for a time, stopped suddenly, then recommenced with even greater fury. Night came, but the storm continued unabated. It began to seem as though the heavens were set on making the entire earth into an ocean. Several times Musashi feared that the wind would rip off the roof. The floor was already littered with shingles torn off its underside. Morning came, gray and formless and with no sign of Iori. Musashi stood by the window and his heart sank. He could do nothing. Here and there, a tree or a clump of grass was visible. All else was a vast, muddy swamp. Luckily, the cabin was still above water level, but in what had been a dry riverbed immediately below it, there was now a rushing torrent, carrying along everything in its path. Not knowing for sure that Iori hadn't fallen into the water and drowned, Musashi felt time drag on until finally he thought he heard Iori's voice calling, Sensei! Here! He was some distance beyond the river, riding a bullock, with a great bundle tied behind him. Musashi watched in consternation as Iori strode straight into the muddy flow, which seemed about to suck him under at every step. When he gained the other bank, he was quaking from the cold and wet, but he calmly guided the bullock to the side of the cabin. Where have you been? demanded Musashi, his voice both angry and relieved. To the village, of course. I brought back lots of food. 
It'll rain half a year's worth before this storm's over, and when it is, we'll be trapped by the floodwaters. After they had taken the straw bundle inside, Iori untied it and removed the items one by one from the inner wrapping of oiled paper. Here are some chestnuts, lentil beans, salted fish. We shouldn't run out of food, even if it takes a month or two for the water to go down. Musashi's eyes misted over with gratitude, but he said nothing. He was too abashed at his own lack of common sense. How could he guide humanity if he was careless about his own survival? Were it not for Iori, he would now be facing starvation, and the boy, having been raised in a remote rural area, must have known about laying in supplies since he was two years old. It struck Musashi as odd that the villagers had agreed to furnish all this food. They couldn't have had very much for themselves. When he recovered his voice and raised the question, Iori replied, I left my money pouch in Hawk and borrowed from the Tokuganji. And what's the Tokuganji? It's the temple about two miles from here. My father told me there was some powdered gold in the pouch. He said if I got into difficulty, I should use it a little at a time. Yesterday, when the weather turned bad, I remembered what he said. Iori wore a smile of triumph. Isn't the pouch a keepsake from your father? Yes. Now that we've burned the old house down, that and the sword are the only things left. He rubbed the hilt of the short weapon in his obi. Though the tang bore no craftsman's signature, Musashi had noted when he'd examined the blade earlier that it was of excellent quality. He also had the feeling that the inherited pouch had some significance beyond that of the powdered gold it contained. You shouldn't hand keepsakes over to other people. One of these days, I'll get it back for you. But after that, you must promise not to let go of it. Yes, sir. Where did you spend the night? The priest told me I'd better wait there till morning. Have you eaten? No. You haven't either, have you? No, but there's no firewood, is there? Oh, there's plenty. He pointed downward, indicating the space under the cabin, where he'd stored a good supply of sticks and roots and bamboo picked up while he worked in the fields. Holding a piece of straw matting over his head, Musashi crawled under the cabin and again marveled at the boy's good sense. In an environment like this, survival depended on foresight, and a small mistake could spell the difference between life and death. When they had finished eating, Iori brought out a book. Then, kneeling formally before his teacher, he said, While we're waiting for the water to go down so we can work, would you teach me some reading and writing? Musashi agreed. On such a dismal, stormy day, it was a good way to pass the time. The book was a volume of the Analects of Confucius. Iori said it had been given to him at the temple. Do you really want to study? Yes. Have you done much reading? No, only a little. Who taught you? My father. What have you read? The Lesser Learning. Did you enjoy it? Yes, very much, he said eagerly, his eyes brightening. All right, then. I'll teach you all I know. Later on, you can find somebody better educated to teach you what I don't know. They devoted the rest of the day to a study session, the boy reading aloud, Musashi stopping him to correct him or explain words he did not understand. They sat in utter concentration, oblivious of the storm. The deluge lasted two more days, by which time there was no land visible anywhere. On the following day, it was still raining. Iori, delighted, took out the book again and said, Shall we begin? Not today. You've had enough of reading for a while. Why? If you do nothing but read, you'll lose sight of the reality around you. Why don't you take the day off and play? I'm going to relax, too. But I can't go outside. Then just do like me, said Musashi, sprawling on his back and crossing his arms under his head. Do I have to lie down? Do what you want. Lie down, stand up, sit, whatever's comfortable. Then what? 
I'll tell you a story. I'd like that, said Iori, flopping down on his stomach and wiggling his legs in the air. What kind of story? Let me see, said Musashi, going over the tales he had liked to hear as a child. He chose the one about the battles between the Genji and the Heike. All boys love that. Iori proved to be no exception. When Musashi came to the part about the Genji being defeated and the Heike taking over the country, the boy's face became gloomy. He had to blink to keep from crying over Lady Tokiwa's sad fate. But his spirits rose as he heard about Minamoto no Yoshitsune learning swordsmanship from the long-nosed goblins on Mount Kurama and later making his escape from Kyoto. I like Yoshitsune, he said, sitting up. Are there really goblins on Mount Kurama? Maybe. Anyway, there are people in this world who might as well be goblins. But the ones who taught Yoshitsune weren't real goblins. What were they? Loyal vassals of the defeated Genji. They couldn't come out in the open while the Heike were in power, so they stayed hidden in the mountains until their chance came. Like my grandfather? Yes, except he waited all his life, and his chance never came. After Yoshitsune grew up, the faithful Genji followers who had looked after him during his childhood got the opportunity they had prayed for. I'll have a chance to make up for my grandfather, won't I? Hmm, I think it's possible. Yes, I really think so. He pulled Iori to him, lifted him up, and balanced him on his hands and feet like a ball. Now try being a great man, he laughed. Iori giggled and stammered, You, you're a go goblin too! Stop it! A fa fall! He reached down and pinched Musashi's nose. On the eleventh day, it finally stopped raining. Musashi chafed to be out in the open, but it was another week before they were able to return to work under a bright sun. The fields they had so arduously carved out of the wilderness had disappeared without a trace. In its place were rocks and a river where none had been before. The water seemed to mock them, just as the villagers had. Iori, seeing no way to reclaim their loss, looked up and said, This place is beyond hope. Let's look for better land somewhere else. No, Musashi said firmly. With the water drained off, this would make excellent farmland. I examined the location from every angle before I chose it. What if we have another heavy rain? We'll fix it so the water doesn't come this way. We'll lay a dam from here all the way to that hill over there. That's an awful lot of work. You seem to forget that this is our dojo. I'm not giving up a foot of this land until I see barley growing on it. Musashi carried on his stubborn struggle throughout the winter, into the second month of the new year. It took several weeks of strenuous labor to dig ditches, drain the water off, pile dirt for a dike, and then cover it with heavy rocks. Three weeks later, everything was again washed away. Look, Iori said, we're wasting our energy on something impossible. Is that the way of the sword? The question struck close to the bone, but Musashi would not give in. Only a month passed before the next disaster, a heavy snowfall followed by a quick thaw. Iori, on his return from trips to the temple for food, inevitably wore a long face, for the people there rode him mercilessly about Musashi's failure. And finally, Musashi himself began to lose heart. For two full days and on into a third, he sat silently brooding and staring at his field. Then it dawned on him suddenly. Unconsciously, he had been trying to create a neat, square field like those common in other parts of the Kanto Plain. But this was not what the terrain called for. Here, despite the general flatness, there were slight variations in the lay of the land and the quality of the soil that argued for an irregular shape. What a fool I've been, he exclaimed aloud. I tried to make the water flow where I thought it should and force the dirt to stay where I thought it ought to be. 
but it didn't work. How could it? Water's water, dirt's dirt. I can't change their nature. What I've got to do is learn to be a servant to the water and a protector of the land. In his own way, he had submitted to the attitude of the peasants. On that day, he became a nature's manservant. He ceased trying to impose his will on nature and let nature lead the way, while at the same time seeking out possibilities beyond the grasp of other inhabitants of the plain. The snow came again, and another thaw. The muddy water oozed slowly over the plain, but Musashi had had time to work out his new approach, and his field remained intact. The same rules must apply to governing people, he said to himself. In his notebook, he wrote, Do not attempt to oppose the way of the universe, but first make sure you know the way of the universe. Mountain Devils Let me make myself clear. I don't want you to go to any trouble on my account. Your hospitality, which I appreciate greatly, is quite sufficient. Yes, sir. That's very considerate of you, sir, replied the priest. I'd just like to relax, that's all. By all means. Now, I hope you'll forgive my rudeness, said the samurai stretching out casually on his side and propping his graying head on his forearm. The guest who just arrived at the Tokuganji was Nagaoka Sado, a high-ranking vassal of Lord Hosokawa Tadaoki of Buzen. He had just time for personal matters, but he invariably came on such occasions as the anniversary of his father's death, usually staying overnight, since the temple was some twenty miles from Edo. For a man of his rank, he traveled unostentatiously, accompanied this time by only two samurai and one young personal attendant. To get away from the Hosokawa establishment even for a short time, he had had to trump up an excuse. He rarely had the chance to do as he pleased, and now that he did, he was fully enjoying the local sake while listening to the croaking of frogs. Briefly, he could forget about everything the problems of administration and the constant need to be attuned to the nuances of daily affairs. After dinner, the priest quickly cleared the dishes and left. Sado was chatting idly with his attendants, who were seated next to the wall, only their faces showing in the light of the lamp. I could just lie here forever and enter nirvana like the Buddha, Sado said lazily. Careful you don't catch cold. The night air is damp. Oh, leave me alone. This body survived a few battles. It can hold its own against a sneeze or two. But just smell those ripe blossoms. Nice fragrance, isn't it? I don't smell anything. Don't you? If your sense of smell is that poor, you sure you don't have a cold yourself? They were engrossed in this kind of seemingly light banter when suddenly the frogs fell silent and a loud voice shouted, You devil! What are you doing here, staring into the guest room? Sado's bodyguards were on their feet instantly. What is it? Who's out there? As their cautious eyes scanned the garden, the clatter of small feet receded in the direction of the kitchen. A priest looked in from the veranda, bowed, and said, Sorry for the disturbance. It's only one of the local children. There's nothing to worry about. Are you sure? Yes, of course. He lives a couple of miles from here. His father worked as a groom until he died recently, but his grandfather is said to have been a samurai, and every time he sees one, he stops and stares with his finger in his mouth. Sado sat up. You mustn't be too hard on him. If he wants to be a samurai, bring him in. We'll have some sweets and talk it over. By now, Iori had reached the kitchen. Hey, Granny! he shouted. I've run out of millet. Fill this up for me, will you? The sack he thrust out to the wrinkled old woman who worked in the kitchen would have held half a bushel. She shouted right back, Watch your tongue, you beggar. You talk as if we owe you something. You've got a lot of nerve to begin with, said a priest who was washing dishes. 
The head priest took pity on you, so we're giving you food, but don't be insolent. When you're asking a favor, do it politely. I'm not begging. I gave the priest the pouch my father left me. There's money in it, plenty of money. And how much could a groom living out in the sticks leave his son? Are you going to give me the millet? Yes or no? There you go again. Just look at yourself. You're crazy, taking orders from that fool Ronin. Where did he come from anyway? Who is he? Why should he be eating your food? None of your business. Humph. <laughs> Digging around in that barren plain where there's never ever going to be a field or a garden or anything else. The whole village is laughing at you. Who asked for your advice? Whatever is wrong with that Ronin's head must be catching. What do you expect to find up there? A pot of gold, like in a fairy tale? You're not even dry behind the ears, and you're already digging your own grave. Shut up and give me the millet! The millet! Now! The priest was still teasing Yodi a couple of minutes later when something cold and slimy hit his face. His eyes popped. Then he saw what it was, a warty toad. He screamed and lunged for Yodi, but just as he collared him, another priest arrived to announce that the boy was wanted in the samurai's room. The head priest had also heard the commotion and rushed to the kitchen. Did he do something to upset our guest? He asked worriedly. No, Sado just said he'd like to talk to him. He'd like to give him some sweets, too. The head priest hurriedly took Iori by the hand and delivered him personally to Sado's room. As Iori timidly sat down beside the priest, Sado asked, How old are you? Thirteen. And you want to become a samurai? That's right, replied Iori, nodding vigorously. Well, well, why don't you come and live with me, then? You'd have to help with the housework at the beginning— but later I'd make you one of the apprentice samurai. Iori shook his head silently. Sado, taking this for bashfulness, assured him that the offer was serious. Iori, flashing an angry look, said, I heard you wanted to give me some sweets. Where are they? Paling, the head priest slapped him on the wrist. Don't scold him, Sado said reprovingly. He liked children and tended to indulge them. He's right. A man should keep his word. Have the sweets brought in. When they arrived, Iori began stuffing them into his kimono. Sado, a little taken aback, said, Aren't you going to eat them here? No, my teacher's waiting for me at home. Oh, you have a teacher? Without bothering to explain himself, Iori bolted from the room and disappeared through the garden. Sado thought his behavior highly amusing. Not so the head priest, who bowed to the floor two or three times before going to the kitchen in pursuit of Iori. Where is that insolent brat? He picked up his sack of millet and left. They listened for a moment, but heard only a discordant screeching. Iori had plucked a leaf from a tree and was trying to improvise a tune. None of the few songs he knew seemed to work. The groom's chanty was too slow, the bon festival songs too complicated. Finally, he settled on a melody resembling the sacred dance music at the local shrine. This suited him well enough, for he liked the dances, which his father had sometimes taken him to see. About halfway to Hotengahara, at a point where two streams joined to make a river, he gave a sudden start. The leaf flew from his mouth, along with a spray of saliva, and he leapt into the bamboo beside the road. Standing on a crude bridge were three or four men engaged in a furtive conversation. It's them, Iori exclaimed softly. A remembered threat rang in his frightened ears. When mothers in this region scolded their children, they were apt to say, if you're not good, the mountain devils will come down and get you. The last time they had actually come had been in the fall of the year before last. Twenty miles or so from here, in the mountains of Hitachi, there was a shrine dedicated to a mountain deity. Centuries earlier, 
The people had so feared this god that the villages had taken turns making annual offerings of grain and women to him. When a community's turn came, the inhabitants had assembled their tribute and gone in a torch-lit procession to the shrine. As time went on, and it became evident that the god was really only a man, they became lax in making their offerings. During the period of the civil wars, the so-called mountain god had taken to having his tribute collected by force. Every two or three years, a pack of brigands, armed with halberds, hunting spears, axes, anything to strike terror into the hearts of peaceful citizens, would descend on first one community, then the next, carrying away everything that caught their fancy, including wives and daughters. If their victims put up any resistance, the plundering was accompanied by slaughter. Their last raid still vivid in his memory, Iodi cringed in the underbrush. A group of five shadows came running across the field to the bridge. Then, through the night mist, another small band, and still another, until the bandits numbered between forty and fifty. Iori held his breath and stared while they debated a course of action. They soon reached a decision. Their leader issued a command and pointed toward the village. The men rushed off like a swarm of locusts. Before long, the mist was rent by a great cacophony. Birds, cattle, horses, the wailing of people, young and old. Iori quickly made up his mind to get help from the samurai at the Tokuganji, but the minute he left the shelter of the bamboo, a shout came from the bridge. Who's there? He had not seen the two men left behind to stand guard. Swallowing hard, he ran for all he was worth, but his short legs were no match for those of grown men. Where do you think you're going? shouted the man who got hold of him first. Who are you? Instead of crying like a baby, which might have thrown the men off guard, Iori scratched and fought against the brawny arms imprisoning him. He saw all of us together. He was going to tell somebody. Let's beat him up and dump him in the rice field. I've got a better idea. They carried Iori to the river, threw him down the bank, and jumping down after him, tied him to one of the bridge posts. There, that takes care of him. The two ruffians climbed back up to their station on the bridge. The temple bell tolled in the distance. Iori watched horrified as the flames rising from the village dyed the river a bloody red. The sound of babies crying and women wailing came closer and closer. Then wheels rumbled onto the bridge. Half a dozen of the bandits were leading ox carts and horses loaded with loot. Filthy scum, screamed a masculine voice. Give me back my wife. The scuffle on the bridge was brief but fierce. Men shouted, metal clanged. A shriek went up, and a bloody corpse landed at Iori's feet. A second body splashed into the river, spraying his face with blood and water. One by one, farmers fell from the bridge, six of them in all. The bodies rose to the surface and floated slowly downstream, but one man, not quite dead, grasped at the reeds and clawed the earth until he had pulled himself halfway out of the water. Hugh, cried Iori, untie this rope. I'll go for help. I'll see that you get your revenge. Then his voice rose to a bellow. Come on, untie me. I've got to save the village. The man lay motionless. Straining at his bonds with all his might, Iori finally loosened them enough to squirm down and kick the man in the shoulder. The face that turned toward his was blotched with mud and gore, the eyes dull and uncomprehending. The man crawled painfully closer. With his last ounce of strength, he undid the knots. As the rope fell loose, he collapsed and died. Iori looked cautiously up at the bridge and bit his lip. There were more bodies up there, but luck was with him. A cartwheel had broken through a rotten plank. The thieves, hurrying to pull it out, didn't notice his escape. Realizing he couldn't make it to the temple, Iori tiptoed along in the shadows until he reached a place shallow enough to cross. When he gained the other bank, he was on the edge of Hotengahara. 
he covered the remaining mile to the cabin as though lightning was nipping at his heels. As he neared the knoll where the cabin stood, he saw that Musashi was standing outside, looking at the sky. Come quick, he shouted. What happened? We have to go to the village. Is that where the fire is? Yes, the mountain devils have come again. Devils? Bandits? Yes, at least forty of them. Please hurry, we have to rescue the villagers. Musashi ducked into the cabin and emerged with his swords. While he was tying his sandals, Iori said, Follow me, I'll show you the way. No, you stay here. Iori couldn't believe his ears. It's too dangerous. I'm not scared. You'd be in the way. You don't even know the shortest way there. The fire's all the guide I need. Now just be a good boy and stay right here. Yes, sir. Iori nodded obediently, but with deep misgivings. He turned his head toward the village and watched somberly as Musashi streaked off in the direction of the red glow. The bandits had tied their female captives, moaning and screaming, in a row and were pulling them mercilessly toward the bridge. Stop your squawking, shouted one bandit. You act like you don't know how to walk. Move! When the women held back, the ruffians lashed them with whips. One woman fell, dragging down others. Seizing the rope and forcing them back on their feet, one man snarled, Stubborn bitches! What have you got to groan about? Stay here and you work like slaves the rest of your lives, all for a bit of millet. Look at you, nothing but skin and bones. You'll be a lot better off having fun with us. Picking one of the healthier-looking animals, which were all heavily loaded with booty, they tied the rope to it and gave it a sharp slap on the rump. The slack in the rope was snapped up suddenly, and fresh shrieks rent the air as the women were yanked forward again. Those who fell were dragged along, with their faces scraping the ground. Stop! screamed one. My arms are coming off! A wave of raucous laughter swept through the brigands. At that moment, horse and women came to a dead halt. What's going on? Somebody's up ahead! All eyes strained to see. Who's there? roared one bandit. The silent shadow walking toward them carried a white blade. The bandits, trained to be sensitive to odors, instantly recognized the one they smelled now. Blood dripping from the sword. As the men in front fell back clumsily, Musashi sized up the enemy force. He counted twelve men, all hard-muscled and brutish-looking. Recovering from the initial shock, they readied their weapons and took defensive stances. One ran forward with an axe. Another, carrying a hunter's spear, approached diagonally, keeping his body low and aiming at Musashi's ribs. The man with the axe was the first to go. Ah! Sounding as though he'd bitten his own tongue off, he weaved crazily and collapsed in a heap. Don't you know me? Musashi's voice rang out sharply. I am the protector of the people, a messenger from the god who watches over this village. In the same breath, he seized the spear pointed at him, wrested it from its owner's hands, and threw it violently to the ground. Moving swiftly into the band of ruffians, he was kept busy countering thrusts from all sides, but after the first surge, made while they still fought with confidence, he had a good idea of what lay ahead. It was a matter not of numbers, but of the opposition's cohesiveness and self-control. Seeing one man after another turned into a blood-spurting missile, the bandits were soon falling back to ever greater distances, until finally they panicked and lost all semblance of organization. Musashi was learning even as he fought, acquiring experience that would lead him to specific methods to be used by a smaller force against a larger one. This was a valuable lesson and couldn't be learned in a fight with a single enemy. His two swords were in their scabbards. For years, he'd practiced to master the art of seizing his opponent's weapon and turning it against him. Now he'd put study into practice, taking the sword away from the first man he'd encountered. His reason wasn't that his own sword, which he thought of as his soul, was too pure to be sullied by the blood of common brigands. He was being practical. Against such a motley array of weapons, a blade might get chipped or even broken. 
When the five or six survivors fled toward the village, Musashi took a minute or two to relax and catch his breath, fully expecting them to return with reinforcements. Then he freed the women and ordered those who could stand to take care of the others. After some words of comfort and encouragement, he told them it was up to them to save their parents and children and husbands. You'd be miserable if you survived and they perished, wouldn't you? he asked. There was a murmur of agreement. You yourselves have the strength to protect yourselves and save the others, but you don't know how to use that strength. That's why you're at the mercy of outlaws. We're going to change that. I'm going to help you by showing you how to use the power you have. The first thing to do is arm yourselves. He had them collect the weapons lying about and distributed one to each of the women. Now follow me and do just as I say. You mustn't be afraid. Try to believe that the god of this district is on your side. As he led the women toward the burning village, other victims emerged from the shadows and joined them. Soon the group had grown into a small army of nearly a hundred people. Women tearfully hugged loved ones, daughters were reunited with parents, wives with husbands, mothers with children. At first, as the women described how Musashi had dealt with the bandits, the men listened with shock expressions on their faces, not believing that this could be the idiot Ronin of Hotengahara. When they did accept it, their gratitude was obvious, despite the barrier imposed by their dialect. Turning to the men, Musashi told them to find weapons. Anything will do, even a good heavy stick or a length of fresh bamboo. No one disobeyed or even questioned his orders. Musashi asked, How many bandits are there in all? About fifty. How many houses in the village? Seventy. Musashi calculated that there was probably a total of seven or eight hundred people. Even allowing for old people and children, the brigands would still be outnumbered by as much as ten to one. He smiled grimly at the thought that these peaceful villagers had believed they had no recourse but to throw up their hands in despair. He knew that if something was not done, the atrocity would be repeated. Tonight, he wanted to accomplish two things— show the villagers how to protect themselves, and see that the brigands were banished forever. Sir, cried a man who had just come from the village, they're on their way here. Though the villagers were armed now, the news made them uneasy. They showed signs of breaking and running. To restore confidence, Musashi said loudly, There's nothing to be alarmed about. I was expecting this. I want you to hide on both sides of the road, but first listen to my instructions. He talked rapidly, but calmly, briefly repeating points for emphasis. When they get here, I'll let them attack me. Then I'll pretend to run away. They'll follow me. You, all of you, stay where you are. I won't need any help. After a time, they'll come back. When they do, attack. Make lots of noise. Take them by surprise. Strike at their sides, legs, chests, any area that's unguarded. When you've taken care of the first bunch, hide again and wait for the next one. Keep doing this until they're all dead. He barely had time to finish and the peasants to disperse before the marauders appeared. From their dress and lack of coordination, Musashi guessed that theirs was a primitive fighting force of a sort that might have been common long ago, when men hunted and fished for sustenance. The name Tokugawa meant nothing to them, no more than did Toyotomi. The mountains were their tribal home. The villagers existed to provide them with food and supplies. Stop! ordered the man at the head of the pack. There were about twenty of them, some with crude swords, some with lances one with a battle-axe, another with a rusty spear. Silhouetted against the glow of the fire, their bodies looked like demonic, jet-black shadows. Is he the one? Yeah, that's him, all right. Some sixty feet ahead of them, Musashi stood his ground, blocking the road. Disconcerted, they began to doubt their own strength, and for a short time none of them moved. 
but only for a moment. Then Musashi's blazing eyes started to pull them inexorably toward them. You the son of a bitch trying to get in our way? Right, roared Musashi, raising his sword and tearing into them. There was a loud reverberation, followed by a whirlwind fray in which it was impossible to make out individual movements. It was like a spinning swarm of winged ants. The rice fields on one side of the road and the embankment lined with trees and bushes on the other were ideal for Musashi, since they provided a measure of cover. But after the first skirmish, he executed a strategic withdrawal. See that? The bastard's running away! After him! They pursued him to a far corner of the nearest field, where he turned and faced them. With nothing behind him, his position seemed worse, but he kept his opponents at bay by moving swiftly to right and left. Then the moment one of them made a false move, Musashi struck. His dark form seemed to flit from place to place, a geyser of blood rising before him each time he paused. The bandits who were not killed were soon too dazed to fight, while Musashi grew sharper with every strike. It was a different sort of battle from the one at Ichijoji. He did not have the feeling of standing on the border between life and death, but he had reached a plane of selflessness, body and sword performing without the need of conscious thought. His attackers fled in complete disarray. A whisper went along the line of villagers, they're coming. Then a group of them jumped out of hiding and fell upon the first two or three bandits, killing them almost effortlessly. The farmers melted into the darkness again, and the process was repeated until all the bandits had been ambushed and slain. Counting the corpses bolstered the villagers' confidence. They're not so strong after all, gloated one man. Wait, here comes another one. Get him. No, don't attack. It's the Ronin. With a minimum of confusion, they lined up along the road like soldiers being reviewed by their general. All eyes were fixed on Musashi's bloody clothing and dripping sword, whose blade was chipped in a dozen places. He threw it away and picked up a lance. Our work's not done, he said. Get yourselves some weapons and follow me. By combining your strength, you can drive the marauders out of the village and rescue your families. Not one man hesitated. The women and children also found weapons and followed along. The damage to the village was not as extensive as they had feared, because the dwellings were set well apart. But the terrified farm animals were raising a great ruckus, and somewhere a baby was crying its lungs out. Loud popping noises came from the roadside, where the fire had spread to a grove of green bamboo. The bandits were nowhere in sight. Where are they? asked Musashi. I seem to smell sake. Where would there be a lot of sake in one place? The villagers were so absorbed in gaping at the fires that nobody had noticed the smell, but one of them said, Must be the village headman's house. He's got barrels of sake. Then that's where we'll find them, said Musashi. As they advanced, more men came out of hiding and joined their ranks. Musashi was gratified by the growing spirit of unity. That's it there, said one man, pointing out a large house surrounded by an earthen wall. While the peasants were getting themselves organized, Musashi scaled the wall and invaded the bandit's stronghold. The leader and his chief lieutenants were ensconced in a large dirt-floored room, swilling sake and forcing their attentions on young girls they were holding captive. Don't get excited, the leader shouted angrily in a rough mountain dialect. He's only one man. I shouldn't have to do anything myself. The rest of you take care of him. He was upbraiding an underling who had rushed in with the news of the defeat outside the village. As their chief fell silent, the others became aware of the hum of angry voices beyond the wall and stirred uneasily. Dropping half-eaten chickens and sake cups, they jumped to their feet and instinctively reached for their weapons. Then they stood there, staring at the entrance to the room. Musashi, using his lance as a pole, vaulted through a high side window, landing directly behind the chief. The man whirled around, only to be impaled on the lance. Letting out a fearsome, Argh! he grabbed with both hands the lance lodged in his chest. 
Musashi calmly let go of the lance, and the man toppled face down on the ground, the blade and most of the shaft projecting from his back. The second man to attack Musashi was relieved of his sword. Musashi sliced him through, brought the blade down on the head of a third man, and thrust it into the chest of a fourth. The others made helter-skelter for the door. Musashi hurled the sword at them and in a continuation of the same motion extricated the lance from the chief's body. Don't move, he bellowed. He charged with the lance held horizontally, parting the bandits like water struck with a pole. This gave him enough room to make effective use of the long weapon, which he now swung with a deftness that tested the very resiliency of its black oak shaft, striking sideways, slicing downward, thrusting viciously forward. The bandits attempting to get out the gate found their way blocked by the armed villagers. Some climbed the wall. When they hit the ground, most were slaughtered on the spot. Of the few who succeeded in escaping, nearly all received crippling wounds. For a time, the air was filled with shouts of triumph from young and old, male and female, and as the first flush of victory subsided, man and wife, parents and children, hugged each other and shed tears of joy. In the midst of this ecstatic scene, someone asked, What if they come back? There was a moment of sudden, anxious stillness. They won't be back, Musashi said firmly. Not to this village. But don't be overconfident. Your business is using plows, not swords. If you grow too proud of your fighting ability... The punishment heaven will mete out to you will be worse than any raid by mountain devils. Did you find out what happened? Nagaoka Sado asked his two samurai when they got back to the Tokuganji. In the distance, across field and swamp, he could see that the light of the fires in the village was fading. Everything's quieted down now. Did you chase the bandits away? How much damage was done in the village? The villagers killed all but a few of them before we got there. The others got away. Well, that's odd. He looked surprised, for if this was true, he had some thinking to do about the way of governing in his own lord's district. On leaving the temple the following day, he directed his horse toward the village, saying, It's out of the way, but let's have a look. A priest came along to show them the way, and while they rode, Sado observed, Those bodies along the roadside don't look to me as though they were cut down by farmers, and asked his samurai for more details. The villagers, foregoing sleep, were hard at work, burying corpses and cleaning up debris from the conflagration. But when they saw Sado and the samurai, they ran inside their houses and hid. Get one of the villagers to come here, and let's find out exactly what happened, he said to the priest. The man who came back with the priest gave them a fairly detailed account of the night's event. Now it begins to make sense, Sado said, nodding. What's this Ronin's name? The peasant, never having heard Musashi's name, cocked his head to one side. When Sado insisted on knowing it, the priest asked about for a time and came up with the required information. Miyamoto Musashi, Sado said thoughtfully. Is he the man the boy spoke of as his teacher? That's right. From the way he's been trying to develop a piece of wasted land on Hotengahara, the villagers thought he was a little soft in the head. I'd like to meet him, said Sado. But then he remembered the work waiting for him in Edo. Never mind. I'll talk to him the next time I come out here. He turned his horse around and left the peasant standing by the road. A few minutes later, he reined up in front of the village headman's gate. There, written in shiny ink on a fresh board, hung a sign. Reminder for the people of the village. Your plow is your sword. Your sword is your plow. Working in the fields, don't forget the invasion. Thinking of the invasion, don't forget your fields. All things must be balanced and integrated. Most important, do not oppose the way of successive generations. 
Hmm, who wrote this? The headman had finally come out and was now bowing on the ground before Sado. Musashi, he answered. Turning to the priest, Sado said, Thank you for bringing us here. It's too bad I couldn't meet this Musashi, but just now I don't have the time. I'll be back this way before long. First Planting The management of the palatial Hosokawa residence in Edo, as well as the performance of the fief's duties to the shogun, was entrusted to a man still in his early twenties, Tadatoshi, the eldest son of the daimyo Hosokawa Tadaoki. The father, a celebrated general who also enjoyed a reputation as a poet and master of the tea ceremony, preferred to live at the large Kokura fief in Buzen province on the island of Kyushu. Though Nagaoka Sado and a number of other trusted retainers were assigned to assist the young man, this was not because he was in any way incompetent. He was not only accepted as a peer by the powerful vassals closest to the shogun, but had distinguished himself as an energetic and far-sighted administrator. In fact, he seemed more in tune with the peace and prosperity of the times than the older lords who had been nurtured on constant warfare. At the moment, Sado was walking in the general direction of the riding ground. Have you seen the young lord? he asked of an apprentice samurai coming toward him. I believe he's at the archery range. As Sado threaded his way down a narrow path, he heard a voice asking, May I have a word with you? Sado stopped, and Iwama Kakube, a vassal respected for his shrewdness and practicality, came up to him. You're going to talk with his lordship? he asked. Yes. If you're not in a hurry, there's a little matter I'd like to consult with you about. Why don't we sit down over there? As they walked a few steps to a rustic arbor, Kakube said, I have a favor to ask. If you have a chance during your talk, there's a man I'd like to recommend to the young lord. Someone wanting to serve the house of Hosokawa? Yes, I know all sorts of people come to you with the same request, but this man's very unusual. Is he one of those men interested only in security and a stipend? Definitely not. He's related to my wife. He's been living with us since he came up from Iwakuni a couple of years ago. So I know him quite well. Iwakuni, the house of Kikawa held Suo province before the Battle of Sekigahara. Is he one of their ronin? No, he's the son of a rural samurai. His name's Sasaki Kojiro. He's still young, but he was trained in the Tomita style of Kanemaki Jisai, and he learned the techniques of drawing a sword with lightning swiftness from Lord Katayama Hisayasu of Hoki. He's even created a style of his own, which he calls Gandyu. Kakube went on, listing in detail Kojiro's various exploits and accomplishments. Sado was not really listening. His mind had gone back to his last visit to the Tokuganji. Though he was sure, even from the little he'd seen and heard, that Musashi was the right sort of man for the house of Hosokawa, he had intended to meet him personally before recommending him to his master. In the meantime, a year and a half had slipped by without his finding an opportunity to visit Hotengahara. When Kakube finished, Sado said, I'll do what I can for you, and continued on to the archery range. Tadatoshi was engaged in a contest with some vassals of his own age, none of whom was remotely a match for him. His shots, unerringly on target, were executed with flawless style. A number of retainers had chided him for taking archery so seriously, arguing that in an age of gun and lance, neither sword nor bow was any longer of much use in actual combat. To this he had replied cryptically, My arrows are aimed at the spirit. The Hosokawa retainers had the highest respect for Tadatoshi, and would have served under him with enthusiasm even if his father, to whom they were also devoted, had not been a man of substantial accomplishments. At the moment, Sado regretted the promise he'd just made to Kakube. 
Tadatoshi was not a man to whom one lightly recommended prospective retainers. Wiping the sweat off his face, Tadatoshi walked past several young samurai with whom he'd been talking and laughing. Catching a sight of Sado, he called, How about it, ancient one? Have a shot? I make it a rule to compete only against adults, Sado replied. So you still think of us little boys with our hair tied up on our heads? Have you forgotten the Battle of Yamazaki? Nirayama Castle? I have been commanded for my performance on the battlefield, you know. Besides, I go in for real archery, not... Ha <laughs> ha! Sorry I mentioned it. I didn't mean to get you started again. The others joined in the laughter. Slipping his arm out of his sleeve, Tadatoshi became serious and asked, Did you come to discuss something? After going over a number of routine matters, Sado said, Kakube says he has a samurai to recommend to you. For a moment, there was a faraway look in Tadatoshi's eyes. I suppose he's talking about Sasaki Kojiro. He's been mentioned several times. Why don't you call him in and have a look at him? Is he really good? Shouldn't you see for yourself? Tadatoshi put on his glove and accepted an arrow from an attendant. I'll take a look at Kakube's man, he said. I'd also like to see that Ronin you mentioned, Miyamoto Musashi, was it? Oh, you remember? I do. You're the one who seems to have forgotten. Not at all. But being so busy, I haven't had a chance to go out to Shimosa. If you think you've found someone, you should take the time. I'm surprised at you, Sado, letting something so important wait until you've got other business to take you out there. It's not like you. I'm sorry. There's always too many men looking for positions. I thought you'd forgotten about it. I suppose I should have brought it up again. Indeed, you should have. I don't necessarily accept other people's recommendations, but I'm eager to see anyone old Sado considers suitable. Understand? Sado apologized again before taking his leave. He went directly to his own house and, without further ado, had a fresh horse saddled and set out for Hotengahara. Isn't this Hotengahara? Sato Genzo, Sado's attendant, said, That's what I thought, but this is no wilderness. There are rice fields all over. The place they were trying to develop must be near the mountains. They had already gone a good distance beyond the Tokuganji and would soon be on the high road to Hitachi. It was late afternoon, and the white herons splashing about in the paddies made the water seem like powder. Along the riverbank and in the shadows of hillocks grew patches of hemp and waving stalks of barley. Look over there, sir, said Genzo. What is it? There's a group of farmers. So there is. They seem to be bowing to the ground one by one, don't they? It looks like some sort of religious ceremony. With a snap of the reins, Genzo forded the river first, making sure it was safe for Sado to follow. You there! called Genzo. The farmers, looking surprised, spread out from their circle to face the visitors. They were standing in front of a small cabin, and Sado could see that the object they'd been bowing before was a tiny wooden shrine, no larger than a birdcage. There were about fifty of them, on their way home from work, it appeared, for their tools had all been washed. A priest came forward, saying, Why, it's Nagaoka Sado, isn't it? What a pleasant surprise! And you're from the Tokuganji, aren't you? I believe you're the one who guided me to the village after the bandit raid. That's right. Have you come to pay a call at the temple? No, not this time. I'll be going back right away. Could you tell me where I might find that Ronin named Miyamoto Musashi? He's not here anymore. He left very suddenly. Left suddenly? Why should he do that? One day, last month, the villagers decided to take a day off and celebrate the progress that's been made here. You can see for yourself how green it is now. 
Well, the morning after that, Musashi and the boy, Iori, were gone. The priest looked around, as though half expecting Musashi to materialize out of the air. In response to Sado's prompting, the priest filled in the details of his story. After the village had strengthened its defenses under Musashi's leadership, the farmers were so thankful for the prospect of living in peace that they practically deified him. Even the ones who had ridiculed him most cruelly had come forward to help with the development project. Musashi treated them all fairly and equally, first convincing them that it was pointless to live like animals. He then tried to impress upon them the importance of exerting a little extra effort so as to give their children a chance for a better life. To be real human beings, he told them, they must work for the sake of posterity. With forty or fifty villagers pitching in to help each day, by fall they were able to keep the floodwaters under control. When winter came, they plowed, and in the spring they drew water from the new irrigation ditches and transplanted the rice seedlings. By early summer the rice was thriving, while in the dry fields hemp and barley were already a foot high. In another year the crop would double, the year after that triple. Villagers began to drop in at the cabin to pay their respects, thanking Musashi from the bottom of their hearts, the women bearing gifts of vegetables. On the day of the celebration, the men arrived with great jars of sake, and all took part in performing a sacred dance, accompanied by drums and flutes. With the villagers gathered around him, Musashi had assured them that it was not his strength, but theirs. All I did was show you how to use the energy you possess. Then he had taken the priest aside to tell him that he was concerned about their relying on a vagabond like him. Even without me, he said, they should have the confidence in themselves and maintain solidarity. He had then taken out a statue of Kanong he'd carved and given it to the priest. The morning after the celebration, the village was in an uproar. He's gone! He can't be! Yes, he's disappeared! The cabin's empty! Grief-stricken, none of the farmers went near the fields that day. When he heard about it, the priest reproached them sharply for their ingratitude, urging them to remember what they'd been taught and subtly coaxing them to carry on the work that had been started. Later, the villagers had built a tiny shrine and placed the treasured image of Kanon in it. They paid their respects to Musashi morning and evening on their way to and from the fields. Sado thanked the priest for the information, concealing the fact that he was disconsolate as only a man of his position could do. As his horse made its way back through the evening mist of late spring, he thought uneasily, I shouldn't have put off coming. I was derelict in my duty, and now I've failed my lord. The Flies On the east bank of the Sumida River, where the road from Shimosa converged with a branch of the Oshu High Road, rose a great barrier with an imposing gate, ample evidence of the firm rule of Aoyama Tadanari, the new magistrate of Edo. Musashi stood in line, idly waiting his turn, Iori at his side. When he had passed through Edo three years earlier, entering and leaving the city had been a simple matter. Even at this distance, he could see that there were far more houses than before, fewer open spaces. You there, Ronin, you're next. Two officials in leather hakama began frisking Musashi with great thoroughness, while a third glared at him and asked questions. What business do you have in the capital? Nothing specific. No special business, eh? Well, I'm a shugyosha. I suppose it could be said that studying to be a samurai is my business. The man was silent. Musashi grinned. Where were you born? In the village of Miyamoto, district of Yoshino, Mimasaka province. Your master? I have none. Who furnishes your travel money? 
No one. I carve statues and draw pictures. Sometimes I can exchange them for food and lodging. Often I stay at temples. Occasionally I give lessons in the sword. One way or another, I manage. Where are you coming from? For the past two years, I've been farming in Hotengahara in Shimosa. I decided I didn't want to do that for the rest of my life, so I've come here. Do you have a place to stay in Edo? No one can enter the city unless he has relatives or a place to live. Yes, replied Musashi on the spur of the moment. He saw that if he tried to stick to the truth, there was going to be no end to it. Well? Yagyu Munenori, Lord of Tajima. The official's mouth dropped open. Musashi, amused at the man's reaction, congratulated himself. The risk of being caught in a lie did not trouble him greatly. He felt that the Yagyus must have heard about him from Takuan. It seemed unlikely they would deny all acquaintance with him if questioned. It might even be that Takuan was in Edo now. If so, Musashi had his means of introduction. It was too late to have a bout with Sekshusai, but he longed to have one with Munenori, his father's successor in the Yagyu style and a personal tutor of the shogun. The name acted like magic. Well, well, said the official amiably. If you're connected with the house of Yagyu, I'm sorry to have troubled you. As you must realize, there are all sorts of samurai on the road. We have to be particularly careful about anyone who appears to be a ronin. Orders, you know. After a few more questions for the sake of form or face, he said, You can go now, and personally escorted Musashi to the gate. Sir? Iori asked when they were on the other side. Why are they so careful about ronin and nobody else? They're on the lookout for enemy spies. What spy would be stupid enough to come here looking like a ronin? The officials are pretty dumb. Them and their stupid questions. They made us miss the ferry. Shh, they'll hear you. Don't worry about the ferry. You can look at Mount Fuji while we're waiting for the next one. Did you know you could see it from here? So what? We could see it from Hotengahara too. Yes, but it's different here. How? Fuji's never the same. It varies from day to day, hour to hour. Looks the same to me. It's not, though. It changes. Time, weather, season, the place you're looking at it from. It differs, too, according to the person who's looking at it, according to his heart. Unimpressed, Iori picked up a flat stone and sent it skimming across the water. After amusing himself in this fashion for a few minutes, he came back to Musashi and asked, are we really going to Lord Yagyu's house? I'll have to think about that. Isn't that what you told the guard? Yes, I intended to go, but it's not all that simple. He's a daimyo, you know. He must be awfully important. That's what I want to be when I grow up. Important? Mm-hmm. You shouldn't aim so low. What do you mean? Look at Mount Fuji. I'll never be like Mount Fuji. Instead of wanting to be like this or that, make yourself into a silent, immovable giant. That's what the mountain is. Don't waste your time trying to impress people. If you become the sort of man people can respect, they'll respect you, without your doing anything. Musashi's words didn't have time to sink in, for just then Iori shouted, Look, here comes the ferry, and ran ahead to be the first one on board. The Sumida River was a study in contrasts, wide in places, narrow in others, shallow here and deep there. At high tide, the waves washing the banks took on a muddy hue. Sometimes the estuary swelled to twice its normal width. At the point where the ferry crossed, it was virtually an inlet of the bay. The sky was clear, the water transparent. Looking over the side, Iori could see schools of countless tiny fish racing about. Among the rocks, he also spotted the rusty remains of an old helmet. 
he had no ears for the conversation going on around him. What do you think? Is it going to stay peaceful the way it is now? I doubt it. You're probably right. Sooner or later, they'll be fighting. I hope not, but what else can you expect? Other passengers kept their thoughts to themselves and stared dourly at the water, afraid an official, possibly in disguise, might overhear and connect them with the speakers. Those who did take the risk seemed to enjoy flirting with the ubiquitous eyes and ears of the law. You can tell from the way they're checking everybody that we're heading for war. It's only very recently they've been clamping down like that, and there are a lot of rumors about spies from Osaka. You also hear about burglars breaking into daimyo's houses, though they try to hush it up. It must be embarrassing being robbed when you're supposed to be the enforcers of law and order. You'd have to be after more than money to take that kind of risk. It's got to be spies. No ordinary crook would have the nerve. As he looked around, it occurred to Musashi that the ferry was transporting a fair cross-section of Edo society. A lumberman with sawdust clinging to his work clothes. A couple of cheap geisha who might have come from Kyoto. A broad-shouldered roughneck or two. A group of well-diggers. Two openly coquettish whores. A priest, a beggar monk, another ronin like himself. When the boat reached the Edo side and they all piled out, a short, heavy-set man called to Musashi. Hey, you! The ronin! You forgot something! He held out a reddish brocade pouch, so old that the dirt seemed to shine more brightly than the few gold threads left in it. Musashi, shaking his head, said, It's not mine. It must belong to one of the other passengers. Iori piped up. It's mine! Snatched the pouch from the man's hand and stuffed it into his kimono. The man was indignant. What are you doing, grabbing like that? Give it here! Then you're going to bow three times before you get it back. If you don't, you're going to get thrown in the river. Musashi intervened, asking the man to excuse Iori's rudeness because of his age. What are you? the man asked roughly. Brother? Master? What's your name? Miyamoto Musashi. What? exclaimed the ruffian, staring hard at Musashi's face. After a moment, he said to Iori, You'd better be careful from now on. Then, as though eager to escape, he turned away. Just a moment, said Musashi. The gentleness of his tone took the man completely by surprise. He whirled around, his hand going to his sword. What do you want? What's your name? What's it to you? You ask mine. As a matter of courtesy, you should tell me yours. I'm one of Hangawara's men. My name's Judo. All right. You can go, said Musashi, pushing him away. I won't forget that! Judo stumbled a few steps before he found his feet and fled. Serves him right, the coward, said Iori. Satisfied that he'd been vindicated, he looked up worshipfully at Musashi's face and moved closer to him. As they walked into the city, Musashi said, Iori. You have to realize that living here is not like being out in the country. There, we had only foxes and squirrels for neighbors. Here, there are lots of people. You'll have to be more careful about your manners. Yes, sir. When people live together in harmony, the earth is a paradise, Musashi went on gravely. But every man has a bad side as well as a good side. There are times when only the bad comes out. Then the world's not paradise, but hell. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, I think so, said Iori, more subdued now. There's a reason we have manners and etiquette. They keep us from letting the bad side take over. This promotes social order, which is the objective of the government's laws. Musashi paused. The way you acted, it was a trivial matter, but your attitude couldn't help but make the man angry. I'm not at all happy about it. Yes, sir. I don't know where we'll be going from here. 
But wherever we are, you'd better follow the rules and act courteously. The boy bobbed his head a couple of times and made a small, stiff bow. They walked on in silence for a short while. Sir, would you carry my pouch for me? I don't want to lose it again. Accepting the small brocade bag, Musashi inspected it closely before tucking it into his kimono. Is this the one your father left you? Yes, sir. I got it back from the tokuganji at the beginning of the year. The priest didn't take any of the money. You can use some of it if you need to. Thanks, Musashi said lightly. I'll take good care of it. He has a talent I don't have, mused Musashi, thinking ruefully of his own indifference to personal matters. The boy's innate prudence had taught Musashi the meaning of economics. He appreciated the boy's trust and was growing fonder of him by the day. He looked forward with enthusiasm to the task of helping him develop his native intelligence. Where would you like to stay tonight? he asked. Iori, who had been looking at his new surroundings with great curiosity, remarked, I see lots of horses over there. It looks like a marketplace right here in town. He spoke as though he had run across a long-lost friend in a strange country. They had reached Bakurocho, where there was a large and diverse selection of tea shops and hostelries catering to the equine professions, sellers, buyers, draymen, grooms, a variety of lesser factotums. Men in small groups haggled and babbled in a welter of dialects, the most prominent being the tangy, irate-sounding speech of Edo. Among the rabble was a well-groomed samurai searching for good horses. With a disgruntled look, he said, Let's go home. There's nothing here but nags, nothing worth recommending to his lordship. Striding briskly between the animals, he came face to face with Musashi, blinked, and stepped back in surprise. You're Miyamoto Musashi, aren't you? Musashi looked at the man for an instant, then broke into a grin. It was Kimura Skekuro. Although the two men had come within inches of locking swords at Koyagyu Castle, Skekuro's manner was cordial. He seemed to bear no lingering rancor from that encounter. I certainly didn't expect to see you here, he said. Have you been in Edo long? I've just come from Shimosa, replied Musashi. How's your master? Is he still in good health? Yes, thank you. But of course, at six Shusai's age, I'm staying with Lord Munenori. You must come to visit. I'd be glad to introduce you. Oh, there's something else, too. He flashed a meaningful look and smiled. We have a beautiful treasure that belongs to you. You must come as soon as you can. Before Musashi could inquire what the beautiful treasure might be, Skekuro made a slight bow and walked rapidly away, his attendant trailing along behind. The guests staying at the inexpensive inns of Bakurocho were mostly horse traders in from the provinces. Musashi decided to take a room there rather than in another part of town where the rates would most likely be higher. Like the other inns, the one he chose had a large stable, so large, in fact, that the rooms themselves seemed rather like an annex. But after the rigors of Hotengahara, even this third-rate hostelry seemed luxurious. Despite his feeling of well-being, Musashi found the horseflies annoying and began grumbling. The proprietress heard him. I'll change your room, she offered solicitously. The flies aren't so bad on the second floor. Once resettled, Musashi found himself exposed to the full strength of the western sun and felt like grumbling again. Only a few days ago, the afternoon sun would have been a source of cheer, a bright ray of hope shedding nourishing warmth on the rice plants and portending good weather for the morrow. As for the flies... When his sweat had attracted them while he worked in the fields, he had taken the view that they were only going about their chores, just as he was going about his. He had even regarded them as fellow creatures. Now, having crossed one wide river and entered the maze of the city, he found the heat of the sun anything but comforting, 
the fly's only an irritation. His appetite took his mind off the inconveniences. He glanced at Iori and saw symptoms of lassitude and gluttony in his face, too. Small wonder, for a party in the next room had ordered a great pot of steaming food and was now attacking it ravenously, amid much talk, laughter, and drinking. Buckwheat noodles, soba, that's what he wanted. In the country, if a man wanted soba, he planted buckwheat in the early spring, watched it flower in the summer, dried the grain in the fall, ground the flour in the winter. Then he could make soba. Here, it required no more effort than clapping one's hands for service. Yuri, shall we order some soba? Yes, came the eager reply. The proprietress came and took their order. While they waited, Musashi propped his elbows on the windowsill and shaded his eyes. Diagonally across the way was a signboard reading, Souls polished here. Zushi no Kosuke, master in the Hongami style. Iori had noticed it too. After staring for a moment in bewilderment, he said, That sign says souls polished. What sort of business is that? Well, it also says the man works in the Hongami style, so I suppose he's a sword polisher. Come to think of it, I ought to have my sword worked on. The soba was slow to arrive, so Musashi stretched out on the tatami for a nap. But the voices in the next room had risen several decibels and become quarrelsome. Yori, he said, opening one eye, will you ask the people next door to be a little quieter? Only Shoji separated the two rooms, but instead of opening them, Iori went out into the hall. The door to the other room was open. Don't make so much noise, he shouted. My teacher's trying to sleep. Huh? The squabble came to an abrupt halt. The men turned and stared angrily at him. You say something, shrimp? Pouting at the epithet, Iori said, we came upstairs because of the flies. Now you're yelling so much he can't rest. Is this your idea, or did your master send you? He sent me. Did he? Well, I'm not wasting my time talking to a little turd like you. Go tell your master Kumagoro of Chichibu. We'll give him his answer later. Now beat it! Kumagoro was a great brute of a man, and the two or three others in the room were not much smaller. Cowed by the menace in their eyes, Iori quickly retreated. Musashi had dropped off to sleep. Not wanting to disturb him, Iori sat down by the window. Presently, one of the horse traders opened the shoji a crack and peeked in at Musashi. There followed much laughter, accompanied by loud and insulting remarks. Who does he think he is, butting into our party? Dumb Ronin? No telling where he comes from, just barges in and starts acting like he owns the place. We'll have to show him what's what. Yeah, we'll make sure he knows what the horse traders of Edo are made of. Talking's not going to show him. Let's haul him out back and throw a bucket of horse piss in his face. Kumagoro spoke up. Hold on now. Let me handle this. Either I'll get an apology in writing, or we'll wash his face with horse piss. Enjoy your sake. Leave everything to me. This should be good, said one man, as Kumagoro, with a confident smirk, tightened his obi. I beg your pardon, said Kumagoro, sliding the shoji open. Without standing up, he shuffled into Musashi's room on his knees. The soba. Six helpings in a lacquered box had finally arrived. Musashi was sitting up now, addressing his chopsticks to his first helping. Look, they're coming in, said Iori under his breath, moving slightly to get out of the way. Kumagoro seated himself behind and to Iori's left, legs crossed, elbows resting on his knees. With a fierce scowl, he said, You can eat later. Don't try to hide the fact that you're scared by sitting there playing with your food. Though he was grinning, 
Musashi gave no indication that he was listening. He stirred the soba with his chopsticks to separate the strands, lifted a mouthful, and swallowed with a joyous slurp. The veins in Kumagoro's forehead nearly popped. Put that bowl down, he said angrily. And who are you? Musashi asked mildly, making no move to comply. You don't know who I am? The only people in Bakurojo who haven't heard my name are good-for-nothings and deaf-mutes. I'm a little hard of hearing myself. Speak up. Tell me who you are and where you come from. I'm Kumagoro from Chichibu, the best horse trader in Edo. When children see me coming, they get so scared they can't even cry. I see. Then you're in the horse business? You bet I am. I sell to the samurai. You better remember that when you're dealing with me. In what way am I dealing with you? You sent that runt there to complain about the noise. Where do you think you are? This is no fancy inn for daimyo, nice and quiet and all. We horse traders like noise. I gathered that. Then why were you trying to bust up our party? I demand an apology. Apology? Yes, in writing. You can address it to Kumagoro and his friends. If we don't get one, we'll take you outside and teach you a thing or two. What you say is interesting. Huh? I mean, your way of speaking is interesting. Cut out the nonsense! Do we get the apology or don't we? Well? Kumagoro's voice had gone from a growl to a roar, and the sweat on his crimson forehead glistened in the evening sun. Looking ready to explode, he bared his hairy chest and took a dagger from his stomach wrapper. Make up your mind! If I don't hear your answer soon, you're in big trouble! He uncrossed his legs and held the dagger vertically beside the lacquer box, its point touching the floor. Musashi, restraining his mirth, said, Well, now, how should I respond to that? Lowering his bowl, he reached out with his chopsticks, removed the dark speck from the soba in the box, and threw it out the window. Still silent, he reached out again and picked off another dark speck, then another. Kumagoro's eyes bugged. His breath halted. There's no end to them, is there? remarked Musashi casually. Here, Iori, go give these chopsticks a good washing. As Iori went out, Kumagoro faded silently back into his own room and in a hushed voice told his companions of the incredible sight he had just witnessed. After first mistaking the black spots on the soba for dirt, he had realized they were live flies, plucked so deftly they had no time to escape. Within minutes, he and his fellows transferred their little party to a more remote quarter, and silence reigned. That's better, isn't it? said Musashi to Iori. The two of them grinned at one another. By the time they'd finished their meal, the sun was down, and the moon was shining wanly above the roof of the soul polisher's shop. Musashi stood up and straightened his kimono. I think I'll see about having my sword taken care of, he said. He picked up the weapon and was about to leave when the proprietress came halfway up the blackened staircase and called, A letter's come for you. Puzzled that anyone should know his whereabouts so soon, Musashi went down, accepted the missive, and asked, Is the messenger still here? No, he left immediately. The outside of the letter bore only the word ske, which Musashi took to stand for Kimura Skekuro. Unfolding it, he read, I informed Lord Munenori that I saw you this morning. He seemed happy to receive word of you after all this time. He instructed me to write and ask when you will be able to visit us. Musashi descended the remaining steps and went to the office, where he borrowed ink and brush. Seating himself in a corner, he wrote on the back of Skekuro's letter, I shall be happy to visit Lord Munenori whenever he wishes to have a bout with me. As a warrior, 
I have no other purpose in calling on him. He signed the note, Masana, a formal name he seldom used. Yuri, he called from the bottom of the stairs. I want you to run an errand for me. Yes, sir. I want you to deliver a letter to Lord Yagyu Munenori. Yes, sir. According to the proprietress, everybody knew where Lord Munenori lived, but she offered directions anyway. Go down the main street until you come to the high road. Go straight along that as far as Nihonbashi. Then bear to the left and go along the river until you get to Kobikicho. That's where it is. You can't miss it. Thanks, said Iori, who already had his sandals on. I'm sure I can find it. He was delighted at the opportunity to go out, particularly since his destination was the home of an important daimyo. Giving no thought to the hour, he walked away quickly, swinging his arms and holding his head up proudly. As Musashi watched him turn the corner, he thought, he's a little too self-confident for his own good. The Soul Polisher Good evening, called Musashi. Nothing about Zushino Kosuke's house suggested it was a place of business. It lacked the grilled front of most shops, and there was no merchandise on display. Musashi stood in the dirt-floored passageway running down the left side of the house. To his right was a raised section, floored with tatami and screened off from the room beyond it. The man sleeping on the tatami with his arms resting on a strong box resembled a Taoist sage Musashi had once seen in a painting. The long, thin face was the grayish color of clay. Musashi could detect in it none of the keenness he associated with sword craftsmen. Good evening, Musashi repeated a little louder. When his voice penetrated Kosuke's torpor, the craftsman raised his head very slowly. He might have been awakening from centuries of slumber. Wiping the saliva from his chin and sitting up straight, he asked, lackadaisically, Can I help you? Musashi's impression was that a man like this might make swords, as well as souls, duller. But he nevertheless held out his own weapon and explained why he was there. Let me take a look at it. Kosuke's shoulders perked up smartly. Placing his left hand on his knee, he reached out with his right to take the sword, simultaneously bowing his head toward it. Strange creature, thought Musashi. He barely acknowledges the presence of a human being, but bows politely to a sword. Holding a piece of paper in his mouth, Kosuke quietly slid the blade out of the scabbard. He stood it vertically in front of him and examined it from hilt to tip. His eyes took on a bright glitter, reminding Musashi of glass eyes in a wooden Buddhist statue. Snapping the weapon back into its scabbard, Kosuke looked up inquiringly at Musashi. Come, have a seat, he said, moving back to make room and offering Musashi a cushion. Musashi removed his sandals and stepped up into the room. Has the sword been in your family for some generations? Oh, no, said Musashi. It's not the work of a famous swordsmith, nothing like that. Have you used it in battle, or do you carry it for the usual purposes? I haven't used it on the battlefield. There's nothing special about it. The best you could say is that it's better than nothing. Hmm. Looking directly into Musashi's eyes, Kosuke then asked, How do you want it polished? How do I want it polished? What do you mean? Do you want it sharpened so it'll cut well? Well, it is a sword. The cleaner it cuts, the better. I suppose so, agreed Kosuke with a defeated sigh. What's wrong with that? Isn't it the business of a craftsman to sharpen swords so they'll cut properly? As Musashi spoke, he squinted curiously into Kosuke's face. The self-proclaimed polisher of souls 
shoved the weapon toward Musashi and said, I can't do anything for you. Take it to somebody else. Strange indeed, thought Musashi. He could not disguise a certain vexation, but he said nothing. Kosuke, his lips tightly set, made no attempt to explain. While they sat silently staring at each other, a man from the neighborhood stuck his head in the door. Kosuke, have you got a fishing pole? It's high tide and the fish are jumping. If you'll lend me a pole, I'll divide my catch with you. Kosuke plainly regarded the man as one more burden he ought not to have to bear. Borrow one somewhere else, he rasped. I don't believe in killing, and I don't keep instruments for murder in my house. The man went quickly away, leaving Kosuke looking grumpier than ever. Another man might have become discouraged and left, but Musashi's curiosity held him there. There was something appealing about this man, not wit nor intelligence, but a rough natural goodness, like that of a karatsu sake jar or a tea bowl by Nonko. Just as pottery often has a blemish evocative of its closeness to the earth, Kosuke had, in a semi-bald spot on his temple, a lesion of some sort, which he'd covered with salve. While attempting to conceal his growing fascination, Musashi said, What is there to keep you from polishing my sword? Is it of such poor quality you can't put a good edge on it? Of course not. You're the owner. You know as well as I do, it's a perfectly good Bizen sword. I also know you want it sharpened for the purpose of cutting people. Is there anything wrong with that? That's what they all say. What's wrong with wanting me to fix a sword so it'll cut better? If the sword cuts, they're happy. But a man bringing in a sword to be polished naturally wants... Just a minute. Kosuke raised his hand. It'll take some time to explain. First, I'd like you to take another look at the sign on the front of my shop. It says, Souls Polished, or at least I think so. Is there any other way of reading the characters? No. You'll notice it doesn't say a word about polishing swords. My business is polishing the souls of the samurai who come in, not their weapons. People don't understand. But that's what I was taught when I studied sword polishing. I see, said Musashi, although he didn't really. Since I try to abide by my master's teachings, I refuse to polish the swords of samurai who take pleasure in killing people. Well, you have a point there. But tell me, who was this master of yours? That's written on the sign, too. I studied in the house of Honami under Honami Koetsu himself. Kosuke squared his shoulders proudly as he uttered his master's name. That's interesting. I happen to have made the acquaintance of your master and his excellent mother, Myoshu. Musashi went on to tell how he had met them in the field near the Rendaiji and later spent a few days at their house. Kosuke, astonished, scrutinized him closely for a moment. Are you by any chance the man who caused the great stir in Kyoto some years ago by defeating the Yoshioka school at Ichijoji? Miyamoto Musashi was the name, I believe. That is my name. Musashi's face reddened slightly. Kosuke moved back a bit and bowed deferentially, saying, Forgive me. I shouldn't have been lecturing you. I had no idea I was talking to the famous Miyamoto Musashi. Don't give it a second thought. Your words were very instructive. Koetsu's character comes through in the lessons he teaches his disciples. As I'm sure you know, the Hoami family served the Ashkaga shoguns. From time to time, they've also been called upon to polish the emperor's swords. Koetsu was always saying that Japanese swords were created not to kill or injure people, 
but to maintain the imperial rule and protect the nation, to subdue devils and drive out evil. The sword is the samurai's soul. He carries it for no other purpose than to maintain his own integrity. It is an ever-present admonition to the man who rules over other men and seeks, in doing so, to follow the way of life. It's only natural that the craftsman who polishes the sword must also polish the swordsman's spirit. How true, agreed Musashi. Koetsu said that to see a good sword is to see the sacred light, the spirit of the nation's peace and tranquility. He hated touching a bad sword. Even being near one used to nauseate him. I see. Are you saying you sensed something evil in my sword? No, not in the least. I just felt a little depressed. Since coming to Edo, I've worked on any number of weapons, but none of their owners seem to have an inkling of the sword's true meaning. I sometimes doubt they have souls to polish. All they care about is quartering a man or splitting his head open, helmet and all. It got so tiresome. That's why I put up a new sign a few days ago. It doesn't seem to have had much effect, though. And I came in asking for the same thing, didn't I? I understand how you feel. Well, that's a beginning. Things may turn out a little differently with you. But frankly, when I saw that blade of yours, I was shocked. All those nicks and stains, stains made by human flesh. I thought you were just one more senseless loaning proud of himself for committing a number of meaningless murders. Musashi bowed his head. It was the voice of Koetsu coming from Kosuke's mouth. I'm grateful for this lesson, he said. I've carried a sword since I was a boy, but I've never really given sufficient thought to the spirit that resides in it. In the future, I'll pay heed to what you've said. Kosuke appeared vastly relieved. In that case, I'll polish the sword for you. Or perhaps I should say I consider it a privilege for one in my profession to be able to polish the soul of a samurai like yourself. Twilight had faded, and the lights had been lit. Musashi decided it was time to go. Wait, said Kosuke. Do you have another sword to carry while I'm working on this one? No, I have only the one long sword. In that case, why don't you pick out a replacement? None of the swords I have here now are very good, I'm afraid, but come and take a look. He guided Musashi into the back room, where he took several swords out of a cabinet and lined them up on the tatami. You can take any one of these, he offered. Despite the craftsman's modest disavowal, they were all weapons of excellent quality. Musashi had difficulty choosing from the dazzling display, but finally he selected one and immediately fell in love with it. Just holding it in his hands, he sensed its maker's dedication. Drawing the blade from the scabbard confirmed his impression. It was indeed a beautiful piece of workmanship, probably dating from the Yoshino period in the 14th century. Nagged by the doubt that it was too elegant for him, once he had brought it close to the light and examined it, he found his hands reluctant to let it go. May I take this one? he asked. He could not bring himself to use the word borrow. You have the eye of an expert, observed Kolske, as he put away the other swords. For once in his life, Musashi was swamped by covetousness. He knew it was futile to mention buying the sword outright. The price would be far beyond his means. But he couldn't help himself. I don't suppose you'd consider selling me the sword, would you? He asked. Why not? How much are you asking for it? I'll let you have it for what I paid for it. 
How much was that? Twenty pieces of gold. An almost inconceivable sum to Musashi. I'd better give it back, he said hesitantly. Why? asked Kosuke with a puzzled look. I'll lend it to you for as long as you wish. Go on, take it. No, that'll make me feel even worse. Wanting it the way I do is bad enough. If I wore it for a while, it would be torture to part with it. Are you really so attached to it? Kosuke looked at the sword, then at Musashi. All right, then. I'll give it to you. In wedlock, as it were. But I expect an appropriate gift in exchange. Musashi was baffled. He had absolutely nothing to offer. I heard from Koetsu that you carve statues. I'd be honored if you'd make me an image of Kanon. That would be sufficient payment. The last Kanon Musashi had carved was the one he'd left in Hotengahara. I have nothing on hand, he said, but in the next few days I can carve something for you. May I have the sword, then? Certainly. I didn't mean to imply I expected it this minute. By the way, instead of putting up at that inn, why don't you come and stay with us? We have a room we're not using. That would be perfect, said Musashi. If I moved in tomorrow, I could start on the statue right away. Come and take a look at it, urged Kosuke, who was also happy and excited. Musashi followed him down the outside passageway, at the end of which was a flight of half a dozen steps. Tucked in between the first and second floors, not quite belonging to either, was an eight-mat room. Through the window, Musashi could see the dew-laden leaves of an apricot tree. Pointing at a roof covered with oyster shells, Kosuke said, That's my workshop there. The craftsman's wife, as if summoned by a secret signal, arrived with sake and some tidbits. When the two men sat down, the distinction between host and guest seemed to evaporate. They relaxed, legs stretched out, and opened their hearts to each other, oblivious of the restraints normally imposed by etiquette. The talk, of course, turned to their favorite subject. Everybody pays lip service to the importance of the sword, said Kosuke. Anybody will tell you the sword's the soul of the samurai, and that a sword is one of the country's three sacred treasures. But the way people actually treat swords is scandalous, and I include samurai and priests as well as townsmen. I took it upon myself at one time to go around to shrines and old houses where there were once whole collections of beautiful swords, and I can tell you the situation is shocking. Kosuke's pale cheeks were ruddy now. His eyes burned with enthusiasm, and the saliva that gathered at the corners of his mouth occasionally flew in a spray right into his companion's face. Almost none of the famous swords from the past are being properly taken care of. At Sua Shrine in Shinano Province, there are more than three hundred swords. They could be classed as heirlooms, but I found only five that weren't rusted. Omishima Shrine in Io is famous for its collection, three thousand swords dating back many centuries. But after spending a whole month there, I found only ten that were in good condition. It's disgusting. Kosuke caught his breath and continued. The problem seems to be that the older and more famous the sword is, the more the owner is inclined to make sure it's stored in a safe place. But then nobody can get at it to take care of it, and the blade gets rustier and rustier. The owners are like parents who protect their children so jealously that the children grow up to be fools. In the case of children, more are being born all the time. It doesn't make any difference if a few are stupid. But swords? Pausing to suck in the spit, he raised his thin shoulders even higher and with a gleam in his eyes declared, We already have all the good swords there'll ever be. 
during the Civil Wars, the swordsmiths got careless, no, downright sloppy. They forgot their techniques, and swords have been deteriorating ever since. The only thing to do is to take better care of the swords from the earlier periods. The craftsmen today may try to imitate the older swords, but they'll never turn out anything as good. Doesn't it make you angry to think about it? Abruptly he stood up and said, Just look at this. Bringing out a sword of awesome length, he laid it down for his guest to inspect. It's a splendid weapon, but it's covered with the worst kind of rust. Musashi's heart skipped a beat. The sword was without doubt Sasaki Kojiro's drawing pole. A flood of memories came rushing back. Controlling his emotions, he said calmly, That's really a long one, isn't it? Must take quite a samurai to handle it. I imagine so, agreed Kosuke. There aren't many like it. Taking the blade out, he turned the back toward Musashi and handed it to him by the hilt. See, he said, it's rusted badly, here and here and here, but he's used it anyway. I see. This is a rare piece of workmanship, probably forged in the Kamakura period. It'll take a lot of work, but I can probably fix it up. On these ancient swords, the rust is only a relatively thin film. If this were a new blade, I'd never be able to get the stains off. On new swords, rust spots are like malignant sores. They eat right into the heart of the metal. Reversing the sword's position so that the back of the blade was toward Kosuke, Musashi said, Tell me, did the owner of this sword bring it in himself? No, I was at Lord Hosokawa's on business, and one of the older retainers, Iwama Kakube, asked me to drop in at his house on the way back. I did, and he gave it to me to work on. Said it belonged to a guest of his. The fittings are good, too, remarked Musashi, his eyes still focused on the weapon. It's a battle sword. The man's been carrying it on his back up till now, but he wants to carry it at his side, so I've been asked to refit the scabbard. He must be a very large man. Either that, or he has a very practiced arm. Kosuke had begun to feel his sake. His tongue was becoming a little thick. Musashi concluded it was time to take his leave, which he did with a minimum of ceremony. It was much later than he thought. There were no lights in the neighborhood. Once inside the inn, he groped through the darkness to the stairway and up to the second floor. Two pallets had been spread, but both were empty. Iuri's absence made him uncomfortable, for he suspected the boy was wandering about lost on the streets of this great unfamiliar city. Going back downstairs, he shook the night watchman awake. Isn't he back yet? asked the man, who seemed more surprised than Musashi. I thought he was with you. Knowing he would only stare at the ceiling until Iori came back, Musashi went out into the black lacquer night again and stood with arms crossed under the eaves. The Fox Is this Kobikicho? In spite of repeated assurances that it was, Iori still had his doubts. The only lights visible on the broad expanse of land belonged to the makeshift huts of woodworkers and stonemasons, and these were few and far between. Beyond them, in the distance, he could just make out the foaming white waves of the bay. Near the river were piles of rocks and stacks of lumber and although Iori knew that buildings were going up at a furious pace all over Edo, it struck him as unlikely that Lord Yagyu would build his residence in an area like this. Where to next, he thought dejectedly as he sat down on some lumber. His feet were tired and burning. To cool them, he wiggled his toes in the dewy grass. Soon his tension ebbed away and the sweat dried, but his spirits remained decidedly damp. It's all the fault of that old woman at the inn, he muttered to himself. 
she didn't know what she was talking about. The time he himself had spent gawking at the sights in the theater district at Sakaicho conveniently slipped his mind. The hour was late, and there was no one around from whom he could ask directions. Yet the idea of spending the night in these unfamiliar surroundings made him uneasy. He had to complete his errand and return to the inn before daybreak, even if it meant waking up one of the workers. As he approached the nearest shack where a light showed, he saw a woman with a strip of matting tied over her head like a shawl. Good evening, auntie, he said innocently. Mistaking him for the helper at a nearby sake shop, the woman glared and sniffed. You, is it? You threw a rock at me and ran away, didn't you, you little brat? Not me, protested Iori. I've never seen you before. The woman came hesitantly toward him, then burst out laughing. No, she said. You're not the one. What's a cute little boy like you doing wandering around here at this time of night? I was sent on an errand, but I can't find the house I'm looking for. Whose house is it? Lord Yagyu of Tajima's. Are you joking? She laughed. Lord Yagyu is a daimyo and a teacher to the shogun. Do you think he'd open his gate to you? She laughed again. You know somebody in the servants' quarters, perhaps? I've brought a letter. Who to? A samurai named Kimura Skekuro. Must be one of his retainers. But you, you're so funny, throwing Lord Yagyu's name around like you knew him. I just want to deliver this letter. If you know where the house is, tell me. It's on the other side of the moat. If you cross that bridge over there, you'll be in front of Lord Ki's house. The next one is Lord Kyogoku, then Lord Kato, then Lord Matsudaira of Suo. Holding up her fingers, she counted off the sturdy storehouses on the opposite bank. I'm sure the one after that is the one you want. If I cross the moat, will I still be in Kobikicho? Of course. Of all the stupid... Here now, that's no way to talk. Hmm, you seem such a nice boy. I'll come along and show you Lord Yagyu's place. Walking in front of him with the matting on her head, she looked to Yori rather like a ghost. They were in the middle of the bridge when a man coming toward them brushed against her sleeve and whistled. He reeked of sake. Before Iori knew what was going on, the woman turned and made for the drunk. I know you, she warbled. Don't just pass me by like that. It isn't nice. She grabbed his sleeve and started toward a place from which they could go below the bridge. Let go, he said. Wouldn't you like to go with me? No money. Oh, I don't care. Latching onto him like a leech, she looked back at Iori's startled face and said, Run along now. I've got business with this gentleman. Iori watched in bewilderment as the two of them tugged back and forth. After a few moments, the woman appeared to get the upper hand, and they disappeared below the bridge. Still puzzled, Iori went to the railing and looked over at the grassy riverbank. Glancing up, the woman shouted, Nitwit! and picked up a rock. Swallowing hard, Iori dodged the missile and made for the far end of the bridge. In all his years on the barren plain of Hotengahara, he had never seen anything so frightening as the woman's angry white face in the dark. On the other side of the river, he found himself before a storehouse. Next to that was a fence then another storehouse, then another fence, and so on down the street. This must be it, he said, when he came to the fifth building. On the gleaming white plaster wall was a crest in the form of a two-tiered woman's hat. This, Iori knew from the words of a popular song, was the Yagyu family crest. Who's there? demanded a voice from inside the gate. Speaking as loudly as he dared, Iori announced, I'm the pupil of Miyamoto Musashi. I've brought a letter. The sentry said a few words Iori could not catch. 
In the gate was a small door through which people could be led in and out without opening the great gate itself. After a few seconds, the door slowly opened and the man asked suspiciously, What are you doing here at this hour? Iori thrust the letter at the guard's face. Please deliver this for me. If there's an answer, I'll take it back. Hmm, mused the man, taking the letter. This is for Kimura Skekuro, is it? Yes, sir. He's not here. Where is he? He's at the house in Higakubo. Huh? Everybody told me Lord Yagyu's house was in Kobikicho. People say that, but there's only storehouses here. Rice, lumber, and a few other things. Lord Yagyu doesn't live here? That's right. How far is it to the other place? Higakubo? Pretty far. Just where is it? In the hills outside the city, in Azabu village. Never heard of it, Iori sighed disappointedly, but his sense of responsibility prevented him from giving up. Sir, would you draw me a map? Don't be silly. Even if you knew the way, it'd take you all night to get there. I don't mind. Lot of foxes in Azabu. You don't want to be bewitched by a fox, do you? No. Do you know Skekuro well? My teacher does. I'll tell you what. Since it's so late, why don't you catch some sleep over there in the granary and go in the morning? Where am I? exclaimed Iori, rubbing his eyes. He jumped up and ran outside. The afternoon sun made him dizzy. Squinting his eyes against the glare, he went to the gatehouse, where the guard was eating his lunch. So, you're finally up. Yes, sir. Could you draw me that map now? You in a hurry, sleepyhead? Here, you better have something to eat first. There's enough for both of us. While the boy chewed and gulped, the guard sketched a rough map and explained how to get to Higakubo. They finished simultaneously, and Iori, fired up with the importance of his mission, set off at a run, never thinking that Musashi might be worried about his failure to return to the inn. He made good time through the busy thoroughfares until he reached the vicinity of Edo Castle, where the imposing houses of the leading daimyo stood on the land built up between the crisscross system of moats. As he looked around, his pace slowed. The waterways were jammed with cargo boats. The stone ramparts of the castle itself were half covered with log scaffolding, which, from a distance, resembled the bamboo trellises used for growing morning glories. He dawdled again in a broad, flat area called Hibiya, where the scraping of chisels and the thud of axes raised a dissonant hymn to the power of the new shogunate. Iori stopped. He was mesmerized by the spectacle of the construction work, the laborers hauling huge rocks, the carpenters with their planes and saws, and the samurai, the dashing samurai, who stood proudly supervising it all. How he wanted to grow up and be like them. A lusty song rose from the throats of the men hauling rocks. We'll pluck the flowers in the fields of Musashi, the gentians, the bellflowers, wild blossoms splashed in confusing disarray, and that lovely girl, the flower unpluckable, moistened by the dew, twill only dampen your sleeve like falling tears. He stood enchanted. Before he realized it, the water in the moats was taking on a reddish cast, and the evening voices of crows reached his ears. Oh no, it's nearly sundown, he chastised himself. He sped away and for a time moved along at full speed, paying attention to nothing save the map the guard had drawn for him. Before he knew it, he was climbing the path up Azabu Hill, which was so thickly overhung with trees it might as well have been midnight. Once he reached the top, however, he could see the sun was still in the sky, though low on the horizon. There were almost no houses on the hill itself, Azabu village being a mere scattering of fields and farm dwellings in the valley below. Standing in a sea of grass and ancient trees, listening to the brooks gurgling down the hillside, 
Iori felt his fatigue give way to a strange refreshment. He was vaguely aware that the spot where he was standing was historic, although he didn't know why. In fact, it was the very place that had given birth to the great warrior clans of the past, both the Taira and the Minamoto. He heard the loud booming of a drum being beaten, the kind often used at Shinto festivals. Down the hill, visible in the forest, were the sturdy cross logs atop the ridge pole of a religious sanctuary. Had Iori but known, it was the great shrine of Igura he'd studied about, the famous edifice sacred to the sun goddess of Ise. The shrine was a far cry from the enormous castle he had just seen, even from the stately gates of the daimyo. In its simplicity, it was almost indistinguishable from the farmhouses around it, and Iori thought it puzzling that people talked more reverently about the Tokugawa family than they did about the most sacred of deities. Did that mean the Tokugawas were greater than the sun goddess? He wondered. I'll have to ask Musashi about that when I get back. Taking out his map, he poured over it, looked about him, and stared at it again. Still, there was no sign of the Yagyu mansion. The evening mist spreading over the ground gave him an eerie feeling. He'd felt something similar before, when in a room with the shoji shut, the setting sun's light played on the rice paper so that the interior seemed to grow lighter as the outside darkened. Of course, such a twilight illusion is just that but he felt it so strongly in several flashes that he rubbed his eyes as if to erase his light-headedness. He knew he wasn't daydreaming and looked around suspiciously. Why, you sneaky bastard, he cried, jumping forward and whipping out his sword. In the same motion, he cut through a clump of tall grass in front of him. With a yelp of pain, a fox leapt from its hiding place and streaked off, its tail glistening with blood from a cut on its hind quarters. Devilish beast! Iori set off in hot pursuit, and though the fox was fast, Iori was too. When the limping creature stumbled, Iori lunged, confident of victory. The fox, however, slipped nimbly away to surge ahead several yards, and no matter how fast Iori attacked, the animal managed to get away each time. On his mother's knee, Iori had heard countless tales proving beyond a shadow of a doubt that foxes had the power to bewitch and possess human beings. He was fond of most other animals, even wild boar and noisome possums, but foxes he hated. He was also afraid of them. To his way of thinking, coming across this wily creature lurking in the grass could mean only one thing— it was to blame for his not finding his way. He was convinced it was a treacherous and evil being that had been following him since the night before and had, just moments before, cast its malevolent spell over him. If he didn't slay it now, it was sure to hex him again. Iori was prepared to pursue his quarry to the end of the earth, but the fox, bounding over the edge of a drop, was lost to sight in a thicket. Dew glistened on the flowers of the dog nettle and spiderwort. Exhausted and parched, Iori sank down and licked the moisture from a mint leaf. Shoulders heaving, he finally caught his breath, whereupon sweat poured copiously from his forehead. His heart thumped violently. Where did it go? he asked, his voice halfway between a scream and a choke. If the fox had really gone, so much the better. But Iori didn't know what to believe. Since he had injured the animal, he felt it was certain to take revenge one way or another. Resigning himself, he sat still and waited. Just as he was beginning to feel calmer, an eerie sound floated to his ears. Wide-eyed, he looked around. It's the fox, for sure, he said, steeling himself against being bewitched. Rising quickly, he moistened his eyebrows with saliva, a trick thought to ward off the influence of foxes. A short distance away, 
A woman came floating through the evening mist, her face half hidden by a veil of silk gauze. She was riding a horse, side saddle, the reins lying loosely across the low pommel. The saddle was made of lacquered wood with mother-of-pearl inlay. It's changed into a woman, thought Iori. This vision in a veil, playing a flute and silhouetted against the thin rays of the evening sun, could by no stretch of the imagination be a creature of this world. As he squatted in the grass like a frog, Iori heard an otherworldly voice call, Otsu! and was sure it had come from one of the fox's companions. The rider had nearly reached the turnoff, where a road diverged to the south, and the upper part of her body glowed reddish. The sun, sinking behind the hills of Shibuya, was fringed by clouds. If he killed her, he could expose her true fox form. Iori tightened his grip on the sword and braced himself, thinking, Lucky it doesn't know I'm hiding here. Like all those acquainted with the truth about foxes, he knew the animal's spirit would be situated a few feet behind its human form. He swallowed hard in anticipation, while waiting for the vision to proceed and make the turn to the south. But when the horse reached the turnoff, the woman stopped playing, put her flute in a cloth wrapper, and tucked it into her obi. Lifting her veil, she peered about with searching eyes. Otsu! the voice called again. A pleasant smile came to her face as she called back, Here I am, Hyogo, up here. Iori watched as a samurai came up the road from the valley. Oh, oh, he gasped when he noticed that the man walked with a slight limp. This was the fox he had wounded, no doubt about it. Disguised not as a beautiful temptress, but as a handsome samurai. The apparition terrified Iori. He shivered violently and wet himself. After the woman and the samurai had exchanged a few words, the samurai took hold of the horse's bit and led it right past the place where Iori was hiding. Now's the time, he decided, but his body would not respond. The samurai noticed a slight motion and looked around, his gaze falling squarely on Iori's petrified face. The light from the samurai's eyes seemed more brilliant than the edge of the setting sun. Iori prostrated himself and buried his face in the grass. Never in his entire fourteen years had he experienced such terror. Hyogo, seeing nothing alarming about the boy, walked on. The slope was steep, and he had to lean back to keep the horse in check. Looking over his shoulder at Otsu, he asked gently, Why are you so late? You've been gone a long time just to have ridden to the shrine and back. My uncle got worried and sent me to look for you. Without answering, Otsu jumped down from the horse. Hyogo stopped. Why are you getting off? Something wrong? No, but it's not fitting for a woman to ride when a man's walking. Let's walk together. We can both hold the bit. She took her place on the other side of the horse. They descended into the darkening valley and passed a sign reading, Sendangen Academy for Priests of the Sodo Zen Sect. The sky was filling with stars, and the Shibuya River could be heard in the distance. The river divided the valley into North Higakubo and South Higakubo. Since the school, established by the monk Lintatsu, lay on the north slope, the priests were casually referred to as the Fellows of the North. The Fellows of the South were the men studying swordsmanship under Yagyu Munenori, whose establishment was directly across the valley. As Yagyu Sekshusai's favorite among his sons and grandsons, Yagyu Hyogo enjoyed a special status among the Fellows of the South. He had also distinguished himself in his own right. At the age of twenty, he had been summoned by the famous general Kato Kiyomasa and given a position at Kumamoto Castle in Higo Province at a stipend of 15,000 bushels. This was unheard of for a man so young, but after the Battle of Sekigahara, 
Hyogo began to have second thoughts about his status because of the danger inherent in having to side with either the Tokugawas or the Osaka faction. Three years earlier, using his grandfather's illness as a pretext, he had taken a leave of absence from Kumamoto and returned to Yamato. After that, saying he needed more training, he had traveled about the countryside for a time. He and Otsu had been thrown together by chance the previous year, when he had come to stay with his uncle. For more than three years prior to that, Otsu had led a precarious existence, never quite able to escape from Matahachi, who had dragged her along everywhere, glibly telling prospective employers that she was his wife. Had he been willing to work as an apprentice to a carpenter or a plasterer or a stonemason, he could have found employment on the day they arrived in Edo, but he preferred to imagine they could work together at softer jobs, she as a domestic servant, perhaps, he as a clerk or accountant. Finding no takers for his services, they had managed to survive by doing odd jobs. And as the months passed, Otsu, hoping to lull her tormentor into complacency, had given in to him in every way short of surrendering her body. Then one day, they had been walking along the street when they encountered a daimyo's procession. Along with everyone else, they moved to the side of the road and assumed a properly respectful attitude. The palanquins and lacquered strong boxes bore the Yagyu crest. Otsu had raised her eyes enough to see this, and memories of Sekishusai and the happy days at Koyagyu Castle flooded her heart. If only she were back in that peaceful land of Yamato now. With Matahachi at her side, she could only stare blankly after the passing retinue. Otsu, isn't that you? The conical sedge hat came lower over the samurai's face, but as he drew closer, Otsu had seen that it was Kimura Skekuro, a man she remembered with affection and respect. She couldn't have been more amazed or thankful if he had been the Buddha himself, surrounded by the wondrous light of infinite compassion. Slipping away from Matahachi's side, she had hurried to Skekuro, who promptly offered to take her home with him. When Matahachi had opened his mouth to protest, Skekuro said peremptorily, If you have anything to say, come to Higakubo and say it there. Powerless before the prestigious house of Yagyu, Matahachi held his tongue, biting his lower lip in angry frustration as he suddenly watched his precious treasure escape from him. An Urgent Letter At thirty-eight, Yagyu Munenori was regarded as the best swordsman of them all. This hadn't kept his father from constantly worrying about his fifth son. If only he can control that little quirk of his, he often said to himself. Or, can anybody that self-willed manage to keep a high position? It was now fourteen years since Tokugawa Ieyasu had commanded Sekishusai to provide a tutor for Hidetada. Sekishusai had passed over his other sons, grandsons, and nephews, Munenori was neither particularly brilliant nor heroically masculine, but he was a man of good, solid judgment, a practical man not likely to get lost in the clouds. He possessed neither his father's towering stature nor Hyogo's genius, but he was reliable, and most important, he understood the cardinal principle of the Yagyu style, namely, that the true value of the art of war lay in its application to government. Sekshusai had not misinterpreted Ieyasu's wishes. The conquering general had no use for a swordsman to teach his heir only technical skills. Some years before Sekigahara, Ieyasu himself had studied under a master swordsman named Okuyama, his objective being, as he himself frequently expressed it, to acquire the eye needed to oversee the country. Still, Hidetada was now shogun, 
and it would not do for the shogun's instructor to be a man who lost in actual combat. A samurai in Munenori's position was expected to excel over all challengers and to demonstrate that Yagyu swordsmanship was second to none. Munenori felt he was constantly being scrutinized and tested, and while others might regard him as lucky to have been singled out for this distinguished appointment, he himself often envied Hyogo and wished he could live the way his nephew did. Hyogo, as it happened, was now walking down the outside passageway leading to his uncle's room. The house, though large and sprawling, was neither stately in appearance nor lavish in its appointments. Instead of employing carpenters from Kyoto to create an elegant, graceful dwelling, Munenori had deliberately entrusted the work to local builders, men accustomed to the sturdy Spartan warrior style of Kamakura. Though the trees were relatively sparse and the hills of no great height, Munenori had chosen the solid rustic style of architecture exemplified by the old main house at Koyagyu. Uncle, called Hyogo softly and politely as he knelt on the veranda outside Munenori's room. Is that you, Hyogo? asked Munenori without removing his eyes from the garden. May I come in? Having received permission to enter, Hyogo made his way into the room on his knees. He had taken quite a few liberties with his grandfather, who was inclined to spoil him, but he knew better than to do that with his uncle. Munenori, though no martinet, was a stickler for etiquette. Now, as always, he was seated in strict formal fashion. At times, Hyogo felt sorry for him. Otsu? asked Munenori, as though reminded of her by Hyogo's arrival. She's back. She'd only gone to Hikawa Shrine, the way she often does. On the way back, she let her horse wander around for a while. You went looking for her? Yes, sir. Munenori remained silent for a few moments. The lamplight accented his tight-lipped profile. It worries me to have a young woman living here indefinitely. You never know what might happen. I've told Skekuro to look for an opportunity to suggest she go elsewhere. His tone slightly plaintive, Hyogo said. I'm told she has no place to go. His uncle's change of attitude surprised him, for when Skekuro had brought Otsu home and introduced her as a woman who had served Sekishusai well, Munenori had welcomed her cordially and said she was free to stay as long as she wished. Don't you feel sorry for her? he asked. Yes, but there's a limit to what you can do for people. I thought you yourself thought well of her. It has nothing to do with that. When a young woman comes to live in a house full of young men, tongues are apt to wag. And it's difficult for the men. One of them might do something rash. This time Hyogo was silent, but not because he took his uncle's remarks personally. He was thirty and, like the other young samurai, single, but he firmly believed his own feelings toward Otsu were too pure to raise doubts about his intentions. He had been careful to allay his uncle's misgivings by making no secret of his fondness for her, while at the same time not once letting on that his feeling went beyond friendship. Hyogo felt that the problem might lie with his uncle. Munenori's wife came from a highly respected and well-placed family, of the sort whose daughters were delivered to their husbands on their wedding day in curtained palanquins, lest they be seen by outsiders. Her chambers, together with those of the other women, were well removed from the more public parts of the house, so virtually no one knew whether relations between the master and his wife were harmonious. It was not difficult to imagine that the lady of the house might take a dim view of beautiful and eligible young women in such proximity to her husband. Hyogo broke the silence, saying, Leave the matter to Skekuro and me. 
We'll work out some solution that won't be too hard on Otsu. Munenori nodded, saying, The sooner, the better. Skekuro entered the anteroom just then, and placing a letter box on the tatami, knelt and bowed. Your lordship, he said respectfully. Turning his eyes toward the anteroom, Munenori asked, What is it? Skekuro moved forward on his knees. A courier from Koyagyu has just arrived by fast horse. Fast horse, said Munenori quickly, but without surprise. Hyogo accepted the box from Skekuro and handed it to his uncle. Munenori opened the letter, which was from Shoda Kizaemon. Written in haste, it said, The old lord has had another spell, worse than any previous. We fear he may not last long. He stoutly insists his illness is not sufficient reason for you to leave your duties. However, after discussing the matter among ourselves, we retainers decided to write and inform you of the situation. His condition is critical, said Munenori. Hyogo admired his uncle's ability to remain calm. He surmised that Munenori knew exactly what was to be done and had already made the necessary decisions. After some minutes of silence, Munenori said, Hyogo, will you go to Koyagyu in my stead? Of course, sir. I want you to assure my father there's nothing to worry about in Edo, and I want you to look after him personally. Yes, sir. I suppose it's all in the hands of the gods and the Buddha now. All you can do is hurry and try to get there before it's too late. I'll leave tonight. From Lord Munenori's room, Hyogo went immediately to his own. During the short time it took him to lay out the few things he would need, the bad news spread to every corner of the house. Otsu quietly went to Hyogo's room, dressed, to his surprise, for traveling. Her eyes were moist. Please take me with you, she pleaded. I can never hope to repay Lord Sikshusai for taking me into his home, but I'd like to be with him and see if I can be of some assistance. I hope you won't refuse. Hyogo considered it possible that his uncle might have refused her, but he himself did not have the heart to. Perhaps it was a blessing that this opportunity to take her away from the house in Edo had presented itself. All right, he agreed but it'll have to be a fast journey. I promise I won't slow you down. Drawing her tears, she helped him finish packing and then went to pay her respects to Lord Munenori. Oh, are you going to accompany Hyogo? He said, mildly surprised. That's very kind of you. I'm sure my father will be pleased to see you. He made a point of giving her ample travel money and a new kimono as a going-away present. Despite his conviction that it was for the best, her departure saddened him. She bowed herself out of his presence. Take good care of yourself, he said with feeling, as she reached the anteroom. The vassals and servants lined up along the path to the gate to see them off, and with a simple, Farewell! From Hyogo, they were on their way. Otsu had folded her kimono up under her obi, so the hem reached only five or six inches below her knees. On her head was a broad-brimmed, lacquered traveling hat, and in her right hand she carried a stick. Had her shoulders been draped with blossoms, she would have been the image of the wisteria girl so often seen in woodblock prints. Since Hyogo had decided to hire conveyances at the stations along the high road, their goal tonight was the inn town of Sangenya, south of Shibuya. From there, his plan was to proceed along the Oyama High Road to the Tama River, take the ferry across, and follow the Tokaido to Kyoto. In the night mist, it was not long before Otsu's lacquered hat glistened with moisture. After walking through a grassy river valley, they came to a rather wide road, which, since the Kamakura period, had been one of the most important in the Kanto district. 
At night, it was lonely and deserted, with trees growing thickly on both sides. Gloomy, isn't it? said Hyogo with a smile, again slowing down his naturally long strides to let Otsu catch up with him. This is Dogen Slope. There used to be bandits around here, he added. Bandits? There was just enough alarm in her voice to make him laugh. That was a long time ago, though. A man by the name of Dogen Taro, who was related to the rebel Wada Yoshimori, is supposed to have been the head of a band of thieves who lived in the caves around here. Let's not talk about things like that. Kyogo's laughter echoed through the dark, and hearing it made him feel guilty for acting frivolous. He couldn't help himself, however. Though sad, he looked forward with pleasure to being with Otsu these next few days. Oh! cried Otsu, taking a couple of steps backward. What's the matter? Instinctively, Hyogo's arm went around her shoulders. There's somebody over there. Where? It's a child, sitting there by the side of the road, talking to himself and crying. The poor thing. When Hyogo got close enough, he recognized the boy he had seen earlier that evening, hiding in the grass in Azabu. Iori leaped to his feet with a gasp. An instant later, he uttered an oath and pointed his sword at Hyogo. Fox! he cried. That's what you are, a fox! Otsu caught her breath and stifled a scream. The look on Iori's face was wild, almost demonic, as if he were possessed by an evil spirit. Even Hyogo drew back cautiously. Foxes! Iori shouted again. I'll take care of you! His voice cracked hoarsely, like an old woman's. Hyogo stared at him in puzzlement, but was careful to steer clear of his blade. How's this? shouted Iori, whacking off the top of a tall shrub not far from Hyogo's side. Then he sank to the ground, exhausted by his effort. Breathing hard, he asked, What did you think of that, fox? Turning to Otsu, Hyogo said with a grin, Poor little fellow, he seems to be possessed by a fox. Maybe you're right. His eyes are ferocious. Just like a fox's. Isn't there something we can do to help him? Well, they say there's no cure for either madness or stupidity, but I suspect there's a remedy for his ailment. He walked up to Iori and glared sternly at him. Glancing up, the boy hastily gripped his sword again. Still here, are you? he cried. But before he could get to his feet, his ears were assailed by a fierce roar coming from the pit of Hyogo's stomach. Yeah! Yuri was scared witless. Hyogo picked him up by the waist and, holding him horizontally, strode back down the hill to the bridge. He turned the boy upside down, grasped him by the ankles, and held him out over the railing. Help! Mother! Help! Help! Sensei! Save me! The screams gradually changed to a wail. Otsu hastened to the rescue. Stop that, Hyogo! Let him go! You shouldn't be so cruel! I guess that's enough, said Hyogo, setting the boy down gently on the bridge. Iori was in a terrible state, bawling and choking, convinced there was not a soul on earth who could help him. Otsu went to his side and put her arm affectionately around his drooping shoulders. Where do you live, child? she asked softly. Between sobs, Iori stammered, oh, Over the, the, that way, and pointed. What do you mean, that way? Ba, ba, Bakurocho? Why, that's miles away. How did you get all the way out here? I came on an errand. I got lost. When was that? I left Bakurocho yesterday. And you've been wandering around all night and all day? Iori half shook his head, but didn't say anything. Why, that's terrible. Tell me, where were you supposed to go? A little calmer now, he replied promptly, as though he'd been waiting for the question. To the residence of Lord Yagyu Munenori of Tajima. After feeling around under his obi, he clutched the crumpled letter and waved it proudly in front of his face.
Bringing it close to his eyes, he said, It's for Kimura Skekuro. I'm to deliver it and wait for an answer. Otsu saw that Iori took his mission very seriously and was ready to guard the missive with his life. Iori, for his part, was determined to show the letter to no one before he reached his destination. Neither had any inkling of the irony of the situation. A mischance, a happening rarer than the coming together across the river of heaven of the herd boy and the spinning maiden. Turning to Hyogo, Otsu said, He seems to have a letter for Skekuro. He's wandered off in the wrong direction, hasn't he? Fortunately, it's not very far. Calling Iori to him, he gave him directions. Go along this river to the first crossroads, then go left and up the hill. When you get to a place where three roads come together, you'll see a pair of large pine trees off to your right. The house is to the left, across the road. And watch out you don't get possessed by a fox again, added Otsu. Iori had regained his confidence. Thanks, he called back, already running along the river. When he reached the crossroads, he half-turned and shouted, To the left here? That's it, answered Hyogo. The road's dark, so be careful. He and Otsu stood watching from the bridge for a minute or two. What a strange child! he said. Yes, but he seems rather bright. In her mind, she was comparing him with Jotaro, who had been only a little bigger than Iori when she had last seen him. Jotaro, she reflected, must be seventeen now. She wondered what he was like, and felt an inevitable pang of yearning for Musashi. So many years since she'd had any word of him. Though now accustomed to living with the suffering that love entails, she dared hope that leaving Edo might bring her closer to him, that she might even meet him somewhere along the road. Let's get on, Hyogo said brusquely, to himself as much as to Otsu. There's nothing to be done about tonight, but we'll have to be careful not to waste any more time. Filial Piety what are you doing, Granny? Practicing your handwriting? Judo, the reed mat's expression, was ambiguous. It might have been admiration or simply shock. Oh, it's you, said Osugi with a trace of annoyance. Sitting down beside her, Judo mumbled, Copying a Buddhist sutra, aren't you? This elicited no reply. Aren't you old enough so you don't have to practice your writing anymore? Or are you thinking of becoming a calligraphy teacher in the next world? Be quiet. To copy the holy scriptures, one has to achieve a state of selflessness. Solitude is best for that. Why don't you go away? After I hurried home just to tell you what happened to me today? It can wait. When will you be finished? I have to put the spirit of the Buddha's enlightenment into each character I write. It takes me three days to make one copy. You've got a lot of patience. Three days is nothing. This summer I'm going to make dozens of copies. I've made a vow to make a thousand before I die. I'll leave them to people who don't have proper love for their parents. A thousand copies? That's a lot. It's my sacred vow. Well... I'm not very proud of it, but I guess I've been disrespectful to my parents, like the rest of these louts around here. They forgot about them a long time ago. The only one who cares for his mother and father is the boss. It's a sad world we live in. Aha! Uh -huh. If it upsets you that much, you must have a good-for-nothing son, too. I'm sorry to say mine has caused me a lot of grief. That's why I took the vow. This is the Sutra on the Great Love of Parents. Everyone who doesn't treat his mother or father right should be forced to read it. You're really giving a copy of whatever you call it to a thousand people? They say that by planting one seed of enlightenment, you can convert a hundred people, 
And if one sprout of enlightenment grows in a hundred hearts, ten million souls can be saved. Laying down her brush, she took a finished copy and handed it to Judo. Here, you can have this. See that you read it when you have time. She looked so pious, Judo nearly burst out laughing, but he managed to contain himself. Overcoming his urge to stuff it into his kimono like so much tissue paper, he lifted it respectfully to his forehead and placed it on his lap. Say, Granny, you sure you wouldn't like to know what happened today? Maybe your faith in the Buddha gets results. I ran into someone pretty special. Who might that be? Miyamoto Musashi. I saw him down at the Sumida River, getting off the ferry. You saw Musashi? Why didn't you say so? She pushed the writing table away with a grunt. Are you sure? Where is he now? There now, take it easy. Your old judo doesn't do things halfway. After I found out who he was, I followed him without him knowing it. He went to an inn at Bakurocho. He's staying near here? Well, it's not all that close. It may not seem that way to you, but it does to me. I've been all over the country looking for him. Springing to her feet, she went to her clothes cabinet and took out the short sword that had been in her family for generations. Take me there, she ordered. Now? Of course now. I thought you had a lot of patience, but why do you have to go now? I'm always ready to meet Musashi, even on a moment's notice. If I get killed, you can send my body back to my family in Mimasaka. Couldn't you wait until the boss comes home? If we go off like this, all I'll get for finding Musashi is a bawling out. But there's no telling when Musashi might go somewhere else. Don't worry about that. I sent a man to keep an eye on the place. Can you guarantee Musashi won't get away? What? I'd do you a favor and you want to tie me up with obligations? Oh, all right. I guarantee it. Absolutely. Look, Granny, now's the time when you should be taking it easy, sitting down copying sutras or something like that. Where is Yajibe? He's on a trip to Chichibu with his religious group. I don't know exactly when he'll be back. I can't afford to wait. If that's the way it is, why don't we get Sasaki Kojiro to come over? You can talk to him about it. The next morning, after contacting his spy, Judo informed Osugi that Musashi had moved from the inn to the house of a sword polisher. See, I told you, declared Osugi. You can't expect him to sit still in one place forever. The next thing you know, he'll be gone again. She was seated at her writing table, but hadn't written a word all morning. Musashi hasn't got wings, Judo assured her. Just be calm. Koroku's going to see Kojiro today. Today? Didn't you send somebody last night? Tell me where he lives. I'll go myself. She started getting ready to go out, but Judo suddenly disappeared, and she had to ask a couple of the other henchmen for directions. Having seldom left the house during her more than two years in Edo, she was quite unfamiliar with the city. Kojiro's living with Iwama Kakube, she was told. Kakube is a vassal of the Hosokawas, but his own house is on the Takanawa High Road. It's about halfway up Isarago Hill. Anybody can tell you where that is. If you have any difficulty, ask for Tsukinomisaki. That's another name for Isarago Hill. The house is easy to recognize because the gate is painted bright red. It's the only place around there with a red gate. All right, I understand, said Osugi impatiently, resenting the implication that she was senile or stupid. It doesn't sound difficult, so I'll just be on my way. Take care of things while I'm out. Be careful about fire. We don't want the place to burn down while Yajibe's away. Having put on her zori, she checked to make sure her short sword was at her side, took a firm grip on her staff, and marched off. A few minutes later, Judo reappeared and asked where she was. She asked us how to get to Kakube's house and went out by herself. Oh, well, what can you do with a pig-headed old woman? 
Then he shouted in the direction of the men's quarters, Koroku! The acolyte abandoned his gambling and answered the summons post-haste. You were going to see Kojiro last night, then you put it off. Now look what's happened. The old woman's gone by herself. So? When the boss gets back, she'll blab to him. You're right. And with that tongue of hers, she'll make us look real bad. Yeah. If she could only walk as well as she talks, but she's thin as a grasshopper. If she gets run into by a horse, that'll be the end of her. I hate to ask you, but you better go after her and see she gets there in one piece. Kuroko ran off, and Judo, ruminating on the absurdity of it all, appropriated a corner of the young men's room. It was a big room, perhaps thirty by forty feet. The floor was covered with thin, finely woven matting, and a wide variety of swords and other weapons were lying about. Hanging from nails were hand towels, kimono underwear, fire hats, and other items of the sort a band of ne'er do wells might require. There were two incongruous articles. One was a woman's kimono in bright colors with a red silk lining. The other was the gold lacquered mirror stand over which it was suspended. They had been placed there on the instructions of Kojiro, who explained to Yajibe, somewhat mysteriously, that if a group of men lived together in one room with no feminine touch, they were apt to get out of hand and fight each other, rather than save their energies for meaningful battles. You're cheating, you son of a bitch! Who's cheating? You're not! Judo cast a disdainful look at the gamblers and lay down with his legs crossed comfortably. With all the rumpus going on, sleep was out of the question but he wasn't going to demean himself by joining one of the card or dice games. No competition, as he saw it. As he closed his eyes, he heard a dejected voice say, It's no good today. No luck at all. The loser, with the sad eyes of the utterly defeated, dropped a pillow on the floor and stretched out beside Judo. They were joined by another, then another, and another. What's this? asked one of them, reaching out for the sheet of paper that had fallen from Judo's kimono. Well, I'll be... It's a sutra. Now what would a mean cuss like you be carrying a sutra for? Judo opened one sleepy eye and said lazily, Oh, that? It's something the old woman copied. She said she'd sworn to make a thousand of them. Let me see it, said another man, making a grab for it. What do you know? It's written out nice and clear. Why, anybody could read it. Does that mean you think you can read it? Of course. It's child's play. All right, then. Let's hear some of it. Put a nice tune to it. Chant it like a priest. Are you joking? It's not a popular song. What difference does that make? A long time ago, they used to sing sutras. That's how Buddhist hymns got started. You know a hymn when you hear one, don't you? You can't chant these words to the tune of a hymn. Well, use any tune you like. You sing, Judo. Encouraged by the enthusiasm of the others, Judo, still lying on his back, opened the sutra above his face and began. The Sutra on the Great Love of Parents Thus have I heard once when the Buddha was on the sacred vulture peak, in the city of royal palaces, preaching to bodhisattvas and disciples, there gathered a multitude of monks and nuns and lay believers, both male and female. All the people of all the heavens, dragon gods and demons to hear the 
sacred love. Around the jeweled throne they gathered and gazed with unwavering eyes at the holy face. What's all that mean? When it says nuns, does it mean the girls we call nuns? You know, I heard some of the nuns from Yoshiwara have started powdering their faces gray and will give it to you for less than in the whorehouses. Quiet! At this time the Buddha preached the law as follows. All ye good men and good women, acknowledge your debt for your father's compassion. Acknowledge your debt for your mother's mercy. For the life of a human being in this world has karma as its basic cause. But parents as its immediate means of origin. It's just talking about being good to your mama and daddy. You've already heard it a million times. Shh! Sing some more. We'll be quiet. Without a father... The child is not born. Without a mother, the child is not nourished. The spirit comes from the father's seed. The body grows within the mother's Judo paused to rearrange himself and pick his nose, then resumed. Because of these relationships, the concern of a mother for her child is without comparison in this world. Noticing how silent the others were, Judo asked, Are you listening? Yes, go on. From the time when she receives the child in her womb, during the passage of nine months, going, coming, sitting, sleeping, she is visited by suffering. She ceases to have her customary love for food or drink or clothing and worry solely about a safe delivery. I'm tired, complained Judo. That's enough, isn't it? No, keep singing. We're listening. The months are full and the days sufficient. At the time of birth, 
The winds of karma hasten it on. Her bones are racked with pain. The father too trembles and is afraid. Relatives and servants worry and are distressed. When the child is born and dropped upon the grass, the boundless joy of the father and mother match that of a penurious woman who has found the omnipotent magic jewel. When the child utters its first sounds, the mother feels that she herself is born anew. Her chest becomes the child's place of rest, her knees its playground, her breasts its source of food, her love its very life. Without its mother, the child cannot dress or undress. Though the mother hungers, she takes the food from her own mouth and gives it to her child. Without the mother, the child cannot be nourished. What's the matter? Why do you stop? Wait a minute, will you? Will you look at that? He's crying like a baby. Aw, oh, shut up. It had all begun as an idle way to pass the time, almost a joke, but the meaning of the words of the sutra was sinking in. Three or four others besides the reader had unsmiling faces, their eyes a faraway look. The mother goes to the neighboring village to work. She draws water, builds the fire, pounds the grain, makes the flower. At night when she returns, before she reaches the house, she hears the babies crying and is filled with love. Her chest heaves, her heart cries out, the milk flows forth, she cannot bear it. She runs to the house, the baby seeing its mother approach from afar, works its brain, shakes its head, and wails for her. She bends her body, takes the child's two hands, places her lips upon its lips, 
There is no greater love than this. When the child is two, he leaves the mother's breast. But without his father, he would not know that fire can burn. Without his mother, he would not know that a knife can cut off fingers. When he is three, he is weaned and learns to eat. Without his father, he would not know that poison can kill. Without his mother, he would not know that medicine cures. When the parents go to other houses and are presented with marvelous delicacies, they do not eat but put the food in their pockets and take it home for the child to make him rejoice. You blubbering again. I can't help it. I just remembered something. Cut it out. You'll have me doing it, too. Sentimentality with regard to parents was strictly taboo among these denizens of society's outer edge, for to express filial affection was to invite charges of weakness, effeminacy, or worse. But it would have done Osugi's aging heart good to see them now. The sutra reading, possibly because of the simplicity of the language, had reached the core of their being. Is that all? Isn't there any more? There's lots more. Well, wait a minute, will you? Judo stood up, blew his nose loudly, and sat down to intone the rest. The child grows. The father brings cloth to clothe him. The mother combs his locks. The parents give every beautiful thing they possess to him. Keeping for themselves only that which is old and worn. The child takes a bride and brings the stranger into the house. The parents become more distant, the new husband and wife are intimate with each other, they stay in their own room, talking happily with each other. That's the way it works, all right, broke in a voice. The parents grow old. Their spirits weaken. Their strength diminishes. They have only the child to depend on. 
only his wife to do things for them. But the child no longer comes to them, neither at night nor in the daytime. Their room is cold. There is no more pleasant talk. They are like lonely guests at an inn. A crisis arises, and they call their child. Nine times in ten he comes not, nor does he serve them. He grows angry and reviles them, saying it would be better to die than to linger on unwanted in this world. The parents listen, and their hearts are filled with rage. Weeping, they say, when you were young, without us you would not have been born. Without us you could not have grown. Ah, uh, how we... Judo broke off abruptly and threw the text aside. I... I can't. Somebody else read it but there was no one to take his place. Lying on their backs, sprawled out on their bellies, sitting with their legs crossed and their heads drooping between their knees, they were as tearful as lost children. Into the middle of this unlikely scene walked Sasaki Kojiro. Spring Shower in Red Isn't Yajibe here? Kojiro asked loudly. The gamblers were so absorbed in their play and the weepers in their memories of childhood that no one replied. Going over to Judo, who was lying on his back with his arms over his eyes, Kojiro said, May I ask what's going on? Oh, I didn't know it was you, sir. There was a hasty wiping of eyes and blowing of noses as Judo and the others pulled themselves to their feet and bowed sheepishly to their sword instructor. Are you crying? he asked. Uh, yes. I mean, no. You're an odd one. While the others drifted off, Judo began telling about his chance encounter with Musashi, happy to have a subject that might distract Kojiro's attention from the state of the young men's room. Since the boss is away, he said, we didn't know what to do, so Osugi decided to go and talk to you. Kojiro's eyes flared brightly. Musashi's putting up at an inn in Bakurocho? He was, but now he's staying at Zushino Kosuke's house. That's an interesting coincidence. Is it? It just happens I sent my drawing pole to Zushino to work on. As a matter of fact, it should be ready now. I came this way today to pick it up. You've been there already? Not yet. I thought I'd drop in here for a few minutes first. That's lucky. If you'd showed up suddenly, Musashi might have attacked you. I'm not afraid of him. But how can I confer with the old lady when she's not here? I don't imagine she's reached Isarago yet. I'll send a good runner to bring her back. At the council of war held that evening, Kojiro expressed the opinion that there was no reason to wait for Yajibe's return. He himself would serve as Osugi's second, so that she might, at long last, take her proper revenge. Judo and Koroku asked to go along too, more for the honor than to help. Though aware of Musashi's reputation as a fighter, they never imagined he might be a match for their brilliant instructor. 
Nothing could be done tonight, however. For all her enthusiasm, Osugi was dead tired and complained of a backache. They decided they would carry out their plan the following night. The next afternoon, Osugi bathed under cold water, blackened her teeth, and dyed her hair. At twilight, she made her preparations for battle, first donning a white underrobe she had bought to be buried in and had carried around with her for years. She had had it stamped for good luck at every shrine and temple she visited, Sumiyoshi Shrine in Osaka, Oyama Hachiman Shrine, and Kiyomizudera in Kyoto, the Kannon Temple in Asakusa, and dozens of less prominent religious establishments in various parts of the country. The sacred imprints made the robe resemble a tie-dyed kimono. Osugi felt safer than she would have in a suit of mail. She carefully tucked a letter to Matahachi into the sash under her obi, together with a copy of the Sutra on the Great Love of Parents. There was also a second letter, which she always carried in a small money pouch. This said, Though I am old, it has become my lot to wander about the country in an effort to realize one great hope. There is no way of knowing but that I may be slain by my sworn enemy or die of illness by the wayside. Should this be my fate, I ask the officials and people of goodwill to use the money in this purse to send my body home. Sugi, widow of Hongiden, Yoshino Village, Mimasaka Province. With her sword in place, her shins wrapped in white leggings, fingerless gloves on her hands, and a blind-stitched obi snugly holding her sleeveless kimono in place, her preparations were nearly complete. Placing a bowl of water on her writing table, she knelt before it and said, I'm going now. She then closed her eyes and sat motionless, addressing her thoughts to Uncle Gong. Judo opened the shoji a crack and peeked in. Are you ready? he asked. It's about time we were leaving. Kojiro's waiting. I'm ready. Joining the others, she went to the place of honor they had left open for her before the alcove. The acolyte took a cup from the table, put it in Osugi's hand, and carefully poured her a cupful of sake. Then he did the same for Kojiro and Judo. When each of the four had drunk, they extinguished the lamp and set forth. Quite a few of the Hangawara men clamored to be taken along, but Kojiro refused, since a large group would not only attract attention, but encumber them in a fight. As they were going out the gate, one young man called to them to wait. He then struck sparks from a flint to wish them luck. Outside, under a sky murky with rain clouds, nightingales were singing. As they made their way through the dark, silent streets, dogs started barking, set off, perhaps, by some instinctive sense that these four human beings were on a sinister mission. What's that? Koroku asked, staring back along a narrow lane. Did you see something? Somebody's following us. Probably one of the fellows from the house, said Kojiro. They were all so eager to come with us. They'd rather brawl than eat. They turned a corner, and Kojiro stopped under the eaves of a house, saying, Kosuke's shop's around here, isn't it? Their voices dropped to whispers. Down the street there, on the other side. What do we do now? asked Koroku. Proceed according to plan. The three of you hide in the shadows. I'll go to the shop. What if Musashi tries to sneak out the back door? Don't worry. He's no more likely to run away from me than I am from him. If he ran away, he'd be finished as a swordsman. Maybe we should position ourselves on opposite sides of the house anyway, just in case. All right. Now, as we agreed, I'll bring Musashi outside and walk along with him. When we get near Osugi, I'll draw my sword and take him by surprise. That's the time for her to come out and strike. Osugi was beside herself with gratitude. Thank you, Kojiro. You're so good to me. You must be an incarnation of the great Hachiman. She clasped her hands and bowed, as if before the god of war himself. In his heart, Kojiro was thoroughly convinced that he was doing the right thing. Indeed, 
It is doubtful that ordinary mortals could imagine the vastness of his self-righteousness at the moment he stepped up to Koske's door. At the beginning, when Musashi and Kojiro had been very young, full of spirit and eager to demonstrate their superiority, there had existed no deep-seated cause for enmity between them. There had been rivalry, to be sure, but only the friction that normally arose between two strong and almost equally matched fighters. What had subsequently rankled with Kojiro was seeing Musashi gradually gaining fame as a swordsman. Musashi, for his part, respected Kojiro's extraordinary skill, if not his character, and always treated him with a certain amount of caution. As the years passed, however, they found themselves at odds over various matters. The house of Yoshioka, the fate of Akemi, the affair of the Hongiden Dowager. Conciliation was by now out of the question. And now that Kojiro had taken it upon himself to become Osugi's protector, the trend of events bore the unmistakable seal of fate. Kosuke! Kojiro rapped lightly on the door. Are you awake? Light seeped through a crack, but there was no other sign of life inside. After a few moments, a voice asked, Who's there? Iwama Kakube gave you my sword to work on. I've come for it. The great long one, is that the one? Open up and let me in. Just a moment. The door slid open and the two men eyed each other. Blocking the way, Kosuke said curtly, The sword's not ready yet. I see. Kojiro brushed past Kosuke and seated himself on the step leading up to the shop. When will it be ready? Well, let's see. Kosuke rubbed his chin pulling the corners of his eyes down and making his long face seem even longer. Kojiro had the feeling he was being made fun of. Don't you think it's taking an awful long time? I told Kakube very clearly I couldn't promise when I'd finish. I can't do without it much longer. In that case, take it back. What's this? Kojiro was taken aback. Artisans didn't talk that way to samurai. But instead of trying to ascertain what might be behind the man's attitude, he jumped to the conclusion that his visit had been anticipated. Thinking it best to act quickly, he said, By the way, I heard Miyamoto Musashi from Mimasaka is staying here with you. Where did you hear that? Kosuke said, looking anxious. As it happens, he is staying with us. Would you mind calling him? I haven't seen him for a long time since we were both in Kyoto. What's your name? Sasaki Kojiro. He'll know who I am. I'll tell him you're here, but I don't know whether he can see you or not. Just a moment. Yes? Perhaps I'd better explain. I happened to hear at Lord Hosokawa's house that a man of Musashi's description was living here. I came with the idea of inviting Musashi out to drink a little and talk a little. I see. Kosuke turned and went toward the back of the house. Kojiro mulled over what to do if Musashi smelled a rat and refused to see him. Two or three stratagems came to mind, but before he had come to a decision, he was startled by a horrendous howling scream. He jumped like a man who had been savagely kicked. He had miscalculated. His strategy had been seen through, not only seen through, but turned against him. Musashi must have sneaked out the back door, gone around to the front and attacked. But who had screamed? Osugi? Juro? Koroku? If that's the way it is, thought Kojiro grimly, as he ran out into the street. Muscles taut, blood racing, in an instant he was ready for anything. I have to fight him sooner or later anyway he thought. He had known this since that day at the pass on Mount Hie. The time had come. If Osugi had already been struck down, Kojiro swore that Musashi's blood would become an offering for the eternal peace of her soul. He had covered about ten paces when he heard his name called from the side of the road. The painfully forced voice seemed to clutch at his running footsteps. Koroku, is that you? Uh, I... 
I've been, been hit. Judo, where's Judo? Him too. Where is he? Before the answer came, Kojiro spotted Judo's blood-soaked form about thirty feet away. His entire body bristling with vigilance for his own safety, he thundered, Koroku, which way did Musashi go? No, not Musashi. Koroku, unable to lift his head, rolled it from side to side. What are you saying? Are you telling me it wasn't Musashi who attacked you? Not, not Musa. Who was it? It was a question Koroku would never answer. His thoughts in a turmoil, Kojiro ran to Judo and pulled him up by the red, sticky collar of his kimono. Judo, tell me, who did it? Which way did he go? But Judo, instead of answering, used his last tearful breath to say, Mother, sorry, shouldn't have. What are you talking about? snorted Kojiro, letting go of the bloody garment. Kojiro! Kujiro, is that you? Running in the direction of Osugi's voice, he saw the old woman lying helpless in a ditch, straw and vegetable peelings clinging to her face and hair. Get me out of here, she pleaded. What are you doing in that filthy water? Kojiro, sounding more angry than sympathetic, yanked her unceremoniously out onto the road, where she collapsed like a rag. Where did the man go? she asked taking the words out of his mouth. What man? Who attacked you? I don't know exactly what happened, but I'm sure it was the man who was following us. Did he attack suddenly? Yes, out of nowhere, like a gust of wind. There was no time to speak. He jumped out of the shadows and got judo first. By the time Koroku drew his sword, he was wounded too. Which way did he go? He shoved me aside so I didn't even see him, but the footsteps went that way. She pointed toward the river. Running across a vacant lot where the horse market was held, Kojiro came to the dike at Yanagihara and stopped to look around. Some distance away, he could see piles of lumber, lights, and people. When he got closer, he saw they were palanquin bearers. My two companions have been struck down in a side street near here, he said. I want you to pick them up and take them to the house of Hangawara Yajibe in the carpenter's district. You'll find an old woman with them. Take her, too. Were they attacked by robbers? Are there robbers around here? Packs of them. Even we have to be careful. Whoever it was must have come running out from that corner over there. Didn't you see anyone? Just now, you mean? Yes. I'm leaving, said the bearer. He and the others picked up three palanquins and prepared to depart. What about the fair? asked one. Collect it when you get there. Kojiro made a quick search of the riverbank and around the stacks of lumber, deciding as he did so that he'd do just as well to go back to Yajibe's house. There was little point in meeting Musashi without Osugi. It also seemed unwise to face the man in his present state of mind. Starting back, he came to a firebreak, along one side of which grew a row of paulonia trees. He looked at it for a minute, then as he turned away, he saw the glint of a blade among the trees. Before he knew it, half a dozen leaves fell. The sword had been aimed at his head. Yellow-livered coward! he shouted. Not me! came the reply as the sword struck out a second time from the darkness. Kojiro whirled and jumped back a full seven feet. If you're Musashi, why don't you use the proper... Before he could finish, the sword was at him again. Who are you? he shouted. Aren't you making a mistake? He dodged the third stroke successfully, and the attacker, badly winded, realized before attempting a fourth that he was wasting his effort. Changing tactics, he began inching forward with his blade extended before him. His eyes were shooting fire. Silence, he growled. There's no mistake at all. Perhaps it'll refresh your memory if you know my name. I'm Hojo Shinzo. You're one of Obata's students, aren't you? You insulted my master and killed several of my comrades. By the warrior's code, 
You're free to challenge me openly at any time. Sasaki Kojiro doesn't play hide and seek. I'll kill you. Go ahead and try. As Kojiro watched him close the distance, twelve feet, eleven, ten, he quietly loosened the upper part of his kimono and placed his right hand on his sword. Come on, he cried. The challenge caused an involuntary hesitation on Shinzo's part, a momentary wavering. Kojiro's body bent forward, his arm snapped like a bow, and there was a metallic ring. The next instant, his sword clicked sharply back into its scabbard. There had been only a thin, flashing thread of light. Shinzo was still standing, his legs spread apart. There was no sign of blood yet, but it was plain that he'd been wounded. Though his sword was still stretched out at eye level, his left hand had gone reflexively to his neck. Oh! Gasps went up on both sides of Shinzo at the same time, from Kojiro and from a man running up behind Shinzo. The sound of footsteps, together with the voices, sent Kojiro off into the darkness. What happened? cried Kosuke. He reached out to support Shinzo, only to have the full weight of the other man's body fall into his arms. Oh, this looks bad, cried Kosuke. Help! Help! Somebody! A piece of flesh no larger than a clamshell fell from Shinzo's neck. The blood gushing out soaked first Shinzo's arm, then the skirts of his kimono all the way to his feet. A Block of Wood Plunk! Another green plum fell from the tree in the dark garden outside. Musashi ignored it, if he heard it at all. In the bright but unsteady lamplight, his disheveled hair appeared heavy and bristly, lacking in natural oil and reddish in color. What a difficult child, his mother had often complained. The stubborn disposition that had so often reduced her to tears was still with him, as endearing as the scar on his head left by a large carbuncle during childhood. Memories of his mother now floated through his mind. At times, the face he was carving closely resembled hers. A few minutes earlier, Kosuke had come to the door, hesitated, and called in. Are you still working? A man named Sasaki Kojiro says he'd like to see you. He's waiting downstairs. Do you want to speak to him, or shall I tell him you've already gone to bed? Musashi had the vague impression Kosuke had repeated his message, but wasn't sure whether he himself had answered. The small table, Musashi's knees, and the floor immediately around him were littered with wood chips. He was trying to finish the image of Kannon he had promised Kosuke in exchange for the sword. His task had been made even more challenging because of a special request by Kosuke, a man of pronounced likes and dislikes. When Kosuke had first taken the ten-inch block out of a cupboard and very gently handed it to him, Musashi saw that it must have been six or seven hundred years old. Kosuke treated it like an heirloom, for it had come from an eighth-century temple at the tomb of Prince Shotoku in Shinaga. I was on a trip there, he explained, and they were repairing the old buildings— some stupid priests and carpenters were axing up the old beams for firewood. I couldn't stand seeing the wood wasted that way, so I got them to cut off this block for me. The grain was good, as was the feel of the wood to the knife, but thinking of how highly Kosuke valued his treasure made Musashi nervous. If he made a slip, he would ruin an irreplaceable piece of material. He heard a bang which sounded like the wind blowing open the gate in the garden hedge. Looking up from his work, for almost the first time since he had begun carving, he thought, Could that be Yori? And cocked his head, waiting for confirmation. What are you standing there gaping for? Kosuke shouted at his wife. Can't you see the man's badly wounded? It doesn't make any difference which room— Behind Kosuke, the men carrying Shinzo excitedly offered to help. Any spirits to wash the wound with? If there aren't, I'll go home for some. 
I'll fetch the doctor. After the commotion died down a bit, Koske said, I want to thank all of you. I think we saved his life. No more need to worry. He bowed deeply to each man as he left the house. Finally, it penetrated Musashi's consciousness that something had happened and Koske was involved. Brushing the chips from his knees, he descended the staircase formed by the tops of tiered storage chests and went to the room where Koske and his wife stood staring down at the wounded man. Oh, are you still awake? asked the sword polisher, moving over to make a place for Musashi. Sitting down near the man's pillow, Musashi looked closely at his face and inquired, Who is he? I couldn't have been more surprised. I didn't recognize him until we got back here. But it's Hojo Shinzo, the son of Lord Hojo of Awa. He's a very dedicated young man who's been studying under Obata Kagenori for several years. Musashi carefully lifted the edge of the white bandage around Shinzo's neck and examined the wound, which had been cauterized, then washed with alcohol. The clam-sized piece of flesh had been sliced out cleanly, exposing the pulsating carotid artery. Death had come that close. Who? Musashi wondered. From the shape of the wound, it seemed probable the sword had been on the upswing of a swallow flight stroke. Swallow flight stroke, Kojiro's specialty. Do you know what happened? Musashi asked. Not yet. Neither do I, of course. But I can tell you this much, he nodded his head confidently. It's the work of Sasaki Kojiro. Back in his own room, Musashi lay down on the tatami with his hands under his head, ignoring the mess around him. His palate had been spread, but he ignored that too, despite his fatigue. He had been working on the statue for nearly forty-eight hours straight. Not being a sculptor, he lacked the technical skills necessary to solve difficult problems, nor could he execute the deft strokes that would cover up a mistake. He had nothing to go on but the image of Kannon he carried in his heart, and his sole technique was to clear his mind of extraneous thoughts and do his best to faithfully transfer this image to the wood. He would think for a time that the sculpture was taking form, but then somehow it would go wrong. Some slip would occur between the image in his mind and the hand working with the dagger. Just as he felt he was making progress again, the carving would get out of hand again. After many false starts, the ancient piece of wood had shrunk to a length of no more than four inches. He heard a nightingale call twice, then dropped off to sleep for perhaps an hour. When he awoke, his strong body was surging with energy, his mind perfectly clear. As he rose, he thought, I'll make it this time. Going to the well behind the house, he washed his face and swilled water through his teeth. Refreshed, he sat down by the lamp again and took up his work with renewed vigor. The knife had a different feel to it now. In the grain of the wood, he sensed the centuries of history contained within the block. He knew that if he did not carve skillfully this time, there would be nothing left but a pile of useless chips. For the next few hours, he concentrated with feverish intensity. Not once did his back unbend, nor did he stop for a drink of water. The sky grew light. The birds began to sing. All the doors in the house save his were thrown open for the morning's cleaning. Still, his attention remained focused on the tip of his knife. Musashi, are you all right? asked his host in a worried tone as he slid open the shoji and entered the room. It's no good, Musashi sighed. He straightened up and tossed his dagger aside. The block of wood was no larger than a man's thumb. The wood around his legs lay like fallen snow. No good? No good. How about the wood? Gone. I couldn't get the bodhisattva's form to emerge. Placing his hands behind his head, he felt himself returning to earth after having been suspended for an indeterminate length of time between delusion and enlightenment. No good at all, 
It's time to forget and to meditate. He lay on his back. When he closed his eyes, distractions seemed to fade away, to be replaced by a blinding mist. Gradually, his mind filled with the single idea of the infinite void. Most of the guests leaving the inn that morning were horse traders going home after the four-day market that had ended the day before. For the next few weeks, the inn would see few customers. Catching sight of Iori going up the stairs, the proprietress called out to him from the office. What do you want? asked Iori. From his vantage point, he could see the woman's artfully disguised bald spot. Where do you think you're going? Upstairs, where my teacher is. Something wrong? More than you know, replied the woman with an exasperated glance. Just when did you leave here? Counting on his fingers, Iori answered, The day before the day before yesterday, I think. Three days ago, wasn't it? That's right. You certainly took your time, didn't you? What happened? Did a fox bewitch you or something? How do you know? You must be a fox yourself. Giggling at his own riposte, he started for the top of the stairs again. Your teacher's not here anymore. I don't believe you. He ran up the stairs, but soon came back with a dismayed look on his face. Has he changed rooms? What's the matter with you? I told you he left. Really gone? There was alarm in the boy's voice. If you don't believe me, look at the account book. See? But why? Why would he leave before I got back? Because you were gone too long. But, but, Iori burst into tears. Where did he go? Please tell me. He didn't tell me where he was going. I imagine he left you behind because you're so useless. His color changing, Iori charged out into the street. He looked east, west, then he gazed up at the sky. Tears poured down his cheeks. Scratching the bald spot with a comb, the woman broke into raucous laughter. Stop your bawling, she called. I was only fooling. Your teacher's staying at the sword polishers over there. She had barely finished speaking when a straw horseshoe came sailing into the office. Meekly, Iori sat down in formal fashion at Musashi's feet and in a subdued voice announced, I'm back. He'd already noticed the atmosphere of gloom hanging over the house. The wood chips had not been cleaned up, and the burnt-out lamp was still sitting where it had been the night before. I'm back, Iori repeated, no more loudly than before. Who is it? mumbled Musashi, slowly opening his eyes. Iori. Musashi sat up quickly. Although relieved to see the boy back safe, his only greeting was, Oh, it's you. I'm sorry I took so long. This met with silence. Forgive me. Neither his apology nor a polite bow elicited a response. Musashi tightened his obi and said, Open the windows and tidy up the room. He was out the door before Iori had time to say, Yes, sir. Musashi went to the room downstairs at the back and asked Kosuke how the invalid was this morning. He seems to be resting better. You must be tired. Shall I come back after breakfast so you can have a rest? Kosuke answered that there was no need. There is one thing I would like to see done, he added. I think we should let the Obata school know about this, but I don't have anybody to send. Having offered to either go himself or send Iori, Musashi went back to his own room, which was now in good order. As he sat down, he said, Iori, was there an answer to my letter? Relieved at not being scolded, the boy broke into a smile. Yes, I brought a reply. It's right here. With a look of triumph, he fished the letter from his kimono. Let me have it. Iori advanced on his knees and placed the folded paper in Musashi's outstretched hand. I am sorry to say, Skekuro had written, that Lord Munenori, 
as tutor to the shogun, cannot engage in a bout with you as you requested. If, however, you should visit us for some other purpose, there is a possibility that his lordship may greet you in the dojo. If you still feel strongly about trying your hand against the Yagyu style, the best plan, I think, would be for you to confront Yagyu Hyogo. I regret to say, however, that he left yesterday for Yamato to be at the bedside of Lord Sikshusai, who is gravely ill. Such being the case, I must ask you to postpone your visit until a later day. I shall be happy to make arrangements at that time. As he slowly refolded the lengthy scroll, Musashi smiled. Iori, feeling more secure, extended his legs comfortably and said, The house is not in Kobikicho. It's at a place called Higakubo. It's very large, very splendid, and Kimura Skekuro gave me lots of good things to eat, his eyebrows arching in disapproval at his display of familiarity, Musashi said gravely, Iori! The boy's legs quickly shot back to their proper place under him. Yes, sir? Even if you did get lost, don't you think three days is a rather long time? What happened? I was bewitched by a fox. A fox? Yes, sir, a fox. How could a boy like you born and raised in the country, be bewitched by a fox. I don't know, but afterward I couldn't remember where I'd been for half a day and half a night. Hmm, very strange. Yes, sir, I thought so myself. Maybe foxes in Edo have it in for people more than the ones in the country do. I suspect that's true. Taking into account the boy's seriousness, Musashi did not have the heart to scold him, but he did feel it necessary to pursue his point. I also suspect, he continued, you were up to something you shouldn't have been up to. Well, the fox was following me, and to keep it from bewitching me, I cut it with my sword. Then the fox punished me for that. No, it didn't. Didn't it? No. It wasn't the fox punishing you. It was your own conscience, which is invisible. Now, you sit there and think about that for a while. When I come back, you can tell me what you think it means. Yes, sir. Are you going somewhere? Yes, to a place near the Hirakawa Shrine in Kojimachi. You'll be back by evening, won't you? <laughs> I should be, unless a fox gets me. Musashi departed, leaving Iori to ponder his conscience. Outside... The sky was obscured by the dull, sullen clouds of the summer rainy season. The Deserted Prophet The forest around the Hirakawa Tenjin Shrine was alive with the hum of cicadas. An owl hooted as Musashi walked from the gate to the entrance hall of the Obata house. Good day, he called but his greeting echoed back as though from an empty cavern. After a time, he heard footsteps. The young samurai who emerged wearing his two swords was clearly no mere underling assigned to answer the door. Without bothering to kneel, he said, May I ask your name? Though no more than twenty-four or five, he gave the impression of being someone to be reckoned with. My name is Miyamoto Musashi. Am I correct in thinking this is Obata Kagenori's Academy of Military Science? That's right, came the reply in clipped tones. From the samurai's manner, it was evident he expected Musashi to explain how he was traveling around to perfect his knowledge of the martial arts and so on. One of the students from your school has been wounded in a fight, said Musashi. He's now being cared for by the sword polisher Zushino Kosuke whom I believe you know. I came at Kosuke's request. It must be Shinzo! There were fleeting signs of severe shock, but the youth recovered immediately. Forgive me. I'm Kagenori's only son, Yogoro. Thank you for taking the trouble to come and tell us. Is Shinzo's life in danger? He seemed better this morning, but it's still too early for him to be moved. I think it would be wise to let him stay at Kosuke's house for the time being. 
I hope you'll convey our thanks to Kolske. I'd be happy to. To tell the truth, since my father is bedridden, Shinzo was lecturing in his stead until last fall when he suddenly left. As you can see, there's almost nobody here now. I regret we're not able to receive you properly. Of course. But tell me, is there a feud going on between your school and Sasaki Kojiro? Yes. I was away when it started, so I don't know all the details, but apparently Kojiro insulted my father, which of course incited the students. They took it upon themselves to punish Kojiro, but he killed several of them. As I understand it, Shinzo left because he finally came to the conclusion that he himself should take revenge. I see. It's beginning to make sense. I'd like to give you a bit of advice. Don't fight Kojiro. He can't be beaten by ordinary sword techniques, and he's even less vulnerable to clever strategy. As a fighter, as a speaker, as a strategist, he's without rival, even among the greatest masters alive today. This assessment brought a burst of angry fire to Yogoro's eyes. Observing this, Musashi felt it prudent to repeat his warning. Let the proud have their day he added. It's senseless to risk disaster over a trivial grievance. Don't entertain the idea that Shinzo's defeat makes it necessary for you to settle the score. If you do, you'll simply follow in his footsteps. That would be foolish, very foolish. After Musashi was out of sight, Yogoro leaned against the wall with his arms folded. Softly, in a faintly tremulous voice, he muttered, to think it's come to this. Even Shinzo has failed. Gazing vacantly at the ceiling, he thought of the letter Shinzo had left for him, in which he'd said that his purpose in leaving was to kill Kojiro, and that if he did not succeed, Yogoro would probably never see him alive again. That Shinzo was not dead did not make his defeat any less humiliating. With the school forced to suspend operations, the public in general had concluded that Kojiro was right. The Obata Academy was a school for cowards, or at best, for theoreticians devoid of practical ability. This had led to the desertion of some of the students. Others, apprehensive over Kagenori's illness or the apparent decline of the Koshu style, had switched to the rival Naganuma style. Only two or three were still in residence. Yogoro decided not to tell his father about Shinzo. It seemed that the only course open to him was to nurse the old man as best he could, although the doctor's opinion was that recovery was out of the question. Yogoro, where are you? It was a source of constant amazement to Yogoro that, although Kagenori was at death's door, when an impulse moved him to summon his son, his voice became that of a perfectly healthy man. Coming! He ran to the sick room, fell to his knees, and said, You called? As he often did when he was tired of lying flat on his back, Kagenori had propped himself up by the window, using his pillow as an armrest. Who was the samurai who just went out the gate? He asked. Huh? said Yogoro, somewhat flustered. Oh, him. Nobody in particular. He was just a messenger. Messenger from where? Well, it seems Shinzo has had an accident. The samurai came to tell us. He gave his name as Miyamoto Musashi. Hmm. He wasn't born in Edo, was he? No, I've heard he's from Mimasaka. He's a ronin. Did you think you recognized him? No, Kagenori replied with a vigorous shake of his thin gray beard. I don't recall ever having seen or heard of him, but there's something about him. I've met a lot of people during my lifetime, you know, on the battlefield as well as in ordinary life. Some were very good people, people I valued greatly but the ones I could consider to be genuine samurai, in every sense of the term, were very few. 
This man, Musashi, did you say? Appealed to me. I'd like to meet him. Talk to him a little. Go bring him back. Yes, sir. Yogoro answered obediently, but before getting to his feet, he continued in a slightly puzzled tone. What was it you noticed about him? You only saw him from a distance. You wouldn't understand. When you do, you'll be old and withered like me. But there must have been something. I admired his alertness. He wasn't taking any chances, even on a sick old man like me. When he came through the gate, he paused and looked around. At the layout of the house, at the windows, whether they were open or closed, at the path to the garden, everything. He took it all in at a single glance. There was nothing unnatural about it. Anyone would have assumed he was simply halting for a moment as a sign of deference. I was amazed. Then you believe he's a samurai of real merit? Perhaps. I'm sure he'd be a fascinating man to talk to. Call him back. Aren't you afraid it'll be bad for you? Kagenori had become quite excited, and Yogoro was reminded of the doctor's warning that his father shouldn't talk for any length of time. Don't worry your head about my health. I've been waiting for years to meet a man like that. I didn't study military science all this time to teach it to children. I grant that my theories of military science are called the Oshu style, but they're not simply an extension of the formulas used by the famous Koshu warriors. My ideas differ from those of Takeda Shingen or Uesugi Kenshin or Oda Nobunaga or the other generals who were fighting for control of the country. The purpose of military science has changed since then. My theory is directed toward the achievement of peace and stability. You know some of these things, but the question is, whom can I entrust my ideas to? Yogoro was silent. My son, while there are many things I want to pass on to you, you're still immature, too immature to recognize the remarkable qualities of the man you just met. Yogoro dropped his eyes, but endured the criticism in silence. If even I, inclined as I am to look favorably on everything you do, see you as immature, then there's no doubt in my mind. You're not yet the person who can carry on my work, so I must find the right man and entrust your future to him. I've been waiting for the right person to come along. Remember, when the cherry blossom falls, it must rely on the wind to spread its pollen. You mustn't fall, father. You must try to live. The old man glared and raised his head. Talk like that proves you're still a child. Now go quickly and find the samurai. Yes, sir. Don't push him. Just tell him roughly what I've told you, and bring him back with you. Right away, father. Yogoro departed on the run. Once outside, he first tried the direction he'd seen Musashi take. Then he looked all over the shrine grounds, even went out to the main street running through Kojimachi, but to no avail. He was not unduly disturbed for he was not as thoroughly convinced as his father of Musashi's superiority, nor was he grateful for Musashi's warning. The talk about Kojiro's unusual ability, about the folly of risking disaster over a trivial grievance, had struck in his craw. It was as though Musashi's visit had been for the express purpose of singing Kojiro's praises. 
Even while listening submissively to his father, he had been thinking to himself, I'm not as young and immature as you say. And the truth was that just then, he really couldn't have cared less what Musashi thought. They were about the same age, even if Musashi's talent was exceptional, there were limits to what he could know and what he could do. In the past, Yogoro had gone away for a year, two years, even three, to lead the life of the ascetic Shugyosha. He had lived and studied for a while at the school of another military expert, and he had studied Zen under a strict master. Yet his father after merely catching a glimpse of the man, had not only formed what Yogoro suspected was an exaggerated opinion of the unknown Ronin's worth, but had gone so far as to suggest that Yogoro take Musashi as a model. May as well go back, he thought sadly. I suppose there's no way to convince a parent that his son is no longer a child. He longed desperately for the day when Kagenori would look at him and suddenly see that he was both a grown man and a brave samurai. It pained him to think that his father might die before that day arrived. Hey, Yogoro! It is Yogoro, isn't it? Yogoro turned on his heel and saw that the voice belonged to Nakatogawa Handayu, a samurai from the house of Hosoka. They had not seen each other recently, but there had been a time when Handayu had attended Kagenori's lectures regularly. How's our revered teacher's health? Official duties keep me so busy I haven't had time to call. He's about the same, thanks. Say, I hear Hojo Shinzo attacked Sasaki Kojiro and was beaten. You've heard that already? Yes, they were talking about it at Lord Hosoka's this morning. It only happened last night. Kojiro is a guest of Iwama Kakube. Kakube must have passed the word around. Even Lord Tadanoshi knew about it. Yogoro was too young to listen with detachment, yet he was loath to reveal his anger by some involuntary twitch. Taking leave of Handayu as quickly as possible, he hurried home. His mind was made up. The Talk of the Town Kosuke's wife was in the kitchen making gruel for Shinzo when Iori came in. The plums are turning yellow, he said. If they're almost ripe, that means the cicadas will be singing soon, she answered absently. Don't you pickle the plums? No, there aren't many of us here, and pickling all those plums would take several pounds of salt. The salt wouldn't go to waste, but the plums will if you don't pickle them. And if there was a war or a flood, they'd come in handy, wouldn't they? Since you're busy taking care of the wounded man, I'll be happy to pickle them for you. My, what a funny child you are, worrying about floods and such. You think like an old man. Iori was already getting an empty wooden bucket out of the closet. With this in hand, he sauntered out into the garden and looked up at the plum tree. Alas, Though sufficiently grown up to worry about the future, he was still young enough to be easily distracted by the sight of a buzzing cicada. Sneaking closer, he captured it and held it in his cupped hands, making it screech like a terrified hag. Peeking between his thumbs, Iori experienced a strange sensation. Insects were supposed to be bloodless, he thought, but the cicada felt warm. Perhaps even cicadas, when faced with the peril of death, gave off body heat. Suddenly he was seized by a mixture of fear and pity. Spreading his palms, he tossed the cicada into the air and watched it fly off toward the street. The plum tree, which was quite large, was the home of a sizable community. Fat caterpillars with surprisingly beautiful fur, ladybirds, Tiny blue frogs clinging to the undersides of leaves, small sleeping butterflies, dancing gadflies. Gazing in fascination at this little corner of the animal kingdom, he thought it would be inhuman to throw these ladies and gentlemen into consternation by shaking a branch. Carefully, he reached out, picked a plum, and bit into it. Then he shook the nearest branch gently and was surprised when the fruit did not fall off. Reaching out, 
He picked a few plums and dropped them into the bucket below. Son of a bitch, shouted Iori, abruptly firing three or four plums into the narrow lane next to the house. The clothes-drying pole between the house and the fence fell to the ground with a clatter, and footsteps hastily retreated from the lane into the street. Koska's face appeared at the bamboo grill of his workroom window. What was that noise? he asked, his eyes wide with astonishment. Jumping down from the tree, Iori cried, Another strange man was hiding in the shadows, squatting right there in the lane. I threw some plums at him and he ran away. The sword polisher came outside, wiping his hands on a towel. What sort of man? A thug. One of Hangawara's men? I don't know. Why do those men come snooping around here? They're looking for a chance to get back at Shinzo. Iori looked toward the back room, where the injured man was just finishing his gruel. His wound had healed to the extent that the bandage was no longer necessary. Kosuke, called Shinzo. The craftsman walked to the edge of the veranda and asked, How are you feeling? Pushing his tray aside, Shinzo reseated himself more formally. I want to apologize for causing you so much trouble. Don't mention it. I'm sorry I've been too busy to do more for you. I noticed that, besides worrying about me, you're being annoyed by those Hangawara hoodlums. The longer I stay, the more danger there is that they'll come to regard you as an enemy, too. I think I should be leaving. Don't give it a thought. I'm much better now, as you can see. I'm ready to go home. Today? Yes. Don't be in such a hurry. At least wait until Musashi comes back. I'd rather not. But please thank him for me. He's been very kind to me, too. I can walk all right now. You don't seem to understand. Hangawara's men are watching this house day and night. They'll pounce on you the minute you step outside. I can't possibly let you leave alone. I had a good reason for killing Judo and Koroku. Kojiro started all this, not me. But if they want to attack me, let them attack. Shinzo was on his feet and ready to go. Sensing there was no way of holding him back, Kosuke and his wife went to the front of the shop to see him off. Musashi appeared at the door just then, his sunburned forehead moist with sweat. Going out? he asked. Going home? Well, I'm glad to see you feel well enough, but it'd be dangerous to go alone. I'll go with you. Shinzo tried to refuse, but Musashi insisted. Minutes later, they set off together. It must be difficult to walk after being in bed so long. Somehow the ground seems higher than it really is. It's a long way to Hirakawa Tenjin. Why don't we hire a palanquin for you? I suppose I ought to have mentioned it before. I'm not going back to the school. Oh, where then? Casting his eyes downward, Shinzo answered, It's rather humiliating. But I think I'll go to my father's house for a while. It's in Ushigome. Musashi stopped the palanquin and virtually forced Shinzo into it. Despite the insistence of the bearers, Musashi refused one for himself, to the disappointment of the Hangawara men watching from around the next corner. Look, he put Shinzo into a palanquin. I saw him glance this way. It's too early to do anything yet. After the palanquin turned right by the outer moat, they hitched up their skirts, pulled back their sleeves, and followed along behind, their glittering eyes seemingly ready to pop out and shoot toward Musashi's back. Musashi and Shinzo had reached the neighborhood of Ushigafuchi when a small rock glanced off the palanquin pole. At the same time, the gang started shouting and moved in to surround its prey. Wait, called one of them. Just stay where you are, you bastard! The bearers, terrified, dropped the palanquin and fled. Shinzo crawled out of the palanquin, hand on sword. Pulling himself to his feet, he assumed a stance and cried, Is it me you're telling me to wait? Musashi jumped in front of him and shouted, State your business! 
The hoodlums inched closer, cautiously, as though feeling their way through shallow water. You know what we want, spat one of them. Turn over that yellow belly you're protecting, and don't try anything funny, or you'll be dead too. Encouraged by this bravado, they seethed with bloodthirsty fury, but none advanced to strike with his sword. The fire in Musashi's eyes was sufficient to hold them at bay. They howled and cursed from a safe distance. Musashi and Shinzo glared at them in silence. Moments passed before Musashi took them unawares by shouting, If Hangawara Yajibe is among you, let him come forward. The boss isn't here, but if you have anything to say, speak to me, Nembutsu Tazaemon, and I'll do you the favor of listening. The elderly man who stepped forward wore a white hemp kimono and had Buddhist prayer beads hung around his neck. What do you have against Hojo Shinzo? Squaring his shoulders, Tazaemon replied, He slaughtered two of our men. According to Shinzo, you two louts helped Kojiro kill a number of Obata's students. That was one thing. This is another. If we don't settle our score with Shinzo, we'll be laughed off the streets. That may be the way things are done in the world you live in, Musashi said in a conciliatory tone. But it's different in the world of the samurai. Among warriors, you can't fault a man for seeking and taking his proper revenge. A samurai may take revenge for the sake of justice or to defend his honor, but not to satisfy a personal grudge. It's not manly, and what you're trying to do right now isn't manly. Not manly? You're accusing us of being unmanly? If Kojiro came forward and challenged us in his own name, that'll be all right. But we can't get involved in a squabble raised by Kojiro's minions. There you go, preaching self-righteously just like any other samurai. Say what you please, we still have to protect our name. If samurai and outlaws fight over whose rules are to prevail, the streets will be filled with blood. The only place to settle this is at the magistrate's office. How about it, Nembutsu? Horse manure! If it was something the magistrate could settle, we wouldn't be here to begin with. Listen, how old are you? What business is it of yours? I'd say you look old enough to know you shouldn't be leading a group of young men to a meaningless death. Ah, keep your smart talk to yourself. I'm not too old for a fight. Tazaemon drew his sword, and the hoodlums moved forward, jostling and shouting. Musashi dodged Tazaemon's thrust and grabbed him by the back of his gray head. Covering the ten paces or so to the moat in great strides, he summarily dumped him over the edge. Then, as the mob closed in, he dashed back, picked Shinzo up by the waist, and made off with him. He ran across a field, toward the middle reaches of a hill. Below them, a stream flowed into the moat, and a bluish marsh was visible at the bottom of the slope. Halfway up, Musashi stopped and stood Shinzo on his feet. Now, he said, let's run. Shinzo hesitated, but Musashi prodded him into motion. The hoodlums, having recovered from their shock, were giving chase. Catch him! No pride! That's a samurai! He can't throw Tazaemon in the moat and get away with it! Ignoring the taunts and slurs, Musashi said to Shinzo, Don't even consider getting involved with them. Run! It's the only thing to do in a case like this. With a grin, he added, it's not so easy to make good time on this terrain, is it? They were passing through what would someday be known as Ushigafuji and Kudang Hill, but now the area was heavily wooded. By the time they lost their pursuers, Shinzo's face was deathly pale. Worn out? Musashi asked solicitously. It's... it's not so bad. I suppose you don't like the idea of letting them insult us like that without fighting back. Well, ha <laughs> ha, think about it quietly and calmly, and you'll see why. There's times when it makes you feel better to run away. There's a stream over there. Rinse your mouth out, and then I'll take you to your father's house. In a few minutes, 
the forest around the Akagi Myojin shrine came into view. Lord Hojo's house was just below. I hope you'll come in and meet my father, Shinzo said when they came to the earthen wall surrounding the house. Some other time. Get plenty of rest and take care of yourself. With that, he was off. After this incident, Musashi's name was heard quite frequently in the streets of Edo, far more frequently than he would have wished. People were calling him a fake, the coward to end all cowards, and saying, shameless, a disgrace to the samurai class. If a fraud like that defeated the Yoshiokas in Kyoto, they must have been hopelessly weak. He must have challenged them knowing they couldn't protect themselves. And then he probably ran away before he was in any real danger. All that phony wants to do is sell his name to people who don't know swordsmanship. Before long, it was impossible to find anyone who would put in a good word for him. The crowning insult was signs posted all over Edo. Here's a word to Miyamoto Musashi, who turned tail and ran. The Honiden Dowager is eager for revenge. We, too, would like to see your face instead of your back for a change. If you are a samurai, come out and fight. The Hangawara Association Book 6 Sun and Moon A Chat with the Men before having breakfast, Lord Hosokawa Tadatoshi began his day with the study of the Confucian classics. Official duties, which often required his attendance at Edo Castle, consumed most of his time, but when he could fit it into his schedule, he practiced the martial arts. Evenings, whenever possible, he liked to spend in the company of the young samurai in his service. The atmosphere was rather like that of a harmonious family seated around its patriarch, not completely informal, to be sure, for the idea that his lordship was just one of the boys was not encouraged, but the usually rigorous etiquette was relaxed a bit. Tadatoshi, lounging in a lightweight hemp kimono, encouraged an exchange of views, which often included the latest gossip. Okatani! said his lordship, singling out one of the more robust men. Yes, sir. I hear you're pretty good with the lance now. That's right. Very good, in fact. Ha <laughs> ha! You certainly don't suffer from false modesty. Well, sir, with everybody else saying so, why should I deny it? One of these days I'll find out for myself how advanced your technique really is. I've been looking forward to that day, but it never seems to come. You're lucky it doesn't. Tell me, sir, have you heard the song everybody's singing? What's that? It goes like this. There's lancers and lancers, all sorts of lancers, but the greatest one of all is Okatani Goroji. Tadatoshi laughed. You can't take me in that easily. That song's about Nagoya Sanzo. The others joined in the laughter. Oh, you knew? You'd be surprised at what I know. He was on the verge of giving further evidence of this, but thought better of it. He enjoyed hearing what his men were thinking and talking about, and considered it his duty to keep himself well informed, but it would hardly do to reveal just how much he actually knew. Instead, he asked, How many of you are specializing in the lance? How many in the sword? Out of seven, Five were studying the lance, only two the sword. Why do so many of you prefer the lance? asked Tadatoshi. The consensus among the lancers was that it was more effective in battle. And what do the swordsmen think about that? One of the two replied, The sword is better. Swordsmanship prepares you for peace as well as for war. This was a perennial subject for discussion, and the debate was usually lively. One of the lancers asserted, The longer the lance is, the better, provided it's not too long to handle efficiently. The lance can be used for striking, thrusting, or slicing, 
and if you fail with it, you can always fall back on your sword. If you have only a sword and it gets broken, that's it. That may be true, rejoined an exponent of sword fighting. But a samurai's work isn't limited to the battlefield. The sword is his soul. To practice its art is to refine and discipline your spirit. In the broadest sense, the sword is the basis for all military training, whatever drawbacks it may have in battle. If you master the inner meaning of the way of the samurai, the discipline can be applied to the use of the lance or even guns. If you know the sword, you don't make silly mistakes or get taken unawares. Swordsmanship is an art with universal applications. The argument might have gone on indefinitely had not Tadatoshi, who had been listening without taking sides, said, Mainosuke, what you just said sounds to me like something you heard somebody else say. Matsushita Mainosuke grew defensive. No, sir, that's my own opinion. Come now, be honest. Well, to tell the truth, I heard something similar when I was visiting Kakube recently. Sasaki Kojiro said about the same thing. But it fitted in so well with my own idea, I wasn't trying to deceive anyone. Sasaki just put it into words better than I could. I thought as much, said Tadatoshi with a knowing smile. The mention of Kojiro's name reminded him that he had not yet made a decision as to whether to accept Kakube's recommendation. Kakube had suggested that since Kojiro was not very old, he might be offered a thousand bushels or so. But much more than the matter of the stipend was involved. Tadatoshi had been told by his father many times that it was of prime importance to first exercise good judgment in hiring samurai and then to treat them well. Before accepting a candidate, it was imperative to assess not only his skills, but also his character. No matter how desirable a man might seem to be, if he could not work together with the retainers who had made the house of Hosoka what it was today, he would be virtually useless. A fief, the elder Hosoka had advised, was like a castle wall built of many rocks. A rock that could not be cut to fit in comfortably with the others would weaken the whole structure, even though the rock itself might be of admirable size and quality. The daimyo of the new age left the unsuitable rocks in the mountains and fields, for there was an abundance of them. The great challenge was to find one great rock that would make an outstanding contribution to one's own wall. Thought of in this way, Tadatoshi felt, Kojiro's youth was in his favor. He was still in his formative years and consequently susceptible to a certain amount of molding. Tadatoshi was also reminded of the other ronin. Nagaoka Sado had first mentioned Musashi at one of these evening get-togethers. Though Sado had allowed Musashi to slip through his fingers, Tadatoshi had not forgotten him. If Sado's information was accurate, Musashi was both a better fighter than Kojiro and a man of sufficient breadth to be valuable in government. As he compared the two, he had to admit that most daimyo would prefer Kojiro. He came from a good family and had studied the art of war thoroughly. Despite his youth, he had developed a formidable style of his own, and he had gained considerable fame as a fighter. The story of his brilliant defeat of men from the Obata Academy on the banks of the Sumida River and again at the dike on the Kanda River was already well known. Nothing had been heard of Musashi for some time. His victory at Ichijoji had made his reputation, but that had been years ago, and soon afterward word had spread that the story was exaggerated, that Musashi was a seeker after fame, who had trumped up the fight, made a flashy attack, and then fled to Mount Hiei. Every time Musashi did something praiseworthy, a spate of rumors followed, denigrating his character and ability. It had reached the point where even the mention of his name usually met with critical remarks. Or else people ignored him entirely. 
As the son of a nameless warrior in the mountains of Mimasaka, his lineage was insignificant. Though other men of humble origin, most notably Toyotomi Hideyoshi, who came from Nakamura in Owari province, had risen to glory in recent memory, people were on the whole class-conscious and not given to paying much heed to a man of Musashi's background. As Tadatoshi mulled over the question, he looked around and asked, Do any of you know of a samurai named Miyamoto Musashi? Musashi? replied a surprised voice. It'll be impossible not to hear of him. His name's all over town. It was evident that they were all familiar with the name. Why is that? A look of anticipation came over Tadatoshi's face. There are signs up about him, offered one young man with a slight air of reticence. Another man, whose name was Mori, chimed in. People were copying the signs, so I did too. I've got it with me now. Shall I read it? Please do. Ah, here it is, said Mori, unfolding a crumpled scrap of paper. Here's a word to Miyamoto Musashi, who turned tail and ran. Eyebrows were raised and smiles began to appear, but Tadatoshi's face was grave. Is that all? No. He read the rest of it and said, The signs were put up by a gang from the carpenter's district. People find it amusing because it's a case of street ruffians tweaking the nose of a samurai. Tadatoshi frowned slightly, feeling that the words maligning Musashi called his own judgment into question. This was a far cry from the image he had formed of Musashi. Still, he was not ready to accept what he had heard at face value. Hmm, he murmured. I wonder if Musashi is really that sort of man. I gather he's a worthless lout, volunteered Mori, whose opinion was shared by the others. Or at least a coward. If he wasn't, why would he allow his name to be dragged through the mud? The clock struck, and the men departed, but Tadatoshi sat on, thinking, there's something interesting about this man. Not one to be swayed by the prevailing opinion, he was curious to know Musashi's side of the story. The next morning, after listening to a lecture on the Chinese classics, he emerged from his study into the veranda and caught sight of Sado in the garden. Good morning, my elderly friend, he called. Sado turned and politely bowed his morning greeting. Are you still on the lookout? asked Tadatoshi. Puzzled by the question, Sado merely stared back. I mean, are you still keeping an eye out for Miyamoto Musashi? Yes, my lord, Sado lowered his eyes. If you do find him, bring him here. I want to see what he's like. Shortly after noon on the same day, Kakube approached Tadatoshi at the archery range and pressed his recommendation of Kojiro. As he picked up his bow, the young lord said quietly, Sorry, I'd forgotten. Bring him any time you wish. I'd like to have a look at him. Whether he becomes a retainer or not is another matter, as you well know. Buzzing Insects Seated in a back room of the small house Kakube had lent him, Kojiro was examining the drawing pole. After the incident with Hojo Shinzo, he had requested Kakube to press the craftsman for the return of the weapon. It had come back this morning. It won't be polished, of course, Kojiro had predicted, but in fact, the sword had been worked on with an attention and care that were beyond his wildest hopes. From the blue-black metal, rippling like the current of a deep-running stream, there now sprang a brilliant white glow, the light of centuries past. The rust spots, which had seemed like leprous blemishes, were gone. The wavy tempering pattern between the blade's edge and the ridge line, hitherto smudged with blood stains, was now as serenely beautiful as a misty moon floating in the sky. It's like seeing it for the first time, marveled Kojiro. Unable to take his eyes from the sword, he didn't hear the visitor calling from the front of the house. Are you here? Kojiro! This part of the hill had been given the name Tsukino Misaki, 
because of the magnificent view it afforded of the rising moon. From his sitting room, Kojiro could see the stretch of bay from Shiba to Shinagawa. Across the bay, frothy clouds appeared to be on a level with his eyes. At this moment, the white of the distant hills and the greenish blue of the water seemed fused with the blade. Kojiro! Isn't anybody here? This time, the voice came from the grass-woven side gate. Coming out of his reverie, he shouted, Who is it? and returned the sword to its scabbard. I'm in the back. If you want to see me, come around to the veranda. Oh, here you are, said Osugi, walking around to where she could see into the house. Well, this is a surprise, said Kojiro cordially. What brings you out on a hot day like this? Just a minute. Let me wash my feet. Then we can talk. The well's over there. Be careful. It's quite deep. You, boy, go with her and see she doesn't fall in. The man addressed as boy was a low-ranking member of Hangawara's gang who had been sent along to guide Osugi. After washing her sweaty face and rinsing her feet, Osugi entered the house and exchanged a few words of greeting. Noticing the pleasant breeze coming off the bay, she squinted and said, The house is nice and cool. Aren't you afraid you'll get lazy, staying in a comfortable place like this? Kojiro laughed. I'm not like Matahachi. The old woman blinked her eyes sadly, but ignored the barb. Sorry, I didn't bring you a real gift, she said. In place of one, I'll give you a sutra I copied. As she handed him the Sutra on the Great Love of Parents, she added, Please read it when you have time. After a perfunctory glance at her handiwork, Kojiro turned to her guide and said, That reminds me, did you put up the signs I wrote for you? The ones telling Musashi to come out of hiding? Yes, those. It took us two whole days, but we put one up at almost every important intersection. Osugi said, We passed some on the way here. Everywhere they're posted, people are standing around gossiping. It made me feel good to hear the things they're saying about Musashi. If he doesn't answer the challenge, he's finished as a samurai. The whole country will be laughing at him. That should be ample revenge for you, Granny. Not on your life. Being laughed at isn't going to get through to him. He's shameless, and it won't satisfy me either. I want to see him punished once and for all. Aha! laughed Kojiro, amused by her tenacity. You get older, but you never give up, do you? By the way, did you come about anything in particular? The old lady rearranged herself and explained that after more than two years with Hangawara, she felt she should be moving on. It was not right for her to live on Yajibe's hospitality indefinitely. Besides, she was tired of mothering a house full of roughnecks. She had seen a nice little place for rent in the vicinity of Yoroi Ferry. What do you think? Her face was serious, questioning. It doesn't look like I'll find Musashi soon, and I have a feeling Matahachi's somewhere in Edo. I think I should have some money sent from home and stay on for a while, but by myself, as I said. There being no reason for Kojiro to object, he quickly agreed with her. His own connection with the Hangarawa menage, entertaining and useful at the beginning, was now a little embarrassing. It was certainly no asset to a ronin looking for a master. He had already decided to discontinue the practice sessions. Kojiro summoned one of Kakube's subordinates and had him bring a watermelon from the patch behind the house. They chatted while it was being cut and served, but before long he showed his guest out, his manner rather suggesting he preferred to have her out of the way before sundown. When they had left... He himself swept his rooms and sprinkled the garden with well water. The morning glory and yam vines growing on the fence had reached the top and returned to the ground again, threatening to ensnare the foot of the stone water basin. Their white flowers waved in the evening breeze. In his room again, he lay down and wondered idly if his host would be on duty that night at the Hosokawa house.
The lamp, which would probably have been blown out by the wind anyway, was unlit. The light of the moon, rising beyond the bay, was already on his face. At the bottom of the hill, a young samurai was breaking through the cemetery fence. Kakube stabled the horse he rode to and from the Hosokawa mansion at a florist's shop at the foot of Isarago Hill. This evening, curiously enough, there was no sign of the florist, who always came out promptly to take charge of the animal. Not seeing him inside the shop, Kakube went around to the back and started to tether his horse to a tree. As he did so, the florist came running out from behind the temple. Taking the reins from Kakube's hands, he panted, Sorry, sir, there was a strange man in the cemetery on his way up the hill. I shouted, told him there was no pathway there. He turned and stared at me. Angry he was, then disappeared. He paused for a moment, peered up into the dark trees and added worriedly, Do you think he could be a burglar? They say a lot of daimyo houses have been broken into recently. Kakube had heard the rumors, but he replied with a short laugh, That's all talk, nothing more. If the man you saw was a burglar, I dare say he was a petty thief, or one of the ronin who waylay people on the streets. Well, we're right here at the entrance to the Tokaido, and lots of travelers have been attacked by men fleeing to other provinces. It makes me nervous when I see suspicious-looking men around at night. If anything happens, run up the hill and knock at my gate. The man staying with me is chafing at the bit, always complaining there's never any action around here. You mean Sasaki Kojiro? He's got quite a reputation as a swordsman here in the neighborhood. Hearing this did Kakube's self-esteem no harm. Apart from liking young people, he knew quite well that it was regarded as both admirable and wise for established samurai like himself to take on promising younger men as prodigies. Should an emergency arise, there could be no more persuasive proof of his loyalty than to be able to furnish his lord with good fighters. And if one of them turned out to be outstanding, due credit would be given to the retainer who had recommended him. One of Kakube's beliefs was that self-interest was an undesirable trait in a vassal. Nevertheless, he was realistic. In a large fief, there were few retainers willing to disregard their own interests entirely. Despite the fact that he held his position through heredity, Kakube was as loyal to Lord Tadatoshi as the other retainers, without being the sort who would strive to outdo others in demonstrating his fealty. For purposes of routine administration, men of his type were on the whole much more satisfactory than the firebrands who sought to perform spectacular feats. I'm back, he called on entering the gate to his house. The hill was quite steep, and he was always a little winded when he reached this point. Since he had left his wife in the country, and the house was populated mostly by men with only a few woman servants, Feminine touches tended to be lacking. Yet on evenings when he had no night duty, he invariably found the stone path from the red gate to the entrance inviting, for it had been freshly watered down in anticipation of his return. And no matter how late the hour, someone always came to the front door to greet him. Is Kojiro here? he asked. He's been in all day, replied the servant. He's lying down in his room, enjoying the breeze. Good. Get some sake ready and ask him to come in to see me. While preparations were being made, Kakube took off his sweaty clothes and relaxed in the bath. Then, donning a light kimono, he entered his sitting room, where Kojiro sat waving a fan. The sake was brought in. Kakube poured, saying, I called you because something encouraging happened today that I wanted to tell you about. Good news? Since I mentioned your name to Lord Tadatoshi, he seems to have heard of you from other sources as well. Today he told me to bring you to see him sometime soon. As you know, it's not easy to arrange these matters. There are dozens of retainers with someone they want to suggest— his expectation that Kojiro would be immensely pleased showed clearly in his tone and manner. 
Kojiro put his cup to his lips and drank. When he did speak, his expression was unchanged, and he said only, Let me pour you one now. Kakube, far from being put out, admired the young man for being able to conceal his emotions. This means I've been successful in carrying out what you requested of me. I think that calls for a celebration. Have another. Kojiro bowed his head slightly and mumbled, I'm grateful for your kindness. I was only doing my duty, of course, Kakube replied modestly. When a man is as capable and talented as you, I owe it to my lord to see that you're given consideration. Please don't overestimate me. And let me re-emphasize one point. It's not the stipend I'm interested in. I simply think the house of Hosokawa is a very good one for a samurai to serve. It's had three outstanding men in a row. The three men were Tadatoshi and his father and grandfather, Sansai and Yusai. You needn't think I've talked you up to the high heavens. I didn't have to. The name Sasaki Kojiro is known throughout the capital. How could I be famous when all I do is loaf around here all day long? I don't see that I'm outstanding in any way. It's just that there are so many fakes around. I was told that I could bring you any time. When would you like to go? Any time suits me too. How about tomorrow? That's all right with me. His face revealed no eagerness, no anxiety, only calm self-confidence. Kakube, even more impressed at his sangfroid, chose this time to say matter-of-factly, You understand, of course, his lordship won't be able to make a final decision until he's seen you. You needn't let that worry you. It's only a matter of form. I have no doubt but what the position will be offered. Kojiro set his cup down on the table and stared straight into Kakube's face. Then, very coldly and defiantly, he said, I've changed my mind. Sorry to have put you to so much trouble. Blood seemed about to burst from his earlobes, already bright red from the drink. W what stammered Kakube. You mean you're giving up the chance for a position with the house of Hosokawa? I don't like the idea, answered his guest curtly, offering no further explanation. His pride told him there was no reason for him to submit to an inspection. Dozens of other daimyo would snap him up sight unseen for fifteen hundred, even twenty-five hundred bushels. Kakube's puzzled disappointment seemed to make no impression on him whatsoever, nor did it matter that he would be regarded as a willful ingrate. Without the least suggestion of doubt or repentance, he finished off his food in silence and returned to his own quarters. The moonlight fell softly on the tatami. Stretching out drunkenly on the floor, arms under his head, he began to laugh quietly to himself. Honest man, that Kakube. Good old honest Kakube. He knew his host would be at a loss to explain this sudden shift to Tadatoshi, but he knew also that Kakube would not be angry at him for very long, no matter how outrageously he behaved. While he had piously denied interest in the stipend, he was in fact consumed with ambition. He wanted a stipend and much more, every ounce of fame and success he could possibly achieve. Otherwise, what would be the purpose of persevering through years of arduous training? Kojido's ambition was different from that of other men only by dint of its magnitude. He wanted to be known throughout the country as a great and successful man, to bring glory to his home in Iwakuni, to enjoy every one of the benefits that can possibly derive from being born human. The quickest road to fame and riches was to excel in the martial arts. He was fortunate in having a natural talent for the sword. He knew this and derived no small measure of self-satisfaction from it. He had planned his course intelligently and with remarkable foresight. Every action of his was calculated to put him closer to his goal. To his way of thinking, Kakube, though his senior, was naive and a little sentimental. He fell asleep, dreaming of his brilliant future. 
Later, when the moonlight had edged a foot across the tatami, a voice no louder than the breeze whispering through the bamboo said, Now! A shadowy form, crouching among the mosquitoes, crept forward like a frog to the eaves of the unlighted house. The mysterious man, seen earlier at the foot of the hill, advanced slowly, silently, until he reached the veranda, where he stopped and peered into the room. Stooping in the shadows out of the moonlight, he might have remained undiscovered indefinitely had he himself made no sound. Kojiro snored on. The soft hum of insects, briefly interrupted as the man moved into position, came again across the dew-covered grass. Minutes passed. Then the silence was broken by the clatter the man made as he whipped out his sword and jumped up onto the veranda. He leapt toward Kojiro and cried, Ark! an instant before he clenched his teeth and struck. There was a sharp hissing as a long black object descended heavily on his wrist, but the original force of his strike had been powerful. Instead of falling from his hand, his sword sank into the tatami where Kojiro's body had been. Like a fish darting away from a pole striking water, the intended victim had streaked to the wall. He now stood facing the intruder, the drawing pole in one hand, its scabbard in the other. Who are you? Kojiro's breathing was calm. Alert as always to the sounds of nature's creatures, to the falling of a dew drop, he was unperturbed. I, it, it's me. Me doesn't tell me anything. I know you're a coward, attacking a man in his sleep. What's your name? I am Yogoro, the only son of Obata Kagenori. You took advantage of my father when he was sick, and you spread gossip about him all over the city. I wasn't the one who spread the gossip. It was the gossipers, the people of Edo. Who was it who lured his students into a fight and killed them? I did that, no doubt about it. I, Sasaki Kojiro. How can I help it if I'm better than they? Stronger, braver, more knowledgeable in the art of war. How can you have the gall to say that when you called on Hangawara's vermin to help you? With a snarl of disgust, Kojiro took a step forward. If you want to hate me, go ahead. But any man who carries a personal grudge into a test of strength in the art of war isn't even a coward. He's worse than that, more pitiable, more laughable. So once again, I have to take the life of an Obata man. Are you resigned to that? No answer. I said, are you resigned to your fate? He moved another step forward. As he did so, the light of the moon reflecting off the newly polished blade of his sword blinded Yogoro. Kojiro stared at his prey as a starving man stares at a feast. The Eagle Kakube regretted having allowed himself to be used shabbily and vowed to have nothing more to do with Kojiro. Yet deep down, he liked the man. What he didn't like was being caught between his master and his protege. Then he began to rethink the matter. Maybe Kojiro's reaction proves how exceptional he is. The ordinary samurai would have jumped at the chance to be interviewed. The more he reflected on Kojiro's fit of pique, the more the ronin's independent spirit appealed to him. For the next three days, Kakube was on night duty. He did not see Kojiro until the morning of the fourth day, when he walked casually over to the young man's quarters. After a short but awkward silence, he said, I want to talk to you for a minute, Kojiro. Yesterday, when I was leaving, Lord Tadatoshi asked me about you. He said he'd see you. Why don't you drop in at the archery range and have a look at the Hosokawa technique? When Kojiro grinned without replying, Kakube added, I don't know why you insist on thinking it's demeaning. It's usual to interview a man before offering him an official position. I know, but supposing he rejects me, then what? I'd be a cast-off, wouldn't I? I'm not so hard up that I have to go around peddling myself to the highest bidder. Then the fault is mine. I put it the wrong way. His lordship never meant to imply any such thing. Well, what answer did you give him? 
None yet. But he seems a little impatient. Aha! You've been very thoughtful, very helpful. I suppose I shouldn't put you in such a difficult position. Wouldn't you reconsider? Go and call on him just once? All right, if it means so much to you, Kojiro said patronizingly, but Kakube was nonetheless pleased. How about today? So soon? Yes. What time? How about a little after noon? That's when he practices archery. All right, I'll be there. Kojiro set about making elaborate preparations for the meeting. The kimono he chose was of excellent quality, and the hakama was made of imported fabric. Over the kimono he wore a formal vest-like garment of sheer silk, sleeveless but with stiff flaring shoulders. To complement his finery, he had the servants provide him with new zori and a new basket hat. Is there a horse I can use? he inquired. Yes, the master's spare horse, the white one, is at the shop at the bottom of the hill. Failing to find the florist, Kojiro glanced toward the temple compound across the way, where a group of people was gathering around a corpse covered with reed matting. He went over to have a look. They were discussing plans for burial with the local priest. The victim had no identifying possessions on him. No one knew who he was, only that he was young and of the samurai class. The blood around the deep gash extending from the tip of one shoulder to his waist was dried and black. I've seen him before, about four days ago in the evening, said the florist, who went on talking excitedly until he felt a hand on his shoulder. When he looked to see who it was, Kojiro said, I'm told Kakube's horse is kept at your place. Get him ready for me, please. Bowing hastily, the florist asked perfunctorily, Are you going out? and hurried off. He patted the dappled gray steed on the neck as he led it out of his stable. Quite a good horse, Kojiro remarked. Yes, indeed, a fine animal. Once Kojiro was in the saddle, the florist beamed and said, It's a good match. Taking some money from his purse, Kojiro threw it to the man. Use this for flowers and incense. Huh? Who for? The dead man over there? Beyond the temple gate, Kojiro cleared his throat and spat, as if to eject the bitter taste left by the sight of the corpse. But he was pursued by the feeling that the youth he had cut down with a drying pole had thrown aside the reed matting and was following him. I did nothing he could hate me for, he told himself, and felt better for the thought. As horse and rider moved along the Takanawa High Road under the boiling sun, townsmen and samurai alike stood aside to make way. Heads turned in admiration. Even on the streets of Edo, Kojiro cut an impressive figure, causing people to wonder who he was and where he came from. At the Hosokawa residence, he turned the horse over to a servant and entered the house. Kakube rushed to meet him. My thanks for coming. It's just the right time, too, he said, as though Kojiro were doing him a great personal favor. Rest a while. I'll tell his lordship you're here. Before doing so, he made sure the guest was provided with cool water, barley tea, and a tobacco tray. When a retainer came to show him to the archery range, Kojiro handed over his beloved drawing pole and followed along wearing only his short sword. Lord Tadatoshi had resolved to shoot a hundred arrows a day during the summer months. A number of close retainers were always there, watching each shot with bated breath and making themselves useful retrieving arrows. Give me a towel, his lordship commanded, standing his bow beside him. Kneeling, Kakube asked, May I trouble you, sir? What is it? Sasaki Kojiro is here. I would appreciate your seeing him. Sasaki, oh, yes. He fitted an arrow to the bowstring, took an open stance, and raised his shooting arm above his eyebrows. Neither he nor any of the others so much as glanced in Kojiro's direction until the hundred shots were finished. With a sigh, Tadatoshi said, Water, bring me some water. An attendant brought some from the well and poured it into a large wooden tub at Tadatoshi's feet. 
Letting the upper part of his kimono hang loose, he wiped off his chest and washed his feet. His men assisted by holding his sleeves, running to fetch more water and wiping off his back. There was nothing formal in their manner, nothing to suggest to an observer that this was a daimyo and his retinue. Kojiro had supposed that Tadatoshi, a poet and an esthete, the son of Lord Sansai and the grandson of Lord Yosai, would be a man of aristocratic bearing, as refined in his conduct as the elegant courtiers of Kyoto. But his surprise did not show in his eyes as he watched. Slipping his still damp feet into his zori, Tadatoshi looked at Kakube, who was waiting off to one side. With the air of one who has suddenly recalled a promise, he said, Now, Kakube, I'll see your man. He had a stool brought and placed in the shade of a tent, where he sat down in front of a banner bearing his crest, a circle surrounded by eight smaller circles, representing the sun, moon, and seven planets. Beckoned by Kakube, Kojiro came forward and knelt before Lord Tadatoshi. As soon as the formal greeting was completed, Tadotoshi invited Kojiro to sit on a stool, thus signifying that he was an honored guest. By your leave, said Kojiro, as he rose and took a seat facing Tadotoshi. I've heard about you from Kakube. I believe you were born in Iwakuni, weren't you? That is correct, sir. Lord... Kikawa Hiroie of Iwakuni was well known as a wise and noble ruler. Were your ancestors retainers of his? No, we never served the house of Kikawa. I've been told we've descended from the Sasakis of Omi province. After the fall of the last Ashikaga shogun, my father seems to have retired to my mother's village. After a few more questions concerning family and lineage, Lord Tadatoshi asked, Will you be going into service for the first time? I do not yet know whether I am going into service. I gathered from Kakube you wish to serve the house of Hosokawa. What are your reasons? I believe it is a house I would be willing to live and die for. Tadatoshi seemed pleased with this answer. And your style of fighting? I call it the Gandyu style. Gandyu? It's a style I invented myself. Presumably, it has antecedents. I studied the Tomita style, and I had the benefit of lessons from Lord Katayama Hisayasu of Hoki, who in his old age retired to Iwakuni. I've also mastered many techniques of my own. I used to practice cutting down swallows on the wing. I see. I suppose the name Gandyu comes from the name of that river near where you were born? Yes, sir. I'd like to see a demonstration. Tadatoshi looked around at the faces of his samurai. Which one of you would like to take this man on? They had been watching the interview in silence, thinking that Kojiro was remarkably young to have acquired the reputation he had. Now all looked first at each other, then at Kojiro, whose flushed cheeks proclaimed his willingness to face any challenger. How about you, Okatani? Yes, sir. You're always claiming the lance is superior to the sword. Now's your chance to prove it. I shall be glad to, if Sasaki is willing. By all means, Kojiro answered with alacrity. In his tone, which was polite but extremely cool, there was a hint of cruelty. The samurai who had been sweeping the sand on the archery range and putting away the equipment assembled behind their master. Although weapons were as familiar to them as chopsticks, their experience had been primarily in the dojo. The chance to witness, much less have, a real bout would occur only a few times throughout their lives. They would readily agree that a man-to-man -man fight was a greater challenge than going out on the battlefield, where it was sometimes possible for a man to pause and get his wind while his comrades fought on. In hand-to-hand -hand combat, he had only himself to rely on, only his own alertness and strength from beginning to end. Either he won, or he was killed or maimed. They watched Okatani Goroji solemnly. 
Even among the lowest-ranking foot soldiers, there were quite a few who were adept with the lance. Goroji was generally conceded to be the best. He had not only been in battle, but had practiced diligently and devised techniques of his own. Give me a few minutes, said Goroji, bowing toward Tadatoshi and Kojiro before withdrawing to make his preparations. It pleased him that today, as on other days, he had on spotless underwear and the tradition of the good samurai, who started each day with a smile and an uncertainty. By evening, he might be a corpse. After borrowing a three-foot wooden sword, Kojiro selected the ground for the match. His body seemed relaxed and open, the more so since he didn't hitch up his pleated hakama. His appearance was formidable. Even his enemies would have had to admit that. There was an eagle-like air of valor about him, and his handsome profile was serenely confident. Worried eyes began to turn toward the canopy behind which Goroji was adjusting his clothing and equipment. What's taking him so long? someone asked. Goroji was calmly wrapping a piece of damp cloth around the point of his lance, a weapon he had used to excellent effect on the battlefield. The shaft was nine feet long, and the tapering blade alone, at eight or nine inches, was the equivalent of a short sword. What are you doing? called Kojiro. If you're worried about hurting me, save yourself the trouble. Again, though the words were courteous, the implication was arrogant. I don't mind if you leave it unwrapped. Looking sharply at him, Goroji said, Are you sure? Perfectly. Though neither Lord Tadatoshi nor his men spoke, their perceiving eyes told Goroji to go ahead. If the stranger had the gall to ask for it, why not run him through? In that case, Goroji tore off the wrapping and advanced holding the lance midway along the shaft. I'm happy to comply, but if I use a naked blade, I want you to use a real sword. This wooden one's fine. No, I can't agree to that. Certainly you wouldn't expect me, an outsider, to have the audacity to employ a real sword in the presence of his lordship. But, with a touch of impatience, Lord Tadotoshi said, Go ahead, Okatani. Nobody will consider you cowardly for complying with the man's request. It was obvious Kojiro's attitude had affected him. The two men, faces flushed with determination, exchanged greetings with their eyes. Goroji made the first move, leaping to the side, but Kojiro, like a bird stuck to a limed fowling pole, slipped under the lance and struck directly at his chest. Lacking time to thrust, the lancer whirled sideways and tried to jab the nape of Kojiro's neck with the butt of his weapon. With a resounding crack, the lance flew back up into the air as Kojiro's sword bit into Goroji's ribs, which had been exposed by the momentum of the rising lance. Goroji slid to one side, then leapt away, but the attack continued without let-up. With no time to catch his breath, he jumped aside again, then again, and again. The first few dodges were successful, but he was like a peregrine falcon trying to fend off an eagle. Hounded by the raging sword, the lance shaft snapped in two. At the same instant, Goroji emitted a cry. It sounded as though his soul was being torn from his body. The brief battle was ended. Kojiro had hoped to take on four or five men, but Tadatoshi said that he had seen enough. When Kakube came home that evening, Kojiro asked him, Did I go a little too far? In front of his lordship, I mean? No, it was a magnificent performance. Kakube felt rather ill at ease. Now that he could assess the full extent of Kojiro's ability, he felt like a man who had hugged a tiny bird to his chest, only to see it grow up to be an eagle. Did Lord Tadatoshi say anything? Nothing in particular. Come now, he must have said something. Nope. He left the archery range without a word. Hmm. Kojiro looked disappointed, but said, Oh, it doesn't matter. He impressed me as a greater man than he's usually made out to be. I was thinking if I had to serve anyone, it might as well be him. But of course, I have no control over how things turn out. 
he didn't reveal how carefully he had thought about the situation. After the Date, Kuroda, Shimazu, and Mori clans, the Hosokawa was the most prestigious and secure. He felt sure this would continue to be true so long as Lord Sansai held the Buzen fief. And sooner or later, Edo and Osaka would clash once and for all. There was no way of predicting the outcome. A samurai who had chosen the wrong master might easily find himself a ronin again, his whole life sacrificed for a few months' stipend. The day after the bout, word came that Goroji had survived, though his pelvis or left thigh bone had been smashed. Kojiro accepted the news calmly, telling himself that even if he did not receive a position, he had given a good enough account of himself. A few days later, he abruptly announced he was going to pay a call on Goroji. Offering no explanation for this sudden display of kindness, he set out alone and on foot for Goroji's house near Tokiwa Bridge. The unexpected visitor was received cordially by the injured man. A match is a match, said Goroji, a smile on his lips and moistness in his eyes. I may deplore my own lack of skill, but I certainly hold nothing against you. It was good of you to come to see me. Thank you. After Kojiro left, Goroji remarked to a friend, Now there's a samurai I can admire. I thought he was an arrogant son of a bitch, but he turns out to be both friendly and polite. This was precisely the reaction Kojiro had hoped for. It was part of his plan. Other visitors would hear him praised by the defeated man himself. Calling once every two or three days, he made three more visits to Goroji's house. On one occasion, he had a live fish delivered from the fish market as a get-well present. Green Persimmons In the dog days after the summer rainy season, the land crabs crawled sluggishly in the parched street, and the signs taunting Musashi to come out and fight were no longer visible. The few that hadn't fallen in the rain-softened earth or been stolen for firewood were obscured by weeds and tall grass. There must be something somewhere, thought Kojiro, looking around for a place to eat. But this was Edo, not Kyoto, and the cheap rice and tea shops so common in the older city had not yet made their appearance here. The only likely place stood in a vacant lot screened off with reed blinds. Smoke rose lazily from behind the blinds, and on a vertical banner was the word Donjiki. The word immediately reminded him of Tonjiki, which in the distant past had meant the rice balls used as military rations. As he approached, he heard a masculine voice ask for a cup of tea. Inside, two samurai were energetically gobbling rice, one from an ordinary rice bowl, the other from a sake bowl. Kojiro seated himself on the edge of a bench across from them and asked the proprietor, What do you have? Rice dishes. I also have sake. On the banner it says donjiki. What does that mean? As a matter of fact, I don't know. Didn't you write it? No. It was written by a retired merchant who stopped in to rest. I see. Good calligraphy, I must say. He said he was on a religious pilgrimage, said he'd visited Hirakawa Tenjin Shrine, Hikawa Shrine, Kanda Myojin, all sorts of places, making big contributions to each of them. Very pious and generous, he seemed. Do you know his name? He told me it was Daizo of Narai. I've heard the name. Donjiki. Well, I don't understand it. But I figured if a fine man like him wrote it, it might help keep the god of poverty away, he laughed. After a look into several large china bowls, Kojiro took some rice and fish, poured tea over the rice, brushed the fly away with his chopsticks, and began eating. One of the other customers stood up and peered through a broken slat in the blind. Take a look out there, Hamada, he said to his companion. Isn't that the watermelon vendor? The other man went quickly to the blind and looked out. Yeah, 
That's him, all right. The vendor, shouldering a pole with baskets at either end, was walking languidly past the donjiki. The two samurai ran out of the shop and caught up with him. Drawing their swords, they cut the ropes supporting the baskets. The vendor stumbled forward, along with the melons. Hamada yanked him up by the scruff of his neck. Where did you take her? he demanded angrily. Don't lie. You must be hiding her somewhere. The other samurai thrust the tip of his sword under the captive's nose. Out with it! Where is she? The sword blade tapped menacingly against the man's cheek. How could anyone with a face like yours think of going off with somebody else's woman? The vendor, cheeks flushed with anger and fear, shook his head, but then, seeing an opening, shoved one of his captors out of the way, picked up his pole, and took a swing at the other one. So you want to fight, do you? Careful, Hamada, this guy's not just an ordinary melon vendor. What can this ass do? sneered Hamada, snatching the pole and knocking the vendor to the ground. Straddling him, he used the ropes to tie him to the pole. A cry like that of a stuck pig went up behind him. Hamada turned his face around right into a spray of fine red mist. Looking totally dumbfounded, he jumped up, screaming, Who are you? What? The adder-like blade moved directly toward him. Kojiro laughed, and as Hamada shrank back, followed him relentlessly. The two moved in a circle through the grass. When Hamada moved back a foot, Kojiro moved forward the same distance. When Hamada leapt to one side, the drawing pole followed, pointing unwaveringly at its prospective victim. The melon vendor cried out in astonishment, Kojiro, it's me! Save me! Hamada blanched with terror and gasped, Kojiro! Then he wheeled around and tried to flee. Where do you think you're going? barked Kojiro. The drawing pole flashed through the sultry stillness, lopping off Hamada's ear and lodging deep in the flesh under the shoulders. He died on the spot. Kojiro promptly cut the melon vendor's bonds. Rearranging himself into a proper sitting posture, the man bowed and stayed bowed, too embarrassed to show his face. Kojiro wiped and resheathed his sword. Amusement playing faintly around his lips, he said, What's the matter with you, Matahachi? Don't look so miserable. You're still alive. Yes, sir. None of this yes, sir business. Look at me. It's been a long time, hasn't it? I'm glad you're well. Why wouldn't I be? But I must say, you've taken to an unusual trade. Let's not talk about it. All right. Pick up your melons. Then... I know. Why don't you leave them at the donjiki? With a loud shout, he summoned the proprietor, who helped them stack the melons behind the blinds. Kojiro took out his brush and ink and wrote on one of the shoji. To whom it may concern, I certify that the person who killed the two men lying on this vacant lot was myself, Sasaki Kojiro, a ronin residing at Tsukinomisaki. To the proprietor, he said, this should fix it so no one will bother you about the killings. Thank you, sir. Think nothing of it. If friends or relatives of the dead man should come around, please deliver this message for me. Tell them I won't run away. If they want to see me, I'm ready to greet them any time. Outside again, he said to Matahachi, Let's go. Matahachi walked beside him, but would not take his eyes off the ground. Not once since coming to Edo had he held a steady job. Whatever his intention, to become a shugyosha or to go into business, when he found the going rough, he changed jobs. And after Otsu slipped away from him, he felt less and less like working. He'd slept in first one place, then another, sometimes at flop houses populated by hoodlums. The past few weeks, he had been making his living as a common peddler, trudging from one part of the castle wall to another, hawking watermelons. Kojiro wasn't particularly interested in what Matachi had been doing, but he had written a sign at the donjiki, and he might later be questioned about the incident. Why did those samurai have it in for you? he asked. To tell the truth, it had to do with a woman. 
Kojiro smiled, thinking wherever Matahachi went, there soon arose some difficulty connected with women. Perhaps this was his karma. Hmm, he mumbled. The great lover in action again, hey? Then more loudly, who is the woman and what exactly happened? It took some prodding, but eventually Matahachi gave in and told his tale, or part of it. Near the moat, there were dozens of tiny tea shops catering to construction workers and passersby. In one of these, there had been a waitress who caught everybody's eyes, enticing men who did not want tea to step in for a cup, and men who were not hungry to order bowls of sweet jelly. One regular customer had been Hamada. Matahaji, too, dropped in occasionally. One day, this waitress whispered to him that she needed his help. That Ronin, she had said, I don't like him, but every night after the shop closes, the master orders me to go home with him. Won't you let me come and hide in your house? I won't be a burden. I'll cook for you and mend your clothes. Since her plea seemed reasonable, Matahachi had agreed. That was all there was to it, he insisted. Kojiro was unconvinced. It sounds fishy to me. Why? Matahachi asked. Kojiro could not decide whether Matahachi was trying to make himself appear innocent or whether he was bragging about an amorous conquest. Without even smiling, he said, Never mind. It's hot out here under the sun. Let's go to your house and you can tell me about it in more detail. Matahachi stopped in his tracks. Is there anything wrong with that? asked Kojiro. Well, my place is... it's... Not the sort of place I'd want to take you to. Seeing the distressed look in Matahachi's eyes, Kojiro said lightly, Never mind. But one of these days soon you must come to see me. I'm staying with Iwama Kakube about halfway up Isarago Hill. I'd like that. By the way, did you see the signs posted around the city recently, the ones addressed to Musashi? Yes. They said your mother was looking for him too. Why don't you go to see her? Not the way I am now. Idiot. You don't have to put on a great show for your own mother. There's no way of knowing just when she might find Musashi, and if you're not there at the time, you'll lose the chance of a lifetime. You'd regret that, wouldn't you? Yes. I'll have to do something about that soon, Matachi said noncommittally, thinking resentfully that other people, including the man who had just saved his life, did not understand the feelings between mothers and their offspring. They parted, Matahachi ambling down a grassy lane, Kojiro ostensibly setting out in the opposite direction. Kojiro soon doubled back and followed Matahachi, taking care to stay out of sight. Matahachi arrived presently at a motley collection of long houses, one-story tenements, each containing three or four small apartments under a single roof. Since Edo had grown rapidly, and not everybody could be choosy about where he lived, people cleared land as the necessity arose. Streets came into existence afterward, developing naturally from pathways. Drainage, too, came about by accident, as wastewater cut its own path to the nearest stream. Had it not been for these jerry-built slums, the influx of newcomers could have not been absorbed. The majority of the inhabitants of such places were, of course, workmen. Near his home, Matahachi was greeted by a neighbor named Umpe, the boss of a crew of well diggers. Umpe was seated cross legged in a large wooden tub, only his face showing above the rain shutter placed sideways in front of the tub for privacy. Good evening, said Matahachi. I see you're having your bath. I'm about to get out, replied the boss genially. Would you like to use it next? Thanks, but I think Akemi's probably heated water for me. You two are very fond of each other, aren't you? Nobody around here seems to know whether you're brother and sister or husband and wife. Which is it? Matahachi giggled sheepishly. The appearance of Akemi saved him from having to answer. She placed a tub under a persimmon tree and brought pailfuls of hot water from the house to fill it. When she was done, she said, Feel it, Matahachi. See if it's hot enough. 
It's a little too hot. There was the squeaking of the well pulley, and Matahachi, stripped to his loincloth, brought up a bucket of cold water and poured it into the bath before climbing in himself. Ah, he sighed contentedly. This feels good. Umpe, wearing a cotton summer kimono, placed a bamboo stool under a gourd trellis and sat down. Did you sell lots of melons? he inquired. Not many. I never sell very many. Noticing dried blood between his fingers, he hastily wiped it off. I don't imagine you would. I still think your life would be easier if you went to work on a well-digging gang. You're always saying that. Don't think I'm ungrateful, but if I did that, they wouldn't let me off the castle grounds, would they? That's why Akemi doesn't want me to take the job. She says she'd be lonesome without me. Happily married couple, eh? Well, well. Ouch! What's the matter? Something fell on my head. A green persimmon landed on the ground just behind Matahachi. Aha! Punishment for bragging about your wife's devotion, that's what it is. Still laughing, Umpe wrapped his tannin-coated fan on his knee. Over sixty years old, with a shaggy, hemp-like mane of white hair, Umpe was a man who enjoyed the respect of his neighbors and the admiration of the young people, whom he big-heartedly treated as his own children. Each morning he could be heard chanting, Namumyoho Renge-kyo, the sacred invocation of the Nichiren sect. A native of Ito in Izu province, he had a sign in front of his house saying, Idohori no Umpe, well digger for the shogun's castle. To build the many wells necessary for the castle involved technical skills beyond those of ordinary laborers. Umpe had been hired as a consultant and recruiter of workers because of his long experience in the gold mines of Izu Peninsula. He enjoyed nothing more than sitting under his beloved gourd trellis, spinning yarns and drinking his nightly cup of cheap but potent shochu, the poor man's sake. After Matahachi emerged from the bath, Akemi surrounded the washtub with rain shutters and had hers. Later, the matter of Umpe's proposal came up once again. Besides having to stay on the castle grounds, the workers were watched very closely and their families were virtually hostages of the bosses of the areas where they lived. On the other hand, the work was easier than on the outside and paid at least twice as much. Leaning over a tray on which there was a dish of cold bean curd garnished with fresh, fragrant basil leaf, Matachi said, I don't want to become a prisoner just to earn a little money. I'm not going to sell melons all my life, but bear with me a little longer, Akemi. Hmm, she replied between mouthfuls of tea and rice gruel. I'd rather you try just once to do something really worthwhile, something that would make people take notice. Though nothing was ever said or done to discourage the idea that she was Matahachi's legal wife, she wasn't about to marry anyone who shilly-shallied the way he did. Fleeing the world of play at Sakaimachi with Matahachi had been only an expedient. He was the perch from which she intended, at the first opportunity, to fly once more into the open sky. But it did not suit her purposes for Matahachi to go off to the castle to work. She felt being left alone would be dangerous. Specifically, she was afraid Hamada might find her and force her to live with him. Oh, I forgot, said Matahachi, as they finished their frugal meal. He then told her about his experiences that day, adjusting the details in a fashion calculated to please her. By the time he had finished, her face was ashen. Taking a deep breath, she said, You saw Kojiro? Did you tell him I was here? You didn't, did you? Matachi took her hand and placed it on his knee. Of course not. Do you think I'd let that bastard know where you are? He's the kind that never gives up. He'd be after you. He broke off with an inarticulate shout and pressed his hand to the side of his face. The green persimmon that smashed against his cheek broke and spattered its whitish meat in Akemi's face. Outside, in the shadows of a moonlit bamboo grove, 
A form not unlike that of Kojiro could be seen walking nonchalantly away in the direction of town. Eyes Sensei! called Iori, who was not yet tall enough to see over the tall grass. They were on Musashino Plain, which was said to cover ten counties. I'm right here, replied Musashi. What's taking you so long? I guess there's a path, but I keep losing it. How much farther do we have to go? Till we find a good place to live. Live? We're going to stay around here? Why shouldn't we? Iori gazed up at the sky, thought of its vastness and the emptiness of the land around him, and said, I wonder. Think what it'll be like in the fall. Clear, beautiful skies, fresh dew on the grass. Doesn't it make you feel cleaner just thinking about it? Well, maybe, but I'm not against living in the city like you. I'm not really. In a way, it's nice to be among people, but even with my thick skin, I couldn't stand being there when those signs were put up. You saw what they said. Iori grimaced. I get mad just thinking about it. Why let yourself get angry over that? I couldn't help it. No matter where I went, there wasn't anybody who'd say anything good about you. Nothing I could do about that. You could have cut down the men spreading the rumors. You could have put up your own signs, challenging them. There's no point in starting fights you can't win. You wouldn't have lost to that scum. You couldn't have. No, you're wrong. I would have. How? Sheer numbers. If I beat ten there'd be a hundred more. If I defeated a hundred, there'd be a thousand. There's no possibility of winning in that kind of situation. But does that mean you're going to be laughed at for the rest of your life? Of course not. I'm as determined as the next person to have a good name. I owe it to my ancestors. And I intend to become a man who's never laughed at. That's what I came out here to learn. We can walk all we want, but I don't think we're going to find any houses. Shouldn't we try to find a temple to stay in again? That's not a bad idea. But what I really want is to find some place with a lot of trees and build a house of our own. It'll be like Hotengahara again, won't it? No. This time we're not going to farm. I think maybe I'll practice Zen meditation every day. You can read books, and I'll give you some lessons in the sword. Entering the plain at the village of Kashiwagi, the Koshu entrance to Edo, they had come down the long slope from Ju Nishogongen and followed a narrow path that repeatedly threatened to disappear among the waving summer grasses. When they finally reached the pine-covered knoll, Musashi made a quick survey of the terrain and said, This'll do fine. To him, any place could serve as home. More than that, Wherever he happened to be was the universe. They borrowed tools and hired a laborer at the nearest farmhouse. Musashi's approach to building a house was not at all sophisticated. In fact, he could have learned quite a bit from watching birds build a nest. The result, finished a few days later, was an oddity, less substantial than a hermit's mountain retreat, but not so crude as to be described as a shed. The posts were logs with the bark left on, the remainder a rough alliance of boards, bark, bamboo, and miscanthus. Standing back to take a good look, Musashi remarked thoughtfully, This must be like the houses people lived in back in the age of the gods. The only relief from the primitiveness were scraps of paper lovingly fashioned to make small shoji. In the days following, the sound of Iori's voice, floating from behind a reed blind as he recited his lessons, rose above the buzz of the cicadas. His training had become very strict in every respect. With Jotaro, Musashi had not insisted on discipline, thinking at the time that it was best to let growing boys grow naturally. But with the passage of time, he had observed that, if anything, Bad traits tended to develop and good ones to be repressed. Similarly, he had noticed that trees and plants he wanted to grow would not grow, while weeds and brush flourished no matter how often he cut them down. 
During the hundred years after the Onin War, the nation had been like a tangled mass of overgrown hemp plants. Then Nobunaga had cut the plants down, Hideyoshi had bundled them up, and Ieyasu had broken and smoothed the ground to build a new world. As Musashi saw it, warriors who placed a high value only on martial practices and whose most noticeable characteristic was unbounded ambition were no longer the dominant element in society. Sekigahara had put an end to that. He had come to believe that whether the nation remained in the hands of the Tokugawas or reverted to the Toyotomis, people in general already knew the direction they wanted to move in, from chaos toward order, from destruction toward construction. At times, he'd had the feeling he had been born too late. No sooner had Hideyoshi's glory penetrated into remote rural areas and fired the hearts of boys like Musashi than the possibility of following in Hideyoshi's footsteps evaporated. So it was his own experience that led to his decision to emphasize discipline in Iori's upbringing. If he was going to create a samurai, he should create one for the coming era, not for the past. Iori! Yes, sir? The boy was kneeling before Musashi almost before the words were out. It's almost sunset. Time for our practice. Bring the swords. Yes, sir. When he placed them in front of Musashi, he knelt and formally requested a lesson. Musashi's sword was long, Iori's short, both wooden practice weapons. Teacher and pupil faced each other in tense silence, swords held at eye level. A rim of sunlight hovered on the horizon. The cryptomeria grove behind the cabin was already sunk in gloom, but if one looked toward the voices of the cicadas, a sliver of moon was visible through the branches. Eyes, said Musashi. Iori opened his eyes wide. My eyes! Look at them! Iori did his best, but his eyes seemed to literally bounce away from Musashi's. Instead of glaring... He was being defeated by his opponent's eyes. When he tried again, he was seized by giddiness. His head began to feel as if it were no longer his own. His hands, his feet, his whole body felt wobbly. Look at my eyes, Musashi commanded with great sternness. Iori's look had strayed again. Then, concentrating on his master's eyes, he forgot the sword in his hand. The short length of curved wood seemed to become as heavy as a bar of steel. Eyes, eyes, said Musashi, advancing slightly. Iori checked the urge to fall back, for which he had been scolded dozens of times. But when he attempted to follow his opponent's lead and move forward, his feet were nailed to the ground. Unable either to advance or to retreat, he could feel his body temperature rise. What's the matter with me? The thought exploded like fireworks inside him. Sensing this burst of mental energy, Musashi yelled, Charge! At the same time, he lowered his shoulders, dropped back, and dodged with the agility of a fish. With a gasp, Iori sprang forward, spun around, and saw Musashi standing where he himself had been. Then the confrontation began again, just as before, both teacher and pupil maintaining strict silence. Before long, the grass was soaked with dew, and the eyebrow of a moon hung above the cryptomerias. Each time the wind gusted, the insects stopped singing momentarily. Autumn had come, and the wild flowers, though not spectacular in the daytime, now quivered gracefully, like the feathered robe of a dancing deity. Enough, said Musashi, lowering his sword. As he handed it to Iori, they became conscious of a voice coming from the direction of the grove. I wonder who that is, said Musashi. Probably a lost traveler wanting to put up for the night. Run and see. As Iori sped around to the other side of the building, Musashi seated himself on the bamboo veranda and gazed out over the plain. The Eulalias were tall, their tops fluffy. The light bathing the grass had a peculiar autumn sheen. When Iori returned, Musashi asked, A traveler? No, a guest. Guest? Here? 
It's Hojo Shinzo. He tied his horse up and he's waiting for you in back. This house doesn't really have any back or front, but I think it'd be better to receive him here. Iori ran around the side of the cabin, shouting, Please, come this way. This is a pleasure, said Musashi, his eyes expressing his delight at seeing Shinzo completely recovered. Sorry to have been out of touch so long. I suppose you live out here to get away from people. I hope you'll forgive me for dropping in unexpectedly like this. Greetings having been exchanged, Musashi invited Shinzo to join him on the veranda. How did you find me? I haven't told anyone where I am. Zushino Kosuke. He said you'd finished the kanon you promised him and sent Iori to deliver it. Aha! I suppose Iori let the secret out. It doesn't matter. I'm not old enough to abandon the world and retire. I did think, though, that if I left the scene for a couple of months, the malicious gossip would quiet down. Then there'd be less danger of reprisals against Kosuke and my other friends. Shinzo lowered his head. I owe you an apology. All this trouble because of me. Not really. That was a minor thing. The real root of the matter has to do with the relationship between Kojiro and me. Did you know he killed Obata Yogoro? No. Yogoro, when he heard about me, decided to take revenge himself. He was no match for Kojiro. I warned him. The image of the youthful Yogoro standing in the entrance of his father's house was still vivid in Musashi's mind. What a pity, he thought to himself. I can understand how he felt, continued Shinzo. The students had all left, and his father had died. He must have thought he was the only one who could do it. In any case, he appears to have gone to Kojiro's house. Still, no one saw them together. There's no real proof. Hmm. Maybe my warning had the opposite effect from what I intended. Stirred up his pride so he felt he had to fight. It's a shame. It is. Yogoro was Sensei's only blood relation. With his death, the house of Obata ceased to exist. However, my father discussed the matter with Lord Munenori, who somehow managed to institute adoption proceedings. I'm to become Kagenori's heir and successor and carry on the Obata name. I'm not sure I'm mature enough yet. I'm afraid I may end up bringing further disgrace to the man. After all, he was the greatest proponent of the Koshu military tradition. Your father's the Lord of Awa. Isn't the Hojo military tradition considered to be on a par with the Koshu school? And your father as great a master as Kagenori? That's what they say. Our ancestors came from Totomi province. My grandfather served Hojo Ujitsuna and Hojo Ujiasu of Odawara, and my father was selected by Ieyasu himself to succeed them as head of the family. Coming from a famous military family, isn't it unusual for you to have become a disciple of Kagenori's? My father has his disciples, and he's given lectures before the shogun on military science. But instead of teaching me anything, he told me to go out and learn from somebody else. Find out the hard way. That's the kind of man he is. Musashi sensed an element of intrinsic decency, even nobility, in Shinzo's demeanor. And it was probably natural, he thought, for his father, Ujikatsu, was an outstanding general, and his mother was the daughter of Hojo Ujiasu. I'm afraid I've been talking too much, said Shinzo. Actually, my father sent me out here. Of course, it would have been only proper for him to come and express his gratitude to you in person. But just now, he has a guest, who's quite eager to see you. My father told me to bring you back with me. Will you come? He peered inquiringly into Musashi's face. A guest of your father's wants to see me? That's right. Who could it be? I know almost no one in Edo. A person you've known since you were a boy. Musashi couldn't imagine who it might be. Matahachi, perhaps? A samurai from Takeyama Castle? 
a friend of his father's. Maybe even Otsu. But Shinzo refused to divulge his secret. I was instructed not to tell you who it is. The guests said it would be better to surprise you. Will you come? Musashi's curiosity was piqued. He told himself it couldn't be Otsu, but in his heart hoped it was. Let's go, he said, rising to his feet. Iori, don't wait up for me. Shinzo, pleased that his mission was successful, went behind the house and brought his horse. Saddle and stirrups were dripping with dew. Holding the bit, he offered the horse to Musashi, who proceeded without further ado to mount it. As they left, Musashi said to Iori, Take care of yourself. I may not be back until tomorrow. It was not long before he was swallowed up by the evening mist. Iori sat quietly on the veranda, lost in thought. Eyes, he thought. Eyes. Innumerable times he had been ordered to keep his eyes on his opponents, but as yet he could neither understand the import of the instruction nor get the idea out of his mind. He gazed vacantly up at the river of heaven. What was wrong with him? Why was it that when Musashi stared at him, he couldn't stare straight back? More vexed by his failure than an adult would have been, he was trying very hard to find the explanation when he became conscious of a pair of eyes. They were aimed at him from the branches of a wild grapevine, which twined around a tree in front of the cabin. What's that? he thought. The brightly shining eyes reminded him strongly of Musashi's eyes during practice sessions. Must be a possum. He had seen one several times, eating the wild grapes. The eyes were like agate, the eyes of a fierce hobgoblin. Beast! cried Iori. You think I don't have any courage? Think even you can outstare me? Well, I'll show you. I'm not about to lose to you. With grim determination, he tensed his elbows and glared back. The possum, whether out of stubbornness or curiosity, made no move to flee. Its eyes took on an even more lustrous brilliance. The effort so absorbed Iori that he forgot to breathe. He swore again not to lose, not to this lowly beast. After what seemed like hours, he realized with a flash that he had triumphed. The leaves of the grapevine shook and the possum vanished. That'll show you, exulted Iori. He was drenched with sweat but he felt relieved and refreshed. He only hoped he would be able to repeat the performance the next time he confronted Musashi. Having lowered a reed blind on the window and snuffed out the lamp, he went to bed. A bluish-white light reflected from the grass outside. He dozed off, but inside his head he seemed to see a tiny spot, shining like a jewel. In time, the spot grew into the vague outline of the possum's face. Tossing and moaning, he was suddenly overwhelmed by the conviction that there were eyes at the foot of his palate. He roused himself with difficulty. Bastard! he cried, reaching for his sword. He took a murderous swing but ended up doing a somersault. The shadow of the possum was a moving spot on the blind. He slashed at it wildly, then ran outside and hacked fiercely at the grapevine. His eyes rose skyward in search of the eyes. There came into focus, slowly, two large, bluish stars. Four Sages with a Single Light Here we are, Shinzo said as they reached the foot of Akagi Hill. From the flute music, which sounded like the accompaniment to a sacred shrine dance and the bonfire visible through the woods, Musashi thought a night festival must be in progress. The trip to Shigome had taken two hours. On one side was the spacious compound of Akagi Shrine. Across the sloping street stood the earthen wall of a large private residence and a gate of magnificent proportions. When they reached the gate, Musashi dismounted and handed the reins to Shinzo, thanking him as he did so. 
Shinzo led the horse inside and handed the reins to one of a group of samurai waiting near the entrance with paper lanterns in their hands. They all came forward, welcomed him back, and led the way through the trees to a clearing in front of the imposing entrance hall. Inside, servants holding lanterns were lined up on both sides of the hallway. The chief steward greeted them, saying, Come in. His lordship is expecting you. I'll show you the way. Thank you, replied Musashi. He followed the steward up a stairway and into a waiting room. The design of the house was unusual. One stairway after another led to a series of apartments, which gave the impression of being stacked one above another all the way up Akagi Hill. As he seated himself, Musashi noted that the room was well up the slope. Beyond a drop at the edge of the garden, he could just make out the northern part of the castle moat and the woods framing the escarpment. He found himself thinking that the view from the room in the daytime must be breathtaking. Noiselessly, the door in an arched doorway slid open. A beautiful serving girl came gracefully in and placed a tray bearing cakes, tea, and tobacco in front of him. Then she slipped out as quietly as she had entered. It seemed as if her colorful kimono and obi had emerged from and melted into the wall itself. A faint fragrance lingered after her, and suddenly Musashi was reminded of the existence of women. The master of the house appeared shortly after that, attended by a young samurai. Dispensing with formalities, he said, Good of you to come. In good soldierly fashion, he seated himself cross-legged on a cushion spread by the attendant and said, From what I hear, my son is much indebted to you. I hope you'll pardon my asking you to come here rather than visiting your house to express my thanks. With his hands resting lightly on the fan in his lap, he inclined his prominent forehead ever so slightly. I'm honored to be invited to meet you, said Musashi. It was not easy to estimate Hojo Ujikatsu's age. Three front teeth were missing, but his smooth, shiny skin testified to a determination never to grow old. The heavy black mustache, streaked with only a few white hairs, had been allowed to grow out on both sides to conceal any wrinkles resulting from the lack of teeth. Musashi's first impression was of a man who had many children and got along well with young people. Sensing that his host wouldn't object, Musashi went straight to the point. Your son tells me that you have a guest who knows me. Who might that be? Not one, but two. You'll see them by and by. Two people? Yes, they know each other very well, and both are good friends of mine. I happened to meet them at the castle today. They came back with me, and when Shinzo came in to greet them, we started chatting about you. One of them said he hadn't seen you for a long time, and would like to. The other, who knows you only by reputation, expressed the desire to be introduced. Smiling broadly, Musashi said, I think I know. One is Takuan Soho, isn't it? That's right! exclaimed Lord Ujikatsu, slapping his knee in surprise. I haven't seen him since I came east several years ago. Before Musashi had time to make a guess at who the other man was, his lordship said, Come with me, and went out into the corridor. They climbed a short stairway and walked down a long, dark corridor. Rain shutters were in place on one side, Suddenly, Musashi lost sight of Lord Ujikatsu. He stopped and listened. After a few moments, Ujikatsu called, I'm down here. His voice seemed to come from a well-lit room that was situated across an open space from the corridor. I understand, Musashi called back. Instead of heading directly for the light, he stood where he was. The space outside the corridor was openly inviting, but something told him danger lurked in that stretch of darkness. What are you waiting for, Musashi? We're over here. Coming, answered Musashi. He was in no position to reply otherwise, but his sixth sense had warned him to be on the alert. Stealthily, 
He turned and walked back about ten paces to a small door which led out onto the garden. Slipping on a pair of sandals, he made his way around the garden to the veranda of Lord Ujikatsu's parlor. Oh, you came that way, did you? said his lordship, looking around from the other end of the room. He sounded disappointed. Takuan, called Musashi as he entered the room, a radiant smile on his face. The priest, seated in front of the alcove, stood up to greet him. To meet again, and under the roof of Lord Hojo Ujikatsu, seemed almost too fortuitous. Musashi had trouble convincing himself that it was really happening. We'll have to bring each other up to date, said Takuan. Shall I begin? He was clad in the plain robes he always wore. No finery, not so much as prayer beads. Yet... He seemed mellower than before, more soft-spoken. Just as Musashi's rural upbringing had been leached out of him by strenuous attempts at self-discipline, Takuan, too, seemed to have had the sharper corners rounded off and to have become more deeply endowed with the wisdom of Zen. To be sure, he was no longer a youth. Eleven years older than Musashi, he was now approaching forty. Let's see... Kyoto, wasn't it? Ah, I remember. It was shortly before I went back to Tajima. After my mother died, I spent a year in mourning. Then I traveled for a while, spent some time at the Nansoji in Izumi, then at the Daitokuji. Later, I saw a good deal of Lord Karasumaru, composed poetry with him, had tea ceremonies, fended off the cares of this world. Before I knew it... I'd spent three years in Kyoto. Recently, I became friendly with Lord Koide of Kishiwada Castle and came with him to have a look at Edo. Then you've been here only a short time? Yes, although I've met Hidetata twice at the Daitokuji and been summoned into Ieyasu's presence a number of times, this is my first trip to Edo. And what about you? I've been here only since the beginning of this summer. It seems you've made quite a name for yourself in this part of the country. Musashi didn't try to justify himself. He hung his head and said, I suppose you've heard about that. Takuan stared at him for a few moments, seemingly comparing him with the Takezo of old. Why worry about that? It'd be strange if a man your age had too good a reputation. So long as you haven't done anything disloyal or ignoble or rebellious, what does it matter? I'm more interested in hearing about your training. Musashi gave a brief account of his recent experiences and ended by saying, I'm afraid I'm still immature, imprudent, far from being truly enlightened. The more I travel, the longer the road becomes. I have the feeling I'm climbing an endless mountain path. That's the way it has to be, said Takuan, clearly pleased with the youth's integrity and humility. If a man not yet thirty claims to know the least bit about the way, it's an unmistakable sign his growth has stopped. Even I still shudder with embarrassment when anyone suggests that an uncouth priest like me could know the ultimate meaning of Zen. It's disconcerting the way people are always asking me to tell them about the Buddhist law or explain the true teachings. People try to look up to a priest as a living Buddha. Be thankful that others don't overestimate you, that you don't have to pay attention to appearances. While the two men happily renewed their friendship, servants arrived with food and drink. Presently, Takuan said, Forgive me, your lordship. I'm afraid we're forgetting something. Why don't you call your other guest in? Musashi was certain now that he knew who the fourth person was, but elected to remain silent. Hesitating slightly, Ujikatsu said, Shall I call him? Then to Musashi, I'll have to admit you saw through our little trick. As the one who planned it, I feel rather ashamed. Takuan laughed. Good for you! I'm glad to see you're up to admitting defeat. But why not? It was only a game to amuse everybody anyway, wasn't it? Certainly nothing for the master of the Hojo style to lose face over. Well, no doubt I was defeated. 
murmured Ujikatsu, reluctance still in his voice. The truth is that, although I've heard what sort of man you are, I had no way of knowing just how well-trained and disciplined you are. I thought I'd see for myself, and my other guest agreed to cooperate. When you stopped in the passageway, he was waiting in ambush, ready to draw his sword. His lordship seemed to regret having had to put Musashi to the test. But you perceived you were being lured into a trap and came across the garden. Looking directly at Musashi, he asked, May I ask why you did that? Musashi merely grinned. Takuan spoke up. It's the difference, your lordship, between the military strategist and the swordsman. Is it now? It's a matter of instinctive responses, that of a military scholar based on intellectual principles versus that of a man who follows the way of the sword based on the heart. You reasoned that if you led Musashi on, he'd follow. Yet, without being able to actually see or to put his finger on anything definite, Musashi sensed danger and moved to protect himself. His reaction was spontaneous, instinctive. Instinctive? Like a Zen revelation. Do you have premonitions like that? I can't really say. In any case, I've learned a lesson. The average samurai, sensing danger, might have lost his head, or perhaps seized upon the trap as an excuse to display his prowess with the sword. When I saw Musashi go back, put on the sandals, and cross the garden, I was deeply impressed. Musashi kept his silence, his face revealing no special pleasure at Lord Ujikatsu's words of praise. His thoughts turned to the man still standing outside in the dark, stranded by the victim's failure to fall into the trap. Addressing his host, he said, May I request that the Lord of Tajima take his place among us now? What's that? Ujikatsu was astonished, as was Takuan. How did you know? Moving back to give Yagyu Munenori the place of honor, Musashi said, Despite the darkness, I felt the presence of peerless swordsmanship. Taking into consideration the other faces present, I don't see how it could be anyone else. You've done it again! Ujikatsu was amazed. At a nod from him, Takuan said, The Lord of Tajima, quite right. Turning to the door, he called, Your secret is out, Lord Munenori. Won't you join us? There was a loud laugh, and Munenori appeared in the doorway. Instead of arranging himself comfortably in front of the alcove, he knelt in front of Musashi and greeted him as an equal, saying, My name is Mataemon Munenori. I hope you will remember me. It is an honor to meet you. I am a ronin from Mimasaka, Miyamoto Musashi by name. I pray for your guidance in the future. Kimura Skekuro mentioned you to me some months ago, but at the time I was busy because of my father's illness. How is Lord Sekishusai? Well, he's very old. There's no way of knowing. After a brief pause, he continued with warm cordiality. My father told me about you in a letter, and I've heard Takuan speak of you several times. I must say... Your reaction a few minutes ago was admirable. If you don't mind, I think we should regard the bout you requested as having taken place. I hope you're not offended by my unorthodox way of carrying it out. Musashi's impression was of intelligence and maturity quite in accordance with the daimyo's reputation. I'm embarrassed by your thoughtfulness he replied, bowing very low. His show of deference was natural, for Lord Munenori's status was so far above Musashi's as to put him virtually in another world. Though his fief amounted to only 50,000 bushels, his family had been famous as provincial magistrates since the 10th century. 
To most people, it would have seemed odd to find one of the shogun's tutors in the same room with Musashi, let alone talking to him in a friendly, informal fashion. It was a relief to Musashi to note that neither Ujikatsu, a scholar and member of the shogun's banner guard, nor Takuan, a country priest by origin, felt any constraint because of Munenori's rank. Warm sake was brought, cups were exchanged, talk and laughter ensued. Differences in age and class were forgotten. Musashi knew he was being accepted in this select circle not because of who he was. He was seeking the way, just as they were. It was the way that permitted such free camaraderie. At one point, Takuan set down his cup and asked Musashi, What's become of Otsu? Reddening slightly, Musashi said he hadn't seen or heard anything of her for some time. Nothing at all? Nothing. That's unfortunate. You can't leave her in the lurch forever, you know. It's not good for you, either. By Otsu, asked Munenori. Do you mean the girl who once stayed with my father in Koyagyu? Yes, replied Takuan on Musashi's behalf. I know where she is. She went to Koyagyu with my nephew, Hyogo, to help nurse my father. With a noted military scientist and Takuan present, thought Musashi, they could be talking about strategy or discussing Zen. With both Munenori and Musashi present, the subject could have been swords. With a nod of apology to Musashi, Takuan told the others about Otsu and her relationship with Musashi. Sooner or later, he concluded, someone will have to bring the two of you together again, but I fear it's no task for a priest. I ask the assistance of you two gentlemen. What he was actually suggesting was that Ujikatsu and Munenori act as Musashi's guardians. They seemed willing to accept this role, Munenori observing that Musashi was old enough to have a family, and Ujikatsu saying that he had reached a satisfactorily high level of training. Munenori suggested that one of these days, Otsu should be summoned back from Koyagyu and given in marriage to Musashi. Then Musashi could set himself up in Edo, where his house, along with those of Ono Tadaki and Yagyu Munenori, would form a triumvirate of the sword and usher in a golden age of swordsmanship in the new capital. Both Takuan and Ujikatsu concurred. Specifically, Lord Ujikatsu, eager to reward Musashi for his kindness to Shinzo, wanted to recommend him as a tutor to the shogun, an idea the three of them had explored before sending Shinzo for Musashi. And having seen how Musashi reacted to their test, Munenori himself was now ready to give his approval to the plan. There were difficulties to be overcome, one being that a teacher in the shogun's household also had to be a member of the honor guard. Since many of its members were faithful vassals of the Tokugawas from the days when Ieyasu had held the Mikawa fief, there was a reluctance to appoint new people, and all candidates were investigated with great thoroughness. However, it was felt that with recommendations from Ujikatsu and Munenori, together with a letter of guarantee from Takuang, Musashi would get by. The sticky point was his ancestry. There was no written record tracing his ancestry back to Hirata Shogen of the Akamatsu clan, nor even a genealogical chart to prove he was of good samurai stock. He assuredly had no family connections with the Tokugawas. On the contrary, it was an undeniable fact that as a callow youth of seventeen, he had fought against the Tokugawa forces at Sekigahara. Still, there was a chance. Other ronin from former enemy clans had joined the house of Tokugawa after Sekigahara. Even Ono Tadaki, a ronin from the Kitabatake clan, which was at present in hiding in Ise Matsuzaka, held an appointment as tutor to the shogun despite his undesirable connections. After the three men had again gone over the pros and cons, Takuan said, All right then, let's recommend him. But perhaps we should find out what he himself thinks about it. The question was put to Musashi, who replied mildly, 
It's kind and generous of you to suggest this, but I'm nothing but an immature young man. Don't think of it in that way, said Takuan with an air of candor. What we're advising you to do is become mature. Will you establish a house of your own, or do you plan to make Otsu go on indefinitely living as she is now? Musashi felt hemmed in. Otsu had said she was willing to bear any hardship, but this would in no way lessen Musashi's responsibility for any grief that might befall her. While it was acceptable for a woman to act in accordance with her own feelings, if the outcome was not a happy one, the man would be blamed. Not that Musashi was unwilling to accept the responsibility. On the whole, he yearned to accept. Otsu had been guided by love, and the onus of that love belonged to him as much as to her. Nevertheless, he felt it was still too early to marry and have a family. The long, hard way of the sword stretched before him yet. His desire to follow it was undiminished. It did not simplify matters that his attitude toward the sword had changed. Since Hotengahara, the sword of the conqueror and the sword of the killer were things of the past, no longer of any use or meaning. Nor did being a technician, even one who gave instruction to men of the shogun's retinue, excite his interest. The way of the sword, as he had come to see it, must have specific objectives. To establish order, to protect, and refine the spirit. The way had to be one men could cherish as they did their lives, until their dying day. If such a way existed, could it not be employed to bring peace to the world and happiness to all? When he had answered Skekuro's letter with a challenge to Lord Munenori, his motive had not been the shallow urge to score a victory that had led him to challenge Sekshusai. Now his wish was to be engaged in the business of governing. Not on any grand scale, of course. A small, insignificant fief would suffice for the activities he imagined would promote the cause of good government. But he lacked the confidence to express these ideas, feeling that other swordsmen would dismiss his youthful ambitions as being absurd. Or, if they took him seriously, they would feel compelled to warn him. Politics leads to destruction. By going into government, he would sully his beloved sword. They would do this out of genuine concern for his soul. He even believed that if he spoke his mind truthfully, the two warriors and the priest would react either with laughter or with alarm. When he did get around to speaking, it was to protest. He was too young too immature, his training was inadequate. At length, Takuan cut him off, saying, Leave it to us! Lord Ujikatsu added, We'll see that it turns out all right for you. The matter was decided. Coming in periodically to trim the lamp, Shinzo had caught the gist of the conversation. He quietly let his father and the guests know that what he had heard pleased him immensely. The Locust Tree Matahachi opened his eyes and looked around, got up and poked his head out the back door. Akemi! he called. There was no answer. Something prompted him to open the closet. She had recently finished making a new kimono. It was gone. Going next door first to Umpe's, he then walked through the alley toward the street anxiously asking everyone he met if they'd seen her. I saw her this morning, said the charcoal vendor's wife. You did? Where? She was all dressed up. I asked her where she was off to, and she said to see relatives in Shinagawa. Shinagawa? Doesn't she have relatives there? she asked skeptically. He started to say no, but caught himself. Uh, yes, of course. That's where she's gone run after her? In truth, his attachment to her was not particularly strong, 
and he was more annoyed than anything else. Her disappearance left a bittersweet taste. He spat and gave vent to an oath or two, then strolled down to the beach just on the other side of the Shibauda High Road. A little back from the water stood a scattering of fishermen's houses. It was his habit to come here every morning while Akemi was cooking rice and look for fish. Usually at least five or six had fallen from the nets, and he would return just in time to have them cooked for breakfast. Today he ignored the fish. What's the matter, Matahachi? The pawnbroker from the main street tapped him on the shoulder. Good morning, said Matahachi. It's nice to be out early, isn't it? I'm glad to see you come out for a walk every morning. Great for your health. You're joking, I suppose. Maybe if I was rich like you, I'd be walking for my health. For me, walking's work. You don't look too well. Something happened? Matachi picked up a handful of sand and cast it bit by bit into the wind. Both he and Akemi were well acquainted with the pawnbroker, who had tided them over several emergencies. Undaunted, the man continued, You know, there's something I've been meaning to talk to you about, but I never seem to have the chance. Are you going out to work today? Why bother? It's not much of a living selling watermelons. Come fishing with me. Matachi scratched his head and looked apologetic. Thanks, but I really don't like to fish. Well, you don't have to fish if you don't want to, but come along anyway. It'll make you feel better. That's my boat over there. You can scull a boat, can't you? I guess so. Come along. I'm going to tell you how to make a lot of money. Maybe a thousand pieces of gold. How would you like that? Suddenly, Matahachi had a great interest in going fishing. About a thousand yards offshore, the water was still shallow enough to touch bottom with the skull. Letting the boat drift, Matahachi asked, Just how do I go about making this money? I'll tell you soon enough. The pawnbroker readjusted his bulky frame on the seat at the waist of the boat. I'd appreciate it if you'd hold a fishing pole out over the water. Why? It's better if people think we're fishing. Two people rowing out this far just to talk would look suspicious. How's this? Fine. He took out a pipe with a ceramic bowl, packed it with expensive tobacco, and lit it. Before I tell you what I have in mind, let me ask you a question. What do your neighbors say about me? About you? Yes, about Daizo of Narai. Well, pawnbrokers are supposed to be skinflints, but everybody says you're very good about lending money. They say you're a man who understands life. I don't mean my business practices. I want to know their opinion of me personally. They think you're a good man, a man with a heart. I'm not just flattering you. That's really what they say. Don't they ever comment on what a religious man I am? Oh, yes, of course. Everybody's amazed at how charitable you are. Have men from the magistrate's office ever come around inquiring about me? No. Why should they? Daizo gave a little laugh. I suppose you think my questions are foolish— but the truth of the matter is that I'm not really a pawnbroker. What? Matachi, you may never have another chance to make so much money all at once. You're probably right. Do you want to catch hold? Of what? The money vine. W what do I have to do? Make a promise to me and carry it out. That's all? That's all. But if you change your mind later, you're as good as dead. I know the money interests you, but think hard before you give your final answer. Just what do I have to do? Matachi asked suspiciously. You have to become a well digger. There's nothing to it. At Edo Castle? Daizo gazed out over the bay. 
cargo boats loaded with building materials and bearing the flags of several great clans, Todo, Arima, Kato, Date, Hosokawa, were lined up almost prow to stern. You catch on quick, Matahachi. The pawnbroker refilled his pipe. Edo Castle is precisely what I have in mind. If I'm not mistaken, Umpe has been trying to persuade you to dig wells for him. It'll be perfectly natural for you to decide to take him up on the offer. That's all I have to do? How is becoming a well digger going to bring me that much money? Be patient. I'll tell you all about it. When they returned to shore, Matahachi was euphoric. They parted with a promise. That evening, he was to slip away unobserved and go to Daizo's house to receive an advance payment of thirty pieces of gold. He went home, took a nap, and awoke a few hours later with the image of the vast sum that would soon be his dancing before his eyes. Money, a fantastic amount, enough to compensate for all the bad luck he had had up until then. Enough to last him for the rest of his life. Even more exciting was the prospect of being able to show people that they were wrong, that he had what it took after all. With the money fever upon him, he could not calm down. His mouth still felt dry, even a little numb. Going outside, he stood in the deserted alleyway facing the bamboo grove behind the house and thought, Who is he anyway? Just what is he up to? Then he began to go over the conversation with Daizo. The well diggers were presently working at the Goshinjo, the new castle in the western encirclement. Daizo had told him, You're to bide your time until the chance presents itself, and then you're to shoot the new shogun with a musket. The gun and ammunition would be on the castle grounds, under a huge, centuries-old locust tree near the back gate at the bottom of Momiji Hill. Needless to say, the laborers were under close surveillance, but Hidetada liked going around with his attendants to inspect the work. It would be simple enough to accomplish the objective. In the ensuing uproar, Matahachi could escape by jumping into the outer moat, from which Daizo's accomplices would rescue him. Without fail, he had said. Back in his room, Matahachi stared at the ceiling. He seemed to hear Daizo's voice whispering certain words over and over, and recalled how his own lips had trembled when he'd said, Yes, I'll do it. His skin covered with goose pimples, he jumped to his feet. This is awful. I'm going over there right now and tell him I don't want any part of it. Then he remembered something else Daizo had said. Now that I've told you all this, you're committed. I'd hate to see anything happen to you, but if you try to back out, my friends will have your head within, oh, three days at the outside. Daizo's piercing stare as he had said this flashed before Matahachi's eyes. Matachi walked a short distance down Nishikubo Lane to the corner of the Takanawa High Road, where the pawn shop stood. The bay, cloaked in darkness, was at the end of a side street. He entered the alley alongside the familiar storehouse, went to the inconspicuous back door of the shop, and knocked softly. It's not locked, came the immediate response. Daizo? Yes, glad you came. Let's go into the storehouse. A rain shutter had been left open. Matachi went into the outer corridor and followed the pawnbroker. Sit down, said Daizo, placing a candle on a long wooden clothes chest. Sitting down himself and crossing his arms, he asked, Did you see Umpe? Yes. When will he take you to the castle? The day after tomorrow, when he has to bring ten new laborers, he said he'd include me. Then everything's set? Well, we still have to get the district headman and the five-man neighborhood association to put their seals on the documents. No problem. It so happens I'm a member of the association. Really? You? What's so surprising about that? 
I'm one of the more influential businessmen in the neighborhood. Last spring, the headman insisted I join. Oh, I wasn't surprised. I, I just didn't know. That's all. Aha! Uh -huh. I know exactly what you thought. You thought it was scandalous for a man like me to be on the committee that looks after neighborhood affairs. Well, let me tell you. If you have money, everybody will say you're a fine man. You can't avoid becoming a local leader, even if you try. Think, Matahachi. Before long, you're going to have lots of money, too. Y y yes stammered Matahachi, unable to suppress a shiver. W w will you give me the advance now? Wait a minute. Picking up the candle, he went to the rear of the storehouse. From a casket on the shelf, he counted out thirty pieces of gold. He came back and said, Do you have anything to wrap them in? No. Use this. He snatched a cotton rag from the floor and threw it to Matahachi. You'd better put it in your stomach wrapper and make sure it's done up tight. Should I give you a receipt? Receipt? Echoed Daiso with an involuntary laugh. My, aren't you the honest one? But no, I don't need one. If you make a mistake, I'll confiscate your head. Matachi blinked and said, I suppose I'd better be going now. Not so fast. Some obligations go with that money. Do you remember everything I told you this morning? Yes. Well, there is one thing. You said the musket would be under the locust tree. Who's going to put it there? Considering how difficult it was for ordinary workers to enter the castle grounds, he wondered how anyone could possibly manage to sneak in a musket and ammunition. And how could anyone without supernatural powers bury them so they'd be ready and waiting half a month from now? That doesn't concern you. You just do what you've agreed to do. You're nervous now because you're not used to the idea. After you've been there a couple of weeks, you'll be all right. I hope so. First, you have to make up your mind you're going through with it. Then you have to be on the lookout for the right moment. I understand. Now, I don't want any slip-ups. Hide that money where no one can find it, and leave it there until after you've carried out your mission. When projects like this fall through, it's always because of money. Don't worry, I've thought about that already. But let me ask you this. How can I be sure that after I've done my job, you won't refuse to pay me the rest? Oomph! It may seem like bragging, but money's the least of my worries. Feast your eyes on those boxes. He held the candle up so Matachi could see better. All over the room were boxes, for lacquered trays, for armor, for many other purposes. Every one of them contains a thousand pieces of gold. Without looking very closely, Matachi said apologetically, I don't doubt your word, of course. The secret conversation went on for another hour or so. Matachi, feeling somewhat more confident, left by the back way. Daizo went to a nearby room and looked in. Akemi, are you there? he called. I think he'll go straight from here to hide the money. You'd better follow him. After a few visits to the pawn shop, Akemi, enthralled with Daizo's personality, had unburdened herself, complaining about her present circumstances and expressing her desire to move on to something better. A couple of days earlier, Daizo had remarked that he was in need of a woman to run his house. Akemi had shown up at his door very early this morning. When he'd let her in, he'd told her not to worry. He'd take care of Matahachi. The prospective assassin, serenely unaware he was being followed, returned home. Hoe in hand, he then climbed through the dark grove behind the house to the top of Nishikubo Hill and buried his treasure. Having observed all this, Akemi reported to Daizo, who immediately set out for Nishikubo Hill. It was almost dawn when he returned to the storehouse and counted the gold pieces he had dug up. 
He counted them a second time and a third, but there was no mistake. Only twenty-eight. Dizel cocked his head and frowned. He profoundly disliked people who stole his money. Tadaaki's Madness Osugi was not one to be driven to despair by the sorrows and bitter disappointments of unrequited maternal devotion. But here, with the insects singing amid the Lespediza and Eulalia plants, with the great river flowing slowly by, she was not unmoved by feelings of nostalgia and the impermanence of life. Are you home? The rough voice sounded harsh in the still evening air. Who is it? she called. I'm from Hangawaras. A lot of fresh vegetables came in from Katsushika. The boss told me to bring you some. Yajibe is always so thoughtful. She was seated at a low table, candle beside her and writing brush in hand, copying the Sutra on the Great Love of Parents. She had moved into a small rented house in the sparsely populated district of Hamacho, and was making a reasonably comfortable living treating other people's aches and pains with moxa. She had no physical complaints to speak of. Since the beginning of autumn, she had felt quite young again. Say, Granny, did a young man come to see you earlier this evening? For a moxa treatment, you mean? Uh-uh. He came to Yajibez, seemed to have something important on his mind. He asked where you were living now, and we told him. How old was he? Twenty-seven or eight, I guess. What did he look like? Sort of round-faced. Not very tall. Hmm, I wonder. He had an accent like yours. I thought maybe he came from the same place. Well, I'll be going. Good night. As the footsteps faded, the voices of the insects rose again like the sound of drizzling rain. Putting down her brush, Osugi gazed at the candle, thinking of the days when she was young and people had read portents in the halo of the candlelight. Those left behind had no way of knowing how husbands, sons, and brothers who'd gone off to war were faring, or what fate might lie in their own uncertain futures. A bright halo was taken as a sign of good fortune, purplish shadows as an indication that someone had died. When the flame crackled like pine needles, a person they were expecting was sure to come. Osugi had forgotten how to interpret the omens, but tonight the cheerful halo, as colorfully beautiful as a rainbow, suggested something splendid in the offing. Could it have been Matahachi? Her hand reached toward the brush once, but drew back. As though entranced, she forgot herself and her surroundings, and for the next hour or two thought only of her son's face, which seemed to float about in the darkness of the room. A rustling noise at the back entrance brought her out of her reverie. Wondering if a weasel was playing havoc with her kitchen, she took the candle and went to investigate. The sack of vegetables was by the sink. On top of the sack was a white object. Picking it up, she found it was heavy, as heavy as two pieces of gold. On the white paper in which they were wrapped, Matahachi had written, I still don't have the heart to face you. Please forgive me if I neglect you for another six months. I'll just leave this note without coming in. A samurai with murder in his eyes was crashing through the tall grass to reach two men standing on the riverbank. Gasping for breath, he called, Hamada! Was it him? No, groaned Hamada. Wrong man! But his eyes sparkled as he continued to survey the surroundings. I'm sure it was. It wasn't. It was a boatman. Are you sure? When I ran after him, he climbed into that boat over there. That doesn't make him a boatman. I checked. I must say, he's fast on his feet. Turning away from the river, they started back through the fields of Hamacho. Matahachi! Matahachi! At first, the sound barely rose above the murmuring of the river, but as it was repeated and became unmistakable, they stopped and looked at one another in astonishment. Somebody's calling him, 
How could that be? Sounds like an old woman. With Hamada in the lead, they quickly traced the sound to its source, and when Osugi heard their footsteps, she ran toward them. Matachi is one of you! They surrounded her and pinioned her arms behind her. What are you doing to me? Puffing up like an enraged blowfish, she shouted, Who are you, anyway? We're students of the Ono school. I don't know anybody named Ono. You never heard of Ono Tadaki? Tutor to the Shogun? Never. Why, you old... Wait, let's see what she knows about Matahachi. I'm his mother. You're the mother of Matahachi, the melon vendor? What do you mean, you pig? Melon vendor. Matahachi is a descendant of the house of Hongiden, and that's an important family in the province of Mimasaka. I'll have you know the Hongidens are high-ranking retainers of Shimmen Munetsura, lord of Takeyama Castle in Yoshino. Enough of this, said one man. What should we do? Pick her up and carry her. Hostage? Do you think it'll work? If she's his mother... He'll have to come for her. Osugi pulled her scrawny body together and fought like a cornered tigress, but to no avail. Bored and dissatisfied these past several weeks, Kojiro had fallen into the habit of sleeping a lot, in the daytime as well as at night. At the moment, he was lying on his back, grumbling to himself, hugging his sword to his chest. It's enough to make my drawing pole weep. A sword like this, a swordsman like myself, rotting away in another man's house. There was a loud click and a metallic flash. Stupid fool! Striking in a great arc above him, the weapon slithered back into its scabbard like a living creature. Splendid! cried a servant from the edge of the veranda. Are you practicing a technique for striking from a supine position? Don't be silly, sniffed Kojiro. He turned over onto his stomach, picked up two specks, and flicked them toward the veranda. It was making a nuisance of itself. The servant's eyes widened. The insect, resembling a moth, had had both its soft wings and tiny body sliced neatly in two. Are you here to lay out my bedding? asked Kojiro. Oh, no, sorry. There's a letter for you. Kojiro unhurriedly unfolded the letter and began to read. As he read, a touch of excitement came to his face. According to Yajibe, Osugi had been missing since the night before. Kojiro was requested to come at once and confer on a course of action. The letter explained in some detail how they had learned where she was. Yajibe had had all his men out searching for her all day long, but the crux of the matter was the message Kojiro had left at the donjiki. It had been crossed out, and beside it was written, To Sasaki Kojiro, the person holding Matahachi's mother in custody is Hamada Toranosuke of the House of Ono. Finally, said Kojiro, the words coming from deep in his throat. At the time he'd rescued Matahachi, He'd suspected that the two samurai he cut down had some connection with the Ono school. He chuckled and said, Just what I was waiting for. Standing on the veranda, he glanced up at the night sky. There were clouds, but it didn't look like rain. Very shortly afterward, he was seen riding up the Takanawa High Road on a rented pack horse. It was late when he reached the Hangawara house. After questioning Yajibe in detail, he made up his mind to spend the night there and move into action the next morning. Ono Tadaki had received his new name not long after the Battle of Sekigahara. It was as Mikogami Tenzen that he'd been summoned to Hidetada's encampment to lecture on swordsmanship, which he did with distinction. Along with bestowal of the name came his appointment as a direct vassal of the Tokugawas and the granting of a new residence on Kanda Hill in Edo. Since the hill afforded an excellent view of Mount Fuji, the shogunate designated it as a residential district for retainers from Suruga, the province in which Fuji was situated. I was told the house is on Saikachi Slope, said Kojiro. 
He and one of Hangawara's men were at the top of the hill. In the deep valley below them, they could see Ochanomizu, a section of river from which water for the shogun's tea was said to be drawn. Wait here, said Kojiro's guide. I'll see where it is. He returned shortly with the information that they had already passed it. I don't remember any place that looked as though it might belong to the shogun's tutor. Neither did I. I thought he'd have a big mansion like Yagyu Munenori, but his house is that old one we saw on the right. I've heard it used to belong to the shogun's stable-keeper. I suppose it's nothing to be surprised about. Ono's only worth fifteen hundred bushels. Most of Munenori's income was earned by his ancestors. This is it, said the guide, pointing. Kojiro stopped to inspect the general layout of the buildings. The old earthen wall extended back from the middle section of the slope to a thicket on a hill beyond. The compound appeared to be quite large. From the doorless gate he could see, beyond the main house, a building he took to be the dojo and an annex, apparently of more recent construction. You can go back now, said Kojiro, and tell Yajibe if I don't return with the old lady by evening, he can assume I've been killed. Yes, sir. The man ran swiftly down Saikachi's slope, stopping several times to look back. Kojiro hadn't wasted any time trying to get near Yagyu Munenori. There was no way to defeat him, and thereby take for himself the other man's glory, for the Yagyu style was the one actually employed by the Tokugawas. That in itself was sufficient excuse for Munenori to refuse to take on ambitious Ronin. Tadaki was inclined to take on all comers. Compared with the Yagyu style, Ono's was more practical, the aim being not to make a great display of skill, but to actually kill. Kojiro had heard of no one who had succeeded in attacking the house of Ono and putting it to shame. While Munenori was in general the more highly respected, Tadaki was considered the stronger. Ever since coming to Edo and learning of this situation, Kojiro had told himself that one of these days he would be knocking on the Ono gate. Numata Kajuro glanced out the window of the dojo's dressing room. He did a double take and his eyes swept the room, looking for Toranosuke. Spotting him in the middle of the room, giving a lesson to a younger student, he ran to his side and in a low voice sputtered, He's here, out there, in the front yard. Toranosuke, his wooden sword poised in front of him, shouted to the student, On guard! Then he pressed forward, his footsteps resounding sharply on the floor. Just as the two reached the north corner, the student did a somersault, and his wooden sword went sailing through the air. Toranosuke turned and said, who are you talking about? Kojiro? Yes, he's just inside the gate. He'll be here any minute. Much sooner than I expected. Taking the old lady hostage was a good idea. What do you plan to do now? Who's going to greet him? It should be someone who's prepared for anything. If he has the nerve to come here alone, he may try a surprise move. Have him brought to the dojo. I'll greet him myself. The rest of you stay in the background and keep quiet. At least there's plenty of us here, said Kajuro. Looking around, he was encouraged to see the faces of stalwarts like Kame Hyosuke, Negoro Hachikuro, and Ito Magobe. There were also about twenty others. They had no idea of Kojiro's way of thinking, but they all knew why Toranosuke wanted him here. One of the two men Kojiro had killed near the Donjiki was Toranosuke's elder brother. Though he was a good-for-nothing, not well thought of at school, his death nevertheless had to be avenged because of the blood relationship. Despite his youth and his modest income, Toranosuke was a samurai to be reckoned with in Edo. Like the Tokugawas, he came originally from Mikawa province, and his family was numbered among the oldest of the shogun's hereditary vassals. He was also one of the four generals of Saikachi Slope, the others being Kamei, Negoro, and Ito. When Toranosuke had come home the night before with Osugi, the consensus was that he had scored a noteworthy coup. 
Now it would be difficult for Kojiro not to show his face. The men vowed that if he did appear, they would beat him within an inch of his life, cut off his nose, and hang him on a tree by the Kanda River for all to see. But they were by no means certain he'd show up. In fact, they had placed wagers on it, the majority betting that he wouldn't. Assembling in the main room of the dojo, they left the floor space open in the middle and waited anxiously. After a time, one man asked Kajiro, Are you sure it was Kojiro you saw? Absolutely sure. They sat in formidable array. Their faces, woodenly stiff at first, were now showing signs of strain. Some feared that if this kept up much longer, they would fall victim to their own tenseness. Just as the breaking point seemed near, the rapid patter of sandals came to a halt outside the dressing room, and the face of another student, standing on tiptoe, appeared in the window. Listen! There's no sense in waiting here! Kojiro's not coming! What do you mean? Kajuro just saw him. Yes, but he went straight to the house. How he got admitted, I don't know, but he's in the guest room, talking with the master. The master? echoed the group with a collective gasp. Are you telling the truth? demanded Toranosuke, the look on his face close to consternation. He strongly suspected that if the circumstances of his brother's death were investigated, it would turn out that he'd been up to no good, but he'd glossed over this in relating the incident to Tadaki. And if his master knew he'd abducted Osugi, it wasn't because he himself had told him. If you don't believe me, go look! What a mess! groaned Toranosuke. Far from sympathizing with him, his fellow students were annoyed by his lack of decisiveness. Advising the others to keep cool while they went to see what the situation was, Kamei and Negoro were just stepping into their zori when an attractive, light-complexioned girl came running out of the house. Recognizing Omitsu, they stopped where they were and the others rushed to the doorway. All of you, she cried in an excited, shrill voice. Come right away! Uncle and the guest have drawn swords. In the garden, they're fighting. Though Omitsu was officially regarded as Tadaki's niece, it had been whispered about that she was really the daughter of Ito Itosai by a mistress. Rumor had it that since Itosai was Tadaki's teacher, Tadaki must have agreed to rear the girl. The look of fear in her eyes was most unusual. I heard uncle and the guests talking. Their voices got louder and louder. And the next thing I knew, I don't suppose uncle's in danger, but... The four generals emitted a collective yelp and lit out for the garden, which was set off from the outer compound by a shrub fence. The others caught up with them at the woven bamboo gate. The gate's locked. Can't you force it? This proved unnecessary. The gate gave way under the weight of the samurai pressing against it. As it fell, a spacious area backed by a hill came into view. Tadaki, his faithful Yukihira sword held at eye level, stood in the middle. Beyond him, at a fair distance, was Kojiro, the great drawing pole rising above his head, fire shooting from his eyes. The charged atmosphere seemed to create an invisible barrier. For men raised in the strict tradition of the samurai class, the awe-inspiring solemnity surrounding the combatants, the dignity of the deadly unsheathed swords, was inviolable. Despite their agitation, the spectacle momentarily deprived the students both of their mobility and of their emotions. But then two or three of them started toward Kojiro's rear, Stay back! cried Tadaki angrily. His voice, harsh and chilling, not at all the fatherly voice they were accustomed to, arrested all movement on the part of his students. People were apt to guess Tadaki's age to be as much as ten years less than his fifty-four or five years, and take his height for average, whereas actually it was somewhat less than that. His hair was still black, his body small but solidly built. There was nothing stiff or awkward in the movements of his long limbs. Kojiro had not yet made one strike, had not, in fact, been able to. 
Yet Tadaki had had to face one fact instantly. He was up against a terrific swordsman. He's another Zenki, he thought, with an imperceptible shudder. Zenki was the last fighter he had encountered to have such scope and driving ambition. And that had been long ago, in his youth, when he traveled with Itosai, living the life of a Shugyosha. Zenki, the son of a boatman in Kuana province, had been Itosai's senior disciple. As Itosai aged, Zenki began to look down on him, even proclaiming that the Ito style was his own invention. Zenki had caused Itosai much grief, for the more adept he became with the sword, the more harm he caused other people. Zenki, Itosai had lamented, is the greatest mistake in my life. When I look at him, I see a monster embodying all the bad qualities I ever had. It makes me hate myself to watch him. Ironically, Zenki served the youthful Tadaki well as a bad example, spurring him to higher achievements than might otherwise have been possible. Eventually, Tadaki clashed with the evil prodigy at Koganegahara in Shimosa and killed him, whereupon Itosai awarded him his certificate in the Itto style and gave him the Book of Secret Instructions. Zenki's one flaw had been that his technical capability was marred by a lack of breeding. Not so, Kojiro. His intelligence and education were evident in his swordsmanship. I can't win this fight, thought Tadaki, who felt himself in no way inferior to Munenori. In fact, his assessment of Munenori's skill was not very high. While he stared at his awesome opponent, another truth came home to rest. Time appears to have passed me by, he thought ruefully. They stood motionless. Not the slightest change was evident. But both Tadaki and Kojiro were expending vital energy at a fearful rate. The physiological toll took the form of sweat pouring copiously from their foreheads, air rushing through flaring nostrils, skin turning white, then bluish. Though a move seemed imminent, the swords remained poised and unwavering. I give up, said Tadaki, abruptly dropping back several paces. They had agreed it was not to be a fight to the finish. Either man could withdraw by acknowledging defeat. Springing like a beast of prey, Kojiro brought the drawing pole into action with a downward stroke of whirlwind force and speed. Though Tadaki ducked just in time, his topknot flew up and was lopped off. Tadaki himself, while dodging, executed a brilliant reprisal, slicing off some six inches of Kojiro's sleeve. Coward! rose the cry from the students, whose faces burned with rage. By seizing on his opponent's capitulation as the opening for an attack, Kojiro had violated the samurai's code of ethics. Every one of the students started for Kojiro. He responded by flying with the speed of a cormorant to a large jujube tree at one end of the garden and half hiding himself behind the trunk. His eyes shifted with intimidating rapidity. Did you see it? he shouted. Did you see who won? They saw it, said Tadaki. Hold off, he told his men, sheathing his sword and returning to the veranda of his study. Summoning Omitsu, he told her to tie up his hair. While she was doing this, he caught his breath. His chest glistened with rivulets of sweat. An old saying came back to his mind. It is easy to surpass a predecessor, but difficult to avoid being surpassed by a successor. He'd been enjoying the fruits of hard training in his youth, complacent in the knowledge that his Itto style was no less flourishing than the Yagyu style. Meanwhile, Society was giving birth to new geniuses like Kojiro. The realization came as a bitter shock, but he was not the sort of man to ignore it. When Omitsu was finished, he said, Give our young guest some water to rinse his mouth out with and show him back to the guest room. The faces of the students around him were white with shock. Some were forcing back tears, others stared resentfully at their master. 
We'll assemble in the dojo, he said. Now. He himself led the way. Tadaki took his place on the raised seat in front and silently contemplated the three rows of his followers sitting facing him. At length he lowered his eyes and said quietly, I fear that I too have become old. As I look back, it seems to me my best days as a swordsman were when I defeated that devil Zenki. By the time the school was opened and people began talking about the Ono group on Saikachi Slope, calling the Ito style unbeatable, I'd already passed my peak as a swordsman. The meaning of the words was so alien to their customary way of thinking that the students could not believe their ears. His voice became firmer, and he looked directly at their doubting, discontented faces. In my opinion, this is something that happens to all men. Age creeps up on us while we're not looking. Times change. The followers surpass their leaders. A younger generation opens up a new way. This is the way it ought to be, for the world advances only through change. Yet this is inadmissible in the field of swordsmanship. The way of the sword must be a way that does not permit a man to age. Itosai. I don't know if he's still alive. I've had no word from my master for years. After Koganegahara, he took the tonsure and retreated to the mountains. His aim, he said, was to study the sword, to practice Zen, to search for the way of life and death to climb the great peak of perfect enlightenment. Now, it's my turn. After today, I could no longer hold my head up before my master. I regret I haven't lived a better life. M -m -m master broke in Negoro Hachikuro. You say you lost, but we don't believe you'd lose to a man like Kojiro under normal circumstances, even if he is young. There must have been something wrong today. Something wrong? Tadaki shook his head and chuckled. Nothing wrong. Kojiro's young. But that's not why I lost. I lost because the times have changed. What does that mean? Listen and see. He looked from Hachikuro to the other silent faces. I'll try to make it brief, because Kojiro is waiting for me. I want you to listen carefully to my thoughts and my hopes for the future. He then informed them that as of this day, he was retiring from the dojo. His intention was not to retire in the ordinary sense, but to follow in the footsteps of Itosai and go out in search of great enlightenment. That is my first great hope, he told them. Next, he requested Ito Magobe, his nephew, to take charge of his only son, Tadanari. Magobe was also enjoined to report the day's happenings to the shogunate and explain that Tadaki had decided to become a Buddhist priest. Then he said, I have no deep regrets over my defeat by a younger man. What does trouble and shame me is this. New fighters like Sasaki are appearing in other quarters, but not a single swordsman of his caliber has come out of the Ono school. I think I know why. A lot of you are hereditary vassals of the Shogun. You've let your status go to your heads. After a bit of training, you begin congratulating yourselves on being masters of the invincible Ito style. You're too self-satisfied. Wait, sir, Hyosuke protested in a trembling voice. That's not fair. Not all of us are lazy and arrogant. We don't all neglect our studies. Shut up! Tadaki glared at him fiercely. Laxness on the part of students is a reflection of laxness on the part of the teacher. I'm confessing my own shame now, passing judgment on myself. The task ahead of you is to eliminate laxness, 
to make the Ono School a center where youthful talent can develop correctly. It must become a training ground for the future. Unless it does, my leaving and making way for a reform will accomplish nothing. At last, the sincerity of his statement began to take effect. His students hung their heads, pondering his words, each reflecting on his own shortcomings. Hamada, said Tadaki. Toranosuke replied, Yes, sir, but he was obviously taken by surprise. Under Tadaki's cold stare, his own eyes dropped to the floor. Stand up! Yes, sir, he said without rising. Stand up! This instant! Toranosuke rose to his feet. The others looked on mutely. I'm expelling you from the school. He paused to let this sink in. But in doing so, I hope there will come a day when you'll have mended your ways, learned discipline, and grasped the meaning of the art of war. Perhaps at that time, we can be together again as teacher and student. Now get out! M master why I don't remember doing anything to deserve this. You don't remember because you don't understand the art of war. If you think about it long and carefully, you'll see. Tell me, please, I can't leave until you do. The veins stood out on his forehead. All right. Cowardice is the most shameful weakness a samurai can be accused of. The art of war admonishes strictly against it. It is an ironclad rule at this school that any man guilty of a cowardly act must be expelled. Nevertheless, you, Hamada Toranosuke, let several weeks pass after your brother's death before challenging Sasaki Kojiro. In the meantime, you ran around trying to take revenge on some insignificant melon vendor. And yesterday, you took this man's aged mother captive and brought her here. Do you call that conduct becoming a samurai? But, sir, you don't understand. I did it to draw Kojiro out. He was about to launch into a spirited defense, but Tadaki cut him short. That's precisely what I mean by cowardice. If you wanted to fight Kojiro, why didn't you go directly to his house? Why didn't you send him a message challenging him? Why didn't you declare your name and your purpose? Well, 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 I did consider those things, but consider. There was nothing to stop you from doing that. But you adopted the cowardly ruse of getting others to help you lure Kojiro here so you could attack him en masse. By comparison, Kojiro's attitude was admirable. Tadaki paused. He came alone to see me personally. Refusing to have anything to do with a coward, he challenged me on the grounds that a student's misconduct is his teacher's misconduct. The result of the confrontation between his sword and mine revealed a shameful crime. I now humbly confess that crime. The room was deathly quiet. Now, Toranosuke, upon reflection, do you still believe yourself to be a samurai without shame? Forgive me. Get out! Eyes downcast, Toranosuke walked back ten paces and knelt on the floor with his arms before him, preparatory to bowing. I wish you the best of health, sir, and the same to the rest of you. His voice was dark. He rose and walked sadly from the dojo. Tadaki stood up. I, too, must take my leave of the world. Suppressed sobs were audible. His final words were stern, yet full of affection. Why mourn? Your day has come. It's up to you to see that the school advances into a new age with honor. Beginning now, be humble, work hard, and try with all your might to cultivate your spirit. Returning to the guest room, 
Tadaki appeared quite unperturbed as he quietly took a seat and addressed Kojiro. After apologizing for keeping him waiting, he said, I've just expelled Hamada. I advised him to change his ways, to try to understand the real meaning of the samurai's discipline. I intend, of course, to release the old woman. Would you like to take her back with you, or should I arrange for her to go later? Unsatisfied with what you've done. She can go with me. Kojiro moved as though to rise. The bout had completely drained him, and the subsequent wait had seemed very, very long. Don't go yet, said Tadaki. Now that it's all over, let's have a cup together and let bygones be bygones. Clapping his hands, he called, Omitsu, bring some sake. Thank you, said Kojiro. It's kind of you to ask me. He smiled and said hypocritically, I know now why Ono Tadaki and the Itto style are so famous. He had no respect whatsoever for Tadaki. If his natural talents are developed in the right way, thought Tadaki, the world will bow at his feet. But if he takes the wrong turn, there's another Zinki in the making. If you were my student, the words were on the tip of Tadaki's tongue. Instead of saying them, he laughed and replied modestly to Kojiro's flattery. In the course of their conversation, Musashi's name came up, and Kojiro learned he was under consideration to become one of the selected group of men who gave lessons to the shogun. Kojiro merely said, Oh? But his expression betrayed his displeasure. Turning his eyes quickly toward the setting sun, he insisted it was time for him to go. Not many days after that, Tadaki vanished from Edo. He had the reputation of being a simple, straightforward warrior, the embodiment of honesty and selflessness, but a man who lacked Munenori's knack for politics. Not understanding why a man who could apparently accomplish anything he set his mind to would flee the world, people were consumed with curiosity and read all sorts of meanings into his disappearance. As a result of his failure, Tadaki, it was said, had lost his mind. The Poignancy of Things Musashi said it was the worst storm he'd ever seen. Iori gazed wistfully at the sodden, tattered book pages scattered hither and yon, and thought sadly, no more studying. Two days of autumn, the two hundred tenth and two hundred twentieth days of the year, were especially dreaded by farmers. It was on these two days that typhoons were most likely to destroy the rice crop. Iori, more attuned to the dangers than his master, had taken the precaution of tying down the roof and weighing it with rocks. Nevertheless, during the night the wind had ripped the roof off, and when it was light enough to inspect the damage, it was evident that the cabin was beyond any hope of repair. With his experience at Hotengahara in mind, Musashi set off shortly after dawn. Watching him go, Iori thought, What good will it do him to look at the neighbor's paddies? Of course they're flooded. Doesn't his own house mean anything to him? He built a fire, using bits and pieces of the walls and floor, and roasted some chestnuts and dead birds for breakfast. The smoke stung his eyes. Musashi came back a little after noon. About an hour later, a group of farmers wearing thick straw rain capes arrived to offer their thanks for assistance to a sick person, for help in draining off the flood water, for a number of other services. As one old man admitted, We always get into quarrels at times like these, what with everybody in a hurry to take care of his own problems first. But today we followed your advice and worked together. They also brought gifts of food, sweets, pickles, and, to Iori's delight, rice cakes. As he thought about it, Iori decided that that day he'd learned a lesson. 
If one forgot about oneself and worked for the group, food would naturally be forthcoming. We'll build you a new house, one farmer promised. One that won't be blown down. For the present, he invited them to stay at his house, the oldest in the village. When they got there, the man's wife hung their clothes out to dry, and when they were ready to go to bed, they were shown to separate rooms. Before he fell asleep, Iori became aware of a sound that stirred his interest. Turning over to face Musashi's room, he whispered through the shoji, Do you hear that, sir? Mm. Listen, you can just hear them. Drums from the shrine dances. Strange, isn't it? Having religious dances the night after a typhoon. The only reply was the sound of deep breathing. The next morning, Iori got up early and asked the farmer about the drums. Coming back to Musashi's room, he said brightly, Mitsumina Shrine in Chichibu isn't so far from here, is it? I shouldn't think so. I wish you'd take me there to pay my respects. Puzzled, Musashi asked why the sudden interest and was told that the drummers had been musicians in a neighboring village, practicing for the Asagaya sacred dance, which their household had specialized in since the distant past. They went every month to perform at the Mitsumine Shrine Festival. The beauty of music and the dance was known to Iori only through these Shinto dances. He was inordinately fond of them, and having heard that the Mitsumine dances were one of the three great types in this tradition, he had his heart set on seeing them. Won't you take me, he pleaded. It'll be five or six days at least before our house is ready. Iori's fervency reminded Musashi of Jotaro, who had often made a nuisance of himself, whining, pouting, purring to get what he wanted. Iori, so grown up and self-sufficient for his age, rarely resorted to such tactics. Musashi wasn't thinking about it particularly, but an observer might have noticed the effects of his influence. One thing he had deliberately taught Iori was to make a strict distinction between himself and his teacher. At first he replied noncommittally, but after a little thought he said, All right, I'll take you. Iori jumped in the air, exclaiming, The weather's good too! Within five minutes he'd reported his good fortune to their host requested box lunches, and procured new straw sandals. Then he was in front of his teacher again, asking, Shouldn't we get started? The farmer saw them off with the promise that their house would be finished by the time they returned. They passed places where the typhoon had left ponds, small lakes almost, in its wake. But otherwise, it was difficult to believe the heavens had unleashed their fury only two days earlier. Shrikes flew low in the clear blue sky. The first night, they chose a cheap inn in the village of Tanashi and went to bed early. The next day, their road led them farther into the great Musashino Plain. Their journey was interrupted for several hours at the Iruma River, which was swollen to three times its normal size. Only a short section of the dirt bridge stood, uselessly, in the middle of the stream. While Musashi watched a group of farmers carrying new piling out from both sides to make a temporary crossing, Iori noticed some old arrowheads and remarked on them, adding, There's tops of helmets, too. There must have been a battle here. He amused himself along the riverbank, digging up arrowheads, rusted fragments of broken swords, and miscellaneous pieces of old, unidentifiable metal. Suddenly, he snatched his hand away from a white object he'd been about to pick up, it's a human bone, he cried. Bring it over here, said Musashi. Iori had no stomach for touching it again. What are you going to do with it? Bury it where it won't be walked on. It's not just a couple of bones. There's lots of them. Good. It'll give us something to do. Bring all you can find. Turning his back to the river, he said, You can bury them over there, where those gentians are blooming. I don't have a spade. You can use a broken sword. When the hole was deep enough, Iori put the bones in it, then gathered up his collection of arrowheads and bits of metal and buried them with the bones. Is that all right? he asked. Put some rocks over it. Make it into a proper memorial. 
When was there a battle here? Have you forgotten? You must have read about it. The Taiheki tells about two fierce battles in 1333 and 1352 in a place called Kotesashigahara. That's about where we are now. On one side was the Nitta family, supporting the southern court, and on the other a huge army led by Ashikaga Takauji. Oh, the battles of Kotesashigahara, I remember now. At Musashi's urging, Iori continued, the book tells us Prince Munenaga lived in the eastern region for a long time and studied the way of the samurai, but was astonished when the emperor appointed him shogun. What was the poem he composed on that occasion? Musashi asked. Iori glanced up at a bird soaring through the azure sky and recited, How could I have known I'd ever be master of the katalpa bow, had I not passed through life without touching it? And the poem in the chapter telling how he crossed into Musashi province and fought at Kotesashigahara? The boy hesitated, biting his lip, then began in phrasing largely of his own making. Why, then, should I cling to a life that is fullified when nobly given for the sake of our great Lord, for the sake of the people? And the meaning? I understand that. Are you sure? Anyone who can't understand without having it explained to him isn't really Japanese, even if he is a samurai. Isn't that true? Yes. But tell me, Iori, if that's the case, why are you behaving as though handling those bones made your hands dirty? Would it make you feel good to handle the bones of dead people? The men who died here were soldiers. They'd fought and perished for the sentiments expressed in Prince Muninaga's poem. The number of samurai like that is uncountable. Their bones, buried in the earth, are the foundation on which this country is built. Were it not for them, we'd still have neither peace nor the prospect of prosperity. Wars, like the typhoon we had, pass. The land as a whole is unchanged, but we must never forget the debt we owe to the white bones under the ground. Iori nodded at almost every word. I understand now. Shall I make an offering of flowers and bow before the bones I buried? Musashi laughed. Bowing's not really necessary, if you keep the memory alive in your heart. But, not quite satisfied, the boy picked some flowers and placed them before the pile of stones. He was about to clasp his hands together in obeisance when another troubling thought came to him. Sir, it's all well and good if these bones really belong to samurai who were loyal to the emperor. But what if they're the remains of Ashikaga Takauji's men? I wouldn't want to pay respect to them. Iori stared at him, waiting for his answer. Musashi fixed his eyes on the thin sliver of daylight moon, but no satisfactory reply came to mind. At length, he said, In Buddhism... There is salvation even for those guilty of the ten evils and the five deadly sins. The heart itself is enlightenment. The Buddha forgives the wicked if only they'll open their eyes to his wisdom. Does that mean loyal warriors and evil rebels are the same after they die? No, Musashi said emphatically. A samurai holds his name to be sacred. If he sullies it, there's no redress throughout all generations. Then why does the Buddha treat bad people and loyal servants alike? Because people are all fundamentally the same. There are those who are so blinded by self-interest and desire that they become rebels or brigands. The Buddha is willing to overlook this. He urges all to accept enlightenment, to open their eyes to true wisdom. This is the message of a thousand scriptures. Of course, when one dies, all becomes void. I see, said Iori, without really seeing. He pondered the matter for a few minutes and then asked, But that's not true of samurai, is it? Not everything becomes void when a samurai dies. Why do you say that? His name lives on, doesn't it? 
That's true. If it's a bad name, it stays bad. If it's a good name, it stays good, even when the samurai is reduced to bones. Isn't that the way it is? Yes, but it isn't really quite so simple, said Musashi, wondering if he could successfully guide his pupil's curiosity. In the case of a samurai, there is such a thing as an appreciation of the poignancy of things. A warrior lacking this sensitivity is like a shrub in a desert. To be a strong fighter and nothing more is to be like a typhoon. It's the same with swordsmen who think of nothing but swords, swords, swords. A real samurai, a genuine swordsman, has a compassionate heart. He understands the poignancy of life. Silently, Iori rearranged the flowers and clasped his hands. Two Drumsticks Halfway up the mountain, ant-like human figures, climbing in continual procession, were swallowed up by a thick ring of clouds. Emerging near the summit, where Mitsumine Shrine was situated, they were greeted by a cloudless sky. The mountain's three peaks, Kumotori, Shiraiwa, and Myoho Gatake, straddled four eastern provinces. Within the Shinto complex, there were Buddhist temples, pagodas, various other buildings and gates. Outside was a flourishing little town, with tea houses and souvenir shops, the offices of the high priests and the houses of some seventy farmers, whose produce was reserved for the shrine's use. Listen, they've started playing the big drums, Iori said excitedly, gobbling down his rice and red beans. Musashi sat opposite, enjoying his repast at a leisurely pace. Iori threw down his chopsticks. The music started, he said. Let's go and watch. I had enough last night. You go alone. But they only did two dances last night. Don't you want to see the others? Not if it means hurrying. Seeing his master's wooden bowl was still half full, Iori said in a calmer tone, Thousands of people have arrived since yesterday. It would be a shame if it rained. Oh? When Musashi finally said, Shall we go now? Iori bounded for the front door like a dog unleashed, borrowed some straw sandals, and set them in place on the doorstep for his master. In front of the Kanonging, the sub-temple where they were staying, and on both sides of the shrine's main gate, great bonfires blazed. Every house had a lighted torch in front of it, and the whole area, several thousand feet above sea level, was as bright as day. Overhead, in a sky the color of a deep lake, the river of heaven glittered like magic smoke, while in the street swarms of men and women, oblivious of the chill in the mountain air, surged toward the stage where the sacred dances were performed. Flutes and great drums echoed on the mountain breeze. The stage itself was empty, except for the gently fluttering banners that would soon serve as a backdrop. Jostled by the mob, Iori got separated from Musashi, but quickly pushed his way through the crowd until he spied him standing near a building, staring up at a list of donors. Iori called his name, ran up to him, tugged at his sleeve, but Musashi's attention was riveted on one plaque, larger than the others. It stood out from all the rest because of the size of the contribution made by Daizo of Narai, Shibaura Village, province of Musashi. The booming of the drums built to a crescendo. They've started the dance, squealed Iori, his heart flying to the sacred dance pavilion. Sensei, what are you looking at? Musashi, stirred from his reverie, said, Oh, nothing special. I just remembered something I have to do. You go watch the dances. I'll be along later. Musashi sought out the office of the Shinto priests, where he was greeted by an old man. I'd like to inquire about a donor, said Musashi. Sorry, we don't have anything to do with that here. You'll have to go to the residence of the chief Buddhist priest. I'll show you where it is. Though Mitsumine Shrine was Shinto, General supervision of the whole establishment was in the hands of a Buddhist prelate. 
The plaque over the gate read, Office of the High Priest in Charge, in suitably large characters. At the entrance hall, the old man talked at some length with the priest on duty. When they were finished, the priest invited Musashi inside and very politely led him to an inner room. Tea was served, along with a tray of splendid cakes. Next came a second tray, followed shortly by a handsome young acolyte bearing sake. Presently, no less a personage than a provisional bishop appeared. Welcome to our mountain, he said. I fear we have only simple country fare to offer you. I trust you'll forgive us. Please, make yourself comfortable. Musashi was at a loss to understand the solicitous treatment. Without touching the sake, he said, I came to make an inquiry about one of your donors. What? The benign countenance of the priest, a rotund man of about fifty, underwent a subtle alteration. An inquiry? he asked suspiciously. In rapid succession, Musashi asked when Daizo had come to the temple, whether he came there often, whether he ever brought anyone with him, and if so, what sort of person. With every question, the priest's displeasure grew, until finally he said, Then you're not here to make a contribution, but merely to ask questions about someone who did? His face was a study in exasperation. The old man must have misunderstood me. I never intended to make a donation. I only wanted to ask about Daizo. You could have made that perfectly clear at the entrance, the priest said haughtily. From all I can see, you're a ronin. I don't know who you are or where you come from. You must understand that I can't give out information about our donors to just anyone. I assure you nothing will happen. Well, you'll have to see the priest in charge of such matters. Looking as though he felt he'd been robbed, he dismissed Musashi. The register of contributors turned out to be no more helpful, for it recorded only that Daizo had been there several times. Musashi thanked the priest and left. Near the dance pavilion, he looked around for Iori without seeing him. If he'd looked up, he would have. The boy was almost directly over his head, having climbed a tree to get a better view. Watching the scene unfolding on the stage, Musashi was transported back to his childhood, to the night festivals at the Sanumo Shrine in Miyamoto. He saw phantom images of the crowds, of Otsu's white face in their midst, of Matahachi always chewing food, of Uncle Gong walking about importantly. Vaguely, he sensed the face of his mother, worried about his being out so late, coming to look for him. The musicians, clad in usual costumes intended to simulate the elegance of the imperial guards of old, took their places on the stage. In the light of the fire, their tawdry finery, glittering with patches of gold brocade, was suggestive of the mythical robes of the age of the gods. The beating of the slightly slack drumheads reverberated through the forest of Cryptomeria, then the flutes and well-seasoned boards clapped rhythmically with small blocks, sounded the prelude. The master of the dance came forward, wearing the mask of an ancient man. This unearthly face, from whose cheeks and chin much of the lacquer had peeled, moved slowly as he sang the words of Kamiyasobi, the dance of the gods. On sacred Mount Mimuro, with its goldly fence, before the great deity, the leaves of the sakaki tree grow in profuse abundance, grow in profuse abundance. The tempo of the drums picked up, and other instruments joined in. Soon song and dance melded in a lively syncopated rhythm. Whence came the spear? It is the spear of the sacred dwelling, of the princess Toyoka, who is in heaven, the spear of the sacred dwelling. Musashi knew some of the songs. As a child, he had sung them and donned a mask and taken part in the dancing at Sanumo Shrine. The sword that protects the people, the people of all lands, 
Let's hang it festively before the deity. Hang it festively before the deity. The revelation struck like lightning. Musashi had been watching the hands of one of the drummers, wielding two short, club-shaped drumsticks. He sucked in his breath and fairly shouted, That's it! Two swords! Startled by the voice, Iori took his eyes away from the stage just long enough to look down and say, Oh, there you are! Musashi didn't even glance up. He stared straight ahead, not in dreamy rapture like the others, but with a look of almost frightening penetration. Two swords, he repeated. It's the same principle. Two drumsticks, but only one sound. He folded his arms more tightly and scrutinized the drummer's every movement. From one point of view, it was simplicity itself. People were born with two hands. Why not use both of them? As it was, swordsmen fought with only one sword and often one hand. This made sense, so long as everybody followed the same practice. But if one combatant were to employ two swords at once, what chance would an opponent using only one have of winning? Against the Yoshioka school at Ichijoji, Musashi had discovered his long sword in his right hand, his short sword in his left. He had grasped both weapons instinctively, unconsciously, each arm involved to the utmost in protecting him. In a life-and-death struggle, he had reacted in an unorthodox fashion. Now, all of a sudden, the rationale seemed natural, if not inevitable. If two armies were facing each other in battle, it would be unthinkable under the rules of the art of war for either to make use of one flank while allowing the other to stand idle. Was there not a principle here that the lone swordsman could not afford to ignore? Ever since Ichijoji, it had seemed to Musashi that to use both hands and both swords was the normal human way. Only custom, followed unquestioningly over the centuries, had made it seem abnormal. He felt he had arrived at an undeniable truth. Custom had made the unnatural appear natural, and vice versa. While custom was bred by daily experience, being on the boundary between life and death was something that occurred only a few times during a lifetime. Yet the ultimate aim of the way of the sword was to be able to stand on the brink of death at any time. Facing death squarely, unflinchingly, should be as familiar as all other daily experiences. And the process had to be a conscious one though movement should be as free as if it were purely reflexive. The two-sword style had to be of this nature, conscious but at the same time as automatic as a reflex, completely free of the restrictions inherent in conscious action. Musashi had been trying for some time to unite in a valid principle what he knew instinctively with what he had learned by intellectual means. Now he was close to formulating it in words, and it would make him famous throughout the country for generations to come. Two drumsticks, one sound. The drummer was conscious of left and right, right and left, but at the same time unconscious of them. Here, before his eyes, was the Buddhist sphere of free interpenetration. Musashi felt enlightened fulfilled. The five sacred dances, having begun with the song of the master of the dance, continued with performances by the dancers. There was the broad, sweeping dance of Iwato, then the dance of Aramikoto no Hoko. The melodies of the flutes quickened, bells rang in lively rhythm. Musashi looked up at Iori and said, Aren't you ready to leave? Not yet came the absent-minded reply. Iori's spirit had become part of the dance. He felt himself to be one of the performers. Come back before it gets too late. Tomorrow we're going to climb the peak to the inner shrine. The Demon's Attendant 
The dogs of Mitsumine were a feral breed, said to result from the crossing of dogs brought by immigrants from Korea more than a thousand years earlier with the wild dogs of the Chichibu Mountains. Only a step removed from the wild stage, they roamed the mountainside and fed like wolves on the other wildlife in the region. But since they were regarded as messengers of the deity and were spoken of as his attendants, worshippers often took home printed or sculptured images of them as good luck charms. The black dog with the man following Musashi was the size of a calf. As Musashi entered the Kanongin, the man turned, said, This way, and beckoned with his free hand. The dog growled, tugging at his leash, a piece of thick rope, and began sniffing. Flicking the leash across the dog's back, the man said, Shh, Guro, be quiet. The man was about fifty, solidly but supplely built, and like his dog, he seemed not quite tame. But he was well dressed. With his kimono, which looked like a priest's robe or a samurai's formal wear, he wore a narrow, flat obi and a hemp hakama. His straw sandals, of the sort men wore at festivals, were fitted with new thongs. Bai Kang, the woman held back to keep away from the dog. Down, commanded Bai Kang, rapping the animal sharply on the head. I'm glad you spotted him, Oko. Then it was him? No doubt about it. For a moment, they stood silently looking through a break in the clouds at the stars, hearing but not really listening to the sacred dance music. What do we do? she asked. I'll think of something. We can't let this chance go to waste. Oko stared expectantly at Baikan. Is Toji at home? he asked. Yes, he got drunk on the festival sake and fell asleep. Get him up. What about you? I've got work to do. After I make my rounds, I'll come to your place. Outside the main shrine gate, Oko broke into a trot. Most of the twenty or thirty houses were souvenir shops or tea houses. There were also a few small eating establishments, from which emanated the cheerful voices of revelers. From the eaves of the shack Oko entered hung a sign saying, Rest House. On one of the stools in the dirt-floored front room sat a young servant enjoying a catnap. Still sleeping? asked Oko. The girl, expecting a scolding, shook her head vigorously. I don't mean you, my husband. Oh, yes, he's still asleep. With a disapproving click of her tongue, Oko grumbled. A festival's going on and he's sleeping. This is the only shop that isn't full of customers. Near the door, a man and an old woman were steaming rice and beans in an earthen oven. The flames struck the only cheerful note in the otherwise gloomy interior. Oko walked over to where a man was sleeping on a bench by the wall, tapped him on the shoulder and said, Get up, you! Open your eyes for a change! Uh, he mumbled, raising himself slightly. Oh my! she exclaimed as she backed away. Then she laughed and said, I'm sorry, I thought you were my husband. A piece of matting had slipped to the ground. The man, a round-faced youth with large, questioning eyes, picked it up, pulled it over his face, and stretched out again. His head rested on a wooden pillow and his sandals were spattered with mud. On the table next to him were a tray and an empty rice bowl, by the wall, a travel pack, a basket hat, and a staff. Turning back to the girl, Oko said, I suppose he's a customer? Yes, he said he's planning to go up to the inner shrine early in the morning and asked if it was all right to take a nap here. Where's Toji? I'm over here, stupid. His voice came from behind a torn shoji. Reclining in the next room, with one foot hanging out into the shop, he said sullenly, And why carry on about me taking a little snooze? Where have you been all this time, when you should have been tending to business? In many ways, the years had been even less kind to Oko than they had to Toji. 
Not only was the charm of her earlier years no longer evident, but running the Oinu tea house required her to do a man's work to make up for her shiftless spouse, since Toji made a pittance hunting in the winter but did little else. After Musashi burned down their hideout with its trick room at Wada Pass, their henchmen had all deserted them. Toji's bleary red eyes gradually focused on a barrel of water. Pulling himself to his feet, he went over to it and gulped down a dipperful. Oko leaned on a bench and looked over her shoulder at him. I don't care if there is a festival going on. It's about time you learned when to stop. You're lucky you didn't get run through by a sword while you were out. Ah, uh, I'm telling you, you'd better be more careful. I don't know what you're talking about. Did you know Musashi's here at the festival? Musashi? Miyamoto Musashi? Jolted into wakefulness, he said, Are you serious? Look, you'd better go hide in the back. Is that all you can think of? Hiding? I don't want what happened at Wada Pass to happen again. Coward! Aren't you eager to get even with him, not only for that, but for what he did to the Yoshioka school? I am, and I'm only a woman. Yeah, but don't forget, we had lots of men to help us then. Now there's just the two of us. Toji hadn't been at Ichijoji, but he had heard how Musashi had fought, and had no illusions about who would end up dead if the two of them ran into each other again. Sidling up to her husband, Oko said, That's where you're wrong. There's another man here, isn't there? A man who hates Musashi as much as you do? Toji knew she was referring to Baiken, whom they had become acquainted with when their wanderings brought them to Mitsumine. Since there were no more battles, being a freebooter was no longer profitable, so Baiken had opened a smithy in Iga only to be driven out when Lord Todo tightened his rule over the province. Intending to seek his fortune in Edo, he had disbanded his gang, but then, through the introduction of a friend, had become the watchman at the temple's treasure house. Even now, the mountains between the provinces of Musashi and Kai were infested with bandits. In hiring Baiken to guard the treasure house with its religious treasures and donated cash, the temple elders were fighting fire with fire. He had the advantage of being intimately familiar with the ways of bandits, and he was also an acknowledged expert with the chain ball sickle. As the originator of the Yaegaki style, he might possibly have attracted the attention of a daimyo, had it not been for the fact that his brother was Tsujikaze Temma. In years long past, the two of them had terrorized the region between Mount Ibuki and the Yasugawa district. Changing times meant nothing to Baiken. To his way of thinking, Temma's death at the hands of Takezo had been the ultimate cause of all his subsequent difficulties. Oko had long since told Baiken about their grievance against Musashi, exaggerating her rancor in order to cement her friendship with him. He had responded by scowling and saying, One of these days. Oko had just finished telling Toji how she had caught sight of Musashi from the tea house, then lost him in the crowd. Later, on a hunch, she had gone to the Kanonin, arriving just as Musashi and Iori were leaving for the outer shrine. This information she had promptly imparted to Baiken. So that's the way it is, said Toji taking courage from the knowledge that a dependable ally had already been lined up. He knew Baiken, using his favorite weapon, had beaten every swordsman at the recent shrine tournament. If he attacked Musashi, there was a good chance of winning. What did he say when you told him? He'll come as soon as he finishes his rounds. Musashi is no fool. If we're not careful... Toji shuddered and uttered a gruff, unintelligible sound. Oko followed his eyes to the man sleeping on the bench. Who's that? asked Toji. Just a customer, answered Oko. Wake him up and get him out of here. Oko delegated this task to the girl's servant, who went to the far corner and shook the man until he sat up. Get out, she said bluntly. We're closing up now. He stood up, stretched, and said, 
That was a nice nap. Smiling to himself and blinking his large eyes, he moved quickly but smoothly, wrapping the matting around his shoulders, donning his basket hat and adjusting his pack. He placed his staff under his arm, said, Thanks a lot, with a bow, and walked quickly out the door. Oko judged from his clothing and accent that he was not one of the local farmers, but he seemed harmless enough. Funny-looking man, she said. I wonder if he paid his bill. Oko and Toji were still rolling up blinds and straightening up the shop when Baiken came in with Kuro. Good to see you, said Toji. Let's go to the back room. Baiken silently removed his sandals and followed them, while the dog nosed around for scraps of food. The back room was only a broken-down lean-to with the first coat of rough plaster on the walls. It was out of earshot of anyone in the shop. When a lamp had been lit, Baiken said, This evening in front of the dance stage, I overheard Musashi tell the boy they'd go up to the inner shrine tomorrow morning. Later I went to the Kanongin and checked it out. Both Oko and Toji swallowed and looked out the window. The peak on which the inner shrine stood was dimly outlined against the starry sky. Knowing whom he was up against, Baiken had made a plan of attack and mobilized reinforcements. Two priests, guards at the treasure house, had already agreed to help and had gone on ahead with their lances. There was also a man from the Yoshioka school who ran a small dojo at the shrine. Baiken calculated he could mobilize perhaps ten freebooters, men he'd known in Iga who were now working in the vicinity. Toji would carry a musket, while Baiken would have his chain-ball sickle. "'You've done all this already?' asked Toji in disbelief. Baiken grinned, but said nothing more. A diminutive sliver of moon hung high above the valley, hidden from view by a thick fog. The great peak was still sleeping, with only the gurgling and roaring of the river to accentuate the silence. A group of dark figures huddled on the bridge at Kosaruzawa. Toji, Baiken whispered hoarsely. Here, be sure to keep your fuse dry. Conspicuous among the motley crew were the two lancer priests, who had the skirts of their robes tucked up ready for action. The others were dressed in a variety of outfits, but all were shod so as to be able to move nimbly. Is this everybody? Yes. How many altogether? They counted heads. Thirteen. Good, said Baiken. He went over their instructions again. They listened in silence, nodding occasionally. Then, at a signal, they scurried into the fog to take up positions along the road. At the end of the bridge, they passed a milestone, saying, Six thousand yards to the inner shrine. When the bridge was empty again, a great company of monkeys emerged from hiding, jumping from limbs, climbing vines, converging on the road. They ran out onto the bridge, crawled under it, threw stones into the ravine. The fog toyed with them, as if encouraging their frolic. Had a Taoist immortal appeared and beckoned, perhaps they would have been transformed into clouds and flown off with him to heaven. The barking of a dog echoed through the mountains. The monkeys vanished, like shumac leaves before an autumn wind. Kuro came up the road, dragging Oko along with him. He'd somehow broken loose, and though Oko had eventually got hold of the leash, she hadn't been able to make him go back. She knew Toji didn't want the dog around to make noise, so she thought maybe she could get him out of the way by letting him go up to the inner shrine. As the restlessly shifting fog began to settle in the valleys like snow, the three peaks of Mitsumine and the lesser mountains between Musashino and Kai rose against the sky in all their grandeur. The winding roads stood out white, and birds began to ruffle their feathers and chirp a greeting to the dawn. Iori said, half to himself, Why is that, I wonder? Why is what? asked Musashi. It's getting light, but I can't see the sun. 
For one thing, you're looking toward the west. Oh! Iori gave the moon, sinking behind the distant peaks, a cursory glance. Iori, a lot of your friends seem to live here in the mountains. Where? Over there. Musashi laughed and pointed to some monkeys clustered around their mother. I wish I was one of them. Why? At least they have a mother. They climbed the steep part of the road in silence and came to a relatively flat stretch. Musashi noticed the grass had been trampled by a large number of feet. After winding around the mountain for a while more, they reached the level area where they were facing east. Look! cried Iori, looking over his shoulder at Musashi. The sun's coming up! So it is. From the sea of clouds beneath them, the mountains of Kai and Kozuke jutted up like islands. Iori stopped and stood stock still, feet together, arms at his sides, lips tightly set. He stared in rapt fascination at the great golden sphere, imagining himself to be a child of the sun. All at once he exclaimed in a very loud voice, It's Amaterasu Omikami, isn't it? He looked to Musashi for confirmation. That's right. Raising his arms high above his head, the boy filtered the brilliant light through his fingers. My blood! he cried. It's the same color as the sun's blood. Clapping his hands, as he would at a shrine to summon the deity, he bowed his head in silent obeisance, thinking, The monkeys have a mother, I have none. But I have this goddess. They have none. The revelation filled him with joy, and as he burst into tears, he seemed to hear from beyond the clouds the music of the shrine dances. The drums boomed in his ears, while the counterpoint of the flutes hovered around the melody of the dance of Iwato. His feet caught the rhythm, his arms swayed gracefully. From his lips came the words he had memorized only the night before. The Katalpa bow, with each coming of spring, I hope to see the dancing of the myriad of gods. Oh, how I hope to see their dancing! Suddenly realizing Musashi had gone on ahead, he abandoned his dance and ran to catch up. The morning light barely penetrated the forest they now entered. Here, in the approach to the inner shrine, the cryptomerias were of enormous circumference and all about the same height. Tiny white flowers grew in the thick patches of moss clinging to the trees. Suspecting the trees were ancient, five hundred years old, perhaps even a thousand, Iori had an urge to bow to them. Here and there, bright red vine maple caught his eye. Low-striped bamboo encroaching on the road narrowed it to a path. Without warning, the earth seemed to tremble under their feet. Close upon the thunderous report came an unnerving scream and a cascade of sharp echoes. Iori covered his ears with his hands and dived into the bamboo. Iori, stay down, Musashi commanded from the shadow of a large tree. Don't move, even if they trample on you. The gloomy half-light seemed infested with lances and swords. Because of the scream, the attackers thought at first the bullet had found its mark, but there was no body in sight. Uncertain as to what had happened, they froze. Iori was at the center of a circle of eyes and unsheathed blades. In the deathly silence that followed, curiosity got the better of him. He slowly raised his head above the bamboo. Only a few feet away, a sword blade, extending from behind a tree, caught a flash of sunlight. Losing all control, Iori screamed at the top of his lungs, Sensei! Somebody's hiding there! As he shouted, he jumped to his feet and made a dash for safety. The sword leapt from the shadows and hung like a demon above his head, but only for an instant. Musashi's dagger flew straight to the swordsman's head and lodged in the temple. Yeah! One of the priests charged at Musashi with his lance. Musashi caught the lance and held it tightly with one hand. Another death cry sounded, as if the man's mouth were full of rocks. Wondering if his attackers could be fighting among themselves, Musashi strained his eyes to see. 
The other priest took careful aim with his lance and hurtled toward him. Musashi caught this lance, too, and held it securely under his right arm. Jump him now! screamed one of the priests, realizing that Musashi had his hands full. His voice stentorian, Musashi shouted, Who are you? Identify yourselves, or I'll assume you're all enemies. It's a shame to spill blood on this holy ground, but I may have no choice. Whirling the lances around and sending the two priests off on different tangents, Musashi whipped out his sword and finished off one of them before he had stopped tumbling. Spinning around, he found himself confronting three more blades, lined up across the narrow path. Without pausing, he moved toward them threateningly, one step at a time. Two more men came out and took their places shoulder to shoulder beside the first three. As Musashi advanced and his opponents retreated, he caught a glimpse of the other lancer priest, who had recovered his weapon and was chasing Iori. Stop, you cutthroat! But the moment Musashi turned to go to Iori's rescue, the five men let out a howl and charged. Musashi rushed head-on to meet them. It was like the collision of two raging waves, but the spray was blood, not brine. Musashi kept whirling from opponent to opponent with the speed of a typhoon. Two blood-curdling cries, then a third. They fell like dead trees, each sliced through the middle of the torso. In Musashi's right hand was his long sword, in his left the short one. With cries of terror, the last two turned and ran, Musashi close behind them. Where do you think you're going? he shouted, splitting one man's head open with the short sword. The black spurt of blood caught Musashi in the eye. Reflexively, he raised his left hand to his face and in that instant heard a strange metallic sound behind him. He swung his long sword to deflect the object, but the effect of the action was very different from the intention. Seeing the ball and chain wrapped around the blade near the sword guard, he was seized with alarm. Musashi had been taken off guard. Musashi! shouted Baiken. He pulled the chain taut. Have you forgotten me? Musashi stared for a moment before exclaiming, Shishido Baiken, from Mount Suzuka! That's right. My brother Temma's calling you from the Valley of Hell. I'll see that you get there quick. Musashi could not free his sword. By slow degrees, Baiken was taking in the chain and moving closer to make use of the razor-sharp sickle. As Musashi looked for an opening for his short sword, he realized with a start that if he had been fighting with only his long sword, he would be utterly defenseless now. Baiken's neck was so swollen it was nearly as thick as his head. With a strained cry, he jerked powerfully on the chain. Musashi had blundered. He knew that. The ball chain sickle was an unusual weapon, but not unfamiliar to him. Years earlier, he had been struck by admiration when he had first seen the hellish device in the hands of Baiken's wife. But it was one thing to have seen it something else to know how to counter it. Baiken gloated, a broad, evil grin spreading over his face. Musashi knew there was only one course open to him. He had to let go of his long sword. He looked for the right moment. With a ferocious howl, Baiken leapt and swept the sickle toward Musashi's head, missing by only a hair's breadth. Musashi released the sword with a loud grunt. No sooner had the sickle been withdrawn than the ball came whirling through the air. Then the sickle, the ball, the sickle. Dodging the sickle put Musashi right in the path of the ball. Unable to get close enough to strike, he wondered frantically how long he could keep it up. Is this it? he asked. The question was conscious, but as the tension increased, his body became difficult to control and his responses purely physiological. Not only his muscles, but his very skin was struggling instinctively. Concentration became so intense, the flow of oily sweat stopped. Every hair on his body stood on end. It was too late to get behind a tree. If he made a dash for it now, he'd probably run into another foe. He heard a clear, plaintive cry and thought, Uh-oh, Yuri? He wanted to look, but in his heart gave the boy up for lost. Die, you son of a bitch! 
The cry came from behind Musashi. Then, Musashi, why are you taking so much time? I'm taking care of the vermin behind you. Musashi didn't recognize the voice, but decided he could focus his attention on Baiken alone. To Baiken, the most important factor was his distance from his opponent. His effectiveness depended on manipulating the length of chain. If Musashi could move a foot beyond the reach of the chain or approach a foot nearer, Baiken would be in trouble. He had to make sure that Musashi did neither. Musashi marveled at the man's secret technique, and as he marveled, it suddenly struck him that here was the principle of the two swords. The chain was a single length. The ball functioned as the right sword, the sickle as the left. Of course, he cried triumphantly. That's it. That's the Yaegaki style. Now confident of victory, he leapt back, putting five feet between the two of them. He transferred his sword to his right hand and hurled it straight as an arrow. Baiken twisted his body and the sword glanced off, burying itself in the root of a nearby tree. But as he twisted, the chain wrapped itself around his torso. Before he could even cry out, Musashi slammed his full weight into him. Baiken got his hand as far as the hilt of his sword, but Musashi broke his hold with a sharp chop to the wrist. In a continuation of the same motion, he drew the weapon and split Baiken open, like lightning splitting a tree. As he pulled the blade down, he twisted ever so slightly. What a pity, thought Musashi. As the story was later told, he even uttered a sigh of compassion as the originator of the Yaegaki style breathed his last. The Karatake Slice! exclaimed an admiring voice, straight down the trunk. No different from splitting bamboo. It's the first time I've ever seen it. Musashi turned and said, Why, if it isn't Gonnosuke from Kiso, what are you doing here? It's been a long time, hasn't it? The god of Mitsumine must have arranged it, perhaps with the aid of my mother, who taught me so much before she died. They fell to chatting, but Musashi suddenly stopped and cried, Iori! He's all right. I rescued him from that pig of a priest and had him climb a tree. Iori, watching them from a high branch, started to speak, but instead shaded his eyes and looked toward a small flat area beyond the edge of the forest. Kuro, tied to a tree, had caught Oko's kimono sleeve with his teeth. She yanked desperately at the sleeve. In a trice... It tore off, and she ran away. The lone survivor, the other priest, was hobbling along, leaning heavily on his lance, blood flowing from a head wound. The dog, perhaps crazed by the smell of blood, started making a terrible racket. The noise echoed and re-echoed for a time, but then the rope gave way, and the dog went after Oko. When he reached him, the priest lifted his lance and aimed for the dog's head. Wounded in the neck, the beast ran into the woods. That woman's getting away, cried Iori. Never mind, you can come down now. There's an injured priest over there. Shouldn't you catch him? Forget it. He doesn't matter anymore. The woman's probably the one from the Oinu tea house, said Gonnosuke. He explained his presence, the heaven-sent coincidence that had enabled him to come to Musashi's assistance. Deeply grateful, Musashi said, You killed the man who fired the gun? No, Gonosuke smiled. Not me, my staff. I knew ordinarily you could take care of men like that. But if they were going to use a gun, I decided I'd better do something. So I came here ahead of them and slipped up behind the man while it was still dark. They checked the corpses. Seven had been killed with the staff, only five with the sword. Musashi said, I haven't done anything except defend myself, but this area belongs to the shrine. I feel I should explain things to the government official in charge. Then he can ask his questions and get the incident cleared up. On their way down the mountain, they ran into a contingent of armed officials at the bridge at Kosaruzawa. Musashi told his story. The captain in charge listened, 
seemingly puzzled, but nevertheless ordered Musashi tied up. Shocked, Musashi wanted to know why, since he was on his way to report to them in the first place. Get moving, ordered the captain. Angry as Musashi was about being treated as an ordinary criminal, there was still another surprise coming. There were more officials farther down the mountain. By the time they arrived in the town, his guard numbered no fewer than a hundred. Brother Disciples Come now, no more tears, Gonosuke hugged Iori to his chest. You're a man, aren't you? It's because I'm a man that I'm crying. He lifted his head, opened his mouth wide, and bawled at the sky. They didn't arrest Musashi. He gave himself up. Gonosuke's mild words masked his own deep concern. Come on, let's go now. No, not until they bring him back. They'll let him go soon. They'll have to. Do you want me to leave you here by yourself? Gonosuke walked a few paces away. Iori didn't move. Just then, Baiken's dog came charging out of the woods, his muzzle a dull, bloody red. Help! screamed Iori, running to Gonosuke's side. You're worn out, aren't you? Look, would you like me to carry you piggyback? Iori, pleased, mumbled his thanks, climbed on the proffered back, and wrapped his arms around the broad shoulders. With the festival over the night before, the visitors had departed. A gentle breeze wafted bits of bamboo wrapping and scraps of paper along the deserted streets. Passing the Oinu tea house, Gonosuke glanced inside, intending to go by unnoticed. But Iori piped out, there's the woman who ran away. I imagine that's where she'd be. He stopped and wondered aloud. If the officials dragged in Musashi, why didn't they arrest her too? When Oko saw Gonnosuke, her eyes blazed with anger. Seeing she seemed to be hurriedly gathering her belongings together, Gonnosuke laughed. Going on a trip? he asked. None of your business. Don't think I don't know you, you meddling scoundrel. You killed my husband. You brought it on yourselves. I'll get even one of these days. She demon! Iori shouted over Gonosuke's head. Retreating into the back room, Oko laughed scornfully. You're fine ones to be saying bad things about me when you're the thieves who broke into the treasure house. What's this? Gonosuke let Iori slide to the ground and went into the tea house. Who are you calling thieves? You can't fool me. Say that again, and thieves. As Gonosuke grabbed her arm, she turned and stabbed at him with a dagger. Not bothering with his staff, he wrested the dagger from her hand and sent her sprawling through the front door. Oko jumped up and screamed, Help! Thieves! I'm being attacked! Gonosuke took aim and hurled the dagger. It entered her back and the point came out in front. Oko pitched forward onto her face. From nowhere, Kuro bounded forth and was at the body, first slurping blood hungrily, then lifting his head to howl at the sky. Look at those eyes! exclaimed Iori in horror. Oko's cry of thieves had caught the ears of the excited villagers. Sometime before dawn, someone had broken into the temple treasure house. It was clearly the work of outsiders, for the religious treasures, old swords, mirrors, and the like, had been left untouched, but a fortune in gold dust, bullion, and cash accumulated over a period of many years was missing. The news had leaked out slowly and was still unconfirmed. The effect of Oko's scream, the most tangible proof so far, was electric. There they are! Inside the Oinu! The cries attracted a still larger mob armed with bamboo spears, boar guns, sticks, and rocks. In no time it seemed that the whole village was surrounding the tea house, thirsty for blood. Gonosuke and Iori ducked out the back and for the next several hours were driven from hiding place to hiding place. But now they had an explanation. Musashi had been arrested not for the crime he was about to confess, but as a thief. 
It was not until they reached Shomaru Pass that they shook off the last of the search parties. You can see Musashino Plain from here, said Iori. I wonder if my teacher's all right. Hmm, I imagine he's in prison by now and being questioned. Isn't there any way to save him? There must be. Please do something, please. You don't have to beg. He's like a teacher to me, too. But, Iori, there's not much you can do here. Can you make it back home by yourself? I suppose so, if I have to. Good. What about you? I'm going back to Chichibu. If they refuse to release Musashi, I'll get him out some way, even if I have to tear the prison down. For emphasis, he thumped the ground once with his staff. Iori, who had seen the power of this weapon, quickly nodded his agreement. That's a boy. You go back and watch over things until I bring Musashi home safe and sound. Placing his staff under his arm, he turned back toward Chichibu. Iori didn't feel lonely or afraid, nor did he worry about getting lost. But he was dreadfully sleepy, and as he walked along under the warm sun, he could hardly keep his eyes open. At Sakamoto, he saw a stone Buddha by the wayside and lay down in its shadow. The evening light was fading when he awoke and heard soft voices on the other side of the statue. Feeling rather guilty about eavesdropping, he pretended he was still asleep. There were two of them, one sitting on a tree stump, the other on a rock. Tied to a tree a little distance away were two horses with lacquered boxes suspended from both sides of their saddles. A wooden tag attached to one of the boxes said, From Shimotsuke Province, For use in the construction of the West Encirclement, Lacquerware Supplier to the Shogun. To Iori, who now peeked around the statue, they did not look like the normal run of well fed castle officials. Their eyes were too sharp, their bodies too muscular. The older one was a vigorous-looking man of more than fifty. The last rays of the sun reflected strongly from his bonnet-like hat, which came down over both ears and projected out in front, concealing his features. His companion was a slender, wiry youth wearing a forelock that suited his boyish face. His head was covered with a suo-dyed hand towel tied beneath his chin. How about the lacquerware boxes? the younger one asked. That was pretty good, wasn't it? Yes, that was clever, making people think we're connected with the work going on at the castle. I wouldn't have thought of that myself. I'll have to teach you these things little by little. Careful now. Don't start making fun of your elders. But who knows, maybe in four or five years, old Daiso will be taking orders from you. Well, young people do grow up. Old people just get older, no matter how hard they work at staying young. Do you think that's what I'm doing? It's obvious, isn't it? You're always thinking of your age, and that's what makes you so devoted to seeing your mission accomplished. You know me pretty well, I guess. Shouldn't we be going? Yes, night's catching up with us. I don't like the idea of being caught up with. Ha <laughs> ha! If you scare easily, you can't have much confidence in what you're doing. I haven't been at this business very long. Even the sound of the wind makes me nervous sometimes. That's because you still think of yourself as an ordinary thief. If you keep in mind that you're doing it for the good of the country... You'll be all right. You always say that. I believe you, but something keeps telling me I'm not doing the right thing. You have to have the courage of your convictions. But the admonition sounded slightly unconvincing, as though Daizo was reassuring himself. The youth jumped lightly into the saddle and rode on ahead. Keep your eye on me, he called back over his shoulder. If I see anything, I'll signal. The road made a long descent to the south. Iori watched from behind the stone Buddha for a minute, then decided to follow them. 
Somehow the idea had formed in his mind that these were the treasure house thieves. Once or twice they looked back cautiously. Apparently finding nothing to warrant alarm, they seemed to forget about him after a time. Before long, the evening glow was gone and it was too dark to see more than a few yards ahead. The two riders were almost at the edge of Musashino Plain when the youth pointed and said, There, chief, you can see the lights of Ogimachiya. The road was flattening out. A short distance ahead, the Iruma River, twisting like a discarded obi, shone silvery in the moonlight. Iori was now being careful to remain inconspicuous. His idea that these men were the thieves had become a conviction, and he knew all about bandits from his days in Hotengahara. Bandits were vicious men who would commit mayhem over a single egg or a handful of red beans. Unprovoked murder was nothing to them. By and by, they entered the town of Ogimachiya. Daizo lifted his arm and said, Jota! We'll stop here and have a bite to eat. The horses have to be fed, and I'd like a smoke. They tied the horses in front of a dimly lit shop and went inside. Jota stationed himself by the door, keeping his eyes on the boxes the whole time he was eating. When he was finished, he went out and fed the horses. Iori went into a food shop across the street, and when the two men rode off, he grabbed the last handful of his rice and ate it as he walked. They rode side by side now. The road was dark but level. Jota, did you send a courier to Kiso? Yes, I took care of that. What time did you tell them? Midnight. We should be there on schedule. In the still night, Iori caught enough of their conversation to know that Daizo called his companion by a boy's name, while Jota addressed the older man as chief. This might mean nothing more than that he was the head of a gang, but somehow Iori got the impression they were father and son. This made them not mere bandits, but hereditary bandits, very dangerous men he would never be able to capture by himself. But if he could stick with them long enough, he could report their whereabouts to the officials. The town of Kawagoe was fast asleep, as soundless as a swamp in the dead of night. Having passed rows of darkened houses, the two riders turned off the highway and began climbing a hill. A stone marker at the bottom said, Forest of the Head-Burring Mound, above. Climbing up through the bushes alongside the path, Iori reached the top first. There was a lone pine tree of great size, to which a horse was tied. Squatting at the base were three men dressed like Ronin, arms folded on their knees, looking expectantly toward the path. Iori had hardly ensconced himself in a hiding place before one of the men stood up and said, It's Daizo, all right. All three ran forward and exchanged jovial salutations. Daizo and his confederates had not met for nearly four years. Before long, they got down to work. Under Daizo's direction, they rolled a huge stone aside and began digging. Dirt was piled to one side, a great store of gold and silver to the other. Jota unloaded the boxes from the horses and dumped out their contents, which, as Iori had suspected, consisted of the missing treasure from Mitsumine Shrine. Added to the previous cash, the total booty must have had a value of many tens of thousands of ryo. The precious metals were poured into plain straw sacks and loaded on three horses, the empty lacquered boxes, along with other objects that had served their purpose, were dumped into the hole. After the ground had been smoothed over, the stone was restored to its original position. That should do it, said Daizo. Time for a smoke. He sat down by the pine tree and took out his pipe. The others brushed off their clothes and joined him. During the four years of his so-called pilgrimage, Daizo had covered the Kanto Plain very thoroughly. There were few temples or shrines without a plaque attesting to his generosity, the extent of which was no secret. Strangely, though, 
No one had thought to ask how he had come by all this money. Daizo, Jotaro, and the three men from Kiso sat in a circle for about an hour, discussing future plans. That it was now risky for Daizo to return to Edo was not in doubt, but one of them had to go. There was gold in the storehouse at Shibaura to be recovered and documents to be burned, and something had to be done about Akemi. Just before sunup, Daizo and the three men began the journey down the Koshu High Road to Kiso. Jotaro, on foot, set off in the opposite direction. The stars Iori was gazing at offered no answer to his question, who to follow? Under the transparently blue autumn sky, the strong rays of the afternoon sun seemed to sink right into Jotaro's skin. His head filled with thoughts of his role in the coming age, he was strolling across the Musashino Plain as though he owned it. Casting a somewhat apprehensive glance behind him, he thought, he's still there. Thinking the boy might want to talk to him, he'd already stopped a couple of times, but the boy had made no attempt to catch up with him. Deciding to find out what was going on, Jotaro chose a clump of Eulalia and hid in it. When Yori reached the stretch of road where he'd last seen Jotaro, he began looking around worriedly. Abruptly, Jotaro stood up and called out, You there! Runt! Iori gasped, but recovered quickly. Knowing he couldn't get away, he walked on past and asked nonchalantly, What do you want? You've been following me, haven't you? Uh-uh. Iori shook his head innocently. I'm on my way to Juniso Nakano. You're lying! You were following me! I don't know what you're talking about! Iori started to break and run, but Jotaro caught him by the back of his kimono. Out with it! But I... I don't know anything! Liar! said Jotaro, tightening his grip. Somebody sent you after me. You're a spy! And you? You're a lousy thief! What? Jotaro shouted, his face almost touching Iori's. Iori bent nearly to the ground, broke loose, and took off. Jotaro hesitated a minute, then set off after him. Off to one side, Iori could see thatched roofs scattering about like wasp nests. He ran through a field of reddish autumn grass, kicking apart several dusty molehills. Help! Help! Thief! cried Iori. The small village he was entering was inhabited by families charged with fighting fires on the plain. Iori could hear a blacksmith's hammer and anvil. People came running out of dark stables and houses where persimmons had been hung to dry. Waving his arms, Iori panted, The man with the bandana! Chasing me! He's a thief! Capture him! Please! Oh, oh! Here he comes! The villagers stared in bewilderment, some looking fearfully at the two youths, but to Iori's dismay, they made no move to capture Jotaro. He's a thief! He stole from the temple! He stopped halfway through the village, conscious that the only thing disturbing the peaceful atmosphere was his own shouting. Then he took to his heels again and found a place to hide and catch his breath. Jotaro cautiously slowed down to a dignified walk. The villagers watched in silence. He certainly didn't look like either a robber or a ronin up to no good. In fact, he seemed like a clean-cut youth, incapable of committing any kind of crime. Disgusted that the villagers, grown-ups, wouldn't stand up to a thief, Iori made up his mind to hurry back to Nakano, where he could at least present his case to people he knew. He left the road and struck out across the plain. When he could see the Cryptomeria Grove behind the house, there was only a mile to go. Filled with relief, he changed his pace from a trot to a full run. Suddenly, he saw that his way was blocked by a man with both arms outstretched. He didn't have time to figure out how Jotaro had got ahead of him, but he was on home ground now. He jumped back and drew his sword. You bastard! he screamed. Jotaro rushed forward empty-handed and caught Iori's collar, but the boy pulled free and jumped ten feet to the side. Son of a bitch, 
muttered Jotaro, feeling warm blood running down his right arm from a two-inch cut. Iori took a stance and fixed his mind on the lesson Musashi had drummed into him. Eyes, eyes, eyes. His strength concentrated in his bright pupils. His whole being seemed to be channeled into a pair of fiery eyes. Outstared, Jotaro whipped out his own sword. I'll have to kill you, he snarled. Iori, taking fresh courage from the strike he had scored, charged his attack the one he always employed against Musashi. Jotaro was having second thoughts. He hadn't believed Iori could use a sword. Now he put his full strength into the fight. For the sake of his comrades, he had to get this meddling child out of the way. Seemingly ignoring Iori's attack, he pressed forward and swung viciously, but unsuccessfully. After two or three parries, Iori turned around, ran, stopped, and charged again. When Jotaro countered, he retreated again, encouraged to see that his strategy was working. He was drawing the opponent into his own territory. Pausing to catch his breath, Jotaro looked around the dark grove and shouted, Where are you, you stupid little bastard? The answer was a shower of bark and leaves. Jotaro raised his head and shouted, I see you! though all he could actually see through the foliage was a couple of stars. Jotaro started climbing toward the rustling sound Iori made as he moved out on a limb. From there, unfortunately, there was nowhere to go. I've got you now. Unless you can grow wings, you'd better give up. Otherwise, you're dead. Iori moved silently back to the fork of two limbs. Jotaro climbed slowly and carefully. When Jotaro reached out to grab him, Iori again moved out on one of the limbs. With a grunt, Jotaro caught hold of a branch with both hands and started to pull himself up, giving Iori the chance he'd been waiting for. With a resounding whack, his sword connected with the branch Jotaro was on. It broke, and Jotaro plummeted to the ground. How do you like that, thief? gloated Iori. His fall broken by lower branches, Jotaro wasn't seriously injured, except for his pride. He cursed and started back up the tree, this time with the speed of a leopard. When he was under Iori's feet again, Iori slashed back and forth with his sword to keep him from getting any nearer. While they were locked in stalemate, the plaintive tones of a shakohachi came to their ears. For a moment, they both stopped and listened. Then Jotaro decided to try reasoning with his adversary. All right, he said. You put up a better fight than I expected. I admire you for that. If you'll tell me who asked you to follow me, I'll let you go. Admit you're licked. Are you crazy? I may not be very big, but I'm Misawa Iori, the only disciple of Miyamoto Musashi. Begging mercy would be an insult to my master's reputation. Give up! W what said Jotaro incredulously. S say that once more? His voice was shrill and unsteady. Listen carefully, Iori said proudly. I am Misawa Iori, the only pupil of Miyamoto Musashi. Does that surprise you? Jotaro was ready to admit defeat. With a mixture of doubt and curiosity, he asked, How is my teacher? Is he well? Where is he? Astonished, but keeping a safe distance from Jotaro, who was moving closer, Iori said, Ha! Sensei would never have a thief for a disciple. Don't call me that. Didn't Musashi ever mention Jotaro? Jotaro? If you're really Musashi's pupil, you must have heard him mention my name sometime or other. I was about your age then. That's a lie. No, it isn't. It's the truth. Overcome with nostalgia, Jotaro reached out to Iori and tried to explain that they should be friends because they were disciples of the same teacher. Still wary, Iori took a swipe at his ribs. Squeezed precariously between two limbs, Jotaro barely succeeded in clasping his hand around Iori's wrist. For some reason, Iori let go of the branch he was holding onto. When they fell, they fell together, one landing on top of the other, 
both knocked senseless. The light in Musashi's new house was visible from all directions, since, though the roof was in place, the walls hadn't been built yet. Takuan, arriving the day before for an after-the-storm call, had decided to wait for Musashi's return. Today, just after nightfall, his enjoyment of his solitary surroundings had been interrupted by a mendicant priest asking for hot water to go with his supper. After his meager meal of rice balls, the aged priest had taken it upon himself to play his shakuhachi for Takuan, fingering his instrument in a halting, amateurish fashion. Yet as Takuan listened, the music struck him as having genuine feeling, albeit of the artless sort, often expressed in poems by non-poets. He thought, too, that he could recognize the emotion the player was attempting to wring from his instrument. It was remorse, from the first off-key note to the last, a wailing cry of repentance. It seemed to be the story of the man's life, but then, Takuan reflected, that couldn't have been too different from his own. Whether people were great or not, there was not much variety in their inner life experience. Any difference lay merely in how they dealt with common human weaknesses. To Takuan, both he and the other man were basically a bundle of illusions wrapped in human skin. I do believe I've seen you before somewhere, Takuan murmured thoughtfully. The priest blinked his almost sightless eyes and said, Now that you mention it, I thought I recognized your voice. Aren't you Takuan Soho from Tajima? Takuan's memory cleared. Moving the lamp closer to the man's face, he said, You're Aoki Tanzaemon, aren't you? Then you are, Takua. Oh, I wish I could crawl into a hole and hide this miserable flesh of mine. How strange we should meet in a place like this. It's been nearly ten years since that time at the Shipoji, hasn't it? Thinking of those days gives me a chill, then he said stiffly. Now that I'm reduced to wandering about in darkness... This wretched sack of bones is sustained only by thoughts of my son. Do you have a son? I've been told he's with that man who has tied up in the old cryptomeria tree. Takezo, was it? I hear he's called Miyamoto Musashi now. The two of them are said to have come east. You mean your son is Musashi's disciple? That's what they say. I was so ashamed. I couldn't face Musashi, so I resolved to put the boy out of my mind. But now he's seventeen this year. If only I could have one look at him and see what kind of man he's grown up to be, I'd be ready and willing to die. So Jotaro's your son. I didn't know that, said Takua. Tanzaimon nodded. There was no hint in his shriveled form of the proud captain filled with lust for Otsu. Takuan gazed at him with pity, pained to see Tanzaemon so tormented by guilt. Seeing that despite his priestly garb he lacked even the comfort of religious faith, Takuan decided the first thing he should do was bring him face to face with the Buddha Amida whose infinite mercy saves even those guilty of the ten evils and the five deadly sins. They would be time enough after he'd recovered from his despair to look for Jotaro. Takuan gave him the name of a Zen temple in Edo. If you tell them I sent you, they'll let you stay as long as you wish. As soon as I have time, I'll come and we'll have a long talk. I have an idea where your son might be. I'll do everything I can to make sure you see him in the not-too-distant future. In the meantime, give up brooding. Even after a man's fifty or sixty, he can still know happiness, even do useful work. You may live for many more years. Talk it over with the priests when you get to the temple. Takuan shooed Tanzaimo out the door, 
unceremoniously and without showing any sympathy, but Tanzaimon seemed to appreciate the unsentimental attitude. After numerous bows of gratitude, he picked up his reed hat and shakuhachi and left. For fear of slipping, Tanzaimon chose to go through the woods, where the path sloped more gently. Presently, his cane struck an obstacle. Feeling around with his hands, he was surprised to find two bodies lying motionless on the damp ground. He hurried back to the cabin. Takuan, can you help me? I came across two unconscious boys in the woods. Takuan roused himself and came outside. Tanzaimon continued, I don't have any medicine with me, and I can't see well enough to get water for them. Takuan slipped on his sandals and shouted toward the bottom of the hill. His voice carried easily. A farmer answered, asking him what he wanted. Takuan told him to bring a torch, some men, and some water. While he waited, he suggested to Tanzaimon that the road was the better way to go, described it in detail, and sent him on his way. Halfway down the hill, Tanzaimon passed the men coming up. When Takuan arrived with the farmers, Jotaro had come too and was sitting underneath the tree, looking dazed. One hand resting on Yori's arm, he was debating whether to revive him and find out what he wanted to know or to get away from there. He reacted to the torch like a nocturnal animal, tensing his muscles, ready to run. What's going on here? asked Takuan. As he looked more closely, inquisitive interest turned to surprise, a surprise matched by Jotaro's. The young man was much taller than the boy Takuan had known, and his face had changed quite a bit. You're Jotaro, aren't you? The youth placed both hands on the ground and bowed. Yes, I am, he replied haltingly, almost fearfully. He'd recognize Takuan instantly. Well, I must say, you've grown up to be a fine young man. Turning his attention to Iori, he put his arm around him and ascertained that he was still alive. Iori revived, and after looking around curiously for a few seconds, burst into tears. What's the matter? Takuan asked soothingly. Are you hurt? Iori shook his head and blubbered. I'm not hurt, but they took my teacher away. He's in the prison in Chichibu. With Iori bawling the way he was, Takuan had trouble understanding him, but soon the basic facts of the story became clear. Takuan, realizing the seriousness of the situation, was nearly as grieved as Iori. Jotaro, too, was deeply agitated. In a shaky voice, he said abruptly, Takuan, I have something to tell you. Could we go somewhere where we can talk? He's one of the thieves, said Iori. You can't trust him. Anything he says will be a lie. He pointed accusingly at Jotaro, and they glared at each other. Shut up, both of you. Let me decide who's right and who's wrong. Takuan led them back to the house and ordered them to build a fire outside. Seating himself by the fire, Takuan commanded them to do likewise. Iori hesitated, his expression saying very plainly he had no intention of being friendly with a thief. But seeing Takuan and Jotaro talking amiably over old times, he felt a pang of jealousy and grudgingly took a seat near them. Jotaro lowered his voice and, like a woman confessing her sins before the Buddha, became very earnest. For four years now, I've been receiving training from a man named Daizo. He comes from Narai in Kiso. I've learned about his aspirations and what he wants to do for the world. I'd be willing to die for him, if necessary. And that's why I've tried to help him with his work. Well, it does hurt to be called a thief. But I'm still Musashi's disciple. Even though I'm separated from him, I've never been apart from him in spirit, not even for a day. He hurried on, not waiting to be asked questions. Daizo and I have sworn by the gods of heaven and earth not to tell anyone what our aim in life is. I can't even tell you. Still, I can't stand by when Musashi's been thrown in prison. I'll go to Chichibu tomorrow and confess. Takuan said, 
Then it was you and Daizo who robbed the treasure house? Yes, Jotaro replied without the slightest sign of contrition. So you are a thief, said Takuan. Jotaro lowered his head to avoid Takuan's eyes. No, no, he murmured lamely. We're not just common burglars. I was not aware that thieves came in different varieties. Well, what I'm trying to say is, we don't do these things for our own gain. We do them for the people. It's a matter of moving public property for the good of the public. I don't understand reasoning like that. Are you telling me your robberies are righteous crimes? Are you saying you're like the bandit heroes in Chinese novels? If so, it's a poor imitation. I can't answer that without revealing my secret agreement with Daizo. Ha-ha! <laughs> you aren't going to let yourself be taken in, are you? I don't care what you say. I'll confess only to save Musashi. I hope you'll put in a good word for me with him later. I wouldn't be able to think of a good word to put in. Musashi's innocent. Whether you confess or not, he'll be freed eventually. It seems to me it's far more important for you to take yourself to the Buddha. Use me as an intermediary and confess everything to him. Buddha? That's what I said. To hear you tell it, you're doing something grand for the sake of other people. In fact, you're putting yourself before others. Has it not occurred to you that you leave quite a number of people unhappy? One can't consider himself when one is working on behalf of society. Stupid fool! He struck Jotaro soundly on the cheek with his fist. One's self is the basis of everything. Every action is a manifestation of the self. A person who doesn't know himself can do nothing for others. What I meant, I wasn't acting to satisfy my own desires. Shut up! Don't you see you're barely grown? There's nothing more frightening than a half-baked do-gooder who knows nothing of the world but takes it upon himself to tell the world what's good for it. You needn't say any more about what you and Daizo are doing. I have a very good idea already. What are you crying about? Blow your nose! Ordered to bed, Jotaro lay down obediently but couldn't get to sleep for thinking of Musashi. He clasped his hands together over his chest and silently begged forgiveness. Tears dribbled into his ears. He turned on his side and began thinking about Otsu. His cheek hurt. Otsu's tears would hurt worse. Still, revealing his secret promise to Daizo was inconceivable, even if Takuan tried to get it out of him in the morning, as he was sure to do. He got up without making a sound, went outside and looked up at the stars. He would have to hurry. The night was nearly gone. Stop! The voice froze Jotaro where he was. Behind him, Takuan was a huge shadow. The priest came to his side and put his arm around him. Are you determined to go and confess? Jotaro nodded. That's not very intelligent said Takuan sympathetically. You'll die a dog's death. You seem to think that if you give yourself up, Musashi will be set free, but it isn't that simple. The officials will keep Musashi in prison until you tell them everything you've been refusing to tell me, and you, you'll be tortured until you talk, whether it takes a year, two years, or more. Jotaro hung his head. Is that what you want? To die a dog's death? But you have no choice now. Either you confess everything under torture, or you tell me everything. As a disciple of the Buddha, I'll not sit in judgment. I'll relay it to Amida. Jotaro said nothing. There is one other way. By the sheerest chance, I happened to meet your father last night. He now wears the robes of a mendicant priest. Of course, I never dreamed you were here, too. I sent him to a temple in Edo. If you've made up your mind to die, it'll be good for you to see him first. And when you see him, 
You can ask him if I'm not right. Jotaro, there are three paths open to you. You must decide for yourself which one to follow. He turned away and started back into the house. Jotaro realized that the shakuhachi he had heard the night before must have belonged to his father. Without being told, he could imagine how his father must look and feel as he wandered around from place to place. Takua, wait! I'll talk! I'll tell everything to the Buddha, including my promise to Daizo! He caught hold of the priest's sleeve, and the two went into the grove. Jotaro confessed in a long monologue, omitting nothing. Takua neither moved a muscle nor spoke. That's all, said Jotaro. Everything? Every single thing. Good. Takua remained silent for fully an hour. Dawn came. Crows began cawing. Dew glistened everywhere. Takuan sat on the root of a cryptomeria. Jotaro leaned against another tree, head bowed, waiting for the tongue lashing he knew was coming. When Takuan finally spoke, he appeared to have no more doubts. I must say, you got mixed up with quite a crowd. Heaven help them. They don't understand which way the world is turning. It's a good thing you told me before matters got worse. Reaching into his kimono, he produced, surprisingly enough, two gold coins and handed them to Jotaro. You better get away as fast as you can. The slightest delay may bring disaster not only to you, but to your father and your teacher. Get as far away as possible, but don't go near the Koshu High Road or the Nakasendo. By noon today, they'll be carrying out a rigid check on all travelers. What'll happen to Sensei? I can't go away and leave him where he is. Leave that to me. After a year or two, when things have quieted down, you can go to see him and make your apologies. Then I'll put in a good word for you. Goodbye. Just a minute. Yes? Go to Edo first. In Azabu, there's a Zen temple called Shojuang. Your father should be there by now. Take this seal I received from the Daitokuji. They'll know it's mine. Get them to give you and your father priests, hats, and robes, as well as the necessary credentials. Then you can travel in disguise. Why do I have to pretend to be a priest? Is there no end to your naivete? You, my silly young friend, are an agent of a group planning to kill the shogun, set fire to Ieyasu's castle in Suruga, throw the whole Kanto district into confusion, and take over the government. In short, you're a traitor. If you're caught, the mandatory punishment is death by hanging. Jotaro's mouth fell open. Now go! May I ask one question? Why should men who want to overthrow the Tokugawas be considered traitors? Why aren't the ones who overthrew the Toyotomis and seized control of the country traitors? Don't ask me, Takuan answered with a cold stare.